Chapter One of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter One. There was no possibility of taking a walk that day. We had been wandering, indeed, in the leafless shrubbery an hour in the morning. But since dinner—Mrs. Reed, when there was no company, dined early—the cold winter wind had brought with it clouds so sombre, and a rain so penetrating, that further outdoor exercise was now out of the question. I was glad of it. I never liked long walks, especially on chilly afternoons. Dreadful to me was the coming home in the raw twilight, with nipped fingers and toes, and a heart saddened by the chidings of Bessie, the nurse, and humbled by the consciousness of my physical inferiority to Eliza, John, and Georgiana Reed. The said Eliza, John, and Georgiana were now clustered round their mamma in the drawing-room. She lay reclined on a sofa by the fireside, and with her darlings about her for the time neither quarrelling nor crying, looked perfectly happy. Me she had dispensed from joining the group, saying, She regretted to be under the necessity of keeping me at a distance, but that until she heard from Bessie, and could discover by her own observation that I was endeavouring in good earnest to acquire a more sociable and childlike disposition, a more attractive and sprightly manner, something lighter, franker, more natural, as it were, she really must exclude me from privileges intended only for contented, happy little children. "'What does Bessie say I have done?' I asked. "'Jane, I don't like cavillers or questioners. Besides, there is something truly forbidding in a child taking up her elders in that manner. Be seated somewhere, and until you can speak pleasantly, remain silent.' A breakfast-room enjoined the drawing-room. I slipped in there. It contained a bookcase. I soon possessed myself of a volume, taking care that it should be one stored with pictures. I mounted into the window-seat. Gathering up my feet, I sat cross-legged, like a Turk, and having drawn the red marine curtain any close, I was shrined in double retirement. Folds of scarlet drapery shut in my view to the right hand. To the left were clear panes of glass protecting, but not separating me from the drear November day. At intervals, while turning over the leaves of my book, I studied the aspect of that winter afternoon. Afar, it offered a pale blank of mist and cloud, near a scene of wet lawn and storm-beat shrub, with ceaseless rain sweeping away wildly before a long and lamentable blast. I returned to my book. Buick's History of British Birds, the letterpress thereof I cared little for, generally speaking, and yet there were certain introductory pages that, child as I was, I could not pass quite as a blank. They were those which treat of the haunts of sea-fowl, of the solitary rocks and promontories, by them only inhabited, of the coast of Norway, studded with isles from its southern extremity, the Lindness, or Nays, to the North Cape where the northern ocean in vast whirls, boils round the naked melancholy isles of farthest Thule, and the Atlantic surge pours in among the stormy Hebrides. Nor could I pass unnoticed the suggestion of the bleak shores of Lapland, Siberia, Spitsbergen, Nova Zembla, Iceland, Greenland, with the vast sweep of the Arctic zone, and those forlorn regions of dreary space, that reservoir of frost and snow, where firm fields of ice, the accumulation of centuries of winters, glazed in alpine heights above heights, surround the pole, and concentrate the multiplied rigours of extreme cold. Of these death-white realms I formed an idea of my own, shadowy, like all the half-comprehended notions that float dim through children's brains but strangely impressive. 
The words in these introductory pages connected themselves with the succeeding vignettes, and gave significance to the rock standing at Boulogne in a sea of billow and spray, to the broken boat stranded on a desolate coast, to the cold and ghastly moon glancing through bars of cloud at a wreck just sinking. I cannot tell what sentiment haunted the quite solitary churchyard, with its inscribed headstone, its gate, its two trees, its low horizon, girdled by a broken wall, and its newly risen crescent, attesting the hour of eventide. The two ships becalmed on a torpid sea, I believed to be marine phantoms. The fiend pinning down the thief's pack behind him I passed over quickly. It was an object of terror. So was the black-horned thing, seated aloof on a rock, surveying a distant crowd surrounding a gallows. Each picture told a story, mysterious often to my undeveloped understanding and imperfect feelings, yet ever profoundly interesting as interesting as the tales Bessie sometimes narrated on winter evenings, when she chanced to be in a good humour, and when, having brought her ironing-table to the nursery hearth, she allowed us to sit about it, and while she got up Mrs. Reed's lace frills, and crimped her nightcap borders, fed our eager attention with passages of love and adventure, taken from old fairy-tales and other ballads. Or, as at a later period I discovered, from the pages of Pamela, and Henry, Earl of Moreland. With Buick on my knee, I was then happy. Happy, at least, in my way. I feared nothing but interruption. And that came too soon. The breakfast-room door opened. "'Bo! Madam Mope!' cried the voice of John Reed. Then he paused. He found the room apparently empty. "'Where the dickens is she?' he continued. "'Lizzie! Georgie!' calling to his sisters. "'Joan is not here. Tell Mamma she has run out into the rain, bad animal!' "'It is well I drew the curtain,' thought I, and I wished fervently he might not discover my hiding-place. Nor would John Reed have found it out himself. He was not quick, either of vision or conception. But Eliza just put her head in at the door, and said at once, "'She is in the window-seat, to be sure, Jack and I came out immediately, for I trembled at the idea of being dragged forth by the said Jack. "'What do you want?' I asked, with awkward diffidence. "'Say, what do you want, Master Reed?' was the answer. "'I want you to come here.' And seating himself in an armchair, he intimated by a gesture that I was to approach and stand before him. John Reed was a schoolboy of fourteen years old four years older than I, for I was but ten, large and stout for his age, with a dingy and unwholesome skin, thick lineaments in a spacious visage, heavy limbs and large extremities. He gorged himself habitually at table, which made him bilious, and gave him a dim and bleared eye and flabby cheeks. He ought now to have been at school, but his mamma had taken him home for a month or two, on account of his delicate health. Mr. Miles, the master, affirmed that he would do very well if he had fewer cakes and sweetmeats sent him from home. But the mother's heart turned from an opinion so harsh, and inclined rather to the more refined idea that John's sallowness was owing to over-application, and perhaps to pining after home. John had not much affection for his mother and sisters, and an antipathy to me. He bullied and punished me not two or three times in the week, nor once or twice in the day, but continually. Every nerve I had feared him, and every morsel of flesh in my bones shrank when he came near. There were moments when I was bewildered by the terror he inspired, because I had no appeal whatever against either his menaces or his inflictions. The servants did not like to offend their young master by taking my part against him, and Mrs. Reed was blind and deaf on the subject. She never saw him strike, or heard him abuse me, though he did both now and then in her very presence, more frequently, however, behind her back. Habitually obedient to John, I came up to his chair. He spent some three minutes in thrusting out his tongue at me as far as he could without damaging the roots. I knew he would soon strike, 
and while dreading the blow I mused on the disgusting and ugly appearance of him who would presently deal it. I wonder if he read that notion in my face, for all at once, without speaking, he struck suddenly and strongly. I tottered, and on regaining my equilibrium retired back a step or two from his chair. "'That is for your impudence in answering Mamma a while since,' said he, "'and for your sneaking way of getting behind curtains, and for the look you had in your eyes two minutes since, you rat!' Accustomed to John Reed's abuse, I never had an idea of replying to it. My care was how to endure the blow which would certainly follow the insult. "'What were you doing behind the curtain?' he asked. I was reading. "'Show the book!' I returned to the window, and fetched it thence. "'You have no business to take our books. You are a dependent, Mamma says. You have no money. Your father left you none. You ought to beg, and not to live here with gentlemen's children like us, and eat the same meals we do, and wear clothes at our Mamma's expense. Now I'll teach you to rummage my bookshelves, for they are mine. All the house belongs to me, or will do in a few years. Go and stand by the door, out of the way of the mirror and windows." I did so, not at first aware what was his intention. But when I saw him lift and poise the book, and stand in act to hurl it, I instinctively started aside with a cry of alarm. Not soon enough, however. The volume was flung. It hit me, and I fell, striking my head against the door and cutting it. The cut bled. The pain was sharp. My terror had passed its climax. Other feelings succeeded. "'Wicked and cruel boy!' I said. "'You are like a murderer. You are like a slave-driver. You are like the Roman emperors." I had read Goldsmith's History of Rome, and had formed my opinion of Nero, Caligula, etc. Also I had drawn parallels and silence, which I never thought thus to have declared aloud. "'What! What!' he cried. "'Did she say that to me? Did you hear her, Eliza and Georgiana? Won't I tell Mamma? But first— He ran headlong at me. I felt him grasp my hair and my shoulder. He had closed with a desperate thing. I really saw in him a tyrant, a murderer. I felt a drop or two of blood from my head trickle down my neck, and was sensible of somewhat pungent suffering. These sensations for the time predominated over fear, and I received him in frantic sort. I don't very well know what I did with my hands, but he called me, RAT! RAT! and bellowed out aloud. Aid was near him. Eliza and Georgiana had run for Mrs. Reed, who was gone upstairs. She now came upon the scene, followed by Bessie and her maid, Abbott. We were parted. I heard the words. Dear, dear, what a fury to fly at Master John! Did ever anybody see such a picture of passion? Then Mrs. Reed subjoined, "'Take her away to the Red Room, and lock her in there.' Four hands were immediately laid upon me, and I was borne upstairs. End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 2 I resisted all the way, a new thing for me, and a circumstance which greatly strengthened the bad opinion Bessie and Miss Abbott were disposed to entertain of me. The fact is, I was a trifle beside myself, or rather out of myself, as the French would say. I was conscious that a moment's mutiny had already rendered me liable to strange penalties, and like any other rebel slave, I felt resolved in my desperation to go all lengths. "'Hold her arms, Miss Abbott! She's like a mad cat!' "'For shame! For shame!' cried the lady's maid. What shocking conduct, Miss Eyre, to strike a young gentleman, your benefactress's son, your young master! Master! How is he my master? Am I a servant? No, you are less than a servant, for you do nothing for your keep. There, sit down, and think over your wickedness. 
They had got me by this time into the apartment indicated by Mrs. Reed, and had thrust me upon a stool. My impulse was to rise from it like a spring. Their two pair of hands arrested me instantly. "'If you don't sit still, you must be tied down,' said Bessie. "'Miss Abbott, lend me your garters. She would break mine directly.' Miss Abbott turned to divest a stout leg of the necessary ligature. This preparation for bonds, and the additional ignominy it inferred, took a little of the excitement out of me. "'Don't take them off,' I cried. "'I will not stir.' In guarantee whereof, I attached myself to my seat by my hands. "'Mind you don't!' said Bessie. And when she had ascertained that I was really subsiding, she loosened her hold of me. Then she and Miss Abbott stood with folded arms, looking darkly and doubtfully on my face, as incredulous of my sanity. "'She never did so before,' at last said Bessie, turning to Abigail. "'But it was always in her,' was the reply. "'I've told Missus often my opinion about the child, and Missus agreed with me. She's an underhand little thing. I never saw a girl of her age with so much cover." Bessie answered not, but ere long addressing me, she said, "'You ought to be aware, miss, that you are under obligations to Mrs. Reed. She keeps you. If she were to turn you off, you would have to go to the poorhouse.' I had nothing to say to these words. They were not new to me. My very first recollections of existence included hints of the same kind. This reproach of my dependence had become a vague sing-song in my ear, very painful and crushing, but only half intelligible. Miss Abbott joined in. "'And you ought not to think yourself on an equality with the Mrs. Reed and Master Reed, because Mrs. Kindly allows you to be brought up with them. They will have a great deal of money, and you will have none. It is your place to be humble, and to try to make yourself agreeable to them." "'What we tell you is for your good added Bessie, in no harsh voice. "'You should try to be useful and pleasant. Then perhaps you would have a home here. But if you become passionate and rude, Missus will send you away, I am sure.' "'Besides,' said Miss Abbott, "'God will punish her. He might strike her dead in the midst of her tantrums, and then where would she go? Come, Bessie, we will leave her. I wouldn't have her heart for anything. Say your prayers, Miss Eyre, when you are by yourself for if you don't repent, something bad might be permitted to come down the chimney, and fetch you away." They went, shutting the door, and locking it behind them. The red room was a square chamber, very seldom slept in, I might say never, indeed, unless when a chance influx of visitors at Gateshead Hall rendered it necessary to turn to account all the accommodation it contained. Yet it was one of the largest and stateliest chambers in the mansion. A bed supported on massive pillars of mahogany, hung with curtains of deep red damask, stood out like a tabernacle in the centre. The two large windows, with their blinds always drawn down, were half shrouded in festoons and falls of similar drapery. The carpet was red. The table at the foot of the bed was covered with a crimson cloth. The walls were a soft fawn colour with a blush of pink in it. The wardrobe, the toilet table, the chairs were of darkly polished old mahogany. Out of these deep surrounding shades rose high, and glared white, the piled-up mattresses and pillows of the bed, spread with a snowy Marseilles counterpane. Scarcely less prominent was an ample cushioned easy-chair, near the head of the bed, also white, with a footstool before it, and looking, as I thought, like a pale throne. This room was chill, because it seldom had a fire. It was silent, because remote from the nursery and kitchen solemn, because it was known to be so seldom entered. The housemaid alone came here on Saturdays, to wipe from the mirrors and the furniture a week's quiet dust, and Mrs. Reed herself, at far intervals, visited it to review the contents of a certain secret drawer in the wardrobe, where were stored divers parchments, her jewel-casket, and a miniature of her deceased husband, and in those last words lies the secret of the Red Room the spell which kept it so lonely, in spite of its grandeur. Mr. Reed had been dead nine years. It was in this chamber he breathed his last. Here he lay in state. Hence his coffin was borne by the undertaker's men, and since that day a sense of dreary consecration had guarded it from frequent intrusion. My seat, to which Bessie and the bitter Miss Abbott had left me riveted, was a low ottoman near the marble chimney-piece. The bed rose before me. 
To my right hand there was the high dark wardrobe, with subdued broken reflections varying the gloss of its panels. To my left were muffled windows. A great looking-glass between them repeated the vacant majesty of the bed and room. I was not quite sure whether they had locked the door, and when I dared move I got up and went to see. Alas! yes! no jail was ever more secure. Returning I had to cross before the looking-glass. My fascinated glance involuntarily explored the depth it revealed. All that looked colder and darker in that visionary hollow than in reality. And the strange little figure there gazing at me, with a white face and arms specking the gloom, and glittering eyes of fear moving where all else was still, had the effect of a real spirit. I thought it like one of the tiny phantoms, half fairy, half imp, Bessie's evening stories represented as coming out of lone, ferny dells and moors, and appearing before the eyes of belated travellers. I returned to my stool. Superstition was with me at that moment, but it was not yet her hour for complete victory. My blood was still warm, the mood of the revolted slave was still bracing me with its bitter vigour. I had to stem a rapid rush of retrospective thought, before I quailed to the dismal present. All John Reed's violent tyrannies, all his sister's proud indifference, all his mother's aversion, all the servant's partiality, turned up in my disturbed mind like a dark deposit in a turbid well. Why was I always suffering, always browbeaten, always accused, for ever condemned? Why could I never please? Why was it useless to try to win any one's favour? Eliza, who was headstrong and selfish, was respected. Georgiana, who had a spoiled temper, a very acrid spite, a captious and insolent carriage, was universally indulged. Her beauty, her pink cheeks and golden curls, seemed to give delight to all who looked at her, and to purchase indemnity for every fault. John, no one thwarted, much less punished though he twisted the necks of the pigeons, killed the little pea-chicks, set the dogs at the sheep, stripped the hothouse vines of their fruit, and broke the buds off the choicest plants in the conservatory. He called his mother old girl, too, sometimes reviled her for her dark skin, similar to his own, bluntly disregarded her wishes, not unfrequently tore and spoiled her silk attire, and he was still her own darling. I dared commit no fault. I strove to fulfil every duty, and I was termed naughty and tiresome, sullen and sneaking, from morning to noon and from noon to night. My head still ached and bled with the blow and fall I had received. No one had reproved John for wantonly striking me, and because I had turned against him to avert farther irrational violence, I was loaded with general opprobrium. Unjust! Unjust! said my reason forced by the agonising stimulus into precocious though transitory power, and resolve, equally wrought up, instigated some strange expedient to achieve escape from insupportable oppression, as running away, or if that could not be effected, never eating or drinking more, and letting myself die. What a consternation of soul was mine that dreary afternoon! How all my brain was in tumult, and all my heart in insurrection! Yet in what darkness, what dense ignorance, was the mental battle fought? I could not answer the ceaseless inward question, why I thus suffered, now at the distance of—I will not say how many years—I see it clearly. I was a discord in Gateshead Hall. I was like nobody there. I had nothing in harmony with Mrs. Reed or her children, or her chosen vassalage. If they did not love me, in fact, as little did I love them. They were not bound to regard with affection a thing that could not sympathise with one amongst them, a heterogeneous thing, opposed to them in temperament, in capacity, in propensities, a useless thing, incapable of serving their interest or adding to their pleasure, a noxious thing, cherishing the germs of indignation at their treatment, of contempt of their judgment. I know that had I been a sanguine, brilliant, careless, exacting, handsome, romping child, though equally dependent and friendless, Mrs. Reed would have endured my presence more complacently, her children would have entertained for me more of the cordiality of fellow-feeling, the servants would have been less prone to make me the scapegoat of the nursery. Daylight began to forsake the red-room. It was past four o'clock, 
and the beclouded afternoon was tending to drear twilight. I heard the rain still beating continuously on the staircase window, and the wind howling in the grove behind the hall. I grew by degrees cold as a stone, and then my courage sank. My habitual mood of humiliation, self-doubt, forlorn depression, fell damp on the embers of my decaying ire. All said I was wicked, and perhaps I might be so. What thought had I been but just conceiving of starving myself to death? That certainly was a crime, and was I fit to die? Or was the vault under the chancel of Gateshead Church an inviting bourne? In such vault, I had been told, did Mr. Reed lie buried, and led by this thought to recall his idea, I dwelt on it with gathering dread. I could not remember him, but I knew that he was my own uncle, my mother's brother, that he had taken me when a parentless infant to his home, and that in his last moments he had required a promise of Mrs. Reed that she would rear and maintain me as one of her own children. Mrs. Reed probably considered she had kept this promise. And so she had, I dare say, as well as her nature would permit her. But how could she really like an interloper not of her race, and unconnected with her, after her husband's death, by any tie? It must have been most irksome to find herself bound by a hard-wrung pledge, to stand in the stead of a parent to a strange child she could not love, and see an uncongenial alien permanently intruded on her own family group. A singular notion dawned upon me. I doubted not, never doubted, that if Mr. Reed had been alive he would have treated me kindly, and now, as I sat looking at the white bed and overshadowed walls, occasionally also turning a fascinated eye towards the dimly gleaming mirror, I began to recall what I had heard of dead men, troubled in their graves by the violation of their last wishes, revisiting the earth to punish the perjured and avenge the oppressed. And I thought Mr. Reed's spirit, harassed by the wrongs of his sister's child, might quit its abode, whether in the church vault or in the unknown world of the departed, and rise before me in this chamber. I wiped my tears and hushed my sobs, fearful lest any sign of violent grief might waken a preternatural voice to comfort me, or elicit from the gloom some haloed face, bending over me with strange pity. This idea, consolatory in theory, I felt would be terrible if realised. With all my might I endeavoured to stifle it, I endeavoured to be firm. Shaking my hair from my eyes, I lifted my head and tried to look boldly round the dark room. At this moment, a light gleamed on the wall. Was it, I asked myself, a ray from the moon penetrating some aperture in the blind? No. Moonlight was still, and this stirred. While I gazed, it glided up to the ceiling and quivered over my head. I can now conjecture readily that this streak of light was, in all likelihood, a gleam from a lantern carried by some one across the lawn. But then, prepared as my mind was for horror, shaken as my nerves were by agitation, I thought the swift darting beam was a herald of some coming vision from another world. My heart beat thick, my head grew hot, a sound filled my ears which I deemed the rushing of wings, something seemed near me, I was oppressed, suffocated, endurance broke down. I rushed to the door and shook the lock in desperate effort. Steps came running along the outer passage. The key turned. Bessie and Abbot entered. "'Miss Eyre, are you ill?' said Bessie. "'What a dreadful noise! It went quite through me!' exclaimed Abbot. "'Take me out! Let me go into the nursery!' was my cry. "'What for? Are you hurt? Have you seen something?' again demanded Bessie. "'Oh! I saw a light, and I thought a ghost would come!' I had now got hold of Bessie's hand, and she did not snatch it from me. "'She has screamed out on purpose,' declared Abbot, in some disgust. "'And what a scream! If she had been in great pain, one would have excused it. But she only wanted to bring us all here. I know her naughty tricks.' "'What is all this?' demanded another voice peremptorily. And Mrs. Reed came along the corridor, her cap flying wide, her gown rustling stormily. "'Abbot and Bessie, I believe I gave orders that Jane Eyre should be left in the red room till I came to her myself.' "'Miss Jane screamed so loud, Mum,' pleaded Bessie. "'Let her go,' was the only answer. "'Loose Bessie's hand, child. You cannot succeed in getting out by these means, be assured. I abhor artifice, particularly in children. 
It is my duty to show you that tricks will not answer. You will now stay here an hour longer, and it is only on condition of perfect submission and stillness that I shall liberate you then. Oh, aunt, have pity! Forgive me! I cannot endure it! Let me be punished some other way! I shall be killed if— Silence! This violence is all most repulsive! And so, no doubt, she felt it. I was a precocious actress in her eyes. She sincerely looked on me as a compound of virulent passions, mean spirit, and dangerous duplicity. Bessie and Abbott having retreated, Mrs. Reed, impatient of my now frantic anguish and wild sobs, abruptly thrust me back and locked me in without further parley. I heard her sweeping away, and soon after she was gone, I suppose I had a species of fit. Unconsciousness closed the scene. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 3 The next thing I remember is, waking up with a feeling as if I had had a frightful nightmare, and seeing before me a terrible red glare, crossed with thick black bars. I heard voices, too, speaking with a hollow sound, and as if muffled by a rush of wind or water. Agitation, uncertainty, and an all-predominating sense of terror confused my faculties. Ere long I became aware that some one was handling me, lifting me up and supporting me in a sitting posture and that more tenderly than I had ever been raised or upheld before. I rested my head against a pillow, or an arm, and felt easy. In five minutes more the cloud of bewilderment dissolved. I knew quite well that I was in my own bed, and that the red glare was the nursery fire. It was night. A candle burnt on the table. Bessie stood at the bed-foot with a basin in her hand, and a gentleman sat in a chair near my pillow, leaning over me. I felt an inexpressible relief, a soothing conviction of protection and security, when I knew that there was a stranger in the room, an individual not belonging to Gateshead, and not related to Mrs. Reed. Turning from Bessie, though her presence was far less obnoxious to me than that of Abbott, for instance, would have been, I scrutinized the face of the gentleman. I knew him. It was Mr. Lloyd, an apothecary, sometimes called in by Mrs. Reed when the servants were ailing. For herself and the children she employed a physician. "'Well, who am I?' he asked. I pronounced his name, offering him at the same time my hand. He took it, smiling and saying, "'We shall do very well by and by.' Then he laid me down, and addressing Bessie, charged her to be very careful that I was not disturbed during the night. Having given some further directions, and intimates that he should call again the next day, he departed, to my grief. I felt so sheltered and befriended while he sat in the chair near my pillow, and as he closed the door after him, all the room darkened and my heart again sank. Inexpressible sadness weighed it down. "'Do you feel as if you should sleep, miss?' asked Bessie, rather softly. Scarcely dared I answer her, for I feared the next sentence might be rough. "'I will try.' "'Would you like to drink, or could you eat anything?' "'No, thank you, Bessie.' "'Then I think I shall go to bed, for it is past twelve o'clock, but you may call me if you want anything in the night.' "'Wonderful civility, this! It emboldened me to ask a question. "'Bessie, what is the matter with me? Am I ill?' "'You fell sick, I suppose, in the red room with the crying. You'll be better soon, no doubt.' Bessie went into the housemaid's apartment, which was near. I heard her say, "'Sarah, come and sleep with me in the nursery. I daren't for my life be alone with that poor child to-night. She might die. It's such a strange thing she should have that fit. I wonder if she saw anything. 
Missus was rather too hard." Sarah came back with her. They both went to bed. They were whispering together for half an hour before they fell asleep. I caught scraps of their conversation from which I was able only too distinctly to infer the main subject discussed. Something passed her, all dressed in white, and vanished. A great black dog behind him. Three loud raps on the chamber door. A light in the churchyard just over his grave, etc., etc. At last both slept. The fire and the candle went out. For me the watches of that long night passed in ghastly wakefulness, strained by dread, such dread as children only can feel. No severe or prolonged bodily illness followed this incident of the Red Room. It only gave my nerves a shock, of which I feel the reverberation to this day. Yes, Mrs. Reed, to you I owe some fearful pangs of mental suffering, but I ought to forgive you, for you knew not what you did. While rending my heart-strings, you thought you were only uprooting my bad propensities. Next day by noon I was up and dressed, and sat wrapped in a shawl by the nursery hearth. I felt physically weak and broken down, but my worse ailment was an unutterable wretchedness of mind, a wretchedness which kept drawing from me silent tears. No sooner had I wiped one salt drop from my cheek than another followed. Yet, I thought, I ought to have been happy, for none of the reeds were there. They were all gone out in the carriage with their mamma. Abbott, too, was sewing in another room, and Bessie, as she moved hither and thither, putting away toys and arranging drawers, addressed to me every now and then a word of unwonted kindness. This state of things should have been to me a paradise of peace, accustomed as I was to a life of ceaseless reprimand and thankless fagging. But in fact my racked nerves were now in such a state, that no calm could soothe, and no pleasure excite them agreeably. Bessie had been down into the kitchen, and she brought up with her a tart on a certain brightly painted china plate, whose bird of paradise, nestling in a wreath of convolvuli and rosebuds, had been wont to stir in me a most enthusiastic sense of admiration, and which plate I had often petitioned to be allowed to take in my hand, in order to examine it more closely, but had always hitherto been deemed unworthy of such a privilege. This precious vessel was now placed on my knee, and I was cordially invited to eat the circlet of delicate pastry upon it. Vain favour! Coming, like most other favours, long deferred, and often wished for, too late. I could not eat the tart, and the plumage of the bird, the tints of the flowers, seemed strangely faded. I put both plate and tart away. Bessie asked if I would have a book. The word book acted as a transient stimulus, and I begged her to fetch Gulliver's travels from the library. This book I had again and again perused with delight. I considered it a narrative of facts, and discovered in it a vein of interest deeper than what I found in fairy tales. For as to the elves, having sought them in vain among foxglove leaves and bells, under mushrooms, and beneath the ground ivy mantling old wall-nooks, I had at length made up my mind to the sad truth, that they were all gone out of England to some savage country, where the woods were wilder and thicker, and the population more scant. Whereas, Lilliput and Brobdignag being, in my creed, solid parts of the earth's surface, I doubted not that I might one day, by taking a long voyage, see with my own eyes the little fields, houses, and trees, the diminutive people, the tiny cows, sheep, and birds of the one realm, and the cornfields forest high, the mighty mastiffs, the monster cats, the tower-like men and women of the other. Yet, when this cherished volume was now placed in my hand, when I turned over its leaves and sought in its marvellous pictures the charm I had, till now, never failed to find, all was eerie and dreary. The giants were gaunt goblins, the pygmies malevolent and fearful imps, Gulliver a most desolate wanderer in most dread and dangerous regions. I closed the book which I dared no longer peruse, and put it on the table beside the untasted tart. Bessie had now finished dusting and tidying the room, 
and having washed her hands, she opened a certain little drawer, full of splendid shreds of silk and satin, and began making a new bonnet for Georgiana's doll. Meantime she sang. Her song was, In the days when we went gypsying, a long time ago. I had often heard the song before, and always with lively delight, for Bessie had a sweet voice. At least I thought so. But now, though her voice was still sweet, I found in its melody an indescribable sadness. Sometimes, preoccupied with her work, she sang the refrain very low, very lingeringly. A long time ago, came out like the saddest cadence of a funeral hymn. She passed into another ballad, this time a really doleful one. My feet they are sore, and my limbs they are weary. Long is the way, and the mountains are wild. Soon will the twilight close moonless and dreary, over the path of the poor orphan child. Why did they send me so far and so lonely, up where the moors spread and grey rocks are piled? Men are hard-hearted, and kind angels only, watch o'er the steps of a poor orphan child. Yet distant and soft the night breeze is blowing, clouds there are none, and clear stars be mild. God in His mercy protection is showing, comfort and hope to the poor orphan child. Even should I fall o'er the broken bridge passing, or stray in the marshes by false lights beguiled, still will my father with promise and blessing take to his bosom the poor orphan child. There is a thought that for strength should avail me, though both of shelter and kindred despoiled. Heaven is a home, and a rest will not fail me. God is a friend to the poor orphan child." "'Come, Miss Jane, don't cry,' said Bessie, as she finished. She might as well have said to the fire, don't burn. But how could she divine the morbid suffering to which I was a prey? In the course of the morning, Mr. Lloyd came again. "'What, already up?' said he, as he entered the nursery. "'Well, nurse, how is she?' Bessie answered that I was doing very well. "'Then she ought to look more cheerful. Come here, Miss Jane. Your name is Jane, is it not?' "'Yes, sir. Jane Eyre.' "'Well, you have been crying, Miss Jane Eyre. Can you tell me what about? Have you any pain?' No, sir. Oh, I dare say she is crying because she could not go out with Missus in the carriage," interposed Bessie. Surely not. Why, she is too old for such pettishness. I thought so too, and my self-esteem being wounded by the false charge, I answered promptly, I never cried for such a thing in my life. I hate going out in the carriage. I cry because I am miserable. Oh, fie, Miss," said Bessie. The good apothecary appeared a little puzzled. I was standing before him. He fixed his eyes on me very steadily. His eyes were small and grey, not very bright, but I dare say I should think them shrewd now. He had a hard-featured, yet good-natured-looking face. Having considered me at leisure, he said, "'What made you ill yesterday?' "'She had a fall,' said Bessie, again putting in her word. "'Fall? Why, that is like a baby again! Can't she manage to walk at her age? She must be eight or nine years old." "'I was knocked down,' was the blunt explanation, jerked out of me by another pang of mortified pride. "'But that did not make me ill,' I added, while Mr. Lloyd helped himself to a pinch of snuff. As he was returning the box to his waistcoat pocket, a loud bell rang for the servant's dinner. He knew what it was. "'That's for you, nurse,' said he. You can go down. I'll give Miss Jane a lecture till you come back." Bessie would rather have stayed, but she was obliged to go, because punctuality at meals was rigidly enforced at Gateshead Hall. "'The fall did not make you ill. What did, then?' pursued Mr. Lloyd, when Bessie was gone. "'I was shut up in a room where there is a ghost, till after dark.' I saw Mr. Lloyd smile and frown at the same time. "'Ghost? What? You are a baby, after all. You are afraid of ghosts?" "'Of Mr. Reed's ghost, I am. He died in that room, and was laid out there. 
Neither Bessie nor any one else will go into it at night if they can help it, and it was cruel to shut me up alone without a candle. So cruel, I think I shall never forget it." Nonsense! And is it that makes you so miserable? Are you afraid now in daylight? No. But night will come again before long. And besides, I am unhappy, very unhappy, for other things." "'What other things? Can you tell me some of them?' How much I wished to reply fully to this question! How difficult it was to frame any answer! Children can feel, but they cannot analyse their feelings, and if the analysis is partially effected in thought, they know not how to express the result of the process in words. Fearful, however, of losing this first and only opportunity of relieving my grief by imparting it, I, after a disturbed pause, contrived to frame a meagre, though, as far as it went, true response. For one thing, I have no father or mother, brothers or sisters. You have a kind aunt and cousins?" Again I paused, then bunglingly announced, but John Reed knocked me down, and my aunt shut me up in the red room." Mr. Lloyd second time produced his snuff-box. "'Don't you think Gateshead Hall a very beautiful house?' asked he. "'Are you not very thankful to have such a fine place to live at?' "'It is not my house, sir. And Abbot says I have less right to be here than a servant.' "'Pooh! You can't be silly enough to wish to leave such a splendid place. If I had anywhere else to go, I should be glad to leave it. But I can never get away from Gateshead till I am a woman." "'Perhaps you may. Who knows? Have you any relations besides Mrs. Reed?" "'I think not, sir." "'None belonging to your father?" "'I don't know. I asked Aunt Reed once, and she said possibly I might have some poor, low relations called heir, but she knew nothing about them." "'If you had such, would you like to go to them?" I reflected. Poverty looks grim to grown people, still more so to children. They have not much idea of industrious, working, respectable poverty. They think of the word only as connected with ragged clothes, scanty food, fireless grates, rude manners, and debasing vices. Poverty for me was synonymous with degradation. No, I should not like to belong to poor people, was my reply. Not even if they were kind to you?" I shook my head. I could not see how poor people had the means of being kind. And then to learn to speak like them, to adopt their manners, to be uneducated, to grow up like one of the poor women I saw sometimes nursing their children, or washing their clothes at the cottage doors of the village of Gateshead. No, I was not heroic enough to purchase liberty at the price of caste. But are your relatives so very poor? Are they working people? I cannot tell. Aunt Reed says if I have any, they must be a beggarly set. I should not like to go a-begging." "'Would you like to go to school?' Again I reflected. I scarcely knew what school was. Bessie sometimes spoke of it as a place where young ladies sat in the stocks, wore backboards, and were expected to be exceedingly genteel and precise. John Reed hated his school, and abused his master. But John Reed's tastes were no rule for mine, and if Bessie's accounts of school discipline, gathered from the young ladies of a family where she had lived before coming to Gateshead, were somewhat appalling, her details of certain accomplishments attained by these same young ladies were, I thought, equally attractive. She boasted of beautiful paintings of landscapes and flowers by them executed, of songs they could sing and pieces they could play, of purses they could net of French books they could translate, till my spirit was moved to emulation as I listened. Besides, school would be a complete change. It implied a long journey, an entire separation from Gateshead, an entrance into a new life. "'I should indeed like to go to school,' was the audible conclusion of my musings. "'Well, well, who knows what may happen,' said Mr. Lloyd, as he got up. The child ought to have a change of air and scene," he said, speaking to himself. Nerves not in a good state. Bessie now returned. At the same moment the carriage was heard rolling up the gravel walk. "'Is that your mistress, nurse?' asked Mr. Lloyd. "'I should like to speak to her before I go.' 
Bessie invited him to walk into the breakfast-room, and led the way out. In the interview which followed between him and Mrs. Reed, I presume, from after occurrences, that the apothecary ventured to recommend my being sent to school, and the recommendation was no doubt readily enough adopted. For, as Abbott said in discussing the subject with Bessie, when both sat sewing in the nursery one night, after I was in bed, and, as they thought, asleep, Mrs. was, she dared say, glad enough to get rid of such a tiresome, ill-conditioned child, who always looked as if she were watching everybody, and scheming plots underhand. Abbott, I think, gave me credit for being a sort of infantine Guy Fawkes. On that same occasion I learned, for the first time, from Miss Abbott's communications to Bessie, that my father had been a poor clergyman, that my mother had married him against the wishes of her friends, who considered the match beneath her that my grandfather Reed was so irritated at her disobedience, he cut her off without a shilling, that after my mother and father had been married a year, the latter caught the typhus fever while visiting among the poor of a large manufacturing town, where his curacy was situated, and where that disease was then prevalent, that my mother took the infection from him, and both died within a month of each other. Bessie, when she heard this narrative, sighed and said, Poor Miss Jane is to be pitied too, Abbot. Yes, responded Abbot. If she were a nice, pretty child, one might compassionate her forlornness. But one really cannot care for such a little toad as that. Not a great deal, to be sure, agreed Bessie. At any rate, a beauty like Miss Georgiana would be more moving in the same condition. Oh, yes, I dote on Miss Georgiana, cried the fervent Abbot. Little darling, with her long curls and her blue eyes, and such a sweet colour as she has, just as if she were painted. Bessie, I could fancy a Welsh rabbit for supper. So could I, with a roast onion. Come, we'll go down. They went. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. — Jane Eyre — by Charlotte Bronte — Chapter Four From my discourse with Mr. Lloyd, and from the above reported conference between Bessie and Abbott, I gathered enough of hope to suffice as a motive for wishing to get well. A change seemed near. I desired and waited it in silence. It tarried, however. Days and weeks passed. I had regained my normal state of health, but no new allusion was made to the subject over which I brooded. Mrs. Reed surveyed me at times with a severe eye, but seldom addressed me. Since my illness she had drawn a more marked line of separation than ever between me and her own children, appointing me a small closet to sleep in by myself condemning me to take my meals alone, and pass all my time in the nursery, while my cousins were constantly in the drawing-room. Not a hint, however, did she drop about sending me to school. Still I felt an instinctive certainty that she would not long endure me under the same roof with her, for her glance now more than ever, when turned on me, expressed an insuperable and rooted aversion. Eliza and Georgiana, evidently acting according to orders, spoke to me as little as possible. John thrust his tongue in his cheek whenever he saw me, and once attempted chastisement. But as I instantly turned against him, roused by the same sentiment of deep ire and desperate revolt which had stirred my corruption before, he thought it better to desist, and ran from me tittering execrations, and vowing I had burst his nose. I had, indeed, levelled at that prominent feature as hard a blow as my knuckles could inflict, and when I saw that either that or my look daunted him, I had the greatest inclination to follow up my advantage to purpose. But he was already with his mamma. I heard him in a blubbering tone commence the tale of how that nasty Jane Eyre had flown at him like a mad cat. He was stopped rather harshly. "'Don't talk to me about her, John. I told you not to go near her. She is not worthy of notice. I do not choose that either you or your sisters should associate with her." Here, leaning over the banister, I cried out suddenly, 
and without at all deliberating on my words. "'They are not fit to associate with me!' Mrs. Reed was rather a stout woman, but on hearing this strange and audacious declaration, she ran nimbly up the stair, swept me like a whirlwind into the nursery, and crushing me down on the edge of my crib, dared me in an emphatic voice to rise from that place, or utter one syllable during the remainder of the day. "'What would Uncle Reed say to you if he were alive?' was my scarcely voluntary demand. I say scarcely voluntary, for it seemed as if my tongue pronounced words without my will consenting to their utterance. Something spoke out of me over which I had no control. "'What?' said Mrs. Reed, under her breath. Her usually cold, composed grey eye became troubled with a look like fear. She took her hand from my arm, and gazed at me as if she really did not know whether I were child or fiend. I was now in for it. "'My uncle Reed is in heaven, and can see all you do and think, and so can papa and mamma. They know how you shut me up all day long, and how you wish me dead.' Mrs. Reed soon rallied her spirits. She shook me most soundly, she boxed both my ears, and then left me without a word. Bessie supplied the hiatus by a homily of an hour's length, in which she proved beyond a doubt I was the most wicked and abandoned child ever reared under a roof. I half believed her, for I felt indeed only bad feelings surging in my breast. November, December, and half of January passed away. Christmas and the New Year had been celebrated at Gateshead with the usual festive cheer. Presents had been interchanged, dinners and evening parties given. From every enjoyment I was, of course, excluded. My share of the gaiety consisted in witnessing the daily apparelling of Eliza and Georgiana, and seeing them descend to the drawing-room, dressed out in thin muslin frocks and scarlet sashes, with hair elaborately ringleted, and afterwards in listening to the sound of the piano or the harp played below, to the passing to and fro of the butler and footman, to the jingling of glass and china as refreshments were handed, to the broken hum of conversation as the drawing-room door opened and closed. When tired of this occupation, I would retire from the stair-head to the solitary and silent nursery. There, though somewhat sad, I was not miserable. To speak truth, I had not the least wish to go into company, for in company I was very rarely noticed, and if Bessie had but been kind and companionable, I should have deemed it a treat to spend the evenings quietly with her, instead of passing them under the formidable eyes of Mrs. Reed, in a room full of ladies and gentlemen. But Bessie, as soon as she had dressed her young ladies, used to take herself off to the lively regions of the kitchen and the housekeeper's room, generally bearing the candle along with her. I then sat with my doll on my knee till the fire got low, glancing round occasionally to make sure that nothing worse than myself haunted the shadowy room. And when the embers sank to a dull red, I undressed hastily, tugging at knots and strings as I best might and sought shelter from cold and darkness in my crib. To this crib I always took my doll. Human beings must love something, and in the dearth of worthier objects of affection, I contrived to find a pleasure in loving and cherishing a faded graven image, shabby as a miniature scarecrow. It puzzles me now to remember with what absurd sincerity I doted on this little toy, half fancying it alive and capable of sensation. I could not sleep unless it was folded in my nightgown, and when it lay there safe and warm, I was comparatively happy, believing it to be happy likewise. Long did the hours seem while I waited the departure of the company, and listened for the sound of Bessie's step on the stairs. Sometimes she would come up in the interval to seek her thimble or her scissors, or perhaps to bring me something by way of supper, a bun or a cheesecake. Then she would sit on the bed while I ate it and when I had finished, she would tuck the clothes round me, and twice she kissed me, and said, "'Good-night, Miss Jane!' When thus gentle, Bessie seemed to me the best, prettiest, kindest being in the world, and I wished most intensely that she would be always so pleasant and amiable, and never push me about, or scold, or task me unreasonably, as she was too often wont to do. Bessie Lee must, I think, have been a girl of good natural capacity, for she was smart in all she did, and had a remarkable knack of narrative. So at least I judge from the impression made on me by her nursery tales. She was pretty, too, if my recollections of her face and person are correct. 
I remember her as a slim young woman, with black hair, dark eyes, very nice features, and good clear complexion. But she had a capricious and a hasty temper, and indifferent ideas of principle or justice. Still, such as she was, I preferred her to any one else at Gateshead Hall. It was the 15th of January, about nine o'clock in the morning. Bessie was gone down to breakfast. My cousins had not yet been summoned to their mamma. Eliza was putting on her bonnet and warm garden coat to go and feed her poultry, an occupation of which she was fond, and not less so of selling the eggs to the housekeeper, and hoarding up the money she thus obtained. She had a turn for traffic, and a marked propensity for saving, shown not only in the vending of eggs and chickens, but also in driving hard bargains with the gardener about flower-roots, seeds, and slips of plants that functionary having orders from Mrs. Reed to buy of his young lady all the products of her parterre she wished to sell, and Eliza would have sold the hair off her head if she could have made a handsome profit thereby. As to her money, she first secreted it in odd corners, wrapping it in a rag or an old curl-paper. But some of these hoards having been discovered by the housemaid, Eliza, fearful of one day losing her valued treasure, consented to entrust it to her mother, at a usurious rate of interest fifty or sixty per cent, which interest she exacted every quarter, keeping her accounts in a little book with anxious accuracy. Georgiana sat on a high stool, dressing her hair at the glass, and interweaving her curls with artificial flowers and faded feathers, of which she had found a store in a drawer in the attic. I was making my bed, having received strict orders from Bessie to get it arranged before she returned for Bessie now frequently employed me as a sort of under-nursery-maid, to tidy the room, dust the chairs, etc. Having spread the quilt and folded my night-dress, I went to the window-seat to put in order some picture-books and doll's-house furniture scattered there. An abrupt command from Georgiana to let her playthings alone, for the tiny chairs and mirrors, the fairy plates and cups were her property, stopped my proceedings and then, for lack of other occupation, I fell to breathing on the frost-flowers with which the window was fretted, and thus clearing a space in the glass through which I might look out on the grounds, where all was still and petrified under the influence of a hard frost. From this window were visible the porter's lodge and the carriage-road, and just as I had dissolved so much of the silver-white foliage veiling the panes as left room to look out, I saw the gates thrown open and a carriage roll through. I watched it ascending the drive with indifference. Carriages often came to Gateshead, but none ever brought visitors in whom I was interested. It stopped in front of the house. The door-bell rang loudly. The newcomer was admitted. All this being nothing to me, my vacant attention soon found livelier attraction in the spectacle of a hungry little robin, which came and chirruped on the twigs of the leafless cherry-tree, nailed against the wall near the casement. The remains of my breakfast of bread and milk stood on the table, and having crumbled a morsel of roll, I was tugging at the sash to put out the crumbs on the window-sill, when Bessie came running upstairs to the nursery. "'Miss Jane, take off your pinafore. What are you doing there? Have you washed your hands and face this morning?' I gave another tug before I answered, for I wanted the bird to be secure of its bread. The sash yielded, I scattered the crumbs, some on the stone-sill, some on the cherry-tree bough. Then, closing the window, I replied, "'No, Bessie, I have only just finished dusting.' "'Oh, troublesome, careless child! And what are you doing now? You look quite red, as if you had been about some mischief. What were you opening the window for?' I was spared the trouble of answering, for Bessie seemed in too great a hurry to listen to explanations. She hauled me to the washstand, inflicted a merciless but happily brief scrub on my face and hands with soap, water, and a coarse towel, disciplined my head with a bristly brush, denuded me of my pinafore, and then hurrying me to the top of the stairs, bid me go down directly, as I was wanted in the breakfast-room. I would have asked who wanted me. I would have demanded if Mrs. Reed was there. But Bessie was already gone, and had closed the nursery door upon me. I slowly descended. For nearly three months I had never been called to Mrs. Reed's presence. Restricted so long to the nursery, the breakfast, dining, and drawing-rooms would become for me awful regions, on which it dismayed me to intrude. I now stood in the empty hall. Before me was the breakfast-room door, and I stopped, intimidated and trembling. What a miserable little poltroon had fear engendered of unjust punishment made of me in those days! I feared to return to the nursery, and feared to go forward to the parlour. 
ten minutes I stood in agitated hesitation. The vehement ringing of the breakfast-room bell decided me. I must enter. "'Who could want me?' I asked inwardly, as with both hands I turned the stiff door-handle, which for a second or two resisted my efforts. What should I see besides Aunt Reed in this apartment? A man or a woman? The handle turned, the door unclosed, and passing through and curtsying low, I looked up at—a black pillar! Such, at least, appeared to me at first sight, the straight, narrow, sable-clad shape standing erect on the rug. The grim face at the top was like a carved mask, placed above the shaft by way of capital. Mrs. Reed occupied her usual seat by the fireside. She made a signal to me to approach. I did so, and she introduced me to the stony stranger with the words, "'This is the little girl respecting whom I applied to you.' He, for it was a man, turned his head slowly towards where I stood, and having examined me with the two inquisitive-looking grey eyes which twinkled under a pair of bushy brows, said solemnly, and in a bass voice, "'Her size is small. What is her age?' Ten years.' "'So much,' was the doubtful answer, and he prolonged his scrutiny for some minutes. Presently he addressed me. "'Your name, little girl?' "'Jane Eyre, sir.' In uttering these words I looked up. He seemed to me a tall gentleman, but then I was very little. His features were large and they, in all the lines of his frame, were equally harsh and prim. "'Well, Jane Eyre, and are you a good child?' Impossible to reply to this in the affirmative, my little world held a contrary opinion. I was silent. Mrs. Reed answered for me by an expressive shake of the head, adding soon, "'Perhaps the less said on that subject the better, Mr. Brocklehurst.' Sorry, indeed, to hear it. She and I must have some talk." And bending from the perpendicular, he installed his person in the armchair opposite Mrs. Reed's. "'Come here,' he said. I stepped across the rug. He placed me square and straight before him. What a face he had, now that it was almost on a level with mine! What a great nose! And what a mouth! And what large, prominent teeth! "'No sight so sad as that of a naughty child,' he began. "'Especially a naughty little girl. Do you know where the wicked go after death?' "'They go to hell,' was my ready and orthodox answer. "'And what is hell? Can you tell me that?' "'A pit full of fire.' "'And should you like to fall into that pit, and then be burning there for ever?' "'No, sir.' What must you do to avoid it?" I deliberated a moment. My answer, when it did come, was objectionable. I must keep in good health, and not die. How can you keep in good health? Children younger than you die daily. I buried a little child of five years old only a day or two since, a good little child, whose soul is now in heaven. It is to be feared the same could not be said of you, were you to be called hence. Not being in a condition to remove his doubt, I only cast my eyes down on the two large feet planted on the rug, and sighed, wishing myself far enough away. "'I hope that sigh is from the heart, and that you repent of ever having been the occasion of discomfort to your excellent benefactress.' "'Benefactress! Benefactress!' said I, inwardly. "'They all call Mrs. Reed my benefactress.' If so, a benefactress is a disagreeable thing. "'Do you say your prayers night and morning?' continued my interrogator. "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you read your Bible?' "'Sometimes.' "'With pleasure. Are you fond of it?' "'I like Revelations, and the book of Daniel, and Genesis, and Samuel, and a little bit of Exodus, and some parts of Kings and Chronicles, and Job and Jonah.' And the Psalms? I hope you like them." "'No, sir." "'No? Oh, shocking! I have a little boy younger than you who knows six Psalms by heart, and when you ask him which he would rather have, a gingerbread nut to eat, or a verse of Psalm to learn, he says, "'Oh, 
the verse of a psalm, angels sing psalms, says he. I wish to be a little angel here below. He then gets two nuts in recompense for his infant piety. Psalms are not interesting, I remarked. That proves you have a wicked heart, and you must pray to God to change it, to give you a new and clean one, to take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I was about to propound a question, touching the manner in which that operation of changing my heart was to be performed, when Mrs. Reed had deposed, telling me to sit down. She then proceeded to carry on the conversation herself. Mr. Brocklehurst, I believe I intimated in the letter which I wrote to you three weeks ago, that this little girl has not quite the character and disposition I could wish. Should you admit her into Lowood School, I should be glad if the superintendent and teachers were requested to keep a strict eye on her, and above all to guard her against her worst fault, a tendency to deceit. I mention this in your hearing, Jane, that you may not attempt to impose on Mr. Brocklehurst. Well might I dread, well might I dislike Mrs. Reed, for it was her nature to wound me cruelly. Never was I happy in her presence. However carefully I obeyed, however strenuously I strove to please her, my efforts were still repulsed and repaid by such sentences as the above. Now uttered before a stranger, the accusation cut me to the heart. I dimly perceived that she was already obliterating hope from the new phase of existence which she destined me to enter. I felt, though I could not have expressed the feeling, that she was sowing aversion and unkindness along my future path. I saw myself transformed under Mr. Brocklehurst's eye, into an artful, noxious child. And what could I do to remedy the injury? Nothing, indeed, thought I, as I struggled to repress a sob, and hastily wiped away some tears, the impotent evidences of my anguish. "'Deceit is indeed a sad fault in a child,' said Mr. Brocklehurst. "'It is akin to falsehood, and all liars will have their portion in the lake, burning with fire and brimstone. She shall, however, be watched, Mrs. Reed. I will speak to Miss Temple and the teachers.' "'I should wish her to be brought up in a manner suiting her prospects,' continued my benefactress, "'to be made useful, to be kept humble. As for the vacation, she will, with your permission, spend them always at Lowood.' "'Your decisions are perfectly judicious, madam,' returned Mr. Brocklehurst. "'Humility is a Christian grace, and one peculiarly appropriate to the pupils of Lowood.' I, therefore, direct that a special care shall be bestowed on its cultivation amongst them. I have studied how best to mortify in them the worldly sentiment of pride, and only the other day I had a pleasing proof of my success. My second daughter, Augusta, went with her mamma to visit the school, and on her return she exclaimed, "'Oh, dear papa, how quiet and plain all the girls at Lowood look, with their hair combed behind their ears! and the long pinafores, and the little holland pockets outside their frocks. They are almost like poor people's children. And, said she, they looked at my dress and mamma's as if they had never seen a silk gown before. This is the state of things I quite approve, returned Mrs. Reed. Had I sought all England over, I could scarcely have found a system more exactly fitting a child like Jane Eyre. Consistency, my dear Mr. Brocklehurst, I advocate consistency in all things. Consistency, madam, is the first of Christian duties, and it has been observed in every arrangement connected with the establishment of Lowood. Plain fare, simple attire, unsophisticated accommodations, hardy and active habits. Such is the order of the day in the house and its inhabitants." Quite right, sir. I may then depend upon this child being received as a pupil at Lowood, and there being trained in conformity to her position and prospects. Madam, you may. She shall be placed in that nursery of chosen plants, and I trust she will show herself grateful for the inestimable privilege of her election. I will send to them as soon as possible, Mr. Brocklehurst, for I assure you I feel anxious to be relieved of a responsibility that was becoming too irksome. No doubt. No doubt, madam. And now I wish you good morning. I shall return to Brocklehurst Hall in the course of a week or two. My good friend, the Archdeacon, will not permit me to leave him sooner. I shall send Miss Temple notice that she is to expect a new girl, so that there will be no difficulty about receiving her. 
Good-bye. Good-bye, Mr. Brocklehurst. Remember me to Mrs. and Miss Brocklehurst, and to Augusta and Theodore, and Master Broughton Brocklehurst. I will, madam. Little girl, here is a book entitled The Child's Guide. Read it with prayer, especially that part containing an account of the awfully sudden death of Martha G., a naughty child addicted to falsehood and deceit." With these words Mr. Brocklehurst put into my hand a thin pamphlet sewn in a cover, and having rung for his carriage, he departed. Mrs. Reed and I were left alone. Some minutes passed in silence. She was sewing. I was watching her. Mrs. Reed might be at that time some six or seven and thirty. She was a woman of robust frame, square-shouldered and strong-limbed, not tall, and though stout, not obese. She had a somewhat large face, the under-jaw being much developed and very solid. Her brow was low, her chin large and prominent, mouth and nose sufficiently regular. Under her light eyebrows glimmered an eye devoid of ruth. Her skin was dark and opaque, her hair nearly flaxen. Her constitution was sound as a bell. Illness never came near her. She was an exact, clever manager. Her household and tenantry were thoroughly under her control. Her children only at times defied her authority and laughed to scorn. She dressed well, and had a presence and port calculated to set off handsome attire. Sitting on a low stool a few yards from her armchair, I examined her figure. I perused her features. In my hand I held the tract containing the sudden death of the liar, to which narrative my attention had been pointed as to an appropriate warning. What had just passed? What Mrs. Reed had said concerning me to Mr. Brocklehurst, the whole tenor of their conversation, was recent, raw, and stinging in my mind. I had felt every word as acutely as I had heard it plainly, and a passion of resentment fermented now within me. Mrs. Reed looked up from her work. Her eye settled on mine, her fingers at the same time suspended their nimble movements. "'Go out of the room. Return to the nursery,' was her mandate. My look or something else must have struck her as offensive, for she spoke with extreme though suppressed irritation. I got up. I went to the door. I came back again. I walked to the window, across the room, then close up to her. "'Speak I must. I had been trodden on severely, and must turn. But how? What strength had I to dart retaliation at my antagonist? I gathered my energies, and launched them in this blunt sentence. I am not deceitful. If I were, I should say I loved you. But I declare I do not love you. I dislike you the worst of anybody in the world except John Reed. And this book about the liar you may give to your girl, Georgiana, for it is she who tells lies, and not I. Mrs. Reed's hands still lay on her work, inactive. Her eye of ice continued to dwell freezingly on mine. "'What more have you to say?' she asked, rather in the tone in which a person might address an opponent of adult age, than such as ordinarily used to a child. That eye of hers, that voice, stirred every antipathy I had. Shaking from head to foot, thrilled with ungovernable excitement, I continued. I am glad you are no relation of mine. I will never call you aunt again as long as I live. I will never come to see you when I am grown up. And if any one asks me how I liked you, and how you treated me, I will say the very thought of you makes me sick, and that you treated me with miserable cruelty." "'How dare you affirm that, Jane Eyre!' "'How dare I, Mrs. Reed? How dare I? Because it is the truth! You think I have no feelings, and that I can do without one bit of love or kindness. But I cannot live so. And you have no pity. I shall remember how you thrust me back, roughly and violently thrust me back, into the red room, and locked me up there to my dying day. Though I was in agony, though I cried out while suffocating with distress, have mercy, have mercy, Aunt Reed. And that punishment you made me suffer because your wicked boy struck me, knocked me down for nothing. I will tell anybody who asks me questions this exact tale. People think you a good woman. But you are bad, hard-hearted. You are deceitful." Ere I had finished this reply, my soul began to expand, to exult, with the strangest sense of freedom, of triumph I ever felt. 
It seemed as if an invisible bond had burst, and that I had struggled out into unhoped-for liberty. Not without cause with this sentiment. Mrs. Reed looked frightened. Her work had slipped from her knee. She was lifting up her hands, rocking herself to and fro, and even twisting her face as if she would cry. "'Jane! You are under a mistake! What is the matter with you? Why do you tremble so violently? Would you like to drink some water?' "'No, Mrs. Reed. Is there anything else you wish for, Jane? I assure you, I desire to be your friend." "'Not you. You told Mr. Brocklehurst I had a bad character, a deceitful disposition. And I'll let everybody at Lowood know what you are, and what you have done." "'Jane, you don't understand these things. Children must be corrected for their faults." "'Deceit is not my fault!' I cried out in a high, savage voice. But you are passionate, Jane, that you must allow. And now return to the nursery, there's a dear, and lie down a little." "'I am not your dear. I cannot lie down. Send me to school soon, Mrs. Reed, for I hate to live here." "'I will indeed send her to school soon,' murmured Mrs. Reed sotto voce, and gathering up her work, she abruptly quitted the apartment. I was left there alone, winner of the field. It was the hardest battle I had fought, and the first victory I had gained. I stood a while on the rug where Mr. Brocklehurst had stood, and I enjoyed my conqueror's solitude. First I smiled to myself, and felt elated. But this fierce pleasure subsided in me as fast as did the accelerated throb of my pulses. A child cannot quarrel with its elders as I had done, cannot give its furious feelings uncontrolled play as I had given mine, without experiencing afterwards the pang of remorse, and the chill of reaction. A ridge of lighted heath, alive, glancing, devouring, would have been a meet emblem of my mind when I accused and menaced Mrs. Reed. The same ridge, black and blasted after the flames are dead, would have represented as meetly my subsequent condition, when half an hour's silence and reflection had shown me the madness of my conduct, and the dreariness of my hated and hating position. Something of vengeance I had tasted for the first time. As aromatic wine it seemed, on swallowing, warm and racy, its after-flavour, metallic and corroding, gave me a sensation as if I had been poisoned. Willingly would I now have gone and asked Mrs. Reed's pardon. But I knew, partly from experience and partly from instinct, that was the way to make her repulse me with double scorn, thereby re-exciting every turbulent impulse of my nature. I would fain exercise some better faculty than that of fierce speaking, fain find nourishment for some less fiendish feeling than that of sombre indignation. I took a book, some Arabian tales. I sat down and endeavoured to read. I could make no sense of the subject. My own thoughts swam always between me and the page I had usually found fascinating. I opened the glass door in the breakfast-room. The shrubbery was quite still. The black frost reigned, unbroken by sun or breeze, through the grounds. I covered my head and arms with the skirt of my frock, and went out to walk in part of the plantation which was quite sequestered. But I found no pleasure in the silent trees the falling fir-cones, the congealed relics of autumn, russet leaves, swept by past winds in heaps, and now stiffened together. I leaned against a gate, and looked into an empty field where no sheep were feeding, where the short grass was nipped and blanched. It was a very grey day, a most opaque sky, onding on snarl, canopied all. Thence flakes fell in intervals, which settled on the hard path, and on the hoary lee without melting. I stood, a wretched child enough, whispering to myself over and over again, What shall I do? What shall I do? All at once I heard a clear voice call, Miss Jane, where are you? Come to lunch. It was Bessie I knew well enough, but I did not stir. Her light step came tripping down the path. You naughty little thing, she said. Why don't you come when you are called? Bessie's presence, compared with the thoughts over which I had been brooding, seemed cheerful, even though, as usual, she was somewhat cross. The fact is, after my conflict with, and victory over, Mrs. Reed, I was not disposed to care much for the nursemaid's transitory anger, and I was disposed to bask in her youthful lightness of heart. I just put my two arms round her, and said, "'Come, Bessie, don't scold.' 
The action was more frank and fearless than any I was habituated to indulge in. Somehow it pleased her. "'You are a strange child, Miss Jane,' she said as she looked down at me. "'A little roving, solitary thing. And you are going to school, I suppose?' I nodded. "'And won't you be sorry to leave poor Bessie?' "'What does Bessie care for me? She's always scolding me.' "'Because you're such a queer, frightened, shy little thing. You should be bolder.' "'What? To get more knocks?' "'Nonsense! But you are rather put upon, that's certain. My mother said, when she came to see me last week, that she would not like a little one of her own to be in your place. Now come in, and I've some good news for you." "'I don't think you have, Bessie." "'Child, what do you mean? What sorrowful eyes you fix on me! Well, but Missus and the young ladies and Master John are going out to tea this afternoon, and you shall have tea with me. I'll ask Cook to bake your little cake, and then you shall help me look over your drawers, for I am soon to pack your trunk. Missus intends you to leave Gateshead in a day or two, and you shall choose what toys you like to take with you." "'Bessie, you must promise not to scold me any more till I go." "'Well, I will. But mind, you are a very good little girl, and don't be afraid of me. Don't start when I chance to speak rather sharply. It's so provoking." I don't think I shall ever be afraid of you again, Bessie, because I have got used to you, and I shall soon have another set of people to dread." "'If you dread them, they'll dislike you." "'As you do, Bessie." "'I don't dislike you, Miss. I believe I am fonder of you than of all the others." "'You don't show it." "'You sharp little thing! You've got quite a new way of talking. What makes you so venturesome and hardy?" "'Why, I shall soon be away from you, and besides—' I was going to say something about what had passed between me and Mrs. Reed, but on second thoughts I considered it better to remain silent on that head. "'And so you're glad to leave me?' "'Not at all, Bessie. Indeed, just now I'm rather sorry.' "'Just now, and rather! How coolly my little lady says it! I dare say now, if I were to ask you for a kiss, you wouldn't give it me. You'd say you'd rather not.' "'I'll kiss you, and welcome.' Bend your head down." Bessie stooped, we mutually embraced, and I followed her into the house quite comforted. That afternoon lapsed in peace and harmony, and in the evening Bessie told me some of her most enchanting stories, and sang me some of her sweetest songs. Even for me, life had its gleams of sunshine. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. — Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. — Chapter Five Five o'clock had hardly struck on the morning of the 19th of January when Bessie brought a candle into my closet, and found me already up and nearly dressed. I had risen half an hour before her entrance, and had washed my face and put on my clothes by the light of a half-moon just setting, whose rays streamed through the narrow window near my crib. I was to leave Gateshead that day by a coach, which passed the lodge gates at six a.m. Bessie was the only person yet risen. She had lit a fire in the nursery where she now proceeded to make my breakfast. Few children can eat when excited with the thoughts of a journey, nor could I. Bessie, having pressed me in vain to take a few spoonfuls of the boiled milk and bread she had prepared for me, wrapped up some biscuits in a paper, and put them into my bag. Then she helped me on with my pelisse and bonnet, and wrapping herself in a shawl, she and I left the nursery. As we passed Mrs. Reed's bedroom, she said, Will you go in and bid Mrs. good-bye?" No, Bessie. She came to my crib last night when you were gone down to supper, and said I need not disturb her in the morning, or my cousins either. And she told me to remember that she had always been my best friend, and to speak of her and be grateful to her accordingly. What did you say, Miss? Nothing. I covered my face with the bedclothes, and turned from her to the wall. Oh, that was wrong, Miss Jane! It was quite right, Bessie. 
Your missus has not been my friend. She has been my foe. Oh, Miss Jane, don't say so. Good-bye to Gateshead, cried I, as we passed through the hall and went out at the front door. The moon was set, and it was very dark. Bessie carried a lantern, whose light glanced on wet steps and gravel roads sodden by a recent thaw. Raw and chill was the winter morning. My teeth chattered as I hastened down the drive. There was a light in the porter's lodge. When we reached it, we found the porter's wife just kindling her fire. My trunk, which had been carried down the evening before, stood corded at the door. It wanted but a few minutes of six, and shortly after that hour had struck, the distant roll of wheels announced the coming coach. I went to the door and watched its lamps approach rapidly through the gloom. "'Is she going by herself?' asked the porter's wife. "'Yes.' "'And how far is it?' Fifty miles.' "'What a long way! I wonder Mrs. Reed is not afraid to trust her so far alone.' The coach drew up. There it was at the gates, with its four horses and its top laden with passengers. The guard and coachman loudly urged haste. My trunk was hoisted up. I was taken from Bessie's neck, to which I clung with kisses. "'Be sure and take good care of her!' cried she to the guard, as he lifted me into the inside. "'Aye, aye!' was the answer. The door was slapped to. A voice exclaimed, "'All right!' and on we drove. Thus was I severed from Bessie and Gateshead, thus whirled away to unknown, and, as I then deemed, remote and mysterious regions. I remember but little of the journey. I only know that the day seemed to me of a preternatural length, and that we appeared to travel over hundreds of miles of road. We passed through several towns, and in one, a very large one, the coach stopped. The horses were taken out, and the passengers alighted to dine. I was carried into an inn, where the guard wanted me to have some dinner, but as I had no appetite, he left me in an immense room with a fireplace at each end, a chandelier pendant from the ceiling, and a little red gallery high up against the wall filled with musical instruments. Here I walked about for a long time, feeling very strange, and mortally apprehensive of some one coming in and kidnapping me, for I believed in kidnappers, their exploits having frequently figured in Bessie's fireside chronicles. At last the guard returned. Once more I was stowed away in the coach. My protector mounted his own seat, sounded his hollow horn, and away we rattled over the stony street of L. The afternoon came on wet and somewhat misty. As it waned into dusk, I began to feel that we were getting very far indeed from Gateshead. We ceased to pass through towns, the country changed, great grey hills heaved up round the horizon. As twilight deepened, we descended a valley, dark with wood, and long after night had overclouded the prospect, I heard a wild wind rushing amongst trees. Lulled by the sound, I at last dropped asleep. I had not long slumbered when the sudden cessation of motion awoke me. The coach door was open, and a person like a servant was standing at it. I saw her face and dress by the light of the lamps. "'Is there a little girl called Jane Eyre here?' she asked. I answered yes, and was then lifted out. My trunk was handed down, and the coach instantly drove away. I was stiff with long sitting, and bewildered with the noise and motion of the coach. Gathering my faculties, I looked about me. Rain, wind, and darkness filled the air. Nevertheless, I dimly discerned a wall before me, and a door open in it. Through this door I passed with my new guide. She shut and locked it behind her. There was now visible a house, or houses, for the building spread far, with many windows and lights burning in some. We went up a broad, pebbly path, splashing wet, and were admitted at a door. Then the servant led me through a passage into a room with a fire, where she left me alone. I stood and warmed my numbed fingers over the blaze. Then I looked round. There was no candle, but the uncertain light from the hearth showed, by intervals, papered walls, carpet, curtains, shining mahogany furniture. It was a parlour, not so spacious or splendid as the drawing-room at Gateshead, but comfortable enough. I was puzzling to make out the subject of a picture on the wall, when the door opened, and an individual carrying a light entered. Another followed close behind. The first was a tall lady with dark hair, dark eyes, and a pale and large forehead. Her figure was partly enveloped in a shawl. 
her countenance was grave, her bearing erect. "'The child is very young to be sent alone,' said she, putting her candle down on the table. She considered me attentively for a minute or two, then further added, "'She had better be put to bed soon. She looks tired. Are you tired?' she asked, placing her hand on my shoulder. "'A little, mum. "'And hungry too, no doubt. Let her have some supper before she goes to bed, Miss Miller. Is this the first time you have left your parents to come to school, my little girl?" I explained to her that I had no parents. She inquired how long they had been dead, then how old I was, what was my name, whether I could read, write, and sew a little. Then she touched my cheek gently with a forefinger, and saying, she hoped I should be a good child, dismissed me along with Miss Miller. The lady I had left might be about twenty-nine. The one who went with me appeared some years younger. The first impressed me by her voice, look, and air. Miss Miller was more ordinary, ruddy in complexion, though of a careworn countenance, hurried in gait and action, like one who had always a multiplicity of tasks on hand. She looked, indeed, what I afterwards found she really was, an under-teacher. Led by her, I passed from compartment to compartment, from passage to passage, of a large and irregular building, till, emerging from the total and somewhat dreary silence pervading that portion of the house we had traversed, we came upon the hum of many voices, and presently entered a wide, long room, with great deal tables, two at each end, on each of which burnt a pair of candles, and seated all round on benches, a congregation of girls of every age, from nine or ten to twenty. Seen by the dim light of the dips, their number to me appeared countless, though not in reality exceeding eighty. They were uniformly dressed in brown stuff frocks of quaint fashion, and long holland pinafores. It was the hour of study. They were engaged in conning over their to-morrow's task, and the hum I had heard was the combined result of their whispered repetitions. Miss Miller signed to me to sit on a bench near the door, then walking up to the top of the long room she cried out, "'Monitors, collect the lesson-books and put them away!' Four tall girls arose from different tables, and going round, gathered the books and removed them. Miss Miller again gave the word of command. "'Monitors, fetch the supper-trays!' The tall girls went out and returned presently, each bearing a tray with portions of something, I knew not what, arranged thereon, and a pitcher of water and mug in the middle of each tray. The portions were handed round. Those who liked took a draught of the water, the mug being common to all. When it came to my turn, I drank, for I was thirsty, but did not touch the food, excitement and fatigue rendering me incapable of eating. I now saw, however, that it was a thin oaten cake shared into fragments. The meal over, prayers were read by Miss Miller, and the classes filed off, two and two, upstairs. Overpowered by this time with weariness, I scarcely noticed what sort of a place the bedroom was, except that, like the schoolroom, I saw it was very long. To-night I was to be Miss Miller's bedfellow. She helped me to undress. When laid down I glanced at the long rows of beds, each of which was quickly filled with two occupants. In ten minutes the single light was extinguished, and amidst silence and complete darkness I fell asleep. The night passed rapidly. I was too tired even to dream. I only once awoke to hear the wind rave in furious gusts, and the rain fall in torrents, and to be sensible that Miss Miller had taken her place by my side. When I again unclosed my eyes, a loud bell was ringing. The girls were up and dressing. Day had not yet begun to dawn, and a rushlight or two burned in the room. I too rose reluctantly. It was bitter cold, and I dressed as well as I could for shivering and washed when there was a basin at liberty, which did not occur soon, as there was but one basin to six girls, on the stands down the middle of the room. Again the bell rang, all formed in file, two and two, and in that order descended the stairs, and entered the cold and dimly lit schoolroom. Here prayers were read by Miss Miller. Afterwards she called out, "'Form classes!' A great tumult succeeded for some minutes, during which Miss Miller repeatedly exclaimed, "'Silence! and order!' When it subsided, I saw them all drawn up in four semicircles, before four chairs, placed at the four tables, 
all held books in their hands, and a great book, like a Bible, lay on each table before the vacant seat. A pause of some seconds succeeded, filled up by the low, vague hum of numbers. Miss Miller walked from class to class, hushing this indefinite sound. A distant bell tinkled. Immediately three ladies entered the room, each walked to a table and took a seat. Miss Miller assumed the fourth vacant chair, which was that nearest the door, and around which the smallest of the children were assembled. To this inferior class I was called, and placed at the bottom of it. Business now began. The day's collect was repeated, then certain texts of Scripture were said, and to these succeeded a protracted reading of chapters in the Bible, which lasted an hour. By the time that exercise was terminated, day had fully dawned. The indefatigable bell now sounded for the fourth time. The classes were marshalled and marched into another room to breakfast. How glad I was to behold a prospect of getting something to eat! I was now nearly sick from inanition, having taken so little of the day before. The refectory was a great, low-sealed, gloomy room. On two low tables smoked basins of something hot, which, however, to my dismay, sent forth an odour far from inviting. I saw a universal manifestation of discontent, when the fumes of the repast met the nostrils of those destined to swallow it. From the van of the procession, the tall girls of the first class, rose the whispered words, "'Disgusting! The porridge is burnt again!' "'Silence!' ejaculated a voice. But not that of Miss Miller, but one of the upper teachers, a little and dark personage, smartly dressed, but of somewhat morose aspect who installed herself at the top of one table, while a more buxom lady presided at the other. I looked in vain for her I had first seen the night before. She was not visible. Miss Miller occupied the foot of the table where I sat, and a strange, foreign-looking, elderly lady, the French teacher, as I afterwards found, took the corresponding seat at the other board. A long grace was said, and a hymn sung. Then a servant brought in some tea for the teachers, and the meal began ravenous, and now very faint. I devoured a spoonful or two of my portion without thinking of its taste. But the first edge of hunger blunted, I perceived I had got in hand a nauseous mess. Burnt porridge is almost as bad as rotten potatoes. Famine itself soon sickens over it. The spoons were moved slowly. I saw each girl taste her food and try to swallow it. But in most cases the effort was soon relinquished. Breakfast was over, and none had breakfasted. Thanks being returned for what we had not got, and a second hymn chanted, the refectory was evacuated for the schoolroom. I was one of the last to go, and in passing the tables, I saw one teacher take a basin of the porridge and taste it. She looked at the others. All their countenances expressed displeasure, and one of them, the stout one, whispered, "'Abominable stuff! How shameful!' A quarter of an hour passed before lessons again began, during which the schoolroom was in glorious tumult. For that space of time it seemed to be permitted to talk loud and more freely, and they used their privilege. The whole conversation ran on the breakfast, which one and all abused roundly. Poor things! It was the sole consolation they had. Miss Miller was now the only teacher in the room. A group of great girls standing about her spoke with serious and sullen gestures. I heard the name of Mr. Brocklehurst pronounced by some lips, at which Miss Miller shook her head disapprovingly. But she made no great effort to check the general wrath. Doubtless she shared in it. A clock in the schoolroom struck nine. Miss Miller left her circle, and standing in the middle of the room, cried, "'Silence! To your seats!' Discipline prevailed. In five minutes the confused throng was resolved into order and comparative silence quelled the babbled clamour of tongues. The upper teachers now punctually resumed their posts, but still all seemed to wait. Ranged on benches down the sides of the room, the eighty girls sat motionless and erect. A quaint assemblage they appeared, all with plain locks combed from their faces, not a curl visible. In brown dresses, made high and surrounded by a narrow tucker about the throat, with little pockets of holland, shaped something like a Highlander's purse, tied in front of their frocks, and destined to serve the purpose of a work-bag. 
all two wearing woollen stockings and country-made shoes, fastened with brass buckles. About twenty of those clad in this costume were full-grown girls, or rather young women. It suited them ill, and gave an air of oddity even to the prettiest. I was still looking at them, and also at intervals examining the teachers, none of whom precisely pleased me, for the stout one was a little coarse, the dark one not a little fierce, the foreigner harsh and grotesque, and Miss Miller, poor thing, looked purple, weather-beaten, and overworked. When, as my eye wandered from face to face, the whole school rose simultaneously, as if moved by a common spring. What was the matter? I had heard no order given. I was puzzled. Ere I had gathered my wits, the classes were again seated. But as all eyes were now turned to one point, mine followed the general direction, and encountered the personage who had received me last night. She stood at the bottom of the long room, on the hearth, for there was a fire at each end. She surveyed the two rows of girls silently and gravely. Miss Miller approaching seemed to ask her a question, and having received her answer, went back to her place, and said aloud, "'Monitor of the first class, fetch the globes!' While the direction was being executed, the lady consulted moved slowly up the room. I suppose I have a considerable organ of veneration, for I retain yet the sense of admiring awe with which my eyes traced her steps. Seen now in broad daylight, she looked tall, fair, and shapely, brown eyes with benignant light in their irids, and a fine pencilling of long lashes round, relieved the whiteness of her large front. On each of her temples her hair, of a very dark brown, was clustered in round curls, according to the fashion of those times, when neither smooth bands nor long ringlets were in vogue. Her dress, also in the mode of the day, was of purple cloth relieved by a sort of Spanish trimming of a black velvet. A gold watch—watches were not so common then as now—shone at her girdle. Let the reader add, to complete the picture, refined features, a complexion, if pale, clear, and a stately air and carriage, and he will have, at least, as clearly as words can give it, a correct idea of the exterior of Miss Temple, Maria Temple as I afterwards saw the name written in a prayer-book entrusted to me to carry to church. The superintendent of Lowood, for such was this lady, having taken her seat before a pair of globes placed on one of the tables, summoned the first class round her, and commenced giving a lesson on geography. The lower classes were called by the teachers. Repetitions in history, grammar, etc., went on for an hour. Writing and arithmetic succeeded, and music lessons were given by Miss Temple to some of the elder girls. The duration of each lesson was measured by the clock, which at last struck twelve. The superintendent rose. "'I have a word to address to the pupils,' said she. The tumult of cessation from lessons was already breaking forth, but it sank at her voice. She went on. "'You had this morning a breakfast which you could not eat. You must be hungry.' I have ordered that a lunch of bread and cheese shall be served to all." The teachers looked at her with a sort of surprise. "'It is to be done on my responsibility,' she added, in an explanatory tone to them, and immediately afterwards left the room. The bread and cheese was presently brought in and distributed, to the high delight and refreshment of the whole school. The order was now given, "'To the garden!' Each put on a coarse straw bonnet, with strings of coloured calico and a cloak of grey frieze. I was similarly equipped, and following the stream I made my way into the open air. The garden was a wide enclosure, surrounded with walls so high as to exclude every glimpse of prospect. A covered veranda ran down one side, and broad walks bordered a middle space divided into scores of little beds. These beds were assigned as gardens for the pupils to cultivate, and each bed had an owner. When full of flowers they would doubtless look pretty, but now, at the latter end of January, all was wintry blight and brown decay. I shuddered as I stood and looked round me. It was an inclement day for outdoor exercise. Not positively rainy, but darkened by a drizzling yellow fog. All underfoot was still soaking wet with the floods of yesterday. The stronger among the girls ran about and engaged in active games, but sundry pale and thin ones herded together for shelter and warmth in the veranda, and amongst these, as the dense mist penetrated to their shivering frames, I heard frequently the sound of a hollow cough. 
As yet I had spoken to no one, nor did anybody seem to take notice of me. I stood lonely enough. But to that feeling of isolation I was accustomed, it did not oppress me much. I leant against a pillar of the veranda, drew my grey mantle close about me, and trying to forget the cold which nipped me without, and the unsatisfied hunger which gnawed me within, delivered myself up to the employment of watching and thinking. My reflections were too undefined and fragmentary to merit record. I hardly yet knew where I was. Gates' head and my past life seemed floated away to an immeasurable distance. The present was vague and strange, and of the future I could form no conjecture. I looked round the convent-like garden, and then up at the house. A large building, half of which seemed grey and old, the other half quite new. The new part, containing the schoolroom and dormitory, was lit by mullioned and latticed windows, which gave it a church-like aspect. A stone tablet over the door bore this inscription. Lowood Institution. This portion was rebuilt A.D. by Naomi Brocklehurst of Brocklehurst Hall, in this county. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. St. Matthew, verse 16. I read these words over and over again. I felt that an explanation belonged to them, and was unable fully to penetrate their import. I was still pondering the significance of institution, and endeavouring to make out a connection between the first words and verse of Scripture, when the sound of a cough close behind me made me turn my head. I saw a girl sitting on a stone bench near. She was bent over a book, on the perusal of which she seemed intent. From where I stood I could see the title. It was Rasselas, a name that struck me as strange, and consequently attractive. In turning a leaf she happened to look up, and I said to her directly, "'Is your book interesting?' I had already formed the intention of asking her to lend it to me some day. "'I like it,' she answered, after a pause of a second or two, during which she examined me. "'What is it about?' I continued. I hardly know where I found the hardihood thus to open a conversation with a stranger. The step was contrary to my nature and habits. But I think her occupation touched a chord of sympathy somewhere, for I too liked reading, though of a frivolous and childish kind. I could not digest or comprehend the serious or substantial. "'You may look at it,' replied the girl, offering me the book. I did so. A brief examination convinced me that the contents were less taking than the title. Rasselas looked dull to my trifling taste. I saw nothing about fairies, nothing about genii, no bright variety seemed spread over the closely printed pages. I returned it to her. She received it quietly, and without saying anything she was about to relapse into her former studious mood. Again I ventured to disturb her. "'Can you tell me what the writing on that stone over the door means? What is Lowood Institution?' "'This house where you are come to live.' And why do they call it an institution? Is it in any way different from other schools?" "'It is partly a charity school. You and I and all the rest of us are charity children. I suppose you are an orphan. Are not either your father or your mother dead?" "'Both died before I can remember." "'Well, all the girls here have lost either one or both parents, and this is called an institution for educating orphans." "'Do we pay no money? Do they keep us for nothing?" We pay, or our friends pay, fifteen pounds a year for each. Then why do they call us charity children? Because fifteen pounds is not enough for board and teaching, and the deficiency is supplied by subscription. Who subscribes? Different benevolent-minded ladies and gentlemen in this neighbourhood and in London. Who is Naomi Brocklehurst? The lady who built the new part of this house, as that tablet records, and whose son overlooks and directs everything here. Why? Because he is treasurer and manager of the establishment. Then this house does not belong to that tall lady who wears a watch, and who said we were to have some bread and cheese. To Miss Temple? Oh, no! I wish it did. She has to answer to Mr. Brocklehurst for all she does. Mr. Brocklehurst buys all our food and all our clothes. Does he live here? No. Two miles off at a large hall. Is he a good man? He is a clergyman, and is said to do a great deal of good. 
Did you say that tall lady was called Miss Temple? Yes. And what are the other teachers called? The one with red cheeks is called Miss Smith. She attends to the work, and cuts out, for we make our own clothes, our frocks and pelisses, and everything. And the little one with black hair is Miss Scatcherd. She teaches history and grammar, and hears the second-class repetitions. And the one who wears a shawl, and has a pocket-handkerchief tied to her side with a yellow ribbon, is Madame Pierrot. She comes from Lille, in France, and teaches French. Do you like the teachers? Well enough. Do you like the little black one, and the Madame—I cannot pronounce her name as you do. Miss Scatcherd is hasty. You must take care not to offend her. Madame Pierrot is not a bad sort of person. But Miss Temple is the best, isn't she? Miss Temple is very good, and very clever. She is above the rest, because she knows far more than they do. Have you been long here? Two years. Are you an orphan? My mother is dead. Are you happy here? You ask rather too many questions. I have given you enough answers for the present. Now I want to read." But at that moment the summons sounded for dinner. All re-entered the house. The odour which now filled the refectory was scarcely more appetising than that which had regaled our nostrils at breakfast. The dinner was served in two huge, tin-plated vessels, whence rose a strong steam redolent of rancid fat. I found the mess to consist of indifferent potatoes and strange shreds of rusty meat, mixed and cooked together. Of this preparation a tolerably abundant plateful was apportioned to each pupil. I ate what I could, and wondered within myself whether every day's fare would be like this. After dinner we immediately adjourned to the schoolroom. Lessons recommenced, and were continued till five o'clock. The only marked event of the afternoon was, that I saw the girl with whom I had conversed in the veranda dismissed and disgraced by Miss Scatcherd from a history class, and sent to stand in the middle of the large schoolroom. The punishment seemed to me in high degree ignominious, especially for so great a girl. She looked thirteen or upwards. I expected she would show signs of great distress and shame, but to my surprise she neither wept nor blushed. Composed, though grave, she stood the central mark of all eyes. How can she bear it so quietly? So firmly, I asked myself, were I in her place, it seems to me I should wish the earth to open and swallow me up. She looks as if she were thinking of something beyond her punishment, beyond her situation, of something not round her, nor before her. I have heard of daydreams. Is she in a daydream now? Her eyes are fixed on the floor, but I am sure they do not see it. Her sight seems turned in, gone down into her heart. She is looking at what she can remember, I believe, not at what is really present. I wonder what sort of a girl she is, whether good or naughty." Soon after five p.m. we had another meal, consisting of a small mug of coffee, and half a slice of brown bread. I devoured my bread and drank my coffee with relish, but I should have been glad of as much more. I was still hungry. Half an hour's recreation succeeded, then study. Then the glass of water and the piece of oat-cake, prayers, and bed. Such was my first day at Lowood. End of chapter 5《Chapter 6 of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 6 The next day commenced as before, getting up and dressing by rushlight. But this morning we were obliged to dispense with the ceremony of washing. The water in the pitchers was frozen. A change had taken place in the weather the preceding evening, and a keen north-east wind, whistling through the crevices of our bedroom windows all night long, had made us shiver in our beds, and turned the contents of the ewers to ice. Before the long hour and a half of prayers and Bible-reading was over, I felt ready to perish with cold. Breakfast-time came at last, and this morning the porridge was not burnt. The quality was eatable, the quantity small. How small my portion seemed! I wished it had been doubled. 
In the course of the day I was enrolled a member of the fourth class, and regular tasks and occupations were assigned me. Hitherto I had only been a spectator of the proceedings at Lowood. I was now to become an actor therein. At first, being little accustomed to learn by heart, the lessons appeared to me both long and difficult. The frequent change from task to task, too, bewildered me, and I was glad when about three o'clock in the afternoon, Miss Smith put into my hands a border of muslin two yards long, together with needle, thimble, etc., and sent me to sit in a quiet corner of the schoolroom, with directions to hem the same. At that hour most of the others were sewing likewise. But one class still stood round Miss Scatcherd's chair reading, and as all was quiet, the subject of their lessons could be heard, together with the manner in which each girl acquitted herself, and the animadversions or commendations of Miss Scatcherd on the performance. It was English history. Among the readers I observed my acquaintance of the veranda. At the commencement of the lesson, her place had been at the top of the class, but for some error of pronunciation, or some inattention to stops, she was suddenly sent to the very bottom. Even in that obscure position, Miss Scatcherd continued to make her an object of constant notice. She was continually addressing to her such phrases as the following. "'Burns!' Such, it seems, was her name. The girls here were all called by their surnames, as boys are elsewhere. "'Burns, you are standing on the side of your shoe. Turn your toes out immediately.' "'Burns, you poke your chin most unpleasantly. Draw it in.' "'Burns, I insist on your holding your head up. I will not have you before me in that attitude.' etc., etc. A chapter having been read through twice, the books were closed and the girls examined. The lesson had comprised part of the reign of Charles I, and there were sundry questions about tonnage and poundage and ship-money, which most of them appeared unable to answer. Still every little difficulty was solved instantly when it reached Burns. Her memory seemed to have retained the substance of the whole lesson, and she was ready with answers on every point. I kept expecting that Miss Scatcherd would praise her attention, but instead of that she suddenly cried out, "'You dirty, disagreeable girl! You have never cleaned your nails this morning!' Burns made no answer. I wondered at her silence. Why, thought I, does she not explain that she could neither clean her nails nor wash her face as the water was frozen? My attention was now called off by Miss Smith desiring me to hold a skein of thread while she was winding it. She talked to me from time to time, asking whether I had ever been at school before, whether I could mark, stitch, knit, etc. Till she dismissed me, I could not pursue my observations on Miss Scatcherd's movements. When I returned to my seat, that lady was just delivering an order of which I did not catch the import. But Burns immediately left the class, and going into the small inner room where the books were kept, returned in half a minute, carrying in her hand a bundle of twigs tied together at one end. This ominous tool she presented to Miss Scatcherd with a respectful courtesy. Then she quietly, and without being told, unloosed her pinafore, and the teacher instantly and sharply inflicted on her neck a dozen strokes with a bunch of twigs. Not a tear rose to Burns's eye, and while I paused from my sewing, because my fingers quivered at this spectacle with a sentiment of unavailing and impotent anger, not a feature of her pensive face altered its ordinary expression. "'Hardened girl!' exclaimed Miss Scatcherd. "'Nothing can correct you of your slatternly habits. Carry the rod away!' Burns obeyed. I looked at her narrowly as she emerged from the book-closet. She was just putting back her handkerchief into her pocket, and the trace of a tear glistened on her thin cheek. The play-hour in the evening I thought the pleasantest fraction of the day at Lowood. The bit of bread, the draught of coffee swallowed at five o'clock, had revived vitality, if it had not satisfied hunger. The long restraint of the day was slackened. The schoolroom felt warmer than in the morning, its fires being allowed to burn a little more brightly, to supply in some measure the place of candles not yet introduced. The ruddy gloaming, the licensed uproar, the confusion of many voices gave one a welcome sense of liberty. On the evening of the day on which I had seen Miss Scatcherd flog her pupil, Burns, I wandered as usual among the forms and tables and laughing groups without a companion, yet not feeling lonely. When I passed the windows, I now and then lifted a blind and looked out. It snowed fast. A drift was already forming against the lower panes. Putting my ear close to the window, 
I could distinguish from the gleeful tumult within, the disconsolate moan of the wind outside. Probably, if I had lately left a good home and kind parents, this would have been the hour when I should have most keenly regretted the separation. That wind would then have saddened my heart, this obscure chaos would have disturbed my peace. As it was, I derived from both a strange excitement, and reckless and feverish I wished the wind to howl more wildly, the gloom to deepen to darkness, and the confusion to rise to clamour. Jumping over forms and creeping under tables, I made my way to one of the fireplaces. There, kneeling by the high wire fender, I found Burns, absorbed, silent, abstracted from all round her by the companionship of a book, which she read by the dim glare of the embers. "'Is it still Rasselas?' I asked, coming behind her. "'Yes,' she said, "'and I have just finished it.' And in five minutes more she shut it up. I was glad of this. Now, thought I, I can perhaps get her to talk. I sat down by her on the floor. "'What is your name besides Burns?' "'Helen. Do you come a long way from here?' "'I come from a place farther north, quite on the borders of Scotland.' "'Will you ever go back?' "'I hope so. But nobody can be sure of the future.' "'You must wish to leave Lowood.' "'No. Why should I? I was sent to Lowood to get an education, and it would be of no use going away until I have attained that object.' "'But that teacher, Miss Scatcherd, is so cruel to you.' Cruel? Not at all. She is severe. She dislikes my faults. And if I were in your place, I should dislike her. I should resist her. If she struck me with that rod, I should get it from her hand. I should break it under her nose. And probably you would do nothing of the sort. But if you did, Mr. Brocklehurst would expel you from the school. That would be a great grief to your relations. It is far better to endure patiently a smart which nobody feels but yourself, than to commit a hasty action whose evil consequences will extend to all connected with you. And besides, the Bible bids us return good for evil. But then it seems disgraceful to be flogged, and to be sent to stand in the middle of a room full of people. And you are such a great girl! I am far younger than you, and I could not bear it." Yes, it would be your duty to bear it, if you could not avoid it. It is weak and silly to say you cannot bear what it is your fate to be required to bear." I heard her with wonder. I could not comprehend this doctrine of endurance, and still less could I understand or sympathise with the forbearance she expressed for her chastiser. Still I felt that Helen Burns considered things by a light invisible to my eyes. I suspected she might be right and I wrong, but I would not ponder the matter deeply. Like Felix, I put it off to a more convenient season. "'You say you have faults, Helen. What are they? To me you seem very good.' "'Then learn from me not to judge by appearances. I am, as Miss Scatcherd said, slatternly. I seldom put and never keep things in order. I am careless. I forget rules. I read when I should learn my lessons. I have no method. And I sometimes say, like you, I cannot bear to be subjected to systematic arrangements. This is all very provoking to Miss Scatcherd, who is naturally neat, punctual, and particular." "'And cross, and cruel,' I added. But Helen Burns would not admit my addition. She kept silence. "'Is Miss Temple as severe to you as Miss Scatcherd?' At the utterance of Miss Temple's name a soft smile flitted over her grave face. Miss Temple is full of goodness. It pains her to be severe to any one, even the worst in the school. She sees my errors, and tells me of them gently, and if I do anything worthy of praise, she gives me my meed liberally. One strong proof of my wretchedly defective nature is, that even her expostulations, so mild, so rational, have not influence to cure me of my faults, and even her praise, though I value it most highly, cannot stimulate me to continued care and foresight." "'That is curious,' said I. "'It is so easy to be careful.' "'For you, I have no doubt it is. I observed you in your class this morning, and saw you were closely attentive. Your thoughts never seemed to wander while Miss Miller explained the lesson and questioned you. Now mine continually rove away. When I should be listening to Miss Scatcherd and collecting all she says with assiduity, often I lose the very sound of her voice. I fall into a sort of dream. 
Sometimes I think I am in Northumberland, and that the noises I hear round me are the bubbling of a little brook which runs through Deepton near our house. Then, when it comes to my turn to reply, I have to be awakened, and having heard nothing of what was read for listening to the visionary brook, I have no answer ready. Yet how well you replied this afternoon! It was mere chance. The subject on which we had been reading had interested me. This afternoon, instead of dreaming of Deepton, I was wondering how a man who wished to do right could act so unjustly and unwisely as Charles I sometimes did. And I thought what a pity it was that, with his integrity and conscientiousness, he could see no farther than the prerogatives of the crown, if he had but been able to look to a distance, and see how what they call the spirit of the age was tending. Still, I like Charles. I respect him. I pity him, poor murdered king. Yes, his enemies were the worst. They shed blood they had no right to shed. How dared they kill him! Helen was talking to herself now. She had forgotten I could not very well understand her, that I was ignorant, or nearly so, of the subject she discussed. I recalled her to my level. And when Miss Temple teaches you, do your thoughts wander then? No, certainly not often. Because Miss Temple has generally something to say which is newer than my own reflections, her language is singularly agreeable to me, and the information she communicates is often just what I wish to gain. Well, then, with Miss Temple you are good. Yes, in a passive way. I make no effort. I follow as inclination guides me. There is no merit in such goodness. A great deal. You are good to those who are good to you. It is all I ever desire to be. If people were always kind and obedient to those who are cruel and unjust, the wicked people would have it all their own way. They would never feel afraid, and so they would never alter, but would grow worse and worse. When we are struck out without a reason, we should strike back again very hard. I am sure we should, so hard as to teach the person who struck us never to do it again. You will change your mind, I hope, when you grow older. As yet you are but a little untaught girl. But I feel this, Helen. I must dislike those who, whatever I do to please them, persist in disliking me. I must resist those who punish me unjustly. It is as natural as that I should love those who show me affection, or submit to punishment when I feel it is deserved. Heathens and savage tribes hold that doctrine, but Christians and civilized nations disown it. How? I don't understand. It is not violence that best overcomes hate, nor vengeance that most certainly heals injury. What, then? Read the New Testament, and observe what Christ says, and how He acts. Make His word your rule, and His conduct your example. What does He say? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and despitefully use you. Then I should love Mrs. Reed, which I cannot do. I should bless her son John, which is impossible." In her turn, Helen Burns asked me to explain, and I proceeded forthwith to pour out in my own way the tale of my sufferings and resentments. Bitter and truculent when excited, I spoke as I felt, without reserve or softening. Helen heard me patiently to the end. I expected she would then make a remark, but she said nothing. "'Well,' I asked impatiently, "'is not Mrs. Reed a hard-hearted, bad woman?' "'She has been unkind to you, no doubt. Because, you see, she dislikes your cast of character, as Miss Scatcherd does mine. But how minutely you remember all she has done and said to you! What a singularly deep impression her injustice seems to have made on your heart! No ill-usage so brands its record on my feelings. Would you not be happier if you tried to forget her severity, together with the passionate emotions it excited? Life appears to me too short to be sent in nursing animosity or registering wrongs. We are, and must be, one and all, burdened with faults in this world. But the time will soon come, when, I trust, we shall put them off in putting off our corruptible bodies, when debasement and sin will fall from us with this cumbrous frame of flesh and only the spark of the spirit will remain. The impalpable principle of light and thought, pure as when it left the Creator to inspire the creature, whence it came it will return, perhaps again to be communicated to some being higher than man, perhaps to pass through gradations of glory, from the pale human soul to brighten to the seraph. 
surely it will never, on the contrary, be suffered to degenerate from man to fiend. No, I cannot believe that. I hold another creed, which no one ever taught me, and which I seldom mention, but in which I delight, and to which I cling. For it extends hope to all, it makes eternity a rest, a mighty home, not a terror and an abyss. Besides, with this creed, I can so clearly distinguish between the criminal and his crime. I can so sincerely forgive the first, while I abhor the last. With this creed, revenge never worries my heart. Degradation never too deeply disgusts me. Injustice never crushes me too low. I live in calm, looking to the end." Helen's head, always drooping, sank a little lower as she finished this sentence. I saw by her look she wished no longer to talk to me, but rather to converse with her own thoughts. She was not allowed much time for meditation. A monitor, a great, rough girl, presently came up, exclaiming in a strong Cumberland accent, "'Helen Burns, if you don't go and put your drawer in order, and fold up your work this minute, I'll tell Miss Scattered to come and look at it!' Helen sighed as her reverie fled, and getting up, obeyed the monitor without reply, as without delay. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Jane Eyre This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 7. My first quarter at Lowood seemed an age, and not the golden age either. It comprised an irksome struggle with difficulties in habituating myself to new rules and unwonted tasks. The fear of failure in these points harassed me worse than the physical hardships of my lot though these were no trifles. During January, February, and part of March, the deep snows, and after their melting the almost impassable roads, prevented our stirring beyond the garden walls, except to go to church. But within these limits we had to pass an hour every day in the open air. Our clothing was insufficient to protect us from the severe cold. We had no boots, the snow got into our shoes and melted there. Our ungloved hands became numbed and covered with chilblains, as were our feet. I remember well the distracting irritation I endured from this cause every evening, when my feet inflamed, and the torture of thrusting the swelled, raw, and stiff toes into my shoes in the morning. Then the scanty supply of food was distressing. With the keen appetites of growing children, we had scarcely sufficient to keep alive a delicate invalid. From this deficiency of nourishment resulted an abuse, which pressed hardly on the younger pupils. Whenever the famished great girls had an opportunity, they would coax or menace the little ones out of their portion. Many a time I have shared between two claimants the precious morsel of brown bread distributed at tea-time, and after relinquishing to a third half the contents of my mug of coffee, I have swallowed the remainder with an accompaniment of secret tears, forced from me by the exigency of hunger. Sundays were dreary days in that wintry season. We had to walk two miles to Brocklebridge Church, where our patron officiated. We set out cold, we arrived at church colder, during the morning service we became almost paralysed. It was too far to return to dinner, and an allowance of cold meat and bread, in the same penurious proportion observed in our ordinary meals, was served round between the services. At the close of the afternoon service we returned by an exposed and hilly road, where the bitter winter wind, blowing over a range of snowy summits to the north, almost flayed the skin from our faces. I can remember Miss Temple, walking lightly and rapidly along our drooping line, her plaid cloak, which the frosty wind fluttered, gathered close about her, and encouraging us, by precept and example, to keep up our spirits and march forward, as she said, like stalwart soldiers. The other teachers, poor things, were generally themselves too much dejected to attempt the task of cheering others. How we longed for the light and heat of a blazing fire when we got back! 
But to the little ones at least this was denied. Each hearth in the schoolroom was immediately surrounded by a double row of great girls, and behind them the younger children crouched in groups, wrapping their starved arms in their pinafores. A little solace came at tea-time in the shape of a double ration of bread, a whole instead of a half slice, with the delicious addition of a thin scrape of butter. It was the hebdomadal treat to which we all looked forward from Sabbath to Sabbath. I generally contrived to reserve a moiety of this bounteous repast for myself, but the remainder I was invariably obliged to part with. The Sunday evening was spent in repeating by heart the church catechism, and the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of St. Matthew, and in listening to a long sermon read by Miss Miller, whose irrepressible yawns attested her weariness. A frequent interlude of these performances was the enactment of the part of Eutychus by some half-dozen of little girls, who, overpowered with sleep, would fall down, if not out of the third loft, yet off the fourth form, and be taken up half-dead. The remedy was to thrust them forward into the centre of the schoolroom, and oblige them to stand there till the sermon was finished. Sometimes their feet failed them, and they sank together in a heap. They were then propped up with the monitor's high stools. I have not yet alluded to the visits of Mr. Brocklehurst, and, indeed, that gentleman was from home during the great part of the first month after my arrival, perhaps prolonging his stay with his friend the Archdeacon. His absence was a relief to me. I need not say that I had my own reasons for dreading his coming. But come he did at last. One afternoon, I had then been three weeks at Lowood, as I was sitting with a slate in my hand, puzzling over a sum in long division, my eyes, raised in abstraction to the window, caught sight of a figure just passing. I recognised almost instinctively that gaunt outline, and when, two minutes after, all the school, teachers included, rose en masse, it was not necessary for me to look up in order to ascertain whose entrance they thus greeted. A long stride measured the schoolroom, and presently beside Miss Temple, who had herself risen, stood the same black column which had frowned on me so ominously from the hearthrug of Gateshead. I now glanced sideways at this piece of architecture. Yes, I was right. It was Mr. Brocklehurst, buttoned up in a surtout, and looking longer, narrower, and more rigid than ever. I had my own reasons for being dismayed at this apparition. Too well I remembered the perfidious hints given by Mrs. Reed about my disposition, etc. The promise pledged by Mr. Brocklehurst to apprise Miss Temple and the teachers of my vicious nature. All along I had been dreading the fulfilment of this promise. I had been looking out daily for the coming man, whose information respecting my past life and conversation was to brand me as a bad child for ever. Now there he was. He stood at Miss Temple's side. He was speaking low in her ear. I did not doubt he was making disclosures of my villainy, and I watched her eye with painful anxiety, expecting every moment to see its dark orb turn on me a glance of repugnance and contempt. I listened, too, and as I happened to be seated quite at the top of the room, I caught most of what he said. Its import relieved me from immediate apprehension. I suppose, Miss Temple, the thread I bought at Lowton will do. It struck me that it would be just of the quality for the calico chemises, and I sorted the needles to match. You may tell Miss Smith that I forgot to make a memorandum of the darning needles, but she shall have some papers sent in next week, and she is not, on any account, to give out more than one at a time to each pupil. If they have more, they are apt to be careless and lose them." and, oh, ma'am, I wish the woollen stockings were better looked to. When I was here last, I went into the kitchen garden and examined the clothes drying on the line. There was a quantity of black hose in a very bad state of repair. From the size of the holes in them, I was sure they had not been well mended from time to time." He paused. "'Your directions shall be attended to, sir,' said Miss Temple. "'And, ma'am,' he continued, the laundress tells me some of the girls have two clean tuckers in the week. It is too much. The rules limit them to one." I think I can explain that circumstance, sir. Agnes and Catherine Johnston were invited to take tea with some friends at Lowton last Thursday, and I gave them leave to put on clean tuckers for the occasion." Mr. Brocklehurst nodded. "'Well, 
For once it may pass, but please not to let the circumstance occur too often. And there is another thing which surprised me. I find in settling accounts with the housekeeper that a lunch, consisting of bread and cheese, has twice been served out to the girls during the past fortnight. How is this? I looked over the regulations, and I find no such meal as lunch mentioned. Who introduced this innovation, and by what authority?" "'I must be responsible for the circumstance, sir,' replied Miss Temple. The breakfast was so ill-prepared that the pupils could not possibly eat it, and I dared not allow them to remain fasting till dinner-time. "'Madam, allow me an instant. You are aware that my plan in bringing up these girls is not to accustom them to habits of luxury and indulgence, but to render them hardy, patient, self-denying. Should any little accidental disappointment of the appetite occur, such as the spoiling of a meal, the under or the over-dressing of a dish, the incident ought not to be neutralized by replacing with something more delicate the comfort lost, thus pampering the body, and obviating the aim of this institution. It ought to be improved to the spiritual edification of the pupils, by encouraging them to evince fortitude under temporary privation. A brief address on those occasions would not be mistimed, wherein a judicious instructor would take the opportunity of referring to the sufferings of the primitive Christians, to the torments of martyrs, to the exhortations of our blessed Lord Himself, calling upon His disciples to take up their cross and follow Him, to His warnings that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, to His divine consolations. If ye suffer hunger or thirst for my sake, happy are ye. O oh, madam, when you put bread and cheese instead of burnt porridge into these children's mouths, you may indeed feed their vile bodies, but you little think how you starve their immortal souls." Mr. Brocklehurst again paused, perhaps overcome by his feelings. Miss Temple had looked down when he first began to speak to her. But she now gazed straight before her, and her face, naturally pale as marble, appeared to be assuming also the coldness and fixity of that material, especially her mouth, closed as if it would have required a sculptor's chisel to open it, and her brow settled gradually into petrified severity. Meantime Mr. Brocklehurst, standing on the hearth with his hands behind his back, majestically surveyed the whole school. Suddenly his eye gave a blink, as if it had met something that either dazzled or shocked its pupil. Turning, he said in more rapid accents than he had hitherto used, "'Miss Temple! Miss Temple! What, what is that girl with curled hair? Red hair, ma'am, curled, curled all over!' And extending his cane, he pointed to the awful object, his hand shaking as he did so. "'It is Julia Seven replied Miss Temple, very quietly. "'Julia Seven, ma'am! And why has she, or any other, curled hair? Why, in defiance of every precept and principle of this house, does she conform to the world so openly, here, in an evangelical charitable establishment, as to wear her hair one mass of curls?' "'Julia's hair curls naturally,' returned Miss Temple, still more quietly. "'Naturally!' Yes, but we are not to conform to nature. I wish these girls to be the children of grace. And why that abundance? I have again and again intimated that I desire the hair to be arranged closely, modestly, plainly. Miss Temple, that girl's hair must be cut off entirely. I will send a barber to-morrow. And I see others who have far too much of the excrescence. That tall girl, tell her to turn round. Tell all the first form to rise up and direct their faces to the wall." Miss Temple passed her handkerchief over her lips, as if to smooth away the involuntary smile that curled them. She gave the order, however, and when the first class could take in what was required of them, they obeyed. Leaning a little back on my bench, I could see the looks and grimaces with which they commented on this manoeuvre. It was a pity Mr. Brocklehurst could not see them too. He would perhaps have felt that, Whatever he might do with the outside of the cup and platter, the inside was further beyond his interference than he imagined. He scrutinized the reverse of these living medals some five minutes, then pronounced sentence. These words fell like the knell of doom. 
all those top-knots must be cut off." Miss Temple seemed to remonstrate. "'Madam,' he pursued, "'I have a master to serve whose kingdom is not of this world. My mission is to mortify in these girls the lusts of the flesh, to teach them to clothe themselves with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair and costly apparel. And each of the young persons before us has a string of hair twisted in plates, which vanity itself might have woven. These, I repeat, must be cut off. Think of the time wasted of—" Mr. Brocklehurst was here interrupted. Three other visitors, ladies, now entered the room. They ought to have come a little sooner to have heard his lecture on dress, for they were splendidly attired in velvet, silk, and furs. The two younger of the trio, fine girls of sixteen and seventeen, had grey beaver hats, then in fashion, shaded with ostrich plumes, and from under the brim of this graceful head-dress fell a profusion of light tresses, elaborately curled. The elder lady was enveloped in a costly velvet shawl, trimmed with ermine, and she wore a false front of French curls. These ladies were deferentially received by Miss Temple, as Mrs. and the Misses Brocklehurst, and conducted to seats of honour at the top of the room. It seems they had come in the carriage with their reverend relative, and had been conducting a rummaging scrutiny of the rooms upstairs, while he transacted business with the housekeeper, questioned the laundress, and lectured the superintendent. They now proceeded to address divers remarks and reproofs to Miss Smith, who was charged with the care of the linen and inspection of the dormitories. But I had no time to listen to what they said. Other matters called off and enchanted my attention. Hitherto, while gathering up the discourse of Mr. Brocklehurst and Miss Temple, I had not at the same time neglected precautions to secure my personal safety, which I thought would be effected if I could only elude observation. To this end I had sat well back on the form, and while seeming to be busy with my sum, had held my slate in such a manner as to conceal my face. I might have escaped notice had not my treacherous slate somehow happened to slip from my hand, and falling with an obtrusive crash, directly drawn every eye upon me. I knew it was all over now, and as I stooped to pick up the two fragments of slate, I rallied my forces for the worst. It came. "'A careless girl!' said Mr. Brocklehurst, and immediately after, "'It is the new pupil, I perceive.' And before I could draw breath, I must not forget, I have a word to say respecting her." Then aloud, how loud it seemed to me! "'Let the child who broke her slate come forward.' Of my own accord I could not have stirred. I was paralysed. But the two great girls who sit on each side of me, set me on my legs and pushed me towards the dread judge. And then Miss Temple gently assisted me to his very feet, and I caught her whispered counsel. "'Don't be afraid, Jane. I saw it was an accident. You shall not be punished." The kind whisper went to my heart like a dagger. "'Another minute, and she will despise me for a hypocrite,' thought I. And an impulse of fury against Reed, Brocklehurst, and company bounded in my pulses at the conviction. I was no Helen Burns. "'Fetch that stool,' said Mr. Brocklehurst, pointing to a very high one from which a monitor had just risen. It was brought. Place the child upon it." And I was placed there, by whom I don't know. I was in no condition to note particulars. I was only aware that they had hoisted me up to the height of Mr. Brocklehurst's nose, that he was within a yard of me, and that a spread of shot orange and purple silk pelisses, and a cloud of silvery plumage extended and waved below me. Mr. Brocklehurst hemmed. "'Ladies,' said he, turning to his family, "'Miss Temple, teachers and children, you all see this girl." Of course they did, for I felt their eyes directed like burning glasses against my scorched skin. "'You see she is yet young. You observe she possesses the ordinary form of childhood. God has graciously given her the shape that He has given to all of us. No signal deformity points her out as a marked character. Who would think that the evil one had already found a servant and agent in her? Yet such, I grieve to say, is the case." A pause, in which I began to steady the palsy of my nerves, and to feel that the Rubicon was passed, and that the trial no longer to be shirked must be firmly sustained. "'My dear children,' 
pursued the black marble clergyman with pathos. "'This is a sad, a melancholy occasion, for it becomes my duty to warn you that this girl, who might be one of God's own lambs, is a little castaway, not a member of the true flock, but evidently an interloper and an alien. You must be on your guard against her. You must shun her example. If necessary, avoid her company, exclude her from your sports, and shut her out from your converse. Teachers, you must watch her. Keep your eyes on her movements, weigh well her words, scrutinize her actions, punish her body to save her soul, if indeed such salvation be possible. For, my tongue falters while I tell it, this girl, this child, the native of a Christian land, worse than many a little heathen who says its prayers to Brahma and kneels before Juggernaut, this girl is a liar. Now came a pause of ten minutes, during which I, by this time in perfect possession of my wits, observed all the female Brocklehursts produce their pocket-handkerchiefs, and apply them to their optics, while the elderly lady swayed herself to and fro, and the two younger ones whispered, "'How shocking!' Mr. Brocklehurst resumed. "'This I learned from her benefactress from the pious and charitable lady who adopted her in her orphan state, reared her as her own daughter, and whose kindness, whose generosity the unhappy girl repaid by an ingratitude so bad, so dreadful, that at last her excellent patroness was obliged to separate her from her own young ones, fearful lest her vicious example should contaminate their purity. She has sent her here to be healed even as the Jews of old sent their disease to the troubled pool of Bethesda. And teachers, superintendent, I beg of you not to allow the waters to stagnate round her." With this sublime conclusion, Mr. Brocklehurst adjusted the top button of his surtout, muttered something to his family, who rose, bowed to Miss Temple, and then all of the great people sailed in state from the room. Turning at the door, my judge said, "'Let her stand half an hour longer on that stool, and let no one speak to her during the remainder of the day.' There was I, then, mounted aloft, I, who had said I could not bear the shame of standing on my natural feet in the middle of the room, was now exposed to general view on a pedestal of infamy. What my sensations were, no language can describe, but just as they all rose, stifling my breath and constricting my throat, a girl came up and passed me. In passing, she lifted her eyes. What a strange light inspired them! What an extraordinary sensation that ray sent through me! How the new feeling bore me up! It was as if a martyr, a hero, had passed a slave or victim, and imparted strength in the transit. I mastered the rising hysteria, lifted up my head, and took a firm stand on the stool. Helen Burns asked some slight question about her work of Miss Smith, was chidden for the triviality of the inquiry, returned to her place, and smiled at me again as she went by. What a smile! I remember it now, and I know that it was the effluence of fine intellect, of true courage. It lit up her marked lineaments, her thin face, her sunken grey eye, like a reflection from the aspect of an angel. Yet at that moment Helen Burns wore on her arm the untidy badge. Scarcely an hour ago I had heard her condemned by Miss Scatcherd to a dinner of bread and water on the morrow, because she had blotted an exercise in copying it out. Such is the imperfect nature of man. Such spots are there on the disk of the clearest planet, and eyes like Miss Scatcherd's can only see those minute defects, and are blind to the full brightness of the orb. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Jane Eyre」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Eight. Ere the half hour ended, five o'clock struck. School was dismissed, and all were gone into the refectory to tea. 
I now ventured to descend. It was deep dusk. I retired into a corner, and sat down on the floor. The spell by which I had been so far supported began to dissolve. Reaction took place, and soon so overwhelming was the grief that seized me, I sank prostrate with my face to the ground. Now I wept. Helen Burns was not here. Nothing sustained me. Left to myself, I abandoned myself, and my tears watered the boards. I had meant to be so good, and to do so much at Lowood, to make so many friends, to earn respect and win affection. Already I had made visible progress. That very morning I had reached the head of my class. Miss Miller had praised me warmly, Miss Temple had smiled approbation. She had promised to teach me drawing, and to let me learn French, if I continued to make similar improvement two months longer. And then I was well received by my fellow pupils, treated as an equal by those of my own age, and not molested by any. Now, here I lay again, crushed and trodden on, and could I ever rise more? Never, I thought, and ardently I wished to die. While sobbing out this wish in broken accents, some one approached. I started up. Again Helen Burns was near me. The fading fires just showed her coming up the long, vacant room. She brought my coffee and bread. "'Come, eat something,' she said. But I put both away from me, feeling as if a drop or a crumb would have choked me in my present condition. Helen regarded me, probably with surprise. I could not now abate my agitation, though I tried hard. I continued to weep aloud. She sat down on the ground near me, embraced her knees with her arms, and rested her head upon them. In that attitude she remained silent as an Indian. I was the first who spoke. "'Helen, why do you stay with a girl whom everybody believes to be a liar?' "'Everybody, Jane. Why, there are only eighty people who have heard you called so, and the world contains hundreds of millions. But what have I to do with millions? The eighty I know despise me. Jane, you are mistaken. Probably not one in the school either despises or dislikes you. Many, I am sure, pity you much. How can they pity me after what Mr. Brocklehurst has said? Mr. Brocklehurst is not a god nor is he even a great and admired man. He is little liked here. He never took steps to make himself liked. Had he treated you as an especial favourite, you would have found enemies, declared or covert, all round you. As it is, the greater number would offer you sympathy if they dared. Teachers and pupils may look coldly on you for a day or two, but friendly feelings are concealed in their hearts, and if you persevere in doing well, these feelings will ere long appear so much the more evidently for their temporary suppression. Besides, Jane—' She paused. "'Well, Helen,' said I, putting my hand into hers. She chafed my fingers gently to warm them, and went on. "'If all the world hated you, and believed you wicked, while your own conscience approved you, and absolved you from guilt, you would not be without friends?' No. I know I should think well of myself, but that is not enough. If others don't love me, I would rather die than live. I cannot bear to be solitary and hated, Helen. Look here, to gain some real affection from you, or Miss Temple, or any other whom I truly love, I would willingly submit to have the bone of my arm broken, or to let a bull toss me, or to stand behind a kicking horse, and let it dash its hoof at my chest. Hush, Jane! You think too much of the love of human beings. You are too impulsive, too vehement. The sovereign hand that created your frame and put life into it, has provided you with other resources than your feeble self, or than creatures feeble as you. Besides this earth, and besides the race of men, there is an invisible world and a kingdom of spirits. That world is round us, for it is everywhere. And those spirits watch us, for they are commissioned to guard us. And if we were dying in pain and shame, if scorn smote us on all sides, and hatred crushed us, angels see our tortures, recognise our innocence. If innocent we be, as I know you are of this charge, which Mr. Brocklehurst has weakly and pompously repeated at second hand from Mrs. Reed, 
for I read a sincere nature in your ardent eyes and on your clear front. And God waits only the separation of spirit from flesh to crown us with a full reward. Why, then, should we ever sink overwhelmed with distress, when life is so soon over, and death is so certain an entrance to happiness, to glory? I was silent. Helen had calmed me. But in the tranquillity she imparted there was an alloy of inexpressible sadness. I felt the impression of woe as she spoke, but I could not tell whence it came. And when, having done speaking, she breathed a little fast, and coughed a short cough, I momentarily forgot my own sorrows to yield to a vague concern for her. Resting my head on Helen's shoulder, I put my arms round her waist. She drew me to her, and we reposed in silence. We had not sat long thus, when another person came in. Some heavy clouds, swept from the sky by a rising wind, had left the moon bare, and her light, streaming in through a window near, shone full both on us and on the approaching figure, which we at once recognised as Miss Temple. "'I came on purpose to find you, Jane Eyre,' said she. "'I want you in my room, and as Helen Burns is with you, she may come too.' We went, following the superintendent's guidance. We had to thread some intricate passages, and mount a staircase before we reached her apartment. It contained a good fire, and looked cheerful. Miss Temple told Helen Burns to be seated in a low armchair on one side of the hearth, and herself taking another, she called me to her side. "'Is it all over?' she asked, looking down at my face. "'Have you cried your grief away?' I'm afraid I never shall do that. Why? Because I have been wrongly accused, and you, Mum, and everybody else, will now think me wicked. We shall think you what you prove yourself to be, my child. Continue to act as a good girl, and you will satisfy us. Shall I, Miss Temple? You will, said she, passing her arm round me. And now tell me, who was the lady whom Mr. Brocklehurst called your benefactress? Mrs. Reed, my uncle's wife. My uncle is dead, and he left me to her care. Did she not then adopt you of her own accord? No, mum. She was sorry to have to do it, but my uncle, as I have often heard the servant say, got it a promise before he died that she would always keep me. Well, now, Jane, you know, or at least I will tell you, that when a criminal is accused, he is always allowed to speak in his own defence. You have been charged with falsehood. Defend yourself to me as well as you can. Say whatever your memory suggests is true, but add nothing, and exaggerate nothing." I resolved, in the depth of my heart, that I would be most moderate, most correct, and having a few minutes in order to arrange coherently what I had to say. I told her all the story of my sad childhood. Exhausted by emotion, my language was more subdued than it generally was when it developed that sad theme, and mindful of Helen's warnings against the indulgence of resentment, I infused into the narrative far less of gall and wormwood than ordinary. Thus restrained and simplified, it sounded more credible. I felt as I went on that Miss Temple fully believed me. In the course of the tale I had mentioned Mr. Lloyd as having come to see me after the fit, I never forgot the, to me, frightful episode of the Red Room, in detailing which my excitement was sure in some degree to break bounds, for nothing could soften in my reflection the spasm of agony which clutched my heart when Mrs. Reed spurned my wild supplication for pardon, and locked me a second time in the dark and haunted chamber. I had finished. Miss Temple regarded me a few minutes in silence. She then said, "'I know something of Mr. Lloyd. I shall write to him. If his reply agrees with your statement, you shall be publicly cleared from every imputation. To me, Jane, you are clear now.' She kissed me, and still keeping me at her side, where I was well contented to stand, for I derived a child's pleasure from the contemplation of her face, her dress her one or two ornaments, her white forehead, her clustered and shining curls and beaming dark eyes. She proceeded to address Helen Burns. "'How are you to-night, Helen? Have you coughed much to-day?' "'Not quite so much, I think, ma'am.' "'And the pain in your chest?' "'It is a little better.' Miss Temple got up, took her hand, and examined her pulse. 
Then she returned to her own seat. As she resumed it, I heard her sigh low. She was pensive a few minutes. Then rousing herself, she said cheerfully, "'But you two are my visitors to-night. I must treat you as such.' She rang her bell. "'Barbara,' she said to the servant who answered it, "'I have not yet had tea. Bring the tray and place cups for these two young ladies.' And a tray was soon brought. How pretty, to my eyes, did the china cups and bright teapot look, placed on the little round table near the fire! How fragrant was the steam of the beverage, and the scent of the toast! Of which, however, I, to my dismay, for I was beginning to be hungry, discerned only a very small portion. Miss Temple discerned it too. "'Barbara,' said she, "'can you not bring a little more bread and butter? There is not enough for three. Barbara went out. She returned soon. "'Madam, Mrs. Arden says she has sent up the usual quantity.' Mrs. Harden, be it observed, was the housekeeper, a woman after Mr. Brocklehurst's own heart, made up of equal parts of whalebone and iron. "'Oh, very well,' returned Miss Temple. "'We must make it do, Barbara, I suppose.' As the girl withdrew, she added, smiling, "'Fortunately, I have it in my power to supply deficiencies for this once.' Having invited Helen and me to approach the table, and placed before each of us a cup of tea with one delicious but thin morsel of toast, she got up, unlocked a drawer, and taking from it a parcel wrapped in paper, disclosed presently to our eyes a good-sized seed-cake. "'I meant to give each of you some of this to take with you,' said she, "'but as there is so little toast, you must have it now.' And she proceeded to cut slices with a generous hand. We feasted that evening as on nectar and ambrosia, and not the least delight of the entertainment was the smile of gratification with which our hostess regarded us, as we satisfied our famished appetites on the delicate fare she liberally supplied. Tea over, and the tray removed, she again summoned us to the fire. We sat one on each side of her, and now a conversation followed between her and Helen, which it was indeed a privilege to be admitted to hear. Miss Temple had always something of serenity in her air, of state in her mien, of refined propriety in her language, which precluded deviation into the ardent, the excited, the eager, something which chastened the pleasure of those who looked on her and listened to her, by a controlling sense of awe, and such was my feeling now. But as to Helen Burns, I was struck with wonder. The refreshing meal, the brilliant fire, the presence and kindness of her beloved instructress, or perhaps more than all these, something in her own unique mind, had roused her powers within her. They woke, they kindled. First they glowed in the bright tint of her cheek, which till this hour I had never seen but pale and bloodless. Then they shone in the liquid lustre of her eyes, which had suddenly acquired a beauty more singular than that of Miss Temple's, a beauty neither of fine colour, nor long eyelash, nor pencilled brow, but of meaning of movement, of radiance. Then her soul sat on her lips, and language flowed, from what source I cannot tell. Has a girl of fourteen a heart large enough, vigorous enough, to hold the swelling spring of pure, full, fervid eloquence? Such was the characteristic of Helen's discourse, on that, to me, memorable evening. Her spirit seemed hastening to live within a very brief span, as much as many live during a protracted existence. They conversed of things I had never heard of, of nations and times past, of countries far away, of secrets of nature discovered or guessed at. They spoke of books. How many they had read! What stores of knowledge they possessed! Then they seemed so familiar with French names and French authors, but my amazement reached its climax when Miss Temple asked Helen if she sometimes snatched a moment to recall the Latin her father had taught her, and taking a book from a shelf, bade her read and construe a page of Virgil. And Helen obeyed, my organ of veneration expanding at every sounding line. She had scarcely finished ere the bell announced bedtime. No delay could be admitted. Miss Temple embraced us both, saying as she drew us to her heart, God bless you, my children." Helen, she held a little longer than me. She let her go more reluctantly. It was Helen her eye followed to the door. 
It was for her she a second time breathed a sad sigh. For her she wiped a tear from her cheek. On reaching the bedroom, we heard the voice of Miss Scatcherd. She was examining drawers. She had just pulled out Helen Burns, and when we entered, Helen was greeted with a sharp reprimand, and told that to-morrow she should have half a dozen of untidily folded articles pinned to her shoulder. "'My things were indeed in shameful disorder,' murmured Helen to me in a low voice. "'I intended to have arranged them, but I forgot.' Next morning Miss Scatcherd wrote in conspicuous characters on a piece of pasteboard the word SLATTEN, and bound it like a phylactery around Helen's large, mild, intelligent, and benign-looking forehead. She wore it till evening, patient, unresentful, regarding it as deserved punishment. The moment Miss Scatcherd withdrew after afternoon school, I ran to Helen, tore it off, and thrust it into the fire the fury of which she was incapable had been burning in my soul all day, and tears, hot and large, had continually been scalding my cheek, for the spectacle of her sad resignation gave me an intolerable pain at the heart. About a week subsequently to the incidents above narrated, Miss Temple, who had written to Mr. Lloyd, received his answer. It appeared that what he said went to corroborate my account. Miss Temple, having assembled the whole school, announced that inquiry had been made into the charges alleged against Jane Eyre, and that she was most happy to be able to pronounce her completely cleared from every imputation. The teachers then shook hands with me and kissed me, and a murmur of pleasure ran through the ranks of my companions. Thus relieved of a grievous load, I from that hour set to work afresh, resolved to pioneer my way through every difficulty. I toiled hard and my success was proportionate to my efforts. My memory, not naturally tenacious, improved with practice. Exercise sharpened my wits. In a few weeks I was promoted to a higher class. In less than two months I was allowed to commence French and drawing. I learned the first two tenses of the verb être, and sketched my first cottage, whose walls, by the by, outrivalled in slope those of the leaning tower of Pisa, on the same day. That night, on going to bed, I forgot to prepare in imagination the barmecide supper of hot roast potatoes, or white bread and new milk, with which I was wont to amuse my inward cravings. I feasted instead on the spectacle of ideal drawings which I saw in the dark, all the work of my own hands, freely pencilled houses and trees, picturesque rocks and ruins, kipe-like groups of cattle, sweet paintings of butterflies hovering over unblown roses, of birds picking at ripe cherries, of wrens' nests enclosing pearl-like eggs, wreathed about with young ivy sprays. I examined, too, in thought, the possibility of my ever being able to translate, currently, a certain little French story which Madame Pierrot had that day shown me, nor was that problem solved to my satisfaction ere I fell sweetly asleep. Well has Solomon said, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is, than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. I would not now have exchanged Lowood with all its privations, for Gateshead and its daily luxuries. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Nine But the privations, or rather the hardships of Lowood, lessened. Spring drew on. She was indeed already come. The frosts of winter had ceased, its snows were melted, its cutting winds ameliorated. My wretched feet, flayed and swollen to lameness by the sharp air of January, began to heal and subside under the gentler breathings of April. The nights and mornings no longer by their Canadian temperature froze the very blood in our veins. We could now endure the play-hour passed in the garden. Sometimes on a sunny day it began even to be pleasant and genial, and a greenness grew over those brown beds, 
which, freshening daily, suggested the thought that hope traversed them at night, and left each morning brighter traces of her steps. Flowers peeped out amongst the leaves, snowdrops, crocuses, purple auriculas, and golden-eyed pansies. On Thursday afternoons, half-holidays, we now took walks, and found still sweeter flowers opening by the wayside, under the hedges. I discovered, too, that a great pleasure, an enjoyment which the horizon only bounded, lay all outside the high and spike-guarded walls of our garden. This pleasure consisted in prospect of noble summits girdling a great hill-hollow, rich in verdure and shadow, in a bright beck, full of dark stones and sparkling eddies. How different had this scene looked when I viewed it laid out beneath the iron sky of winter, stiffened in frost, shrouded with snow! When mists as chill as death wandered to the impulse of east winds along those purple peaks, and rolled down Ing and Holm till they blended with the frozen fog of the beck. The beck itself was then a torrent, turban and curbless. It tore asunder the wood, and sent a raving sound through the air often thickened with wild rain or whirling sleet, and for the forest on its banks, that showed only ranks of skeletons. April advanced to May. A bright, serene May it was. Days of blue sky, placid sunshine, and soft western or southern gales filled up its duration. And now vegetation matured with vigour. Low wood shook loose its tresses, it became all green, all flowery. Its great elm, ash, and oak skeletons were restored to majestic life. Woodland plants sprang up profusely in its recesses. Unnumbered varieties of moss filled its hollows, and it made a strange ground sunshine out of the wealth of its wild primrose plants. I have seen their pale gold gleam in overshadowed spots, like scatterings of the sweetest lustre. All this I enjoyed often and fully, free, unwatched, and almost alone. For this unwonted liberty and pleasure there was a cause, to which it now becomes my task to advert. Have I not described a pleasant sight for a dwelling, when I speak of it as bosomed in hill and wood, and rising from the verge of a stream? Assuredly pleasant enough, but whether healthy or not is another question. That forest dell, where Lowood lay, was the cradle of fog, and fog-bred pestilence, which quickening with the quickening spring, crept into the orphan asylum, breathed typhus through its crowded schoolroom and dormitory, and ere May arrived, transformed the seminary into a hospital. Semi-starvation and neglected colds had predisposed most of the pupils to receive infection. Forty-five out of the eighty girls lay ill at one time. Classes were broken up, rules relaxed. The few who continued well were allowed almost unlimited license, because the medical attendant insisted on the necessity of frequent exercise to keep them in health, and had it been otherwise, no one had leisure to watch or restrain them. Miss Temple's whole attention was absorbed by the patients. She lived in the sick-room, never quitting it except to snatch a few hours' rest at night. The teachers were fully occupied with packing up and making other necessary preparations, for the departure of those girls who were fortunate enough to have friends and relations, able and willing to remove them from the seat of contagion. Many, already smitten, went home only to die. Some died at the school, and were buried quietly and quickly, the nature of the malady forbidding delay. While disease had thus become an inhabitant of Lowood, and death its frequent visitor, while there was gloom and fear within its walls, while its rooms and passages steamed with hospital smells, the drug and the pastille striving vainly to overcome the effluvia of mortality, that bright May shone unclouded over the bold hills and beautiful woodland out of doors. Its garden, too, glowed with flowers. Hollyhocks had sprung up tall as trees, lilies had opened, tulips and roses were in bloom, the borders of the little beds were gay with pink thrift and crimson double daisies, the sweetbriars gave out morning and evening their scent of spice and apples and these fragrant treasures were all useless for most of the inmates of Lowood, 
except to furnish now and then a handful of herbs and blossoms to put in a coffin. But I, and the rest who continued well, enjoyed fully the beauties of the scene and season. They let us ramble in the wood, like gypsies from morning till night. We did what we liked, went where we liked. We lived better, too. Mr. Brocklehurst and his family never came near Lowood now. Household matters were not scrutinised into. The cross housekeeper was gone, driven away by the fear of infection. Her successor, who had been matron at the Lowton dispensary, unused to the ways of her new abode, provided with comparative liberality. Besides, there were fewer to feed. The sick could eat little. Our breakfast basins were better filled. When there was no time to prepare a regular dinner, which happened often, she would give us a large piece of cold pie, or a thick slice of bread and cheese, and this we carried away with us to the wood, where we each chose the spot we liked best, and dined sumptuously. My favourite seat was a smooth and broad stone, rising white and dry from the very middle of the beck, and only to be got at by wading through the water, a feat I accomplished barefoot. The stone was just broad enough to accommodate, comfortably, another girl and me. At that time my chosen comrade, one Marianne Wilson, a shrewd, observant personage, whose society I took pleasure in, partly because she was witty and original, and partly because she had a manner which set me at my ease. Some years older than I, she knew more of the world, and could tell me many things I liked to hear. With her my curiosity found gratification. To my faults, also, she gave ample indulgence, never imposing curb or rein on anything I said. She had a turn for narrative, I for analysis. She liked to inform, I to question. So we got on swimmingly together, deriving much entertainment, if not much improvement, from our mutual intercourse. And where, meantime, was Helen Burns? Why did I not spend these sweet days of liberty with her? Had I forgotten her? Or was I so worthless as to have grown tired of her pure society? Surely the Marianne Wilson I have mentioned was inferior to my first acquaintance. She could only tell me amusing stories, and reciprocate any racy and pungent gossip I chose to indulge in. While, if I have spoken truth of Helen, she was qualified to give those who enjoyed the privilege of her converse a taste of far higher things. True, reader! And I knew and felt this. And though I am a defective being, with many faults and few redeeming points, yet I never tired of Helen Burns, nor ever ceased to cherish for her a sentiment of attachment, as strong, tender, and respectful as any that ever animated my heart. How could it be otherwise, when Helen, at all times and under all circumstances, evinced for me a quiet and faithful friendship, which ill-humour never soured, nor irritation never troubled? But Helen was ill at present. For some weeks she had been removed from my sight, to I knew not what room upstairs. She was not, I was told, in the hospital portion of the house with the fever patients, for her complaint was consumption, not typhus. And by consumption I, in my ignorance, understood something mild, which time and care would be sure to alleviate. I was confirmed in this idea by the fact of her once or twice coming downstairs on very warm sunny afternoons, and being taken by Miss Temple into the garden. But on these occasions I was not allowed to go and speak to her. I only saw her from the schoolroom window, and then not distinctly, for she was much wrapped up, and sat at a distance under the veranda. One evening, in the beginning of June, I had stayed out very late with Mary Ann in the wood. We had, as usual, separated ourselves from the others, and had wandered far, so far that we lost our way, and had to ask it at a lonely cottage, where a man and woman lived who looked after a herd of half-wild swine that fed on the mast in the wood. When we got back, it was after moonrise. A pony, which we knew to be the surgeon's, was standing at the garden door. Marianne remarked that she supposed some one must be very ill, as Mr. Bates had been sent for at that time of the evening. She went into the house. I stayed behind a few minutes to plant in my garden a handful of roots I had dug up in the forest, and which I feared would wither if I left them till the morning. This done, I lingered yet a little longer. The flowers smelt so sweet as the dew fell. It was such a pleasant evening. 
so serene, so warm. The still glowing west promised so fairly another fine day on the morrow. The moon rose with such majesty in the grave east. I was noting these things and enjoying them as a child might, when it entered my mind as it had never done before. How sad to be lying now on a sick-bed, and to be in danger of dying! This world is pleasant. It would be dreary to be called from it, and to have to go who knows where. And then my mind made its first earnest effort to comprehend what had been infused into it concerning heaven and hell, and for the first time it recoiled, baffled, and for the first time glancing behind on each side and before it, it saw all round an unfathomed gulf. It felt the one point where it stood, the present. All the rest was formless cloud and vacant depth, and it shuddered at the thought of tottering and plunging amid that chaos. While pondering this new idea, I heard the front door open. Mr. Bates came out, and with him was a nurse. After she had seen him mount his horse and depart, she was about to close the door, but I ran up to her. "'How is Helen Burns?' "'Very poorly,' was the answer. "'Is it her Mr. Bates has been to see?' Yes. And what does he say about her? He says she'll not be here long. This phrase, uttered in my hearing yesterday, would have only conveyed the notion that she was about to be removed to Northumberland to her own home. I should not have suspected that it meant she was dying. But I knew instantly now. It opened clear on my comprehension that Helen Burns was numbering her last days in this world, and that she was going to be taken to the region of spirits, if such region there were. I experienced a shock of horror, then a strong thrill of grief, then a desire, a necessity to see her, and I asked in what room she lay. "'She is in Miss Temple's room,' said the nurse. "'May I go up and speak to her?' Oh, no, child, it is not likely. And now it is time for you to come in. You'll catch the fever if you stop out when the dew is falling." The nurse closed the front door. I went in by the side entrance which led to the schoolroom. I was just in time. It was nine o'clock, and Miss Miller was calling the pupils to go to bed. It might be two hours later, probably near eleven, when I, not having been able to fall asleep, and deeming from the perfect silence of the dormitory that my companions were all wrapped in profound repose, rose softly, put on my frock over my nightdress, and without shoes crept from the apartment, and set off in quest of Miss Temple's room. It was quite at the other end of the house, but I knew my way, and the light of the unclouded summer moon, entering here and there at passage windows, enabled me to find it without difficulty. An odour of camphor and burnt vinegar warned me when I came near the fever-room, and I passed its door quickly, fearful lest the nurse who sat up all night should hear me. I dreaded being discovered and sent back, for I must see Helen, I must embrace her before she died, I must give her one last kiss, exchange with her one last word. Having descended a staircase, traversed a portion of the house below, and succeeded in opening and shutting without noise two doors, I reached another flight of steps. These I mounted, and then just opposite to me was Miss Temple's room. A light shone through the keyhole and from under the door. A profound stillness pervaded the vicinity. Coming near, I found the door slightly ajar, probably to admit some fresh air into the close abode of sickness. Indisposed to hesitate, and full of impatient impulses, soul and senses quivering with keen throes, I put it back and looked in. My eyes sought Helen, and feared to find death. Close by Miss Temple's bed, and half covered with its white curtains, there stood a little crib. I saw the outline of a form under the clothes, but the face was hid by the hangings. The nurse I had spoken to in the garden sat in an easy-chair asleep, an unsnuffed candle burnt dimly on the table. Miss Temple was not to be seen. I knew afterwards that she had been called to a delirious patient in the fever-room. I advanced, then paused by the crib's side. My hand was on the curtain, but I preferred speaking before I withdrew it. I still recoiled at the dread of seeing a corpse. "'Helen,' I whispered softly, "'are you awake?' She stirred herself, put back the curtain, and I saw her face, 
pale, wasted, but quite composed. She looked so little changed that my fear was instantly dissipated. "'Can it be you, Jane?' she asked, in her own gentle voice. "'Oh, I thought, she is not going to die. They are mistaken. She could not speak and look so calmly if she were.' I got under her crib and kissed her. Her forehead was cold, and her cheek both cold and thin, and so were her hand and wrist. But she smiled as of old. "'Why are you come here, Jane? It is past eleven o'clock. I heard it strike some minutes since.' I came to see you, Helen. I heard you were very ill, and I could not sleep till I had spoken to you. You came to bid me good-bye, then. You are just in time, probably. Are you going somewhere, Helen? Are you going home? Yes, to my long home, my last home. No, no, Helen! I stopped, distressed. While I tried to devour my tears, a fit of coughing seized Helen. It did not, however, wake the nurse. When it was over, she lay some minutes exhausted. Then she whispered, "'Jane, your little feet are bare. Lie down and cover yourself with my quilt.' I did so. She put her arm over me, and I nestled close to her. After a long silence, she resumed, still whispering, "'I am very happy, Jane. And when you hear that I am dead, you must be sure and not grieve. There is nothing to grieve about. We all must die one day, and the illness which is removing me is not painful. It is gentle and gradual. My mind is at rest. I leave no one to regret me much. I have only a father, and he is lately married and will not miss me. By dying young I shall escape great sufferings. I had not qualities or talents to make my way very well in the world. I should have been continually at fault. But where are you going to, Helen? Can you see? Do you know?" I believe. I have faith. I am going to God. Where is God? What is God? My Maker and yours, who will never destroy what He created. I rely implicitly on His power, and confide wholly in His goodness. I count the hours till that eventful one arrives which shall restore me to Him, reveal Him to me. You are sure, then, Helen, that there is such a place as heaven, and that our souls can get to it when we die? I am sure there is a future state. I believe God is good. I can resign my immortal part to Him without any misgiving. God is my Father. God is my friend. I love Him. I believe He loves me. And shall I see you again, Helen, when I die? You will come to the same region of happiness be received by the same mighty universal parent, no doubt, dear Jane." Again I questioned, but this time only in thought. Where is that region? Does it exist? And I clasped my arms closer round Helen. She seemed dearer to me than ever. I felt as if I could not let her go. I lay with my face hidden on her neck. Presently she said, in the sweetest tone, "'How comfortable I am!' The last fit of coughing has tired me a little. I feel as if I could sleep. But don't leave me, Jane. I like to have you near me. I'll stay with you. Dear Helen, no one shall take me away. Are you warm, darling? Yes. Good night, Jane. Good night, Helen. She kissed me, and I her, and we both soon slumbered. When I awoke it was day. An unusual movement roused me. I looked up. I was in somebody's arms. The nurse held me. She was carrying me through the passage back to the dormitory. I was not reprimanded for leaving my bed. People had something else to think about. No explanation was afforded then to my many questions. But a day or two afterwards I learned that Miss Temple, on returning to her own room at dawn, had found me laid in the little crib, my face against Helen Byrne's shoulder my arms round her neck. I was asleep, and Helen was dead. Her grave is in Brocklebridge churchyard. For fifteen years after her death it was only covered by a grassy mound, but now a grey marble tablet marks the spot, inscribed with her name, and the word, Resurgam.
End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Ten. Hitherto I have recorded in detail the events of my insignificant existence. To the first ten years of my life I have given almost as many chapters. But this is not to be a regular autobiography. I am only bound to invoke memory where I know her responses will possess some degree of interest. Therefore I now pass a space of eight years almost in silence. A few lines only are necessary to keep up the links of connection. When the typhus fever had fulfilled its mission of devastation at Lowood, it gradually disappeared from thence, but not till its virulence and the number of its victims had drawn public attention on the school. Inquiry was made into the origin of the scourge, and by degrees various facts came out which excited public indignation in a high degree. The unhealthy nature of the sight, the quantity and quality of the children's food, the brackish, fetid water used in its preparation, the pupils' wretched clothing and accommodations, all these things were discovered, and the discovery produced a result mortifying to Mr. Brocklehurst, but beneficial to the institution. Several wealthy and benevolent individuals in the county subscribed largely for the erection of a more convenient building in a better situation. New regulations were made, improvements in diet and clothing introduced, the funds of the school were entrusted to the management of a committee. Mr. Brocklehurst, who, from his wealth and family connections, could not be overlooked, still retained the post of treasurer, but he was aided in the discharge of his duties by gentlemen of rather more enlarged and sympathising minds. His office of inspector, too, was shared by those who knew how to combine reason with strictness, comfort with economy, compassion with uprightness. The school, thus improved, became in time a truly useful and noble institution. I remained an inmate of its walls, after its regeneration, for eight years, six as a pupil and two as a teacher, and in both capacities I bear my testimony to its value and importance. During those eight years my life was uniform, but not unhappy, because it was not inactive. I had the means of an excellent education placed within my reach, a fondness for some of my studies, and a desire to excel in all together with a great delight in pleasing my teachers, especially such as I loved, urged me on. I availed myself fully of the advantages offered me. In time I rose to be the first girl of the first class. Then I was invested with the office of teacher, which I discharged with zeal for two years. But at the end of that time I altered. Miss Temple, through all changes, had thus far continued superintendent of the seminary. To her instruction I owed the best part of my acquirements. Her friendship and society had been my continual solace. She had stood me in the stead of mother, governess, and latterly companion. At this period she married, removed with her husband, a clergyman, an excellent man, almost worthy of such a wife, to a distant county, and consequently was lost to me. From the day she left I was no longer the same. With her was gone every settled feeling, every association that had made Lowood in some degree a home to me. I had imbibed from her something of her nature and much of her habits. More harmonious thoughts, what seemed better regulated feelings, had become the inmates of my mind. I had given an allegiance to duty and order. I was quiet. I believed I was content. To the eyes of others, usually even to my own, I appeared a disciplined and subdued character. But destiny, in the shape of the Reverend Mr. Nasmith, came between me and Miss Temple. I saw her in her travelling dress step into a post-chaise, shortly after the marriage ceremony. I watched the chaise mount the hill and disappear beyond its brow, and then retired to my own room, 
and there spent in solitude the greatest part of the half-holiday granted in honour of the occasion. I walked about the chamber most of the time. I imagined myself only to be regretting my loss, and thinking how to repair it. But when my reflections were concluded, and I looked up and found that the afternoon was gone, and evening far advanced, another discovery dawned on me, namely, that in the interval I had undergone a transforming process, that my mind had put off all it had borrowed of Miss Temple, or rather that she had taken with her the serene atmosphere I had been breathing in her vicinity, and that now I was left in my natural element, and beginning to feel the stirring of old emotions. It did not seem as if a prop were withdrawn, but rather as if a motive were gone. It was not the power to be tranquil which had failed me, but the reason for tranquillity was no more. My world had for some years been in Lowood, my experience had been of its rules and systems. Now I remembered that the real world was wide, and that a varied field of hopes and fears, of sensations and excitements, awaited those who had courage to go forth into its expanse, to seek real knowledge of life amidst its perils. I went to my window, opened it, and looked out. There were the two wings of the building, there was the garden, there were the skirts of Lowood, there was the hilly horizon. My eye passed all other objects to rest on those most remote, the blue peaks. It was those I longed to surmount. All within their boundary of rock and heath seemed prison-ground, exile limits. I traced the white road, winding round the base of one mountain, and vanishing in a gorge between two. How I longed to follow it farther! I recalled the time when I had travelled that very road in a coach. I remembered descending that hill at twilight. An age seemed to have elapsed since the day which brought me first to Lowood, and I had never quitted it since. My vacations had been all spent at school. Mrs. Reed had never sent for me to Gateshead. Neither she nor any of her family had ever been to visit me. I had had no communication by letter or message with the outer world. School rules, school duties, school habits and notions, and voices and faces and phrases and costumes, and preferences and antipathies, such was what I knew of existence. And now I felt that it was not enough. I tired of the routine of eight years in one afternoon. I desired liberty. For liberty I gasped, for liberty I uttered a prayer. It seemed scattered on the wind, then faintly blowing. I abandoned it and framed a humbler supplication. For change, stimulus. That petition, too, seemed swept off into vague space. Then, cried I, half desperate, grant me at least a new servitude. Here a bell ringing the hour of supper called me downstairs. I was not free to resume the interrupted chain of my reflections till bedtime. Even then a teacher who occupied the same room with me kept me from the subject to which I longed to recur, by a prolonged effusion of small talk. How I wished sleep would silence her! It seemed as if, could I but go back to the idea which had last entered my mind as I stood by the window, some inventive suggestion would rise for my relief. Miss Grice snored at last. She was a heavy Welsh woman, and till now her habitual nasal strains had never been regarded by me in any other light than as a nuisance. To-night I hailed the first deep notes with satisfaction. I was debarrassed of interruption. My half-effaced thought instantly revived. A new servitude. There is something in that, I soliloquized. Mentally, be it understood, I did not talk aloud. I know there is, because it does not sound too sweet. It is not like such words as liberty, excitement, enjoyment. Delightful sounds, truly, but no more than sounds for me, and so hollow and fleeting that it is mere waste of time to listen to them. But servitude! That must be matter of fact. Any one may serve. I have served here eight years. Now all I want is to serve elsewhere. Can I not get so much of my own will? Is not the thing feasible? Yes. Yes, the end is not so difficult, if I had only a brain active enough to ferret out the means of attaining it." I sat up in bed by way of arousing this said brain. It was a chilly night. I covered my shoulders with a shawl, 
and then I proceeded to think again with all my might. What do I want? A new place, in a new house, amongst new faces, under new circumstances. I want this, because it is of no use wanting anything better. How do people do to get a new place? They apply to friends, I suppose. I have no friends. There are many others who have no friends, who must look about for themselves and be their own helpers. And what is their resource? I could not tell. Nothing answered me. I then ordered my brain to find a response, and quickly. It worked and worked faster. I felt the pulses throb in my head and temples, but for nearly an hour it worked in chaos, and no result came of its efforts. Feverish with vain labour, I got up and took a turn in the room, undrew the curtains, noted a star or two, shivered with cold, and again crept to bed. A kind fairy in my absence had surely dropped the required suggestion on my pillow, for as I lay down it came quietly and naturally to my mind. Those who want situations advertise. You must advertise in the blank share herald. How? I know nothing about advertising." Replies rose smooth and prompt now. You must enclose the advertisement and the money to pay for it under a cover directed to the editor of the Herald. You must put it, the first opportunity you have, into the post at Lowton. Answers must be addressed to J. E. at the post office there. You can go and inquire in about a week after you send your letter, if any are come, and act accordingly. This scheme I went over twice, thrice. It was then digested in my mind. I had it in a clear, practical form. I felt satisfied, and fell asleep. With earliest day I was up. I had my advertisement written, enclosed, and directed before the bell rang to rouse the school. It ran thus. A young lady accustomed to tuition, had I not been a teacher two years, is desirous of meeting with a situation in a private family where the children are under fourteen. I thought that as I was barely eighteen, it would not do to undertake the guidance of pupils nearer my own age. She is qualified to teach the usual branches of a good English education, together with French, drawing, and music. In those days, reader, this now narrow catalogue of accomplishments would have been held tolerably comprehensive. Address, J. E., Post Office, Lowton, Blankshire. This document remained locked in my drawer all day. After tea, I asked leave of the new superintendent to go to Lowton, in order to perform some small commissions for myself and one or two of my fellow-teachers. Permission was readily granted. I went. It was a walk of two miles, and the evening was wet, but the days were still long. I visited a shop or two, slipped the letter into the post-office, and came back through heavy rain, with streaming garments, but with a relieved heart. The succeeding week seemed long. It came to an end at last, however, like all sublunary things, and once more, towards the close of a pleasant autumn day, I found myself afoot on the road to Lowton. A picturesque track it was, by the way, lying along the side of the beck and through the sweetest curves of the dale. But that day I thought more of the letters, that might or might not be awaiting me at the little burg where I was bound, than of the charms of lee and water. My ostensible errand on this occasion was to get measured for a pair of shoes, so I discharged that business first, and when it was done, I stepped across the clean and quiet little street from the shoemaker's to the post-office. It was kept by an old dame, who wore horn spectacles on her nose, and black mittens on her hands. "'Are there any letters for J. E.?' I asked. She peered at me over her spectacles, and then she opened a drawer and fumbled among its contents for a long time so long that my hopes began to falter. At last, having held a document before her glasses for nearly five minutes, she presented it across the counter, accompanying the act by another inquisitive and mistrustful glance. It was for J. E. "'Is there only one?' I demanded. "'There are no more,' said she. And I put it in my pocket, and turned my face homeward. I could not open it then. Rules obliged me to be back by eight, and it was already half-past seven. Various duties awaited me on my arrival. I had to sit with the girls during their hour of study. Then it was my turn to read prayers, to see them to bed. 
Afterwards I supped with the other teachers. Even when we finally retired for the night, the inevitable Miss Grice was still my companion. We had only a short end of a candle in our candlestick, and I dreaded lest she should talk till it was all burnt out. Fortunately, however, the heavy supper she had eaten produced a soporific effect. She was already snoring before I had finished undressing. There still remained an inch of candle. I now took out my letter. The seal was an initial F. I broke it. The contents were brief. If J. E., who advertised in the Blankshire Herald of last Thursday, possesses the acquirements mentioned, and if she is in a position to give satisfactory references as to character and competency, a situation can be offered her where there is but one pupil, a little girl, under ten years of age, and where the salary is thirty pounds per annum. J. E. is requested to send references, name, address, and all particulars to the direction, Mrs. Fairfax, Thornfield, near Milcote, Blankshire. I examined the document long. The writing was old-fashioned, and rather uncertain, like that of an elderly lady. This circumstance was satisfactory. A private fear had haunted me, that in thus acting for myself and by my own guidance, I ran the risk of getting into some scrape, and above all things, I wished the result of my endeavours to be respectable, proper, en règle. I now felt that an elderly lady was no bad ingredient in the business I had on hand. Mrs. Fairfax. I saw her in a black gown and widow's cap. Frigid, perhaps, but not uncivil. A model of elderly English respectability. Thornfield. That, doubtless, was the name of her house. A neat, orderly spot, I was sure, though I failed in my efforts to conceive a correct plan of the premises. Milcott, Blankshire. I brushed up my recollections of the map of England. Yes, I saw it, both the shire and the town. Blankshire was seventy miles nearer London than the remote county where I now resided. That was a recommendation to me. I longed to go where there was life and movement. Milcott was a large manufacturing town on the banks of the A. A busy place enough, doubtless, so much the better. It would be a complete change, at least. Not that my fancy was much captivated by the idea of long chimneys and clouds of smoke. But, I argued, Thornfield will probably be a good way from the town. Here the socket of the candle dropped, and the wick went out. Next day new steps were to be taken. My plans could no longer be confined to my own breast. I must impart them in order to achieve their success. Having sought and obtained an audience of the superintendent during the noontide recreation, I told her I had a prospect of getting a new situation, where the salary would be double what I now received for at Lowood I only got fifteen pounds per annum, and requested she would break the matter for me to Mr. Brocklehurst, or some of the committee, and ascertain whether they would permit me to mention them as references. She obligingly consented to act as mediatrix in the matter. The next day she laid the affair before Mr. Brocklehurst, who said that Mrs. Reed must be written to, as she was my natural guardian. A note was accordingly addressed to the lady, who returned for answer that, I might do as I pleased. She had long relinquished all interference in my affairs. This note went the round of the committee, and at last, after what appeared to me most tedious delay, formal leave was given me to better my condition if I could, and an assurance added, that as I had always conducted myself well, both as teacher and pupil at Lowood, a testimonial of character and capacity, signed by the inspectors of that institution, should forthwith be furnished me. This testimonial I accordingly received in about a month, forwarded a copy of it to Mrs. Fairfax, got that lady's reply, stating that she was satisfied, and fixing that day fortnight as the period for my assuming the post of governess in her house. I now busied myself in preparations. The fortnight passed rapidly. I had not a very large wardrobe, though it was adequate to my wants, and the last day sufficed to pack my trunk the same I had brought with me eight years ago from Gateshead. The box was corded, the card nailed on. In half an hour the carrier was to call for it to take it to Lowton, whither I myself was to repair at an early hour the next morning to meet the coach. I had brushed my black stuff travelling dress, prepared my bonnet, gloves, and muff, sought in all my drawers to see that no article was left behind, and now, having nothing more to do, I sat down and tried to rest. I could not. Though I had been on foot all day, I could not now repose an instant. I was much too excited. 
A phase of my life was closing to-night, a new one opening to-morrow. Impossible to slumber in the interval, I must watch feverishly while the change was being accomplished. "'Miss,' said a servant, who met me in the lobby, where I was wandering like a troubled spirit, "'a person below wishes to see you.' "'The carrier, no doubt,' I thought, and ran downstairs without inquiry. I was passing the back parlour or teacher's sitting-room, the door of which was half open, to go to the kitchen, when some one ran out. "'It's her, I'm sure! I could have told her anywhere!' cried the individual who stopped my progress and took my hand. I looked. I saw a woman attired like a well-dressed servant, matronly, yet still young, very good-looking, with black hair and eyes, and lively complexion. "'Well, who is it?' she asked, in a voice, and with a smile I half recognised. "'You've not quite forgotten me, I think, Miss Jane.' In another second I was embracing and kissing her rapturously. "'Bessie! Bessie! Bessie!' That was all I said, whereat she half laughed, half cried, and we both went into the parlour. By the fire stood a little fellow of three years old, in plaid frock and trousers. "'That is my little boy,' said Bessie directly. Then you are married, Bessie?" "'Yes, nearly five years since, to Robert Levin, the coachman, and I have a little girl besides Bobby there, that I have christened Jane." "'And you don't live at Gateshead?' "'I live at the lodge. The old porter has left.' "'Well, and how do they all get on? Tell me everything about them, Bessie. But sit down first, and Bobby, come and sit at my knee, will you?' But Bobby preferred sidling over to his mother. "'You're not grown so very tall, Miss Jane, nor so very stout,' continued Mrs. Levin. "'I dare say they've not kept you too well at school. Miss Reed is the head and shoulders taller than you are, and Miss Georgiana would make two of you in breadth.' "'Georgiana is handsome, I suppose, Bessie?' "'Very. She went up to London last winter with her mamma, and there everybody admired her, and a young lord fell in love with her, but his relations were against the match, and what do you think?' He and Miss Georgiana made it up to run away, but they were found out and stopped. It was Miss Reed that found them out. I believe she was envious, and now she and her sister lead a cat and dog life together. They are always quarrelling." "'Well, and what of John Reed?' "'Oh, he is not doing so well as his mamma could wish. He went to college, and he got—plucked, I think they call it. And then his uncles wanted him to be a barrister and study the law. But he is such a dissipated young man, they will never make much of him, I think. What does he look like? He is very tall. Some people call him a fine-looking young man, but he has such thick lips. And Mrs. Reed? Mrs. looks stout and well enough in the face, but I think she is not quite easy in her mind. Mr. John's conduct does not please her. He spends a great deal of money. Did she send you here, Bessie? No, indeed. But I have long wanted to see you, and when I heard that there had been a letter from you, and that you were going to another part of the country, I thought I'd just set off and get a look at you before you were quite out of my reach." "'I am afraid you are disappointed in me, Bessie." I said this laughing. I perceived that Bessie's glance, though it expressed regard, did in no shape denote admiration. "'No, Miss Jane, not exactly. You are genteel enough, you look like a lady, and it is as much as I ever expected of you. You were no beauty as a child." I smiled at Bessie's frank answer. I felt that it was correct, but I confess I was not quite indifferent to its import. At eighteen most people wish to please, and the conviction that they have not an exterior likely to second that desire brings anything but gratification. "'I dare say you are clever, though,' continued Bessie, by way of solace. "'What can you do? Can you play on the piano?' "'A little. There was one in the room. Bessie went and opened it, and then asked me to sit down and give her a tune. I played a waltz or two, and she was charmed. "'The Miss Reeds could not play as well,' said she exultingly. "'I always said you would surpass them in learning. And can you draw?' And that is one of my paintings over the chimney-piece. It was a landscape in water-colours, of which I had made a present to the superintendent, in acknowledgment of her obliging mediation with the committee on my behalf, and which she had framed and glazed. "'Well, that is beautiful, Miss Jane! It is as fine a picture as any Miss Reed's drawing-master could paint, let alone the young ladies themselves, who could not come near it. 
And have you learnt French? Yes, Bessie, I can both read it and speak it. And you can work on muslin and canvas? I can. Oh, you are quite a lady, Miss Jane. I knew you would be. You will get on whether your relations notice you or not. There was something I wanted to ask you. Have you ever heard anything from your father's kinsfolk, the heirs? Never in my life. Well, you know Missus always said they were poor and quite despicable. And they may be poor, but I believe they are as much gentry as the Reeds are. For one day, nearly seven years ago, a Mr. Eyre came to Gateshead and wanted to see you. Missus said you were at school fifty miles off. He seemed so much disappointed, for he could not stay. He was going on a voyage to a foreign country, and the ship was to sail from London in a day or two. He looked quite a gentleman, and I believe he was your father's brother." "'What foreign country was he going to, Bessie?" "'And Ireland, thousands of miles off, where they make wine. The butler did tell me." "'Madeira,' I suggested. "'Yes, that is it, the very word.' So he went. Yes, he did not stay many minutes in the house. Missus was very high with him. She called him afterwards a sneaking tradesman. My Robert believes he was a wine merchant." "'Very likely,' I returned. Or perhaps clerk or agent to a wine merchant." Bessie and I conversed about old times an hour longer, and then she was obliged to leave me. I saw her again for a few minutes the next morning at Lowton, while I was waiting for the coach. We parted finally at the door of the Brocklehurst Arms there. Each went her separate way. She set off for the brow of Lowood Fell to meet the conveyance which was to take her back to Gateshead. I mounted the vehicle which was to bear me to new duties and a new life in the unknown environs of Milkett. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Eleven A new chapter in a novel is something like a new scene in a play. And when I draw up the curtain this time, reader, you must fancy you see a room in the George Inn at Milcote, with such large figured papering on the walls as inn-rooms have, such a carpet, such furniture, such ornaments on the mantelpiece, such prints, including a portrait of George the Third, and another of the Prince of Wales, and a representation of the death of Wolfe. All this is visible to you by the light of an oil-lamp hanging from the ceiling, and by that of an excellent fire, near which I sit in my cloak and bonnet. My muff and umbrella lie on the table, and I am warming away the numbness and chill contracted by sixteen hours' exposure to the rawness of an October day. I left Lowton at four o'clock a.m., and the Milkett town clock is now just striking eight. Reader, though I look comfortably accommodated, I am not very tranquil in my mind. I thought when the coach stopped here, there would be some one to meet me. I looked anxiously round as I descended the wooden steps, the boots placed for my convenience, expecting to hear my name pronounced, and to see some description of carriage waiting to convey me to Thornfield. Nothing of the sort was visible, and when I asked a waiter if any one had been to inquire after a Miss Eyre, I was answered in the negative, so I had no resource but to request to be shown into a private room. And here I am waiting, while all sorts of doubts and fears are troubling my thoughts. It is a very strange sensation to inexperienced youth to feel itself quite alone in the world, cut adrift from every connection, uncertain whether the port to which it is bound can be reached, and prevented by many impediments from returning to that it has quitted. The charm of adventure sweetens that sensation, the glow of pride warms it, but then the throb of fear disturbs it. And fear with me became predominant when half an hour elapsed and I was still alone. I bethought myself to ring the bell. Is there a place in this neighbourhood called Thornfield? I asked of the waiter who answered the summons. Thornfield? I don't know, mum. I'll inquire at the bar. He vanished, but reappeared instantly. Is your name Eyre, miss? Yes. 
person here waiting for you." I jumped up, took my muff and umbrella, and hastened into the inn passage. A man was standing by the open door, and in the lamplit street I dimly saw a one-horse conveyance. "'This will be your luggage, I suppose?' said the man rather abruptly when he saw me, pointing to my trunk in the passage. Yes. He hoisted it on to the vehicle, which was a sort of car, and then I got in. Before he shut me up, I asked him how far it was to Thornfield. A matter of six miles. How long shall we be before we get there? Happen an hour and a half. He fastened the car door, climbed to his own seat outside, and set off. Our progress was leisurely, and gave me ample time to reflect. I was content to be at length so near the end of my journey, and as I leaned back in the comfortable, though not elegant, conveyance, I meditated much at my ease. I suppose, thought I, judging from the plainness of the servant and carriage, Mrs. Fairfax is not a very dashing person. So much the better. I never lived amongst fine people but once, and I was very miserable with them. I wonder if she lives alone except this little girl. If so, and if she is in any degree amiable, I shall be surely able to get on with her. I will do my best. It is a pity that doing one's best does not always answer. At Lowood, indeed, I took that resolution, kept it, and succeeded in pleasing. But with Mrs. Reed, I remember my best was always spurned with scorn. I pray God Mrs. Fairfax may not turn out a second Mrs. Reed. But if she does, I am not bound to stay with her. Let the worst come to the worst, I can advertise again. How far are we now on our road, I wonder?" I let down the window and looked out. Milcote was behind us. Judging by the number of its lights, it seemed a place of considerable magnitude, much larger than Lowton. We were now, as far as I could see, on a sort of common, but there were houses scattered all over the district. I felt we were in a different region to Lowood more populous, less picturesque, more stirring, less romantic. The roads were heavy, the night misty. My conductor let his horse walk all the way, and the hour and a half extended, I verily believe, to two hours. At last he turned in his seat and said, "'You're known so far for Thornfield now.' Again I looked out. We were passing a church. I saw its low, broad tower against the sky, and its bell was tolling a quarter. I saw a narrow galaxy of lights, too, on a hillside, marking a village or hamlet. About ten minutes after, the driver got down and opened a pair of gates. We passed through, and they clashed two behind us. We now slowly ascended a drive, and came upon the long front of a house. Candlelight gleamed from one curtained bow window. All the rest were dark. The car stopped at the front door. It was opened by a maid-servant. I alighted and went in. "'Will you walk this way, ma'am?' said the girl, and I followed her across a square hall with high doors all round. She ushered me into a room whose double illumination of fire and candle at first dazzled me, contrasting as it did with the darkness to which my eyes had been for two hours inured. When I could see, however, a cosy and agreeable picture presented itself to my view. A snug, small room, a round table by a cheerful fire, an armchair high-backed and old-fashioned, wherein sat the neatest imaginable little elderly lady, in widow's cap, black silk gown, and snowy muslin apron, exactly like what I had fancied Mrs. Fairfax, only less stately and milder-looking. She was occupied in knitting. A large cat sat demurely at her feet. Nothing, in short, was wanting to complete the beau ideal of domestic comfort. A more reassuring introduction for a new governess could scarcely be conceived. There was no grandeur to overwhelm, no stateliness to embarrass. And then, as I entered, the old lady got up and promptly and kindly came forward to meet me. "'How do you do, my dear? I'm afraid you have had a tedious ride. John drives so slowly. You must be cold. Come to the fire.' "'Mrs. Fairfax, I suppose,' said I. "'Yes, you are right. Do sit down.' She conducted me to her own chair, and then began to remove my shawl and untie my bonnet-strings. I begged she would not give herself so much trouble. "'Oh, it is no trouble. I dare say your own hands are almost numbed with cold. Leia, make a little hot negus and cut a sandwich or two. Here are the keys of the storeroom.' 
and she produced from her pocket a most housewifely bunch of keys, and delivered them to the servant. "'Now, then, draw nearer to the fire,' she continued. "'You've brought your luggage with you, haven't you, my dear?' "'Yes, ma'am. "'I'll see it carried into your room,' she said, and bustled out. "'She treats me like a visitor,' thought I. "'I little expected such a reception. "'I anticipated only coldness and stiffness. "'This is not like what I have heard of the treatment of governesses. "'But I must not exult too soon.' She returned, with her own hands cleared her knitting apparatus and a book or two from the table, to make room for the tray which Leah now brought, and then herself handed me the refreshments. I felt rather confused at being the object of more attention than I had ever before received, and that, too, shown by my employer and superior. But as she did not seem herself to consider she was doing anything out of her place, I thought it better to take her civilities quietly. "'Shall I have the pleasure of seeing Miss Fairfax to-night?' I asked, when I had partaken of what she offered me. "'What did you say, my dear? I am a little deaf,' returned the good lady, approaching her ear to my mouth. I repeated the question more distinctly. "'Miss Fairfax?' "'Oh, you mean Miss Varen. Varen is the name of your future pupil.' "'Indeed. Then she is not your daughter?' "'No. I have no family.' I should have followed up my first inquiry, by asking in what way Miss Barron's was connected with her, but I recollected it was not polite to ask too many questions. Besides, I was sure to hear in time. "'I am so glad,' she continued, as she sat down opposite to me, and took the cat on her knee. "'I am so glad you are come. It will be quite pleasant living here now with a companion. To be sure it is pleasant at any time, for Thornfield is a fine old hall rather neglected of late years, perhaps, but still it is a respectable place. Yet you know, in winter-time one feels dreary quite alone in the best quarters. I say alone. Leah is a nice girl, to be sure, and John and his wife are very decent people. But then you see they are only servants, and one can't converse with them on terms of equality. One must keep them at due distance, for fear of losing one's authority. I'm sure last winter— it was a very severe one, if you recollect, and when it did not snow, it rained and blew. Not a creature but the butcher and the postman came to the house from November till February. And I really got quite melancholy with sitting night after night alone. I had Leah in to read to me sometimes. But I don't think the poor girl liked the task much. She felt it confining. In spring and summer one got on better. Sunshine and long days make such a difference. And then, just at the commencement of this autumn, little Adela Varens came and her nurse. A child makes a house alive all at once, and now while you are here I shall be quite gay." My heart really warmed to the worthy lady as I heard her talk, and I drew my chair a little nearer to her, and expressed my sincere wish that she might find my company as agreeable as she anticipated. "'But I'll not keep you sitting up late to-night,' said she. It is on the stroke of twelve now, and you have been travelling all day. You must feel tired. If you have got your feet well warmed, I'll show you your bedroom. I've had the room next to mine prepared for you. It is only a small apartment, but I thought you would like it better than one of the large front chambers. To be sure, they have finer furniture, but they are so dreary and solitary. I never sleep in them myself." I thanked her for her considerate choice, and as I really felt fatigued with my long journey, expressed my readiness to retire. She took her candle, and I followed her from the room. First she went to see if the hall-door was fastened. Having taken the key from the lock, she led the way upstairs. The steps and banisters were of oak. The staircase window was high and latticed. Both it and the long gallery into which the bedroom doors opened looked as if they belonged to a church rather than a house. A very chill and vault-like air pervaded the stairs and gallery, suggesting cheerless ideas of space and solitude and I was glad, when finally ushered into my chamber, to find it of small dimensions, and furnished in ordinary modern style. When Mrs. Fairfax had bidden me a kind good-night, and I had fastened my door, gazed leisurely round, and in some measure effaced the eerie impression made by that wide hall, that dark and spacious staircase, and that long, cold gallery, by the livelier aspect of my little room, I remembered that— after a day of bodily fatigue and mental anxiety, I was now at last in safe haven. 
The impulse of gratitude swelled my heart, and I knelt down at the bedside, and offered up thanks where thanks were due, not forgetting ere I rose to implore aid on my further path, and the power of meriting the kindness which seemed so frankly offered me before it was earned. My couch had no thorns in it that night, my solitary room no fears. At once weary and content, I slept soon and soundly. When I awoke, it was broad day. The chamber looked such a bright little place to me as the sun shone in between the gay blue chintz window-curtains, showing papered walls and a carpeted floor, so unlike the bare planks and stained plaster of low wood, that my spirits rose at the view. Externals have a great effect on the young. I thought that a fairer era of life was beginning for me, one that was to have its flowers and pleasures as well as its thorns and toils. My faculties, roused by the change of scene, the new field offered to hope, seemed all astir. I cannot precisely define what they expected, but it was something pleasant. Not perhaps that day or that month, but at an indefinite future period. I rose, I dressed myself with care, obliged to be plain, for I had no article of attire that was not made with extreme simplicity. I was still by nature solicitous to be neat. It was not my habit to be disregardful of appearance, or careless of the impression I made. On the contrary, I ever wished to look as well as I could, and to please as much as my want of beauty would permit. I sometimes regretted that I was not handsomer. I sometimes wished to have rosy cheeks, a straight nose, and a small cherry mouth. I desired to be tall, stately, and finely developed in figure. I felt it a misfortune that I was so little, so pale, and had features so irregular and so marked. And why had I these aspirations and these regrets? It would be difficult to say. I could not then distinctly say it to myself. Yet I had a reason, and a logical, natural reason, too. However, when I had brushed my hair very smooth, and put on my black frock, which, Quaker-like as it was, at least had the merit of fitting to a nicety, and adjusted my clean white tucker, I thought that I should do respectably enough to appear before Mrs. Fairfax, and that my new pupil would not at least recoil from me with antipathy. Having opened my chamber window, and seen that I left all things straight and neat on the toilet-table, I ventured forth. Traversing the long and matted gallery, I descended the slippery steps of oak. Then I gained the hall. I halted there a minute. I looked at some pictures on the walls. One, I remember, represented a grim man in a cuirass, and one a lady with powdered hair and a pearl necklace. At a bronze lamp pendant from the ceiling, at a great clock whose case was of oak curiously carved, an ebon black with time and rubbing. Everything appeared very stately and imposing to me, but then I was so little accustomed to grandeur. The hall door, which was half of glass, stood open. I stepped over the threshold. It was a fine autumn morning. The early sun shone serenely on embrowned groves and still green fields. Advancing on to the lawn, I looked up and surveyed the front of the mansion. It was three stories high, of proportions not vast, though considerable, a gentleman's manor-house, not a nobleman's seat. Battlements round the top gave it a picturesque look. Its grey front stood out well from the background of a rookery, whose cawing tenants were now on the wing. They flew over the lawn and grounds to alight in a great meadow, from which these were separated by a sunk fence, and where an array of mighty old thorn-trees, strong, knotty, and broad as oaks, had once explained the etymology of the mansion's designation. Farther off were hills, not so lofty as those round Lowood, nor so craggy, nor so like barriers of separation from the living world, but yet quiet and lonely hills enough and seeming to embrace Thornfield with a seclusion I had not expected to find existent so near the stirring locality of Milkett. A little hamlet, whose roofs were blent with trees, straggled up the side of one of these hills. The church of the district stood nearer Thornfield. Its old tower-top looked over a knoll between the house and gates. I was yet enjoying the calm prospect and pleasant fresh air, yet listening with delight to the cawing of the rooks, yet surveying the wide hoary front of the hall, and thinking what a great place it was for one lonely little dame like Mrs. Fairfax to inhabit, when that lady appeared at the door. "'What, out already?' said she. "'I see you are an early riser.' I went up to her, and was received with an affable kiss and shake of the hand. 
"'How do you like Thornfield?' she asked. I told her I liked it very much. "'Yes,' she said, "'it is a pretty place. But I fear it will be getting out of order unless Mr. Rochester should take it into his head to come and reside here permanently, or at least visit it rather oftener. Great houses and fine grounds require the presence of the proprietor." "'Mr. Rochester,' I exclaimed, "'who is he?' "'The owner of Thornfield,' she responded quietly. "'Did you not know he was called Rochester?' "'Of course I did not. I had never heard of him before. But the old lady seemed to regard his existence as a universally understood fact, with which everybody must be acquainted by instinct. "'I thought,' I continued, "'Thornfield belonged to you.' "'To me! Bless you, child, what an idea! To me! I am only the housekeeper, the manager. To be sure, I am distantly related to the Rochesters by the mother's side, or at least my husband was. He was a clergyman, incumbent of Hay, that little village yonder on the hill, and that church near the gates was his. The present Mr. Rochester's mother was a Fairfax, and second cousin to my husband. But I never presume on the connection. In fact, it is nothing to me. I consider myself quite in the light of an ordinary housekeeper. My employer is always civil, and I expect nothing more." "'And the little girl? My pupil?' "'She is Mr. Rochester's ward. He commissioned me to find a governess for her. He intended to have her brought up in Blankshire, I believe. Here she comes, with her bonne, as she calls her nurse." The enigma, then, was explained. This affable and kind little widow was no great dame, but a dependent like myself. I did not like her the worse for that. On the contrary, I felt better pleased than ever. The equality between her and me was real, not the mere result of condescension on her part. So much the better. My position was all the freer. As I was meditating on this discovery, a little girl, followed by her attendant, came running up the lawn. I looked to my pupil, who did not at first appear to notice me. She was quite a child, perhaps seven or eight years old, slightly built, with a pale, small-featured face, and a redundancy of hair falling in curls to her waist. "'Good morning, Miss Adela,' said Mrs. Fairfax. Come and speak to the lady who is to teach you, and to make you a clever woman some day." She approached. "'C'est là ma gouvernante,' said she, pointing to me, and addressing her nurse, who answered, "'Mais oui, certainement.' "'Are they foreigners?' I inquired, amazed at hearing the French language. "'The nurse is a foreigner, and Adela was born on the continent, and I believe never left it until within six months ago. When she first came here she could speak no English. Now she can make shift to talk it a little. I don't understand her, she mixes it so with French, but you will make out her meaning very well, I dare say." Fortunately I had had the advantage of being taught French by a French lady, and as I had always made a point of conversing with Madame Pierrot as often as I could, and had, besides, during the last seven years, learnt a portion of French by heart daily applying myself to take pains with my accent, and imitating as closely as possible the pronunciation of my teacher, I had acquired a certain degree of readiness and correctness in the language, and was not likely to be much at a loss with Mademoiselle Adela. She came and shook hands with me when she heard that I was her governess, and as I led her into breakfast, I addressed some phrases to her in her own tongue. She replied briefly at first, but after we were seated at the table, and she had examined me some ten minutes with her large hazel eyes, she suddenly commenced chattering fluently. "'Ah!' cried she in French, "'you speak my language as well as Mr. Rochester does. I can talk to you as I can to him, and so can Sophie. She will be glad. Nobody here understands her. Madame Fairfax is all English. Sophie is my nurse. She came with me over the sea in a great ship with a chimney that smoked. How it did smoke! And I was sick, and so was Sophie, and so was Mr. Rochester. Mr. Rochester lay down on a sofa in a pretty room called the Salon, and Sophie and I had little beds in another place. I nearly fell out of mine. It was like a shelf. And Mademoiselle—what is your name? Air. Jane Air. Air? Bah! I cannot say it. 
Well, our ship stopped in the morning, before it was quite daylight, at a great city, a huge city, with very dark houses, and all smoky, not at all like the pretty clean town I came from. And Mr. Rochester carried me in his arms over a plank to the land, and Sophie came after, and we all got into a coach, which took us to a beautiful large house, larger than this, and finer, called an hotel. We stayed there nearly a week. I and Sophie used to walk every day in a great green place full of trees called the park, and there were many children there besides me, and a pond with beautiful birds in it that I fed with crumbs. Can you understand her when she runs on so fast? asked Mrs. Fairfax. I understood her very well, for I had been accustomed to the fluent tongue of Madame Pierrot. I wish, continued the good lady, you would ask her a question or two about her parents. I wonder if she remembers them." "'Adèle,' I inquired, "'with whom did you live when you were in that pretty clean town you spoke of?' "'I lived long ago with Mamma, but she is gone to the Holy Virgin. Mamma used to teach me to dance and sing and to say verses. A great many gentlemen and ladies came to see Mamma, and I used to dance before them or to sit on their knees and sing to them. I liked it. Shall I let you hear me sing now?" She had finished her breakfast, so I permitted her to give a specimen of her accomplishments. Descending from her chair, she came and placed herself on my knee. Then, folding her little hands demurely before her, shaking back her curls and lifting her eyes to the ceiling, she commenced singing a song from some opera. It was the strain of a forsaken lady, who, after bewailing the perfidy of her lover, calls pride to her aid, desires her attendant to deck her in her brightest jewels and richest robes, and resolves to meet the false one that night at a ball, and prove to him, by the gaiety of her demeanour, how little his desertion has affected her. The subject seems strangely chosen for an infant singer, but I suppose the point of the exhibition lay in hearing the notes of love and jealousy warbled with the lisp of childhood, and in very bad taste that point was, at least I thought so. Adèle sang the canzonet tunefully enough, and with the naïveté of her age. This achieved, she jumped from my knee, and said, "'Now, mademoiselle, I will repeat you some poetry.' Assuming an attitude, she began La Ligue des Rats, Fable de la Fontaine. She then declaimed the little piece with an attention to punctuation and emphasis, a flexibility of voice, and an appropriateness of gesture, very unusual indeed at her age, and which proved she had been very carefully trained. "'Was it your mamma who taught you that piece?' I asked. "'Yes, and she just used to say it in this way. "'Qu'avez-vous donc? Lui dit un de ses rats. Parlez!' She made me lift my hand, so, to remind me to raise my voice at the question. "'Now shall I dance for you?' "'No, that will do. But after your mamma went to the Holy Virgin, as you say, with whom did you live, then?' With Madame Frederic and her husband. She took care of me, but she is nothing related to me. I think she is poor, for she had not so fine a house as Mamma. I was not long there. Mr. Rochester asked me if I would like to go and live with him in England, and I said yes, for I knew Mr. Rochester before I knew Madame Frederic, and he was always kind to me, and gave me pretty dresses and toys. But you see, he has not kept his word, for he has brought me to England, and now he has gone back again himself, and I never see him. After breakfast, Adèle and I withdrew to the library, which room, it appears, Mr. Rochester had directed should be used as the schoolroom. Most of the books were locked up behind glass doors, but there was one bookcase left open, containing everything that could be needed in the way of elementary works, and several volumes of light literature, poetry, biography, travels, a few romances, etc. I suppose he had considered that these were all the governess would require for her private perusal, and indeed they contented me amply for the present. Compared with the scanty pickings I had now and then been able to glean at Lowood, they seemed to offer an abundant harvest of entertainment and information. In this room, too, there was a cabinet piano, quite new and of superior tone, also an easel for painting, and a pair of globes. I found my pupil sufficiently docile, though disinclined to apply. She had not been used to regular occupation of any kind. I felt it would be injudicious to confine her too much at first. So, when I had talked to her a great deal, and got her to learn a little, and when the morning had advanced to noon, I allowed her to return to her nurse. I then proposed to occupy myself till dinner-time in drawing some little sketches for her use. As I was going upstairs to fetch my portfolio and pencils, Mrs. Fairfax called to me. "'Your morning school hours are over now, I suppose?' 
said she. She was in a room the folding doors of which stood open. I went in when she addressed me. It was a large, stately apartment with purple chairs and curtains, a turkey carpet, walnut-panelled walls, one vast window rich in slanted glass, and a lofty ceiling nobly moulded. Mrs. Fairfax was dusting some vases of fine purple spa, which stood on a sideboard. "'What a beautiful room!' I exclaimed as I looked round, for I had never seen before any half so imposing. Yes, this is the dining-room. I have just opened the window to let in a little air and sunshine, for everything gets so damp in apartments that are seldom inhabited. The drawing-room yonder feels like a vault." She pointed to a wide arch corresponding to the window, and hung like it with Tyrian-dyed curtain, now looped up, mounting to it by two broad steps, and looking through. I thought I caught a glimpse of a fairy place, so bright to my novice eyes appeared the view beyond. Yet it was merely a very pretty drawing-room, and within it a boudoir, both spread with white carpets, on which seemed laid brilliant garlands of flowers, both sealed with snowy mouldings of white grapes and vine-leaves, beneath which glowed in rich contrast crimson couches and ottomans, while the ornaments on the pale Parian mantelpiece were of sparkling bohemian glass, ruby-red, and between the windows large mirrors repeated the general blending of snow and fire. "'In what order you keep these rooms, Mrs. Fairfax?' said I. "'No dust, no canvas coverings. Except that the air feels chilly, one would think they were inhabited daily.' "'Why, Miss Eyre, though Mr. Rochester's visits here are rare, they are always sudden and unexpected. And as I observed that it put him out to find everything swathed up, and to have a bustle of arrangement on his arrival, I thought it best to keep the rooms in readiness.' "'Is Mr. Rochester an exacting, fastidious sort of man?' Not particularly so, but he has a gentleman's tastes and habits, and he expects to have things managed in conformity to them. Do you like him? Is he generally liked? Oh, yes. The family have always been respected here. Almost all the land in this neighbourhood, as far as you can see, has belonged to the Rochester's time out of mind. Well, but leaving his land out of the question, do you like him? Is he liked for himself? I have no cause to do otherwise than like him and I believe he is considered a just and liberal landlord by his tenants. But he has never lived much amongst them." "'But he has no peculiarities. What, in short, is his character?' "'Oh! His character is unimpeachable, I suppose. He is rather peculiar, perhaps. He has travelled a great deal, and seen a great deal of the world, I should think. I dare say he is clever, but I never had much conversation with him." "'In what way is he peculiar?' I don't know. It is not easy to describe. Nothing striking. But you feel it when he speaks to you. You cannot be always sure whether he is in jest or earnest, whether he is pleased or the contrary. You don't thoroughly understand him, in short. At least I don't. But it is of no consequence. He is a very good master." This was all the account I got from Mrs. Fairfax of her employer and mine. There are people who seem to have no notion of sketching a character, or observing and describing salient points, either in persons or things. The good lady evidently belonged to this class. My queries puzzled, but did not draw her out. Mr. Rochester was Mr. Rochester in her eyes, a gentleman, a landed proprietor, nothing more. She inquired and searched no further, and evidently wondered at my wish to gain a more definite notion of his identity. When we left the dining-room, she proposed to show me over the rest of the house, and I followed her upstairs and downstairs, admiring as I went, for all was well arranged and handsome. The large front chambers I thought especially grand, and some of the third-story rooms, though dark and low, were interesting from their air of antiquity. The furniture once appropriated to the lower apartments had from time to time been removed here, as fashion changed and the imperfect light entering by their narrow casement showed bedsteads of a hundred years old, chests in oak or walnut, looking with their strange carvings of palm branches and cherubs' heads, like types of the Hebrew ark. Rows of venerable chairs, high-backed and narrow, stools still more antiquated, on whose cushioned tops were yet apparent traces of half-effaced embroideries, wrought by fingers that for two generations had been coffin-dust. All these relics gave to the third story of Thornfield Hall the aspect of a home of the past, a shrine of memory. I liked the hush, the gloom, the quaintness of these retreats in the day, 
but I by no means coveted a night's repose on one of those wide and heavy beds, shut in, some of them with doors of oak, shaded others with wrought old English hangings crusted with thick work, betraying effigies of strange flowers, and stranger birds, and strangest human beings, all which would have looked strange indeed by the pallid gleam of moonlight. "'Do the servants sleep in these rooms?' I asked. No, they occupy a range of smaller apartments to the back. No one ever sleeps here. One would almost say that, if there were a ghost at Thornfield Hall, this would be its haunt. So I think. You have no ghost, then? None that I ever heard of, returned Mrs. Fairfax, smiling. Nor any traditions of one? No legends or ghost stories? I believe not. And yet it is said the Rochesters have been rather a violent than a quiet race in their time. Perhaps, though, that's the reason they rest tranquilly in their graves now. Yes, after life's fitful fever they sleep well, I muttered. Where are you going now, Mrs. Fairfax? For she was moving away. On to the leads. Will you come and see the view from thence? I followed still up a very narrow staircase to the attics, and thence by a ladder and through a trap-door to the roof of the hall. I was now on a level with the crow colony, and could see into their nests. Leaning over the battlements and looking far down, I surveyed the grounds laid out like a map, the bright and velvet lawn closely girdling the grey base of the mansion, the field, wide as a park, dotted with its ancient timber, the wood, dun and sere, divided by a path visibly overgrown, greener with moss than the trees or with foliage the church at the gates, the road, the tranquil hills, all reposing in the autumn day's sun, the horizon bounded by a propitious sky, azure marbled with pearly white. No feature in the scene was extraordinary, but all was pleasing. When I turned from it and repassed the trap-door, I could scarcely see my way down the ladder. The attic seemed black as a vault compared with that arch of blue air to which I had been looking up, and to that sunlit scene of grove, pasture, and green hill, of which the hall was the centre, and over which I had been gazing with delight. Mrs. Fairfax stayed behind a moment to fasten the trap-door. I, by drift of groping, found the outlet from the attic, and proceeded to descend the narrow garret staircase. I lingered in the long passage to which this led, separating the front and back rooms of the third story, narrow, low, and dim, with only one little window at the far end, and looking with its two rows of small black doors all shut, like a corridor in some bluebeard's castle. While I paced softly on, the last sound I expected to hear in so still a region, a laugh, struck my ear. It was a curious laugh, distinct, formal, mirthless. I stopped. The sound ceased, only for an instant. It began again, louder. For at first, though distinct, it was very low. It passed off in a clamorous peal that seemed to wake an echo in every lonely chamber, though it originated but in one, and I could have pointed out the door from which the accents issued. "'Mrs. Fairfax,' I called out, for now I heard her descending the great stairs. "'Did you hear that loud laugh?' Who is it?" "'Some of the servants, very likely,' she answered. "'Perhaps Grace Poole?' "'Did you hear it?' I again inquired. "'Yes, plainly. I often hear her. She sews in one of these rooms. Sometimes Leah is with her. They are frequently noisy together.' The laugh was repeated in its low, syllabic tone, and terminated in an odd murmur. "'Grace!' exclaimed Mrs. Fairfax. I really did not expect any grace to answer, for though the laugh was as tragic, as preternatural a laugh as any I have heard, and but that it was high noon, and that no circumstance of ghostliness accompanied the curious cachination, but that neither scene nor season favoured fear, I should have been superstitiously afraid. However, the event showed me I was a fool for entertaining a sense even of surprise. The door nearest me opened, and a servant came out a woman of between thirty and forty, a set, square-made figure, red-haired and with a hard, plain face. Any apparition less romantic or less ghostly could scarcely be conceived. "'Too much noise, Grace,' said Mrs. Fairfax. "'Remember directions!' Grace curtsied silently, and went in. "'She is a person we have to sew and assist Leah in her housemaid's work,' continued the widow. 
not altogether unobjectionable in some points, but she does well enough. By the by, how have you got on with your new pupil this morning?" The conversation, thus turned on Adèle, continued till we reached the light and cheerful region below. Adèle came running to meet us in the hall, exclaiming, "'Mesdames, vous êtes servie!' adding, "'J'ai bien faim, moi!' We found dinner ready, and waiting for us in Mrs. Fairfax's room. End of chapter 11《was not belied on a longer acquaintance with the place and its inmates. Mrs. Fairfax turned out to be what she appeared, a placid-tempered, kind-natured woman, of competent education and average intelligence. My pupil was a lively child, who had been spoilt and indulged, and therefore was sometimes wayward, but as she was committed entirely to my care, and no injudicious interference from any quarter ever thwarted my plans for her improvement, she soon forgot her little freaks, and became obedient and teachable. She had no great talents, no marked traits of character, no peculiar development of feeling or taste which raised her one inch above the ordinary level of childhood, but neither had she any deficiency or vice which sunk her below it. She made reasonable progress, entertained for me a vivacious, though perhaps not very profound, affection and by her simplicity, gay prattle, and efforts to please, inspired me, in return, with a degree of attachment sufficient to make us both content in each other's society. This, par parenthèse, will be thought cool language by persons who entertain solemn doctrines about the angelic nature of children, and the duty of those charged with their education to conceive for them an idolatrous devotion but I am not writing to flatter parental egotism, to echo cant, or prop up humbug. I am merely telling the truth. I felt a conscientious solicitude for Adèle's welfare and progress, and a quiet liking for her little self, just as I cherished towards Mrs. Fairfax a thankfulness for her kindness, and a pleasure in her society proportionate to the tranquil regard she had for me, and the moderation of her mind and character. Anybody may blame me who likes, when I add further, that, now and then, when I took a walk by myself in the grounds, when I went down to the gates and looked through them along the road, or when, while Adèle played with her nurse, and Mrs. Fairfax made jellies in the store-room, I climbed the three staircases, raised the trap-door of the attic, and having reached the leads, looked out afar over sequestered field and hill and along dim sky-line that then I longed for a power of vision which might overpass that limit, which might reach the busy world, towns, regions full of life I had heard of but never seen, that then I desired more of practical experience than I possessed, more of intercourse with my kind, of acquaintance with variety of character, than was here within my reach. I valued what was good in Mrs. Fairfax, and what was good in Adèle but I believed in the existence of other and more vivid kinds of goodness, and what I believed in I wished to behold. Who blames me? Many, no doubt, and I shall be called discontented. I could not help it. The restlessness was in my nature. It agitated me to pain sometimes. Then my sole relief was to walk along the corridor of the third story, backwards and forwards, safe in the silence and solitude of the spot, and allow my mind's eye to dwell on whatever bright visions rose before it, and certainly they were many and glowing, to let my heart be heaved by the exultant movement, which, while it swelled it in trouble, expanded it with life, and best of all, to open my inward ear to a tale that was never ended, a tale my imagination created, and narrated continuously, quickened with all of incident, life, fire, feeling, that I desired and had not in my actual existence. 
It is in vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquillity. They must have action, and they will make it if they cannot find it. Millions are condemned to a stiller doom than mine, and millions are in silent revolt against their lot. Nobody knows how many rebellions, besides political rebellions, ferment in the masses of life which people earth. Women are supposed to be very calm, generally. But women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties, and a field for their efforts, as much as their brothers do. They suffer from too rigid a restraint, too absolute a stagnation, precisely as men would suffer. And it is narrow-minded in their more privileged fellow-creatures, to say that they ought to confine themselves to making puddings and knitting stockings, to playing on the piano and embroidering bags. It is thoughtless to condemn them, or laugh at them, if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary for their sex. When thus alone, I not unfrequently heard Grace Poole's laugh, the same peal, the same low, slow, ha, ha, which, when first heard, had thrilled me. I heard, too, her eccentric murmurs, stranger than her laugh. There were days when she was quite silent, but there were others when I could not account for the sounds she made. Sometimes I saw her. She would come out of her room with a basin, or a plate, or a tray in her hand, go down to the kitchen, and shortly return, generally—O oh, romantic reader, forgive me for telling the plain truth—bearing a pot of porter. Her appearance always acted as a damper to the curiosity raised by her oral oddities. Hard-featured and staid, she had no point to which interest could attach. I made some attempts to draw her into conversation, but she seemed a person of few words. A monosyllabic reply usually cut short every effort of that sort. The other members of the household, viz. John and his wife, Leah the housemaid, and Sophie the French nurse, were decent people, but in no respect remarkable. With Sophie I used to talk French, and sometimes I asked her questions about her native country, but she was not of a descriptive or narrative turn and generally gave such vapid and confused answers, as were calculated rather to check than encourage inquiry. October, November, December passed away. One afternoon in January, Mrs. Fairfax had begged a holiday for Adele, because she had a cold, and as Adele seconded the request with an ardour that reminded me how precious occasional holidays had been to me in my own childhood, I accorded it, deeming that I did well in showing pliability on the point. It was a fine, calm day, though very cold. I was tired of sitting still in the library, through a whole long morning. Mrs. Fairfax had just written a letter which was waiting to be posted, so I put on my bonnet and cloak, and volunteered to carry it to Hay. The distance, two miles, would be a pleasant winter afternoon walk. Having seen Adele comfortably seated in her little chair by Mrs. Fairfax's parlour fireside, and given her best wax doll, which I usually kept enveloped in a silver paper in a drawer, to play with, and a story-book for change of amusement, and having replied to her, Revenez bientôt, mon bon ami, ma chère mademoiselle Jeannette, with a kiss, I set out. The ground was hard, the air was still, my road was lonely. I walked fast till I got warm, and then I walked slowly to enjoy and analyse the species of pleasure brooding for me in the hour and situation. It was three o'clock. The church bell tolled as I passed under the belfry. The charm of the hour lay in its approaching dimness, in the low gliding and pale beaming sun. I was a mile from Thornfield, in a lane noted for wild roses in summer, for nuts and blackberries in autumn and even now possessing a few coral treasures and hips and haws, but whose best winter delight lay in its utter solitude and leafless repose. If a breath of air stirred, it made no sound here, for there was not a holly, not an evergreen to rustle, and the stripped hawthorn and hazel bushes were as still as the white, worn stones which causewayed the middle of the path. Far and wide on each side there were only fields, where no cattle now browsed and the little brown birds, which stirred occasionally in the hedge, looked like single russet leaves that had forgotten to drop. This lane inclined uphill all the way to hay. Having reached the middle, I sat down on a stile which led thence into a field. Gathering my mantle about me, and sheltering my hands in my muff, I did not feel the cold, though it froze keenly. 
as was attested by a sheet of ice covering the causeway, where a little brooklet, now congealed, had overflowed after a rapid thaw some days since. From my seat I could look down on Thornfield. The grey and battlemented hall was the principal object in the vale below me. Its woods and dark rookery rose against the west. I lingered till the sun went down amongst the trees, and sank crimson and clear behind them. I then turned eastward. On the hilltop above me sat the rising moon. Pale yet as a cloud, but brightening momentarily, she looked over hay, which, half lost in trees, sent up a blue smoke from its few chimneys. It was yet a mile distant, but in the absolute hush I could hear plainly its thin murmurs of life. My ear, too, felt the flow of currents. In what dales and depths I could not tell, but there were many hills beyond hay, and doubtless many becks threading their passes. That evening calm betrayed alike the tinkle of the nearest streams, the sioux of the most remote. A rude noise broke on these fine ripplings and whisperings, at once so far away and so clear. A positive tramp, tramp, a metallic clatter, which effaced the soft wave wanderings, as, in a picture, the solid mass of a crag, or the rough boles of a great oak, drawn in dark and strong on the foreground, efface the aerial distance of Azure Hill, sunny horizon, and blended clouds, where tint melts into tint. The din was on the causeway. A horse was coming. The windings of the lane yet hid it, but it approached. I was just leaving the stile. Yet, as the path was narrow, I sat still to let it go by. In those days I was young and all sorts of fancies, bright and dark, tenanted my mind. The memories of nursery stories were there amongst other rubbish, and when they recurred, maturing youth added to them a vigour and vividness beyond what childhood could give. As this horse approached, and as I watched for it to appear through the dusk, I remembered certain of Bessie's tales, wherein figured a North of England spirit called a guy-trash, which, in the form of a horse, mule, or large dog, haunted solitary ways, and sometimes came upon belated travellers, as this horse was now coming upon me. It was very near, but not yet in sight, when, in addition to the tramp, tramp, I heard a rush under the hedge, and close down by the hazel stems glided a great dog, whose black and white colour made him a distinct object against the trees. It was exactly one form of Bessie's guy-trash, a lion-like creature with long hair and a huge head. It passed me, however, quietly enough, not staying to look up with strange pretocanine eyes in my face, as I half expected it would. The horse followed, a tall steed, and on its back a rider. The man, the human being, broke the spell at once. Nothing ever rode the guy-trash. It was always alone and goblins, to my notions, though they might tenant the dumb carcasses of beasts, could scarce covet shelter in the commonplace human form. No guy-trash was this, only a traveller taking the short-cut to milk it. He passed, and I went on. A few steps, and I turned, a sliding sound and an exclamation of, "'What the deuce is to do now?' and a clattering tumble arrested my attention. Man and horse were down. They had slipped on the sheet of ice which glazed the causeway. The dog came bounding back, and seeing his master in a predicament, and hearing the horse groan, barked till the evening hills echoed the sound, which was deep in proportion to his magnitude. He snuffed round the prostrate group, and then he ran up to me. It was all he could do. There was no other help at hand to summon. I obeyed him, and walked down to the traveller, by this time struggling himself free of his steed. His efforts were so vigorous, I thought he could not be much hurt, but I asked him the question. "'Are you injured, sir?' I think he was swearing, but I am not certain. However, he was pronouncing some formula which prevented him from replying to me directly. "'Can I do anything?' I asked again. "'You must just stand on one side,' he answered as he rose first to his knees, and then to his feet. I did, whereupon began a heaving, stamping, clattering process, accompanied by a barking and baying which removed me effectually some yards' distance, but I would not be driven quite away till I saw the event. This was finally fortunate. The horse was re-established, and the dog was silenced with a, "'Down, pilot!' The traveller, now stooping, felt his foot and leg as if trying whether they were sound. Apparently something ailed them for he halted to the stile whence I had just risen, and sat down. 
I was in the mood for being useful, or at least officious, I think, for I now drew near him again. "'If you are hurt, and want help, sir, I can fetch some one either from Thornfield Hall or from Hay.' "'Thank you. I shall do. I have no broken bones, only a sprain.' And again he stood up and tried his foot, but the result extorted an involuntary, "'Ugh!' Oh! Something of daylight still lingered, and the moon was waxing bright. I could see him plainly. His figure was enveloped in a riding-cloak, fur-collared and steel-clasped. Its details were not apparent, but I traced the general points of middle height and considerable breadth of chest. He had a dark face, with stern features and a heavy brow. His eyes and gathered eyebrows looked ireful and thwarted just now. He was past youth, but had not reached middle age. Perhaps he might be thirty-five. I felt no fear of him, and but little shyness. Had he been a handsome, heroic-looking young gentleman, I should not have dared to stand thus questioning him against his will, and offering my services unasked. I had hardly ever seen a handsome youth, never in my life spoken to one. I had a theoretical reverence and homage for beauty, elegance, gallantry, fascination. But had I met those qualities incarnate in masculine shape, I should have known instinctively that they neither had nor could have sympathy with anything in me, and should have shunned them as one would fire, lightning, or anything else that is bright but antipathetic. If even the stranger had smiled and been good-humoured to me when I addressed him, if he had put off my offer with assistance gaily and with thanks, I should have gone on my way and not felt any vocation to renew inquiries. But the frown, the roughness of the traveller, set me at my ease. I retained my station when he waved me to go, and announced, "'I cannot think of leaving you, sir, at so late an hour in this solitary lane, till I see you are fit to mount your horse.' He looked at me when I said this. He had hardly turned his eyes in my direction before. "'I should think you ought to be at home yourself,' said he. "'If you have a home in this neighbourhood, where do you come from?' "'From just below, and I am not at all afraid of being out late when it is moonlight. I will run over to Hay for you with pleasure, if you wish it. Indeed, I am going there to post a letter.' "'You live just below. Do you mean at that house with the battlements?' pointing to Thornfield Hall, on which the moon cast a hoary gleam, bringing it out distinct and pale from the woods, that, by contrast with the western sky, now seemed one mass of shadow. "'Yes, sir.' "'Whose house is it?' "'Mr. Rochester's.' "'Do you know Mr. Rochester?' "'No. I have never seen him.' "'He is not resident, then?' "'No.' "'Can you tell me where he is?' I cannot. You are not a servant at the hall, of course. You are— He stopped, ran his eye over my dress, which, as usual, was quite simple. A black merino cloak, a black beaver bonnet, neither of them half fine enough for a lady's maid. He seemed puzzled to decide what I was. I helped him. I am the governess. Ah, the governess, he repeated. Deuce take me if I had not forgotten. The governess! and again my raiment underwent scrutiny. In two minutes he rose from the stile. His face expressed pain when he tried to move. "'I cannot commission you to fetch help,' he said. "'But you may help me a little yourself, if you will be so kind.' "'Yes, sir.' "'You have not an umbrella that I can use as a stick?' "'No.' "'Try to get hold of my horse's bridle, and lead him to me. You are not afraid?' I should have been afraid to touch a horse when alone, but when told to do it, I was disposed to obey. I put down my muff on the stile, and went up to the tall steed. I endeavoured to catch the bridle, but it was a spirited thing, and would not let me come near its head. I made effort on effort, though in vain. Meantime I was mortally afraid of its trampling forefeet. The traveller waited and watched for some time, and at last he laughed. "'I see,' he said. The mountain will never be brought to Mahomet, so all you can do is to aid Mahomet to go to the mountain. I must beg of you to come here." I came. "'Excuse me,' he continued. "'Necessity compels me to make you useful.' He laid a heavy hand on my shoulder, and leaning on me with some stress, limped to his horse. Having once caught the bridle, he mastered it directly and sprang to his saddle, grimacing grimly as he made the effort, for it wrenched his sprain. 
Now, said he, releasing his under lip from a hard bite, just hand me my whip. It lies there under the hedge. I sought it and found it. Thank you. Now make haste with a letter to Hay and return as fast as you can. A touch of a spurred heel made his horse first start and rear, and then bound away. The dog rushed in his traces. All three vanished. Like heath that in the wilderness the wild wind whirls away. I took up my muff and walked on. The incident had occurred and was gone for me. It was an incident of no moment, no romance, no interest in a sense. Yet it marked with change one single hour of a monotonous life. My help had been needed and claimed. I had given it. I was pleased to have done something. Trivial, transitory though the deed was, it was yet an active thing. And I was weary of an existence all passive. The new face, too, was like a new picture introduced to the gallery of memory. And it was dissimilar to all the others hanging there. Firstly, because it was masculine, and secondly, because it was dark, strong, and stern. I had it still before me when I entered Hay, and slipped the letter into the post-office. I saw it as I walked fast downhill all the way home. When I came to the stile, I stopped a minute, looked round and listened, with an idea that a horse's hoofs might ring on the causeway again, and that a rider in a cloak, and a guy-trash like Newfoundland dog might be again apparent. I saw only the hedge and a pollard willow before me, rising up still and straight to meet the moonbeams. I heard only the faintest waft of wind roaming fitful among the trees round Thornfield a mile distant. And when I glanced down in the direction of the murmur, my eye, traversing the hall-front, caught a light kindling in a window. It reminded me that I was late, and I hurried on. I did not like re-entering Thornfield. To pass its threshold was to return to stagnation. To cross the silent hall, to ascend the darksome staircase, to seek my own lonely little room, and then to meet tranquil Mrs. Fairfax, and spend the long winter evening with her, and her only, was to quell wholly the faint excitement wakened by my walk, to slip again over my faculties the viewless fetters of a uniform and too still existence, of an existence whose very privileges of security and ease I was becoming incapable of appreciating. What good it would have done me at that time to have been tossed in the storms of an uncertain, struggling life, and to have been taught by rough and bitter experience to long for the calm amidst which I now repined! Yes, just as much good as it would do a man tired of sitting still, in a too easy chair, to take a long walk, and just as natural was the wish to stir, under my circumstances, as it would be under his. I lingered at the gates. I lingered on the lawn. I paced backwards and forwards on the pavement. The shutters of the glass door were closed. I could not see into the interior, and both my eyes and spirit seemed drawn from the gloomy house, from the grey hollow filled with rayless cells, as it appeared to me, to that sky expanded before me, a blue sea absolved from taint of cloud, the moon ascending it in solemn march her orb seeming to look up as she left the hill-tops, from behind which she had come, far and farther below her, and aspired to the zenith, midnight dark in its fathomless depth and measureless distance, and for those trembling stars that followed her course, they made my heart tremble, my veins glow when I viewed them. Little things recall us to earth. The clock struck in the hall. That sufficed. I turned from moon and stars, opened a side-door, and went in. The hall was not dark, nor yet was it lit, only by the high-hung bronze lamp. A warm glow suffused both it and the lower steps of the oak staircase. This ruddy shine issued from the great dining-room, whose two-leaved door stood open, and showed a genial fire in the grate, glancing on marble hearth and brass fire-irons, and revealing purple draperies and polished furniture, in the most pleasant radiance. It revealed, too, a group near the mantelpiece. I had scarcely caught it, and scarcely become aware of a cheerful mingling of voices, amongst which I seemed to distinguish the tones of Adele, when the door closed. I hastened to Mrs. Fairfax's room. There was a fire there, too, but no candle, and no Mrs. Fairfax. Instead, all alone, sitting upright on the rug, and gazing with gravity at the blaze, I beheld a great black-and-white long-haired dog just like the guy-trash of the lane. 
It was so like it that I went forward and said, Pilot? And the thing got up and came to me and snuffed me. I caressed him, and he wagged his great tail. But he looked an eerie creature to be alone with, and I could not tell whence he had come. I rang the bell, for I wanted a candle, and I wanted, too, to get an account of this visitant. Leah entered. What dog is this? He came with Master. With whom? With Master, Mr. Rochester. He's just arrived. Indeed. And is Mrs. Fairfax with him? Yes, and Miss Adele. They are in the dining-room, and John has gone for a surgeon, for Master has had an accident, his horse fell and his ankle is sprained. Did the horse fall in Hay Lane? Yes, coming down hill. It slipped on some ice. Ah! Bring me a candle, will you, Leah? Leah brought it. She entered, followed by Mrs. Fairfax, who repeated the news adding that Mr. Carter the surgeon was come, and was now with Mr. Rochester. Then she hurried out to give orders about tea, and I went upstairs to take off my things. End of chapter 12《Chapter 13 of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 13 Mr. Rochester, it seems, by the surgeon's orders, went to bed early that night, nor did he rise soon next morning. When he did come down, it was to attend to business. His agent and some of his tenants were arrived, and waiting to speak with him. Adèle and I had now to vacate the library. It would be in daily requisition as a reception-room for callers. A fire was lit in an apartment upstairs, and there I carried our books, and arranged it for the future schoolroom. I discerned in the course of the morning that Thornfield Hall was a changed place. No longer silent as a church, it echoed every hour or two to a knock at the door, or a clang of the bell. Steps, too, often traversed the hall, and new voices spoke in different keys below. A rill from the outer world was flowing through it. It had a master. For my part, I liked it better. Adèle was not easy to teach that day. She could not apply. She kept running to the door and looking over the banisters to see if she could get a glimpse of Mr. Rochester. Then she coined pretexts to go downstairs, in order, as I shrewdly suspected, to visit the library, where I knew she was not wanted. Then, when I got a little angry, and made her sit still, she continued to talk incessantly of her ami, Monsieur Edward Fairfax de Rochester, as she dubbed him. I had not before heard his praenomens, and to conjecture what presents he had brought her. For it appears he had intimated the night before, that when his luggage came from Milcote, there would be found amongst it a little box in whose contents she had an interest. "'Et cela doit signifier,' said she, "'qu'il y aura la dedans un cadeau pour moi, et peut-être pour vous aussi, mademoiselle. Monsieur a parlé de vous, il m'a demandé le nom de ma gouvernante, et si elle n'était pas un petit personne, assez mince, est un peu pâle. J'ai dit que oui.' c'est vrai, n'est-ce pas, mademoiselle?" I and my pupil dined as usual in Mrs. Fairfax's parlour. The afternoon was wild and snowy, and we passed it in the schoolroom. At dark I allowed Adèle to put away books and work, and to run downstairs, for, from the comparative silence below, and from the cessation of appeals to the door-bell, I conjectured that Mr. Rochester was now at liberty. Left alone, I walked to the window. But nothing was to be seen thence. Twilight and snowflakes together thickened the air, and hid the very shrubs on the lawn. I let down the curtain, and went back to the fireside. In the clear embers I was tracing a view, not unlike a picture I remembered to have seen of the castle of Heidelberg on the Rhine, when Mrs. Fairfax came in, breaking up by her entrance the fiery mosaic I had been piercing together, and scattering, too, some heavy unwelcome thoughts that were beginning to throng on my solitude. "'Mr. Rochester would be glad if you and your pupil would take tea with him in the drawing-room this evening,' said she. "'He has been so much engaged all day that he could not ask to see you before.' "'When is his tea-time?' I inquired. "'Oh, at six o'clock. He keeps early hours in the country. You had better change your frock now. I will go with you and fasten it. Here is a candle.' "'Is it necessary to change my frock?' 
"'Yes, you had better. I always dress for the evening when Mr. Rochester is here.' This additional ceremony seemed somewhat stately. However, I repaired to my room, and with Mrs. Fairfax's aid, replaced my black stuff dress by one of black silk, the best and the only additional one I had, except one of light grey, which in my lowwood notions of the toilet I thought too fine to be worn, except on first-rate occasions. "'You want a brooch,' said Mrs. Fairfax. I had a single little pearl ornament which Miss Temple gave me as a parting keepsake. I put it on, and then we went downstairs. Unused as I was to strangers, it was rather a trial to appear thus formally summoned in Mr. Rochester's presence. I let Mrs. Fairfax precede me into the dining-room, and kept in her shade as we crossed that apartment, and passing the arch, whose curtain was now dropped, entered the elegant recess beyond. Two wax candles stood lighted on the table, and two on the mantelpiece. Basking in the light and heat of a superb fire lay Pilot. Adèle knelt near him. Half reclined on a couch appeared Mr. Rochester, his foot supported by the cushion. He was looking at Adèle and the dog. The fire shone full on his face. I knew my traveller, with his broad and jetty eyebrows, his square forehead, made squarer by the horizontal sweep of his black hair. I recognised his decisive nose, more remarkable for character than beauty, his full nostrils, denoting, I thought, collar, his grim mouth, chin, and jaw. Yes. All three were very grim, and no mistake. His shape, now divested of cloak, I perceived harmonised in squareness with his physiognomy. I suppose it was a good figure, in the athletic sense of the term, broad-chested and thin-flanked, though neither tall nor graceful. Mr. Rochester must have been aware of the entrance of Mrs. Fairfax and myself, but it appeared he was not in the mood to notice us, for he never lifted his head as we approached. "'Here is Miss Eyre, sir.' said Mrs. Fairfax, in her quiet way. He bowed, still not taking his eyes from the group of the dog and child. "'Let Miss Eyre be seated,' said he, and there was something in the forced, stiff bow, in the impatient yet formal tone, which seemed further to express, "'What the deuce is it to me whether Miss Eyre is there or not? At this moment I am not disposed to accost her.' I sat down, quite disembarrassed. A reception of finished politeness would probably have confused me. I could not have returned or repaid it by answering grace and elegance on my part. But harsh caprice laid me under no obligation. On the contrary, a decent quiescence under the freak of manner gave me the advantage. Besides, the eccentricity of the proceeding was piquant. I felt interested to see how he would go on. He went on as a statue would. That is, he neither spoke nor moved. Mrs. Fairfax seemed to think it necessary that some one should be amiable, and she began to talk. Kindly, as usual, and, as usual, rather trite, she condoled with him on the pressure of business he had had all day, on the annoyance it must have been to him with that painful sprain. Then she commended his patience and perseverance in going through with it. "'Madam, I should like some tea,' was the sole rejoinder she got. She hastened to ring the bell and when the tray came, she proceeded to arrange the cups, spoons, etc., with assiduous celerity. I and Adele went to the table, but the master did not leave his couch. "'Will you hand Mr. Rochester's cup?' said Mrs. Fairfax to me. "'Adele might perhaps spill it.' I did as requested. As he took the cup from my hand, Adele, thinking the moment propitious for making a request in my favour, cried out, N'est-ce pas, monsieur, qu'il y a un cadeau pour mademoiselle Eyre dans votre petite coffre? Who talks of cadeau? said he gruffly. Did you expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? And he searched my face with eyes that I saw were dark, irate, and piercing. I hardly know, sir. I have little experience of them. They are generally thought pleasant things. Generally thought? But what do you think? I should be obliged to take time, sir, before I could give you an answer worthy of your acceptance. A present has many faces to it, has it not? And one should consider all before pronouncing an opinion as to its nature." "'Miss Eyre, you are not so unsophisticated as Adèle. She demands a cadeau clamorously the moment she sees me. You beat about the bush." "'Because I have less confidence in my deserts than Adèle has. She can prefer the claim of old acquaintance, and the right too of custom. For she says you have always been in the habit of giving her playthings. 
but if I had to make out a case, I should be puzzled, since I am a stranger, and have done nothing to entitle me to an acknowledgment." "'Oh, don't fall back on over-modesty! I have examined Adele, and find you have taken great pains with her. She is not bright, she has no talents, yet in a short time she has made much improvement." "'Sir, you have now given me my cadeau. I am obliged to you. It is the mead teachers most covet, praise of their pupil's progress." "'Humph!' said Mr. Rochester, and he took his tea in silence. "'Come to the fire!' said the master, when the tray was taken away, and Mrs. Fairfax had settled into a corner with her knitting, while Adèle was leading me by the hand round the room, showing me the beautiful books and ornaments on the consoles and chiffonniere. We obeyed as in duty bound. Adèle wanted to take a seat on my knee, but she was ordered to amuse herself with Pilate. "'You have been resident in my house three months?' "'Yes, sir.' "'And you came from—' "'From Lowood School, in Blankshire.' "'Ah! A charitable concern! How long were you there?' Eight years.' Eight years! You must be tenacious of life. I thought half the time in such a place would have done up any constitution. No wonder you have rather the look of another world. I marvelled where you had got that sort of face. When you came on me in Hay Lane last night, I thought unaccountably of fairy tales, and had half a mind to demand whether you had bewitched my horse. I am not sure yet. Who are your parents?" I have none. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them?" No. I thought not. And so you were waiting for your people when you sat on that stile? For whom, sir? For the men in green. It was a proper moonlight evening for them. Did I break through one of your rings that you spread that damned ice on the causeway?" I shook my head. The men in green all forsook England a hundred years ago, said I speaking as seriously as he had done. And not even in Hay Lane, or the fields about it, could you find a trace of them. I don't think either summer or harvest, or winter moon will ever shine on their revels more." Mrs. Fairfax had dropped her knitting, and, with raised eyebrows, seemed wondering what sort of talk this was. "'Well,' resumed Mr. Rochester, "'if you disown parents, you must have some sort of kinsfolk—uncles and aunts?' "'No. None that I ever saw. And your home?" I have none. Where do your brothers and sisters live? I have no brothers or sisters. Who recommended you to come here? I advertised, and Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement. Yes, said the good lady, who now knew what ground we were upon. And I am daily thankful for the choice Providence led me to make. Miss Eyre has been an invaluable companion to me, and a kind and careful teacher to Adèle. "'Don't trouble yourself to give her a character,' returned Mr. Rochester. "'Eulogiums will not bias me. I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse.' "'Sir,' said Mrs. Fairfax, "'I have her to thank for this sprain.' The widow looked bewildered. "'Miss Eyre, have you ever lived in a town?' "'No, sir.' "'Have you seen much society?' "'None but the pupils and teachers of Lowood, and now the inmates of Thornfield.' Have you read much? Only such books as came in my way, and they have not been numerous or very learned. You have lived the life of a nun. No doubt you are well drilled in religious forms. Brocklehurst, who I understand directs Lowood as a parson, is he not? Yes, sir. And you girls probably worshipped him, as a convent full of religieuses would worship their director. Oh, no! You are very cool. No. What? A novice not worship a priest? That sounds blasphemous." I disliked Mr. Brocklehurst, and I was not alone in the feeling. He is a harsh man, at once pompous and meddling. He cut off our hair, and for economy's sake brought us bad needles and thread, with which we could hardly sew. That was very false economy," remarked Mrs. Fairfax, who now again caught the drift of the dialogue. And what was the head and front of his offending? demanded Mr. Rochester. He starved us when he had the sole superintendence of the provision department, before the committee was appointed, and he bored us with long lectures once a week, and with evening readings from books of his own indicting, about sudden deaths and judgments, which made us afraid to go to bed. 
What age were you when you went to Lowood? About ten. And you stayed there eight years? You are now, then, eighteen? I assented. Arithmetic, you see, is useful. Without its aid, I should hardly have been able to guess your age. It is a point difficult to fix where the features and countenance are so much at variance as in your case. And now what did you learn at Lowood? Can you play? A little? Of course. That is the established answer. Go into the library. I mean, if you please. Excuse my tone of command. I am used to say, do this, and it is done. I cannot alter my customary habits for this one new inmate. Go then into the library, take a candle with you, leave the door open, sit down to the piano, and play a tune." I departed, obeying his directions. "'Enough!' he called out in a few minutes. "'You play a little, I see, like any other English schoolgirl. Perhaps rather better than some, but not well.' I closed the piano and returned. Mr. Rochester continued. Adele showed me some sketches this morning, which she said were yours. I don't know whether they were entirely of your doing. Probably a master aided you." "'No, indeed,' I interjected. "'Ah! That prick's pride! Well, fetch me your portfolio, if you can vouch for its contents being original. But don't pass your word unless you are certain. I can recognise patchwork." "'Then I shall say nothing, and you shall judge for yourself, sir." I brought the portfolio from the library. "'Approach the table,' said he, and I wheeled it to his couch. Adèle and Mrs. Fairfax drew near to see the pictures. "'No crowding,' said Mr. Rochester. "'Take the drawings from my hand as I finish with them, but don't push your faces up to mine.' He deliberately scrutinised each sketch and painting. Three he laid aside. The others, when he examined them, he swept from him. "'Take them off to the other table, Mrs. Fairfax,' said he, "'and look at them with Adèle. You,' glancing at me, "'resume your seat and answer my questions. I perceive those pictures were done by one hand. Was that hand yours?' "'Yes.' "'And when did you find time to do them? They have taken much time, and some thought.' "'I did them in the last two vacations I spent at Lowood, when I had no other occupation.' "'Where did you get your copies?' out of my head. That head I see now on your shoulders. Yes, sir. Has it other furniture of the same kind within? I should think it may have. I should hope better. He spread the pictures before him, and again surveyed them alternately. While he is so occupied, I will tell you, reader, what they are, and first I must premise that they are nothing wonderful. The subjects had, indeed, risen vividly on my mind. As I saw them with the spiritual eye before I attempted to embody them, they were striking, but my hand would not second my fancy, and in each case it had wrought out but a pale portrait of the thing I had conceived. These pictures were in water-colours. The first represented clouds, low and livid, rolling over a swollen sea. All the distance was an eclipse. So too was the foreground, or rather the nearest billows, for there was no land. One gleam of light lifted into relief a half-submerged mast, on which sat a cormorant, dark and large, with wings flecked with foam. Its beak held a gold bracelet set with gems, that I had touched with as brilliant tints as my palette could yield, and as glittering distinctness as my pencil could impart. Sinking below the bird and mast, a drowned corpse glanced through the green water. A fair arm was the only limb clearly visible, whence the bracelet had been washed or torn. The second picture contained for foreground only the dim peak of a hill, with grass and some leaves slanting as if by a breeze. Beyond and above spread an expanse of sky, dark blue as at twilight. Rising into the sky was a woman's shape to the bust, portrayed in tints as dusk and soft as I could combine. The dim forehead was crowned with a star. The lineaments below were seen as through the suffusion of vapour, the eyes shone dark and wild, the hair streamed shadowy like a beamless cloud torn by storm or electric travail. On the neck lay a pale reflection like moonlight. The same faint lustre touched the train of thin clouds from which rose and bowed this vision of the evening star. The third showed the pinnacle of an iceberg piercing a polar wintry sky. A muster of northern lights reared their dim lances, close serried along the horizon. 
Throwing these into distance, rose, in the foreground, a head, a colossal head, inclined towards the iceberg and resting against it. Two thin hands, joined under the forehead and supporting it, drew up before the lower features a sable veil, a brow quite bloodless, white as bone, and an eye hollow and fixed, a blank of meaning, but for the glassiness of despair alone were visible. Above the temples, amidst wreathed turban folds of black drapery, vague in its character and consistency as cloud, gleamed a ring of white flame, gemmed with sparkles of a more lurid tinge. This pale crescent was the likeness of a kingly crown. What it diademed was the shape which shape had none. "'Were you happy when you painted these pictures?' asked Mr. Rochester presently. "'I was absorbed, sir. Yes, and I was happy. To paint them, in short, was to enjoy one of the keenest pleasures I have ever known." "'That is not saying much. Your pleasures, by your own account, have been few. But I dare say you did exist in a kind of artist's dreamland while you blent and arranged these strange tints. Did you sit at them long each day?" I had nothing else to do, because it was the vacation, and I sat at them from morning till noon, and from noon till night. The length of the midsummer days favoured my inclination to apply. "'And you felt self-satisfied with the result of your ardent labours?' "'Far from it. I was tormented by the contrast between my idea and my handiwork. In each case I had imagined something which I was quite powerless to realise." "'Not quite. You have secured the shadow of your thought. But no more, probably. You had not enough of the artist's skill and science to give it full being. Yet the drawings are, for a schoolgirl, peculiar. As to the thoughts, they are elfish. These eyes in the evening star you must have seen in a dream. How could you make them look so clear, and yet not at all brilliant? For the planet above quells their rays. And what meaning is that in their solemn depth? And who taught you to paint wind? There is a high gale in that sky, and on this hilltop. Where did you see Latmos? For that is Latmos. There, put the drawings away." I had scarce tied the strings of the portfolio, when, looking at his watch, he said abruptly, "'It is nine o'clock. What are you about, Miss Eyre, to let Adèle sit up so long? Take her to bed.' Adèle went to kiss him before quitting the room. He endured the caress, but scarcely seemed to relish it more than Pilate would have done, nor so much. "'I wish you all good night now said he, making a movement of the hand towards the door, in token that he was tired of our company and wished to dismiss us. Mrs. Fairfax folded up her knitting, I took my portfolio, we curtsied to him, received a frigid bow in return, and so withdrew. "'You said Mr. Rochester was not strikingly peculiar, Mrs. Fairfax,' I observed, when I rejoined her in her room, after putting Adèle to bed. "'Well, is he?' "'I think so. He is very changeful and abrupt." "'True. No doubt he may appear so to a stranger. But I am so accustomed to his manner, I never think of it. And then, if he has peculiarities of temper, allowance should be made." "'Why?" "'Partly because it is his nature. And we can none of us help our nature. And partly because he has painful thoughts, no doubt, to harass him and make his spirits unequal." "'What about?" "'Family troubles, for one thing. But he has no family." "'Not now, but he has had, or at least relatives. He lost his elder brother a few years since." "'His elder brother?' "'Yes. The present Mr. Rochester has not been very long in possession of the property, only about nine years." Nine years is a tolerable time. Was he so very fond of his brother as to be still inconsolable for his loss?' "'Why, no. Perhaps not. I believe there was some misunderstanding between them. Mr. Rowland Rochester was not quite just to Mr. Edward, and perhaps he prejudiced his father against him. The old gentleman was fond of money, and anxious to keep the family estate together. He did not like to diminish the property by division, and yet he was anxious that Mr. Edward should have wealth too, to keep up the consequence of the name. And soon after he was of age, some steps were taken that were not quite fair, and made a great deal of mischief. Old Mr. Rochester and Mr. Rowland combined to bring Mr. Edward into what he considered a painful position, for the sake of making his fortune. What the precise nature of that position was, I never clearly knew, but his spirit could not brook what he had to suffer in it. He is not very forgiving. 
He broke with his family, and now for many years he has led an unsettled kind of life. I don't think he has ever been resident at Thornfield for a fortnight together, since the death of his brother without a will left him master of the estate, and indeed no wonder he shuns the old place." "'Why should he shun it?' "'Perhaps he thinks it gloomy.' The answer was evasive. I should have liked something clearer. But Mrs. Fairfax either could not or would not give me more explicit information of the origin and nature of Mr. Rochester's trials. She averred they were a mystery to herself, and that what she knew was chiefly from conjecture. It was evident, indeed, that she wished me to drop the subject, which I did accordingly. End of chapter 13 Chapter Fourteen of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Fourteen. For several subsequent days, I saw little of Mr. Rochester. In the mornings, he seemed much engaged with business and in the afternoon gentlemen from Milket or the neighbourhood called, and sometimes stayed to dine with him. When his brain was well enough to admit of horse exercise, he rode out a good deal, probably to return these visits, as he generally did not come back till late at night. During this interval, even Adele was seldom sent for to his presence, and all my acquaintance with him was confined to an occasional rencontre in the hall, on the stairs, or in the gallery, when he would sometimes pass me haughtily and coldly, just acknowledging my presence by a distant nod or a cool glance, and sometimes bow and smile with gentlemanlike affability. His changes of mood did not offend me, because I saw that I had nothing to do with their alternation. The ebb and flow depended on causes quite disconnected with me. One day he had had company to dinner, and had sent for my portfolio, in order, doubtless, to exhibit its contents. The gentleman went away early to attend a public meeting at Milcott, as Mrs. Fairfax informed me. But the night being wet and inclement, Mr. Rochester did not accompany them. Soon after they were gone, he rang the bell. A message came that I and Adele were to go downstairs. I brushed Adele's hair and made her neat, and having ascertained that I was myself in my usual Quaker trim, where there was nothing to retouch, all being too close and plain, braided locks included to admit of disarrangement, we descended. Adele, wondering whether the petit coffre was at length come, for owing to some mistake its arrival had hitherto been delayed. She was gratified. There it stood, a little carton, on the table when we entered the dining-room. She appeared to know it by instinct. "'Ma boite! Ma boite!' exclaimed she, running towards it. "'Yes, there is your boite at last. Take it into a corner, you genuine daughter of Paris, and amuse yourself with disembowelling it,' said the deep and rather sarcastic voice of Mr. Rochester, proceeding from the depths of an immense easy-chair at the fireside. "'And mind!' he continued. Don't bother me with any details of the anatomical process, or any notice of the condition of the entrails. Let your operation be conducted in silence. Tiens-toi tranquille, enfant. Comprends-tu?" Adèle seemed scarcely to need the warning. She had already retired to a sofa with her treasure, and was busy untying the cord which secured the lid. Having removed this impediment, and lifted certain silvery envelopes of tissue-paper, she merely exclaimed, Oh, ciel! Que c'est beau!" and then remained absorbed in ecstatic contemplation. "'Is Miss Eyre there?' now demanded the master, half rising from his seat to look round the door, near which I still stood. "'Ah! Well, come forward. Be seated here.' He drew a chair near his own. "'I am not fond of the prattle of children,' he continued. For old bachelor as I am, I have no pleasant associations connected with their lisp. It would be intolerable to me to pass a whole evening tete-a-tete -tete with a brat. 
Don't draw that chair farther off, Miss Eyre. Sit down exactly where I placed it. If you please, that is. Confound these civilities! I continually forget them. Nor do I particularly affect simple-minded old ladies. By the by, I must have mine in mind. It won't do to neglect her. She is a Fairfax, or wed to one, and blood is said to be thicker than water." He rang, and dispatched an invitation to Mrs. Fairfax, who soon arrived, knitting basket in hand. "'Good evening, madam. I sent to you for a charitable purpose. I have forbidden Adele to talk to me about her presence, and she is bursting with repletion. Have the goodness to serve her as an auditress and interlocutrice. It will be one of the most benevolent acts you ever performed." Adèle, indeed, no sooner saw Mrs. Fairfax, than she summoned her to her sofa, and there quickly filled her lap with the porcelain, the ivory, the waxen contents of her boîte, pouring out, meantime, explanations and raptures, in such broken English as she was mistress of. "'Now I have performed the part of a good host.' pursued Mr. Rochester. Put my guests into the way of amusing each other. I ought to be at liberty to attend to my own pleasure. Miss Eyre, draw your chair still a little farther forward. You are yet too far back. I cannot see you without disturbing my position in this comfortable chair, which I have no mind to do." I did as I was bid, though I would much rather have remained somewhat in the shade. But Mr. Rochester had such a direct way of giving orders, it seemed a matter of course to obey him promptly. We were, as I have said, in the dining-room. The lustre, which had been lit for dinner, filled the room with a festal breadth of light. The large fire was all red and clear. The purple curtains hung rich and ample before the lofty window and loftier arch. Everything was still, save the subdued chat of Adèle, she dared not speak loud and filling up each pause, the beating of winter rain against the panes. Mr. Rochester, as he sat in his damask-covered chair, looked different to what I had seen him look before, not quite so stern, much less gloomy. There was a smile on his lips, and his eyes sparkled, whether with wine or not I am not sure, but I think it very probable. He was, in short, in his after-dinner mood more expanded and genial, and also more self-indulgent than the frigid and rigid temper of the morning. Still he looked preciously grim, cushioning his massive head against the swelling back of his chair, and receiving the light of the fire on his granite-hewn features, and in his great dark eyes. For he had great dark eyes, and very fine eyes, too, not without a certain change in their depth sometimes which, if it was not softness, reminded you, at least, of that feeling. He had been looking two minutes at the fire, and I had been looking the same length of time at him, when, turning suddenly, he caught my gaze fastened on his physiognomy. "'You examine me, Miss Eyre,' said he. "'Do you think me handsome?' I should, if I had deliberated, have replied to this question by something conventionally vague and polite. But the answer somehow slipped from my tongue before I was aware. No, sir. Ah! By my word! There is something singular about you," said he. You have the air of a little nonet, quaint, quiet, grave, and simple, as you sit with your hands before you, and your eyes generally bent on the carpet, except, by the by, when they are directed piercingly to my face, as just now, for instance. And when one asks you a question, or makes a remark to which you are obliged to reply, you rap out a round rejoinder, which, if not blunt, is at least brusque. What do you mean by it?" "'Sir, I was too plain. I beg your pardon. I ought to have replied that it was not easy to give an impromptu answer to a question about appearances, that tastes mostly differ, and that beauty is of little consequence, or something of that sort. You ought to have replied no such thing. Beauty of little consequence, indeed! And so, under pretence of softening the previous outrage, of stroking and soothing me into placidity, you stick a sly penknife under my ear. Go on. What fault do you find with me, pray? I suppose I have all my limbs and all my features like any other man?" Mr. Rochester, 
Allow me to disown my first answer. I intended no pointed repartee, it was only a blunder." "'Just so. I think so, and you shall be answerable for it. Criticise me. Does my forehead not please you?" He lifted up the sable waves of hair, which lay horizontally over his brow, and showed a solid enough mass of intellectual organs, but an abrupt deficiency where the suave sign of benevolence should have risen. "'Now, ma'am, am I a fool?' "'Far from it, sir. You would perhaps think me rude if I inquired in return whether you are a philanthropist." "'There again! Another stick of the penknife, when she pretended to pat my head! And that is because I said I did not like the society of children and old women, low be it spoken. No, young lady, I am not a general philanthropist, but I bear a conscience." And he pointed to the prominences which are said to indicate that faculty, and which, fortunately for him, was sufficiently conspicuous, giving indeed a marked breadth to the upper part of his head. And besides, I once had a kind of rude tenderness of heart. When I was as old as you, I was a feeling fellow enough, partial to the unfledged, unfostered, and unlucky. But fortune has knocked me about since. She has even kneaded me with her knuckles, and now I flatter myself I am as hard and tough as an india-rubber ball, pervious though, through a chink or two still, and with one sentient point in the middle of the lump. Yes, does that leave hope for me?" "'Hope of what, sir?' "'Of my final re-transformation from india-rubber back to flesh.' Decidedly he has had too much wine, I thought and I did not know what answer to make to his queer question. How could I tell whether he was capable of being re-transformed?" "'You look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. And though you are not pretty any more than I am handsome, yet a puzzled air becomes you. Besides, it is convenient, for it keeps those searching eyes of yours away from my physiognomy, and busies them with the worsted flowers of the rug. So puzzle on. Young lady, I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative to-night." With this announcement he rose from his chair, and stood, leaning his arm on the marble mantelpiece. In this attitude his shape was seen plainly, as well as his face, his unusual breadth of chest, disproportionate almost to his length of limb. I am sure most people would have thought him an ugly man. Yet there was so much unconscious pride in his port, so much ease in his demeanour, such a look of complete indifference to his own external appearance, so haughty a reliance on the power of other qualities, intrinsic or adventitious, to atone for the lack of mere personal attractiveness, that in looking at him one inevitably shared the indifference, and even in a blind imperfect sense, put faith in the confidence. "'I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative to-night,' he repeated, "'and that is why I sent for you. The fire and the chandelier were not sufficient company for me. Nor would Pilot have been, for none of these can talk. Adele is a degree better, but still far below the mark. Mrs. Fairfax, ditto. You, I am persuaded, can suit me if you will. You puzzled me the first evening I invited you down here. I have almost forgotten you since. Other ideas have driven yours from my head. But to-night I am resolved to be at ease to dismiss what importunes, and recall what pleases. It would now please me to draw you out, to learn more of you. Therefore speak." Instead of speaking, I smiled, and not a very complacent or submissive smile either. "'Speak!' he urged. "'What about, sir?' "'Whatever you like. I leave both the choice of subject and the manner of treating it entirely to yourself. Accordingly, I sat and said nothing. If he expects me to talk for the mere sake of talking and showing off, he will find he has addressed himself to the wrong person, I thought. "'You are dumb, Miss Eyre.' I was dumb still. He bent his head a little towards me, and with a single hasty glance seemed to dive into my eyes. "'Stubborn,' he said. "'And annoyed. Ah! It is consistent. I put my request in an absurd, almost insolent form. Miss Eyre, I beg your pardon. The fact is, once for all, I don't wish to treat you as an inferior. That is—correcting himself. 
I claim only such superiority as must result from twenty years' difference in age and a century's advance in experience. This is legitimate. Et j'y tiens, as Adele would say. And it is by virtue of this superiority, and this alone, that I desire you to have the goodness to talk to me a little now, and divert my thoughts, which are galled with dwelling on one point, cankering as a rusty nail." He had deigned an explanation, almost an apology, and I did not feel insensible to his condescension, and would not seem so. "'I am willing to amuse you if I can, sir, quite willing, but I cannot introduce a topic because how do I know what will interest you? Ask me questions, and I will do my best to answer them." "'Then, in the first place, do you agree with me that I have a right to be a little masterful, abrupt, perhaps exacting sometimes, on the grounds I stated, namely, that I am old enough to be your father, and that I have battled through a varied experience with many men of many nations, and roamed over half the globe, while you have lived quietly with one set of people in one house? Do as you please, sir." That is no answer. Or rather, it is very irritating, because a very evasive one. Reply clearly." I don't think, sir, you have a right to command me, merely because you are older than I, or because you have seen more of the world than I have. Your claim to superiority depends on the use you have made of your time and experience. Hm! <laughs> Promptly spoken! But I won't allow that, seeing it would never suit my case, as I have made an indifferent, not to say a bad, use of both advantages. Leaving superiority out of the question, then, you must still agree to receive my orders now and then, without being piqued or hurt by the tone of command. Will you?" I smiled. I thought to myself, Mr. Rochester is peculiar. He seems to forget that he pays me thirty pounds per annum for receiving his orders. The smile is very well," said he, catching instantly the passing expression. But speak, too. I was thinking, sir, that very few masters would trouble themselves to inquire whether or not their paid subordinates were piqued and hurt by their orders. Paid subordinates? What? You are my paid subordinate, are you? Oh, yes, I had forgotten the salary. Well, then, on that mercenary ground, will you agree to let me hector a little?" No, sir, not on that ground. But on the ground that you did forget it, and that you care whether or not a dependent is comfortable in his dependency, I agree heartily. And will you consent to dispense with a great many conventional forms and phrases, without thinking that the omission arises from insolence? I am sure, sir, I should never mistake informality for insolence. One I rather like. The other nothing free-born would submit to, even for a salary." Humbug! Most things free-born will submit to anything for a salary. Therefore keep to yourself, and don't venture on generalities of which you are intensely ignorant. However, I mentally shake hands with you for your answer, despite its inaccuracy, and as much for the manner in which it was said, as for the substance of the speech. The manner was frank and sincere. One does not often see such a manner. No, on the contrary, affectation or coldness or stupid, coarse-minded misapprehension of one's meaning are the usual rewards of candour. Not three in three thousand raw schoolgirl governesses would have answered me as you have just done. But I don't mean to flatter you. If you are cast in a different mould to the majority, it is no merit of yours. Nature did it. And then, after all, I go too fast in my conclusions, for what I yet know you may be no better than the rest. You may have intolerable defects to counterbalance your few good points." And so may you, I thought. My eye met his, as the idea crossed my mind. He seemed to read the glance, answering as if its import had been spoken as well as imagined. "'Yes, yes, you are right,' said he. "'I have plenty of faults of my own. I know it, and I don't wish to palliate them, I assure you. God wot I need not be too severe about others. I have a past experience, a series of deeds, a colour of life to contemplate within my own breast, which I might well call my sneers and censures from my neighbours to myself. I started, or rather, for like other defaulters, I like to lay half the blame on ill fortune and adverse circumstances, was thrust on to a wrong tack at the age of when and twenty, and have never recovered the right course since. 
But I might have been very different. I might have been as good as you, wiser, almost as stainless. I envy you your peace of mind, your clean conscience, your unpolluted memory. Little girl, a memory without blot or contamination must be an exquisite treasure, an inexhaustible source of pure refreshment, is it not? How was your memory when you were eighteen, sir? All right, then. Limpid, salubrious, no gush of bilge-water had turned it to fetid puddle. I was your equal at eighteen, quite your equal. Nature meant me to be, on the whole, a good man, Miss Eyre, one of the better kind, and you see I am not so. You would say you don't see it, at least I flatter myself, I read as much in your eye. Beware, by the by, what you express with that organ, I am quick at interpreting its language. Then take my word for it. I am not a villain, you are not to suppose that. Not to attribute to me any such bad eminence. But owing, I verily believe, rather to circumstances than to my natural bent, I am a trite, commonplace sinner, hackneyed in all the poor, petty dissipations with which the rich and worthless try to put on life. Do you wonder that I avow this to you? Know that in the course of your future life, you will often find yourself elected the involuntarily confidant of your acquaintance's secrets. People will instinctively find out, as I have done, that it is not your forte to tell of yourself, but to listen while others talk of themselves. They will feel, too, that you listen with no malevolent scorn of their indiscretion, but with a kind of innate sympathy, not the less comforting and encouraging, because it is very unobtrusive in its manifestations. How do you know? How can you guess all this, sir? I know it well. Therefore I proceed almost as freely as if I were writing my thoughts in a diary. You would say I should have been superior to circumstances. So I should. So I should. But you see, I was not. When fate wronged me, I had not the wisdom to remain cool. I turned desperate. Then I degenerated. Now, when any vicious simpleton excites my disgust by his paltry ribaldry, I cannot flatter myself that I am better than he. I am forced to confess that he and I are on a level. I wish I had stood firm. God knows I do. Dread remorse when you are tempted to err, Miss Eyre. Remorse is the poison of life. Repentance is said to be its cure, sir. It is not its cure. Reformation may be its cure. And I could reform. I have strength yet for that. If— But where is the use of thinking of it, hampered, burdened, cursed as I am? Besides, since happiness is irrevocably denied me, I have a right to get pleasure out of life, and I will get it, cost what it may." "'Then you will degenerate still more, sir?' "'Possibly. Yet why should I, if I can get sweet, fresh pleasure? And I may get it as sweet and fresh as the wild honey the bee gathers on the moor." "'It will sting. It will taste bitter, sir.' "'How do you know? You never tried it.' How very serious, how very solemn you look! And you are as ignorant of the matter as this cameo head," taking one from the mantelpiece. You have no right to preach to me, you neophyte, that have not passed the porch of life, and are absolutely unacquainted with its mysteries. I only remind you of your own words, sir. You said error brought remorse, and you pronounced remorse the poison of existence. And who talks of error now? I scarcely think the notion that flitted across my brain was an error. I believe it was an inspiration, rather than a temptation. It was very genial, very soothing. I know that. Here it comes again. It is no devil, I assure you. Or if it be, it has put on the robes of an angel of light. I think I must admit so fair a guest when it asks entrance to my heart." Distrust it, sir. It is not a true angel. Once more. How do you know? By what instinct do you pretend to distinguish between a fallen seraph of the abyss, and a messenger from the eternal throne, between a guide and a seducer?" I judge by your countenance, sir, which was troubled when you said the suggestion had returned upon you. I feel sure it will work you more misery if you listen to it. Not at all. It bears the most gracious message in the world. 
For the rest, you are not my conscience-keeper, so don't make yourself uneasy. Here, come in, bonny wanderer." He said this as if he spoke to a vision, viewless to any eye but his own. Then folding his arms, which he had half extended, on his chest, he seemed to enclose in their embrace the invisible being. Now, he continued, again addressing me, I have received the pilgrim, a disguised deity, as I verily believe. Already it has done me good. My heart was a sort of charnel. It will now be a shrine." To speak truth, sir, I don't understand you at all. I cannot keep up the conversation, because it has got out of my depth. Only one thing I know. You said you were not as good as you should like to be, and that you regretted your own imperfection. One thing I can comprehend. You intimated that to have a sullied memory was a perpetual bane. It seems to me that if you tried hard, you would in time find it possible to become what you yourself would approve, and that if from this day you began with resolution to correct your thoughts and actions, you would in a few years have laid up a new and stainless store of recollections, to which you might revert with pleasure." "'Justly thought! Rightly said, Miss Eyre! And at this moment I am paving hell with energy." Sir, I am laying down good intentions, which I believe durable as flint. Certainly my associates and pursuits shall be other than they have been." "'And better?' "'And better. So much better as pure ore as than foul dross. You seem to doubt me. I don't doubt myself. I know what my aim is, what my motives are. And at this moment I pass a law unalterable as that of the Medes and Persians, that both are right." "'They cannot be, sir, if they require a new statute to legalise them." "'They are, Miss Eyre, though they absolutely require a new statute. Unheard-of combinations of circumstances demand unheard-of rules." "'That sounds a dangerous maxim, sir, because one can see at once that it is liable to abuse." "'Sententious sage! So it is! but I swear by my household gods not to abuse it." "'You are human and fallible." "'I am. So are you. What then?" The human and fallible should not arrogate a power, with which the divine and perfect alone can be safely entrusted." "'What power?' "'That of saying of any strange, unsanctioned line of action, let it be right." Let it be right. The very words, you have pronounced them." "'May it be right, then,' I said, as I rose, deeming it useless to continue a discourse which was all darkness to me, and besides, sensible that the character of my interlocutor was beyond my penetration, at least beyond its present reach, and feeling the uncertainty, the vague sense of insecurity which accompanies a conviction of ignorance. "'Where are you going?' To put Adele to bed, it is past her bedtime. You are afraid of me, because I talk like a sphinx. Your language is enigmatical, sir, but though I am bewildered, I am certainly not afraid. You are afraid. Your self-love dreads a blunder. In that sense I do feel apprehensive. I have no wish to talk nonsense. If you did, it would be in such a grave, quiet manner I should mistake it for sense. Do you never laugh, Miss Eyre? Don't trouble yourself to answer. I see you laugh rarely. But you can laugh very merrily. Believe me, you are not naturally austere, any more than I am naturally vicious. The low wood constraint still clings to you somewhat, controlling your features, muffling your voice, and restricting your limbs. And you fear in the presence of a man and a brother or father, or master, or what you will, to smile too gaily, speak too freely, or move too quickly. But in time I think you will learn to be natural with me, as I find it impossible to be conventional with you. And then your looks and movements will have more vivacity and variety than they dare offer now. I see at intervals the glance of a curious sort of bird through the close-set bars of a cage. A vivid, restless, resolute captive is there. Were it but free, it would soar cloud-high. You are still bent on going." "'It has struck nine, sir.' "'Never mind. Wait a minute. 
Adèle is not ready to go to bed yet. My position, Miss Eyre, with my back to the fire and my face to the room, favours observation. While talking to you, I have also occasionally watched Adèle. I have my own reasons for thinking her a curious study, reasons that I may, nay, that I shall impart to you some day. She pulled out of her box, about ten minutes ago, a little pink silk frock. Rapture lit her face as she unfolded it. Coquetry runs in her blood, blends with her brains, and seasons the marrow of her bones. "'Il faut que je sais,' cried she. "'Et à l'instant même,' she rushed out of the room. She is now with Sophie, undergoing a robing process. In a few minutes she will re-enter, and I know what I shall see. A miniature of Céline Varenne as she used to appear on the boards at the rising of— but never mind that. However, my tenderest feelings are about to receive a shock, such as my presentiment. Stay now to see whether it will be realised." Ere long, Adèle's little foot was heard tripping across the hall. She entered, transformed as her guardian had predicted. A dress of rose-coloured satin, very short, and as full in the skirt as it could be gathered, replaced the brown frock she had previously worn. A wreath of rosebuds circled her forehead. Her feet were dressed in silk stockings and small white satin sandals. "'Est-ce que ma robe va bien?' cried she, bounding forwards. "'Et mes souliers! Et mes bras! Tenez, je crois que je vais danser!' And spreading out her dress, she chassed across the room, till, having reached Mr. Rochester, she wheeled lightly round before him on tiptoe, then dropped on one knee at his feet, exclaiming, Monsieur, je vous remercie mille fois de votre bonté. Then rising, she added, C'est comme cela que mamma faisait, n'est-ce pas, monsieur? Precisely, was the answer. And comme cela, she charmed my English gold out of my British breeches pocket. I have been green too, monsieur. Aye, grass green. Not a more vernal tint freshens you now than once freshened me. My spring is gone, however, but it has left me that French floweret on my hands, which in some moods I would fain be rid of, not valuing now the root whence it sprang, having found that it was of a sort which nothing but gold dust could manure. I have but half a liking to the blossom, especially when it looks so artificial as just now. I keep it and rear it rather on the Roman Catholic principle of expiating numerous sins, great or small, by one good work. I'll explain all this some day. Good night. End of chapter 14《Chapter Fifteen of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Fifteen Mr. Rochester did, on a future occasion, explain it. It was one afternoon when he chanced to meet me and Adèle in the grounds, and while she played with Pilot and her shuttlecock, he asked me to walk up and down a long beech avenue within sight of her. He then said that she was the daughter of a French opera dancer, Céline Varenne, towards whom he had once cherished what he called a grande passion. This passion Céline had professed to return with even superior ardour. He thought himself her idol, ugly as he was. He believed, as he said, that she preferred his tie d'athlète to the elegance of the Apollo Belvedere. "'And so, Miss Eyre, so much was I flattered by this preference of the Gallic sylph for her British gnome, that I installed her in hotel. I gave her a complete establishment of servants, a carriage, cashmeres, diamonds, dentelle, etc. In short, I began the process of ruining myself in the received style, like any other spoony. I had not, it seemed, the originality to chalk out a new road to shame and destruction, but trod the old track with stupid exactness not to deviate an inch from the beaten centre. I had, as I deserved to have, the fate of all other spoonies. 
Happening to call one evening when Celine did not expect me, I found her out. But it was a warm night, and I was tired with strolling through Paris, so I sat down in her boudoir, happy to breathe the air consecrated so lately by her presence. No, I exaggerate. I never thought that there was any consecrating virtue about her. It was rather a sort of pastille perfume she had left, a scent of musk and amber than an odour of sanctity. I was just beginning to stifle with the fumes of conservatory flowers and sprinkled essences, when I bethought myself to open the window and step out on to the balcony. It was moonlight and gaslight besides, and very still and serene. The balcony was furnished with a chair or two. I sat down and took out a cigar. I will take one now, if you will excuse me." Here ensued a pause, filled up by the producing and lighting of a cigar. Having placed it to his lips, and breathed a trail of Havana incense on the freezing and sunless air, he went on. "'I liked bonbons, too, in those days, Miss Eyre, and I was croquant,' overlooked the barbarism, croquant chocolat confit, and smoking alternately, and watching meantime the equipage that rolled along the fashionable streets toward the neighbouring opera-house, when in an elegant close carriage, drawn by a beautiful pair of English horses, and distinctly seen in the brilliant city night, I recognised the voiture I had given Céline. She was returning. Of course my heart thumped with impatience against the iron rails I leant upon. The carriage stopped, as I had expected, at the hotel door. My flame, that is the very word for an opera in Amarata, alighted. Though muffled in a cloak, an unnecessary encumbrance, by the by, on so warm a June evening, I knew her instantly by her little foot, seen peeping from the skirt of her dress as she skipped from the carriage step. Bending over the balcony, I was about to murmur, Mon ange, in a tone, of course, which should be audible to the ear of love alone, when a figure jumped from the carriage after her cloaked also. But that was a spurred heel which had rung on the pavement, and that was a hatted head which now passed under the arched porte cochere of the hotel. "'You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? Of course not. I need not ask you, because you have never felt love. You have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps. The shock is yet to be given which shall waken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away. Floating on with closed eyes and muffled ears, you neither see the rocks bristling not far off in the bed of the flood, nor hear the breakers boil at their base. But I tell you, and you may mark my words, you will come some day to a craggy pass in the channel, where the whole of life's stream will be broken up into whirl and tumult, foam and noise. Either you will be dashed to atoms on crag points, or lifted up and borne on by some master wave into a calmer current, as I am now. I like this day. I like that sky of steel. I like the sternness and stillness of the world under this frost. I like Thornfield, its antiquity, its retirement, its old crow-trees and thorn-trees, its grey façade and lines of dark windows reflecting that metal welkin. And yet how long have I abhorred the very thought of it, shunned it like a great plague-house? How do I still abhor?" He ground his teeth and was silent. He arrested his step and struck his boot against the hard ground. Some hated thought seemed to have him in its grip, and to hold him so tightly that he could not advance. We were ascending the avenue when he thus paused. The hall was before us. Lifting his eye to its battlements, he cast over them a glare such as I had never saw before or since. Pain, shame, ire, impatience, disgust, detestation, seemed momentarily to hold a quivering conflict in the large pupil, dilating under his ebon eyebrow. Wild was the wrestle which should be paramount, but another feeling rose and triumphed. Something hard and cynical, self-willed and resolute, it settled his passion and petrified his countenance. He went on. During the moment I was silent, Miss Eyre, I was arranging a point with my destiny. She stood there by that beech-trunk, a hag like one of those who appeared to Macbeth on the heath of forest. You like Thornfield? she said, lifting her finger. And then she wrote in the air a memento, 
which ran in lurid hieroglyphics all along the house-front, between the upper and lower row of windows. Like it if you can, like it if you dare. I will like it, said I. I dare like it. And, he subjoined moodily, I will keep my word. I will break obstacles to happiness, to goodness, yes, goodness. I wish to be a better man than I have been, than I am, as Job's leviathan broke the spear, the dart, and the habergeon, tindrances which others count as iron and brass, I will esteem but straw and rotten wood." Adèle here ran before him with her shuttlecock. "'Away!' he cried harshly. "'Keep at a distance, child, or go in to Sophie.' Continuing then to pursue his walk in silence, I ventured to recall him to the point where he had abruptly diverged. "'Did you leave the balcony, sir?' I asked, when Mademoiselle Varenne entered. I almost expected a rebuff for this hardly well-timed question, but on the contrary, waking out of his scowling abstraction, he turned his eyes towards me, and the shade seemed to clear off his brow. "'Oh! I had forgotten Céline. Well, to resume. When I saw my charmer thus come in accompanied by a cavalier, I seemed to hear a hiss, and the green snake of jealousy rising on undulating coils from the moonlit balcony, glided within my waistcoat, and ate its way in two minutes to my heart's core. Strange! he exclaimed, suddenly starting again from the point. Strange that I should choose you for the confidant of all this young lady! passing strange that you should listen to me quietly, as if it were the most usual thing in the world for a man like me to tell stories of his opera-mistress to a quaint, inexperienced girl like you. But the last singularity explains the first, as I intimated once before. You, with your gravity, considerateness, and caution, were made to be the recipient of secrets. Besides, I know what sort of a mind I have placed in communication with my own. I know it is one not liable to take infection. It is a peculiar mind. It is a unique one. Happily I do not mean to harm it. But if I did, it would not take harm from me. The more you and I converse, the better. For while I cannot blight you, you may refresh me." After this digression, he proceeded. I remained in the balcony. They will come to her boudoir, no doubt, thought I. Let me prepare an ambush. So putting my hand in through the open window, I drew the curtain over it, leaving only an opening through which I could take observations. Then I closed the casement, all but a chink just wide enough to furnish an outlet to lover's whispered vows. Then I stole back to my chair, and as I resumed it, the pair came in. My eye was quickly at the aperture. Céline's chambermaid entered, lit a lamp, left it on the table, and withdrew. The couple were thus revealed to me clearly. Both removed their cloaks. And there was the Varenne, shining in satin and jewels—my gifts, of course. And there was her companion in an officer's uniform. And I knew him for a young roué of a vicomte, a brainless and vicious youth whom I had sometimes met in society, and had never thought of hating, because I despised him so absolutely. On recognising him, the fang of the snake jealousy was instantly broken, because at the same moment my love for Céline sank under an extinguisher. A woman who could betray me for such a rival was not worth contending for. She deserved only scorn. Less, however, than I, who had been her dupe. They began to talk. Their conversation eased me completely. Frivolous, mercenary, heartless, and senseless, it was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener. A card of mine lay on the table. This, being perceived, brought my name under discussion. Neither of them possessed an energy or wit to belabour me soundly, but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in their little way, especially Céline who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects, deformities, she termed them. Now it had been her custom to launch out into fervent admiration of what she called my beauté mal, wherein she differed diametrically from you, who told me point-blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome. The contrast struck me at the time, and— Adèle here came running up again. "'Monsieur, John has just been to say that your agent has called and wished to see you.' 
Ah, in that case I must abridge. Opening the window, I walked in upon them, liberated Celine from my protection, gave her notice to vacate her hotel, offered her a purse for immediate exigencies, disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, protestations, convulsions, made an appointment with the Vicomte for a meeting at the Bois de Boulogne. Next morning I had the pleasure of encountering him, left a bullet in one of his poor etiolated arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken in the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. But unluckily, the Varenne, six months before, had given me this fillette Adèle, who, she affirmed, was my daughter. And perhaps she may be, though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written in her countenance. Pilate is more like me than she. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned her child, and ran away to Italy with a musician or singer. I acknowledged no natural claim on Adèle's part to be more supported by me, nor do I now acknowledge any for I am not her father. But hearing that she was quite destitute, I e'en took the poor thing out of the slime and mud of Paris, and transplanted it here, to grow up a clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden. Mrs. Fairfax found you to train it. But now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl, you will perhaps think differently of your post and protégé. You will be coming to me some day with notice that you have found another place, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, etc. Eh? No. Adèle is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her. And now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoilt pet of a wealthy family, who would hate her governess as a nuisance, to a lonely little orphan, who leans towards her as a friend? No. Oh. That is the light in which you view it. Well, I must go in now, and you too. It darkens." But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adèle and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battledore and shuttlecock. When we went in, and I had removed her bonnet and coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which betrayed in her a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. Still she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I sought in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression announced relationship. It was a pity. If she could but have been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. It was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me. As he had said, there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself. A wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer, and her treachery to him, were everyday matters enough, no doubt, in society. But there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysm of emotion which had suddenly seized him, when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood, and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and its environs. I meditated wonderingly on this incident. But gradually quitting it, as I found it for the present inexplicable, I turned to the consideration of my master's man to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed a tribute to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had now, for some weeks, been more uniform towards me than at the first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur. When he met me unexpectedly, the encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by formal invitation to his presence, I was honoured by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him, and that these evening conferences were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. I indeed talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind unacquainted with the world glimpses of its scenes and ways. I do not mean its corrupt scenes and wicked ways, but such as derived their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterised. 
and I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered, in imagining the new pictures he portrayed, and following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. The friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, with which he treated me, drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master. Yet he was imperious sometimes still. But I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added to life, that I ceased to pine after kindred. My thin crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved. I gathered flesh and strength. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude and many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering than the brightest fire. Yet I had not forgotten his faults. Indeed I could not, for he brought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic, harsh to inferiority of every description. In my secret soul I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I more than once, when sent for to read to him, found him sitting in his library alone, with his head bent on his folded arms, and when he looked up, a morose, almost a malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believed that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality, I say former, for now he seemed corrected of them, had their source in some cruel cross of fate. I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles, and purer taste than such as circumstances had developed, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought there were excellent materials in him, though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was and would have given much to assuage it. Though I had now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue, and told how his destiny had risen up before him, and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. "'Why not?' I asked myself. "'What alienates him from the house? Will he leave it again soon?' Mrs. Fairfax said he seldom stayed here longer than a fortnight at a time, and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent spring, summer, and autumn! How joyless sunshine and fine days will seem! I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious which sounded, I thought, just above me. I wished I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits were depressed. I rose and sat up in bed, listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquillity was broken. The clock, far down in the hall, struck two. Just then it seemed my chamber door was touched, as if fingers had swept the panels in groping away along the dark gallery outside. I said, "'Who is there?' Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once I remembered that it might be Pilot, who, when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I had seen him lying there myself in the mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again through the whole house, I began to feel the return of slumber. But it was not fated that I should sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear, when it fled affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing incident enough. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed, and deep uttered as it seemed at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laugher stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow. But I rose, looked round, and could see nothing. While as I still gazed, the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. 
My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt, my next again to cry out, "'Who is there?' Something gurgled and moaned. Ere long, steps retreated up the gallery towards the third-story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. "'Was that Grace Poole? And is she possessed with a devil?' thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and a shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside, and on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at this circumstance, but still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim, as if filled with smoke, and while looking to the right hand and left, to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax. I thought no more of Grace Poole or the laugh. In an instant I was within the chamber. Tongues of flame darted round the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapour, Mr. Rochester lay stretched motionless in deep sleep. "'Wake! Wake!' I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. Not one moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and ewer. Fortunately one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water. I heaved them up, deluged the bed and its occupant, flew back to my own room, brought my own water-jug, baptized the couch afresh, and by God's aid succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element, the breakage of a pitcher which I flung from my hand when I had emptied it, and above all the splash of the shower-bath I had liberally bestowed, roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake, because I heard him fulminating strange anathemas at finding himself lying in a pool of water. "'Is there a flood?' he cried. "'No, sir,' I answered. "'But there has been a fire. Get up, do. You are quenched now. I will fetch you a candle.' "'In the names of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jane Eyre?' he demanded. "'What have you done with me, witch, sorceress? Who was in the room besides you? Have you plotted to drown me?' "'I will fetch you a candle, sir, and in heaven's name get up. Somebody has plotted something. You cannot too soon find out who and what it is.' "'There! I am up now. But at your peril you fetch a candle yet. Wait two minutes till I get into some dry garments, if any dry there be. Yes, here is my dressing-gown. Now run!" I did run. I brought the candle which still remained in the gallery. He took it from my hand, held it up, and surveyed the bed, all blackened and scorched, the sheets drenched, the carpet round, swimming in water. "'What is it? And who did it?' he asked. I briefly related to him what had transpired, the strange laugh I had heard in the gallery, the step ascending to the third story, the smoke, the smell of fire which had conducted me to his room, in what state I had found matters there, and how I had deluged him with all the water I could lay hands on. He listened very gravely. His face, as I went on, expressed more concern than astonishment. He did not immediately speak when I had concluded. "'Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax?' I asked. "'Mrs. Fairfax? No. What the deuce would you call her for? What can she do? Let her sleep unmolested.' "'Then I will fetch Leah, and wake John and his wife.' "'Not at all. Just be still. You have a shawl on. If you are not warm enough, you may take my cloak yonder. Wrap it about you, and sit down in the armchair. There, I will put it on. Now place your feet on the stool to keep them out of the wet. I am going to leave you a few minutes. I shall take the candle. Remain where you are till I return. Be as still as a mouse. I must pay a visit to the second story. Don't move, remember, or call any one." He went. I watched the light withdraw. He passed up the gallery very softly, unclosed the staircase door with as little noise as possible, shut it after him, and the last ray vanished. I was left in total darkness. I listened for some noise, but heard nothing. A very long time elapsed. I grew weary. It was cold in spite of the cloak, and then I did not see the use of staying as I was not to rouse the house. 
I was at the point of risking Mr. Rochester's displeasure by disobeying his orders, when the light once more gleamed dimly on the gallery wall, and I heard his unshod feet tread the matting. I hope it is he, thought I, and not something worse. He re-entered, pale and very gloomy. "'I have found it all out,' said he, setting his candle down on the washstand. "'It is as I thought.' "'How, sir?' He made no reply, but stood with his arms folded, looking at the ground. At the end of a few minutes he inquired in rather a peculiar tone, "'I forget whether you said you saw anything when you opened your chamber door.' "'No, sir. Only the candlestick on the ground.' "'But you heard an odd laugh. You have heard that laugh before, I should think, or something like it?' "'Yes, sir. There is a woman who sews here, called Grace Poole. She laughs in that way. She is a singular person.' "'Just so. Grace Poole, you have guessed it. She is, as you say, singular. Very. Well, I shall reflect on the subject. Meantime, I am glad that you were the only person besides myself acquainted with the precise details of to-night's incident. You are no talking fool. Say nothing about it. I will account for this state of affairs," pointing to the bed, and now return to your own room. I shall do very well on the sofa in the library for the rest of the night. It is near four. In two hours the servants will be up. Good night, then, sir said I, departing. He seemed surprised, very inconsistently so, as he had just told me to go. "'What?' he exclaimed. "'Are you quitting me already, and in that way?' "'You said I might go, sir.' "'But not without taking leave. Not without a word or two of acknowledgment and good will. Not in short, in that brief, dry fashion. Why, you have saved my life, snatched me from a horrible and excruciating death and you walk past me as if we were mutual strangers. At least shake hands." He held out his hand. I gave him mine. He took it first in one, then in both his own. "'You have saved my life. I have a pleasure in owing you so immense a debt. I cannot say more. Nothing else that has been would have been tolerable to me in the character of creditor for such an obligation. But you—it is different. I feel your benefits no burden, Jane." He paused, gazed at me. Words almost visible trembled on his lips, but his voice was checked. "'Good night again, sir. There is no debt, benefit, burden, obligation in the case.' "'I knew,' he continued, "'you would do me good in some way, at some time. I saw it in your eyes when I first beheld you. Their expression and smile did not— Again he stopped. Did not, he proceeded hastily, strike delight to my very inmost heart so for nothing. People talk of natural sympathies. I have heard of good genii. There are grains of truth in the wildest fable. My cherished preserver, good night. Strange energy was in his voice, strange fire in his look. I am glad I happen to be awake," I said, and then I was going. What? You will go? I am cold, sir. Cold? Yes, and standing in a pool. Go then, Jane, go. But still he retained my hand, and I could not free it. I bethought myself an expedient. I think I hear Mrs. Fairfax move, sir, said I. Well, leave me." He relaxed his fingers, and I was gone. I regained my couch, but never thought of sleep. Till morning dawned I was tossed on a buoyant but unquiet sea, where billows of trouble rolled under surges of joy. I thought sometimes I saw beyond its wild waters a shore, sweet as the hills of Beulah and now and then a freshening gale, wakened by hope, bore my spirit triumphantly towards the bourne. But I could not reach it, even in fancy. A counteracting breeze blew off land, and continually drove me back. Sense would resist delirium, judgment would warn passion. Too feverish to rest, I rose as soon as day dawned. End of chapter 15 
Chapter Sixteen of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Sixteen. I both wished and feared to see Mr. Rochester on the day which followed this sleepless night. I wanted to hear his voice again, yet feared to meet his eye. During the early part of the morning I momentarily expected his coming. He was not in the frequent habit of entering the schoolroom, but he did step in for a few minutes sometimes, and I had the impression that he was sure to visit it that day. But the morning passed just as usual. Nothing happened to interrupt the quiet course of Adele's studies. Only soon after breakfast I heard some bustle in the neighbourhood of Mr. Rochester's chamber, Mrs. Fairfax's voice, and Leah's, and the cook's, that is, John's wife, and even John's own gruff tones. There were exclamations of, "'What a mercy, Master, was not burnt in his bed!' "'It is always dangerous to keep a candle lit at night. How providential that he had presence of mind to think of the water-jug! I wonder he waked nobody. It is to be hoped he will not take cold with sleeping on the library sofa, etc. To much confabulation succeeded a sound of scrubbing and setting to rights, and when I passed the room, in going downstairs to dinner, I saw through the open door that all was again restored to complete order, only the bed was stripped of its hangings. Leah stood up in the window-seat, rubbing the panes of glass dimmed with smoke. I was about to address her, for I wished to know what account had been given of the affair. But on advancing, I saw a second person in the chamber, a woman sitting on a chair by the bedside, and sewing rings to new curtains. That woman was no other than Grace Poole. There she sat, staid and taciturn, looking as usual in her brown stuff gown, her check apron, white handkerchief and cap. She was intent on her work, in which her whole thoughts seemed absorbed. On her hard forehead, and in her commonplace features, was nothing either of the paleness or desperation one would have expected to see marking the countenance of a woman who had attempted murder, and whose intended victim had followed her late last night to her lair, and, as I believed, charged her with the crime she wished to perpetrate. I was amazed, confounded. She looked up, while I still gazed at her. No start, no increase or failure of colour betrayed emotion, consciousness of guilt, or fear of detection. She said, "'Good morning, miss,' in her usual phlegmatic and brief manner, and taking up another ring and more tape, went on with her sewing. "'I will put her to some test,' thought I. Such absolute impenetrability is past comprehension. "'Good morning, Grace,' I said. "'Has anything happened here?' I thought I heard the servants all talking together a while ago. Only Master had been reading in his bed last night. He fell asleep with his candle lit, and the curtains got on fire, but fortunately he awoke before the bedclothes or the woodwork caught, and contrived to quench the flames with the water in the ewer. "'A strange affair,' I said, in a low voice. Then looking at fixedly, "'Did Mr. Rochester wake nobody? Did no one hear him move?' She again raised her eyes to me and this time there was something of consciousness in her expression. She seemed to examine me warily. Then she answered, "'The servants sleep so far off, you know, miss, they would not be likely to hear. Mrs. Fairfax's room and yours are the nearest to Master's, but Mrs. Fairfax said she heard nothing. When people get elderly they often sleep heavy.' She paused, and then added with a sort of assumed indifference, but still in a marked and significant tone. But you are young, miss, and I should say a light sleeper. Perhaps you may have heard a noise." "'I did,' said I, dropping my voice, so that Leah, who was still polishing the panes, could not hear me. And at first I thought it was Pilot. But Pilot cannot laugh, and I am certain I heard a laugh, and a strange one." She took a new needleful of thread, waxed it carefully, threaded her needle with steady hand, and then observed, with perfect composure, "'It is hardly likely Master would laugh, I should think, Miss, when he was in such danger. He must have been dreaming.' "'I was not dreaming,' I said, with some warmth, for her brazen coolness provoked me. Again she looked at me, and with the same scrutinising and conscious eye. 
"'Have you told Master that you heard a laugh?' she inquired. "'I have not had the opportunity of speaking to him this morning. "'You did not think of opening your door and looking out into the gallery?' she further asked. She appeared to be cross-questioning me, attempting to draw from me information unawares. The idea struck me that if she discovered I knew or suspected her guilt, she would be playing some of her malignant pranks on me, I thought it advisable to be on my guard. "'On the contrary,' said I, "'I bolted my door.' "'Then you are not in the habit of bolting your door every night before you get into bed?' "'Fiend! She wants to know my habits, that she may lay her plans accordingly. Indignation again prevailed over prudence. I replied sharply, Hitherto I have often omitted to fasten the bolt. I did not think it necessary. I was not aware any danger or annoyance was to be dreaded at Thornfield Hall. But in future, and I laid marked stress on the words, I shall take good care to make all secure before I venture to lie down. It will be wise to do so was her answer. This neighbourhood is as quiet as any I know, and I never heard of the hall being attempted by robbers since it was a house, though there are hundreds of pounds worth of plate in the plate-closet, as is well known. And you see, for such a large house there are very few servants, because Master has never lived here much, and when he does come, being a bachelor, he needs little waiting on. But I always think it best to err on the safe side. A door is soon fastened, and it is well to have a drawn bolt between one and any mischief that may be about. A deal of people, miss, are for trusting all to Providence, but I say Providence will not dispense with the means, though he often blesses them when they are used discreetly." And here she closed her harangue, a long one for her, and uttered with the demureness of a Quakeress. I still stood absolutely dumbfounded at what appeared to be her miraculous self-possession and most inscrutable hypocrisy, when the cook entered. "'Mrs. Poole,' said she, addressing Grace, the servant's dinner will soon be ready. Will you come down?" No. Just put my pint of porter and a bit of pudding on a tray, and I'll carry it upstairs. You'll have some meat? Just a morsel, and a taste of cheese, that's all. And the sago? Never mind it at present. I shall be coming down before tea-time. I'll make it myself. The cook here turned to me, saying that Mrs. Fairfax was waiting for me, so I departed. I hardly heard Mrs. Fairfax's account of the curtain conflagration during dinner, so much was I occupied in puzzling my brains over the enigmatical character of Grace Poole, and still more in pondering the problem of her position at Thornfield, and questioning why she had not been given into custody that morning, or at the very least dismissed from her master's service. He had almost as much as declared his conviction of her criminality last night. What mysterious cause withheld him from accusing her? Why had he enjoined me, too, to secrecy? It was strange. A bold, vindictive, and haughty gentleman seemed somehow in the power of one of the meanest of his dependents, so much in her power, that even when she lifted her hand against his life, he dared not openly charge her with the attempt, much less punish her for it. Had Grace been young and handsome, I should have been tempted to think that tenderer feelings than prudence or fear influenced Mr. Rochester in her behalf. But, hard-favoured and matronly as she was, the idea could not be admitted. Yet, I reflected, she has been young once. Her youth would be contemporary with her master's. Mrs. Fairfax told me once she had lived here many years. I don't think she can ever have been pretty but for aught I know, she may possess originality and strength of character, to compensate for the want of personal advantages. Mr. Rochester is an amateur of the decided and eccentric. Grace is eccentric, at least. What of a former caprice? A freak very possible to a nature so sudden and headstrong as his, has delivered him into her power, and she now exercises over his actions a secret influence, the result of his own indiscretion which he cannot shake off, and dare not disregard. But having reached this point of conjecture, Mrs. Poole's square, flat figure, and uncomely, dry, even coarse face, recurred so distinctly to my mind's eye, that I thought, no, impossible, my supposition cannot be correct. Yet, suggested the secret voice which talks to us in our own hearts, you are not beautiful either, and perhaps Mr. Rochester reproves you. At any rate, you have often felt as if he did. And last night, remember his words, remember his look, remember his voice. I well remembered all. 
Language, glance, and tone seemed at the moment vividly renewed. I was now in the schoolroom. Adèle was drawing. I bent over her and directed her pencil. She looked up with a sort of start. "'Qu'avez-vous, mademoiselle?' said she. "'Vos doigts tremblent comme la feuille, et vos joues sont rouges, mais rouges comme des cerises.' I am hot, Adèle, with stooping. She went on sketching. I went on thinking. I hastened to drive from my mind the hateful notion I had been conceiving respected Grace Poole. It disgusted me. I compared myself with her, and found we were different. Bessie Levin had said I was quite a lady, and she spoke truth. I was a lady. And now I looked much better than I did when Bessie saw me. I had more colour and more flesh, more life, more vivacity, because I had brighter hopes and keener enjoyments. "'Evening approaches,' said I, as I looked towards the window. I had never heard Mr. Rochester's voice or step in the house to-day, but surely I shall see him before night. I feared the meeting in the morning. Now I desire it, because expectation has been so long baffled that it has grown impatient." When dusk actually closed, and when Adèle left me to go and play in the nursery with Sophie, I did most keenly desire it. I listened for the bell to ring below. I listened for Leah coming up with a message. I fancied sometimes I heard Mr. Rochester's own tread, and I turned to the door expecting it to open and admit him. The door remained shut. Darkness only came in through the window. Still it was not late. He often sent for me at seven and eight o'clock, and it was yet but six. Surely I should not be wholly disappointed to-night, when I had so many things to say to him. I wanted again to introduce the subject of Grace Poole, and to hear what he would answer. I wanted to ask him plainly if he really believed it was she who had made last night's hideous attempt, and if so, why he kept her wickedness a secret. It little mattered whether my curiosity irritated him. I knew the pleasure of vexing and soothing him by turns. It was one I chiefly delighted in, and a sure instinct always prevented me from going too far. Beyond the verge of provocation I never ventured. On the extreme brink I liked well to try my skill. Retaining every minute form of respect, every propriety of my station, I could still meet him in argument without fear or uneasy restraint. This suited both him and me. A tread creaked on the stairs at last. Leah made her appearance, but it was only to intimate that tea was ready in Mrs. Fairfax's room. Thither I repaired, glad at least to go downstairs, for that brought me, I imagined, nearer to Mr. Rochester's presence. "'You must want your tea.' said the good lady, as I joined her. "'You ate so little at dinner.' "'I am afraid,' she continued, "'you are not well to-day. You look flushed and feverish.' "'Oh, quite well. I never felt better.' "'Then you must prove it by evincing a good appetite. Will you fill the teapot while I knit off this needle?' Having completed her task, she rose to draw down the blind, which she had hitherto kept up, by way, I suppose, of making the most of daylight, though dusk was now fast deepening into total obscurity. "'It is fair to-night,' said she, as she looked through the panes, "'though not starlight. Mr. Rochester has, on the whole, had a favourable day for his journey.' "'Journey? Is Mr. Rochester gone anywhere? I did not know he was out.' "'Oh, he set off the moment he had breakfasted. He has gone to the Lees, Mr. Eshton's place, ten miles on the other side Milkit. I believe there is quite a party assembled there. Lord Ingram, Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and others. Do you expect him back to-night? No, nor to-morrow either. I should think he is very likely to say a week or more. When these fine, fashionable people get together, they are so surrounded by elegance and gaiety, so well provided with all that can please and entertain, they are in no hurry to separate. Gentlemen, especially, are often in request on such occasions, and Mr. Rochester is so talented and so lively in society, that I believe he is a general favourite. The ladies are very fond of him, though you would not think his appearance calculated to recommend him particularly in their eyes. But I suppose his acquirements and abilities, perhaps his wealth and good blood, make amends for any little fault of look. Are there ladies at the Lees? There are Mrs. Eshton and her three daughters. Very elegant young ladies, indeed, and there are the Honourable Blanche and Mary Ingram, most beautiful women, I suppose. Indeed, I have seen Blanche, six or seven years since, when she was a girl of eighteen. She came here to a Christmas ball and party Mr. Rochester gave. 
You should have seen the dining-room that day! How richly it was decorated, how brilliantly lit up! I should think there were fifty ladies and gentlemen present, all of the first county families, and Miss Ingram was considered the belle of the evening." "'You saw her, you say, Mrs. Fairfax. What was she like?' "'Oh, yes, I saw her. The dining-room doors were thrown open, and as it was Christmas-time, the servants were allowed to assemble in the hall, to hear some of the ladies sing and play. Mr. Rochester would have me to come in, and I sat down in a quiet corner and watched them. I never saw a most splendid scene. The ladies were magnificently dressed. Most of them, at least most of the younger ones, looked handsome, but Miss Ingram was certainly the Queen. And what was she like? Tall, fine bust, sloping shoulders, long, graceful neck, olive complexion, dark and clear, noble features, eyes rather like Mr. Rochester's, large and black, and as brilliant as her jewels. And then she had such a fine head of hair, raven black, and so becomingly arranged, a crown of thick plaits behind, and in front the longest, the glossiest curls I ever saw. She was dressed in pure white. An amber-coloured scarf was passed over her shoulders and across her breast, tied at the side, and descending in a long fringed end below her knee. She wore an amber-coloured flower, too, in her hair. It contrasted well with the jetty mass of her curls. She was greatly admired, of course. Yes, indeed, and not only for her beauty, but for her accomplishments. She was one of the ladies who sang. A gentleman accompanied her on the piano. She and Mr. Rochester sang a duet. Mr. Rochester? I was not aware he could sing. Oh, he has a fine bass voice, and an excellent taste for music. And Miss Ingram, what sort of a voice had she? A very rich and powerful one. She sang delightfully. It was a treat to listen to her, and she played afterwards. I am no judge of music, but Mr. Rochester is, and I heard him say her execution was remarkably good. And this beautiful and accomplished lady, she is not yet married? It appears not. I fancy neither she nor her sister have very large fortunes. Old Lord Ingram's estates was chiefly entailed, and the eldest son came in for everything almost. But I wonder no wealthy nobleman or gentleman has taken a fancy to her. Mr. Rochester, for instance. He is rich, is he not? Oh, yes. But you see there is a considerable difference in age. Mr. Rochester is nearly forty. She is but twenty-five. What of that? More unequal matches are made every day. True. Yet I should scarcely fancy Mr. Rochester would entertain an idea of the sort. But you eat nothing. You have scarcely tasted since you began tea. No. I am too thirsty to eat. Will you let me have another cup? I was about again to revert to the probability of a union between Mr. Rochester and the beautiful Blanche, but Adèle came in, and the conversation was turned into another channel. When once more alone I reviewed the information I had got, looked into my heart, examined its thoughts and feelings, and endeavoured to bring back with a strict hand such as had been straying through imagination's boundless and trackless waste into the safe fold of common sense. Arraigned at my own bar, memory, having given her evidence of the hopes, wishes, sentiments I had been cherishing since last night, of the general state of mind in which I had indulged for nearly a fortnight past, Reason, having come forward and told, in her own quiet way, a plain, unvarnished tale, showing how I had rejected the real and rabidly devoured the ideal, I pronounced judgment to this effect. That a greater fool than Jane Eyre had never breathed the breath of life, that a more fantastic idiot had never surfeited herself on sweet lies, and swallowed poison as if it were nectar. You, I said, a favourite with Mr. Rochester! You, gifted with the power of pleasing him! You, of importance to him in any way! Go! Your folly sickens me! And you have derived pleasure from occasional tokens of preference, equivocal tokens shown by a gentleman of family, and a man of the world who are dependent and a novice! How dared you! Poor stupid dupe! Could not even self-interest make you wiser? You repeated to yourself this morning the brief scene of last night. Cover your face and be ashamed. He said something in praise of your eyes, did he? Blind puppy! Open their bleared lids and look on your own accursed senselessness. 
It does good to no woman to be flattered by her superior, who cannot possibly intend to marry her. And it is madness in all women to let a secret love kindle within them, which, if unreturned and unknown, must devour the life that feeds it, and, if discovered and responded to, must lead, ignis fatus-like, into miry wilds whence there is no extrication. Listen, then, Jane Eyre, to your sentence. To-morrow, place the glass before you, and draw in chalk your own picture, faithfully, without softening one defect, omit no harsh line, smooth away no displeasing irregularity, write under it, portrait of a governess, disconnected, poor, and plain. Afterwards, take a piece of smooth ivory, you have one prepared in your drawing-box, Take your palette, mix your freshest, finest, clearest tints, choose your most delicate camel-hair pencils, delineate carefully the loveliest face you can imagine, paint it in your softest shades and sweetest lines, according to the description given by Mrs. Fairfax of Blanche Ingram. Remember the raven ringlets, the oriental eye. What? You revert to Mr. Rochester as a model? Order! No snivel, no sentiment, no regret! I will endure only sense and resolution. Recall the august yet harmonious lineaments, the Grecian neck and bust. Let the round and dazzling arm be visible, and the delicate hand. Omit neither diamond ring nor gold bracelet. Portray faithfully the attire, aerial lace and glistening satin, graceful scarf and golden rose. Call it Blanche, an accomplished lady of rank. Whenever, in future, you should chance to fancy Mr. Rochester thinks well of you, take out these two pictures and compare them. Say, Mr. Rochester might probably win that noble lady's love, if he chose to strive for it. Is it likely he would waste a serious thought on this indigent and insignificant plebeian? I'll do it, I resolved, and having framed this determination, I grew calm and fell asleep. I kept my word. An hour or two sufficed to sketch my own portrait in crayons, and in less than a fortnight I had completed an ivory miniature of an imaginary Blanche Ingram. It looked a lovely face enough, and when compared with the real head and chalk, the contrast was as great as self-control could desire. I derived benefit from the task. It had kept my head and hands employed, and had given force and fixedness to the new impressions I wished to stamp indelibly on my heart. Ere long I had reason to congratulate myself on the course of wholesome discipline to which I had thus forced my feelings to submit. Thanks to it, I was able to meet subsequent occurrences with a decent calm, which, had they found me unprepared, I should probably have been unequal to maintain, even externally. End of chapter 16 Chapter Seventeen of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Seventeen. A week passed, and no news arrived of Mr. Rochester. Ten days, and still he did not come. Mrs. Fairfax said she should not be surprised if he were to go straight from the Lees to London, and thence to the Continent, and not show his face again at Thornfield for a year to come. He had not unfrequently quitted it in a manner quite as abrupt and unexpected. When I heard this, I was beginning to feel a strange chill and failing at the heart. I was actually permitting myself to experience a sickening sense of disappointment. But rallying my wits and recollecting my principles, I at once called my sensations to order, and it was wonderful how I got over the temporary blunder, how I cleared up the mistake of supposing Mr. Rochester's movements a matter in which I had any cause to take a vital interest. Not that I humbled myself by a slavish notion of inferiority. On the contrary, I just said, you have nothing to do with the master of Thornfield, further than to receive the salary he gives you for teaching his protégé, and to be grateful for such respectful and kind treatment as, if you do your duty, you have a right to expect at his hands. 
Be sure that is the only tie he seriously acknowledges between you and him, so don't make him the object of your fine feelings. Your raptures, agonies, and so forth, he is not of your order. Keep to your caste, and be too self-respecting to lavish the love of the whole heart, soul, and strength, where such a gift is not wanted and would be despised." I went on with my day's business tranquilly. But ever and anon vague suggestions kept wandering across my brain, of reasons why I should quit Thornfield. And I kept involuntarily framing advertisements, and pondering conjectures about new situations. These thoughts I did not think to check. They might germinate and bear fruit, if they could. Mr. Rochester had been absent upwards of a fortnight, when the post brought Mrs. Fairfax a letter. "'It is from the master!' said she, as she looked at the direction. Now I suppose we shall know whether we are to expect his return or not." And while she broke the seal and perused the document, I went on taking my coffee. We were at breakfast. It was hot, and I attributed to that circumstance a fiery glow which suddenly rose to my face. Why my hand shook, and why I involuntarily spilt half the contents of my cup into my saucer, I did not choose to consider. Well, I sometimes think we are too quiet, but we run a chance of being busy enough now, for a little while at least," said Mrs. Fairfax, still holding the note before her spectacles. Ere I permitted myself to request an explanation, I tied the string of Adele's pinafore, which happened to be loose. Having helped her also to another bun, and refilling her mug with milk, I said nonchalantly, "'Mr. Rochester is not likely to return soon, I suppose. Indeed, he is! In three days, he says. That will be next Thursday, and not alone either. I don't know how many of the fine people at the Lees are coming with him. He sends directions for all the best bedrooms to be prepared, and the library and drawing-rooms are to be cleaned out. I am to get more kitchen-hands from the George Inn at Milcote, and from wherever else I can. And the ladies will bring their maids and gentlemen their valets, so we shall have a full house of it." and Mrs. Fairfax swallowed her breakfast, and hastened away to commence operations. The three days were, as she had foretold, busy enough. I had thought all the rooms at Thornfield beautifully clean and well arranged, but it appears I was mistaken. Three women were got to help, and such scrubbing, such brushing, such washing of paint and beating of carpets, such taking down and putting up of pictures, such polishing of mirrors and lustres, such lighting of fires and bedrooms, such airing of sheets and feather beds on hearths, I never beheld, either before or since. Adèle ran quite wild in the midst of it. The preparations for company and the prospect of their arrival seemed to throw her into ecstasies. She would have Sophie to look over all her toilette, as she called frocks, to furbish up any that were passé, and to air and arrange the new. For herself she did nothing but caper about in the front chambers, jump on and off the bedstead, and lie on the mattresses and piled up bolsters and pillows before the enormous fires roaring in the chimneys. From school duty she was exonerated. Mrs. Fairfax had pressed me into her service, and I was all day in the storeroom, helping, or hindering, her and the cook, learning to make custards and cheesecakes and French pastry, to truss game and garnish dessert dishes. The party were expected to arrive on Thursday afternoon in time for dinner at six. During the intervening period I had no time to nurse chimeras, and I believe I was as active and gay as anybody, Adele excepted. Still, now and then, I received a damping check to my cheerfulness, and was, in spite of myself, thrown back on the region of doubts and portents, and dark conjectures. This was when I chanced to see the third-story staircase door, which of late had always been kept locked, open slowly, and give passage to the form of Grace Poole, in prim cap, white apron, and handkerchief. When I watched her glide along the gallery, her quiet tread muffled in a list slipper, when I saw her look into the bustling, topsy-turvy bedrooms, just say a word, perhaps, to the charwoman about the proper way to polish a grate, or clean a marble mantelpiece, or take stains from papered walls, and then pass on. She would thus descend to the kitchen once a day, eat her dinner, smoke a moderate pipe on the hearth, and go back, carrying her pot of porter with her, for her private solace, in her own gloomy upper haunt. 
Only one hour in twenty-four did she pass with her fellow-servants below. All the rest of her time was spent in some low-sealed oaken chamber of the second story. There she sat and sewed, and probably laughed drearily to herself, as companionless as a prisoner in his dungeon. The strangest thing of all was, that not a soul in the house, except me, noticed her habits, or seemed to marvel at them. No one discussed her position or employment, no one pitied her solitude or isolation. I once indeed overheard part of a dialogue between Leah and one of the charwomen, of which Grace formed the subject. Leah had been saying something I had not caught, and the charwoman remarked, "'She gets good wages, I guess.' "'Yes,' said Leah. I wish I had as good. Not that mine are to complain of. There's no stinginess at Thornfield, but they're not one-fifth of the sum Mrs. Poole receives. And she is laying by. She goes every quarter to the bank at Milcote. I should not wonder but she has enough saved to keep her independent if she liked to leave. But I suppose she got used to the place. And then she's not forty yet, and strong and able for anything. It is too soon for her to give up business." "'She is a good hand, I dare say,' said the charwoman. "'Ah! she understands what she has to do. Nobody better,' rejoined Leah significantly. "'And it is not every one could fill her shoes, not for all the money she gets.' "'That it is not,' was the reply. "'I wonder whether the master—' The charwoman was going on, but here Leah turned and perceived me, and she instantly gave her companion a nudge. "'Doesn't she know?' I heard the woman whisper. Leah shook her head, and the conversation was of course dropped. All I had gathered from it amounted to this, that there was a mystery at Thornfield, and that from participation in that mystery I was purposely excluded. Thursday came. All work had been completed the previous evening. Carpets were laid down, bed-hangings festooned, radiant white counterpanes spread, toilet-tables arranged furniture rubbed, flowers piled in vases, both chambers and saloons looked as fresh and bright as hands could make them. The hall, too, was scoured, and the great carved clock, as well as the steps and banisters of the staircase, were polished to the brightness of glass. In the dining-room the sideboard flashed resplendent with plate, in the drawing-room and boudoir vases of exotics bloomed on all sides. Afternoon arrived. Mrs. Fairfax assumed her best black satin gown, her gloves, and her gold watch, for it was her part to receive the company, to conduct the ladies to their rooms, etc. Adèle, too, would be dressed, though I thought she had little chance of being introduced to the party that day at least. However, to please her, I allowed Sophie to apparel her in one of her short, full muslin frocks. For myself, I had no need to make any change. I should not be called upon to quit my sanctum of the schoolroom for a sanctum it was now become to me, a very pleasant refuge in time of trouble. It had been a mild, serene spring day, one of those days which, towards the end of March at the beginning of April, rise shining over the earth as heralds of summer. It was drawing to an end now, but the evening was even warm, and I sat at work in the schoolroom with the window open. "'It gets late,' said Mrs. Fairfax, entering in rustling state. I am glad I ordered dinner an hour after the time Mr. Rochester mentioned, for it is past six now. I have sent John down to the gates to see if there is anything on the road. One can see a long way from thence in the direction of Milcote." She went to the window. "'Here he is,' said she. "'Well, John,' leaning out, "'any news?' "'They're coming, ma'am,' was the answer. "'They'll be here in ten minutes.' Adèle flew to the window. I followed, taking care to stand on one side, so that, screened by the curtain, I could see without being seen. The ten minutes John had given seemed very long, but at last wheels were heard, four equestrians galloped up the drive, and after them came two open carriages. Fluttering veils and waving plumes filled the vehicles. Two of the cavaliers were young, dashing-looking gentlemen. The third was Mr. Rochester, on his black horse, Mesrour, pilot bounding before him. At his side rode a lady, and he and she were the first of the party. Her purple riding-habit almost swept the ground, her veil streamed long on the breeze, mingling with its transparent folds and gleaming through them, shone rich raven ringlets. "'Miss Ingram!' exclaimed Mrs. Fairfax, and away she hurried to her post below. 
The cavalcade, following the sweep of the drive, quickly turned the angle of the house, and I lost sight of it. Adèle now petitioned to go down, but I took her on my knee, and gave her to understand that she must not on any account think of venturing in sight of the ladies, either now or at any other time, unless expressly sent for, that Mr. Rochester would be very angry, etc. Some natural tears she shed on being told this, but as I began to look very grave, she consented at last to wipe them. A joyous stir was now audible in the hall. Gentlemen's deep tones and ladies' silvery accents blent harmoniously together, and distinguishable above all, though not loud, was the sonorous voice of the master of Thornfield Hall, welcoming his fair and gallant guests under his roof. Then light steps ascended the stairs, and there was a tripping through the gallery, and soft cheerful laughs, and opening and closing doors, and for a time a hush. "'Elle change de toilette!' said Adèle, who, listening attentively, had followed every movement, and she sighed. "'Chez maman,' said she, "'quand il y avait du monde, je le suivais partout, au salon et à la chambre. Souvent je regardais les femmes de chambre coiffées et habillées les dames, et c'était si amusant, comme cela on apprend. "'Don't you feel hungry, Adèle?' "'Mais oui, mademoiselle, voilà cinq ou six heures que nous n'avons pas mangé.' "'Well, now, while the ladies are in their rooms, I will venture down and get you something to eat.' And issuing from my asylum with precaution, I sought a back stairs which conducted directly to the kitchen. All in that region was fire and commotion. The soup and fish were in the last stage of projection, and the cook hung over her crucibles in a frame of mind and body threatening spontaneous combustion. In the servants' hall two coachmen and three gentlemen's gentlemen stood or sat round the fire. The Abigails, I suppose, were upstairs with their mistresses. The new servants that had been hired from Milkett were bustling about everywhere. Threading this chaos, I at last reached the larder. There I took possession of a cold chicken, a roll of bread, some tarts, a plate or two, and a knife and fork. With this booty I made a hasty retreat. I had regained the gallery, and was just shutting the back door behind me, when an accelerated hum warned me that the ladies were about to issue from their chambers. I could not proceed to the schoolroom without passing some of their doors, and running the risk of being surprised with my cargo of victuallage. So I stood still at this end, which, being windowless, was dark, quite dark now, for the sun was set and twilight gathering. Presently the chambers gave up their fair tenants one after another. Each came out gaily and airily, with dresses that gleamed lustrous through the dark. For a moment they stood grouped together at the other extremity of the gallery, conversing in a key of sweet, subdued vivacity. They then descended the staircase almost as noiselessly as a bright mist rolls down a hill. Their collective appearance had left on me an impression of high-born elegance, such as I had never before received. I found Adèle peeping through the schoolroom door, which she held ajar. "'What beautiful ladies!' cried she in English. "'Oh, I wish I might go to them! Do you think Mr. Rochester will send for us by and by after dinner?" "'No, indeed, I don't. Mr. Rochester has something else to think about. Never mind the ladies to-night. Perhaps you will see them to-morrow. Here is your dinner.' She was really hungry, so the chicken and tarts served to divert her attention for a time. It was well I secured this forage, or both she and I, and Sophie, to whom I conveyed a share of our repast, would have run a chance of getting no dinner at all. Every one downstairs was too much engaged to think of us. The dessert was not carried out till after nine, and at ten footmen were still running to and fro with trays and coffee-cups. I allowed Adèle to sit up much later than usual, for she declared she could not possibly go to sleep while the doors kept opening and shutting below, and people bustling about. Besides, she added, a message might possibly come from Mr. Rochester when she was undressed. Et alors, quel dommage! I told her stories as long as she would listen to them, and then for a change I took her out into the gallery. The hall lamp was now lit, and it amused her to look over the balustrade and watch the servants passing backwards and forwards. When the evening was far advanced, a sound of music issued from the drawing-room, whither the piano had been removed. Adèle and I sat down on the top step of the stairs to listen. Presently a voice blent with the rich tones of the instrument. It was a lady who sang, and very sweet her notes were. The solo over, a duet followed, and then a glee. 
A joyous conversational murmur filled up the intervals. I listened long. Suddenly I discovered that my ear was wholly intent on analysing the mingled sounds, and trying to discriminate amidst the confusion of accents those of Mr. Rochester. And when it caught them, which it soon did, it found a further task in framing the tones, rendered by distance inarticulate, into words. The clock struck eleven. I looked at Adèle, whose head leant against my shoulder. Her eyes were waxing heavy, so I took her up in my arms and carried her off to bed. It was near one before the gentlemen and ladies sought their chambers. The next day was as fine as its predecessor. It was devoted by the party to an excursion to some site in the neighbourhood. They set out early in the forenoon, some on horseback, the rest in carriages. I witnessed both the departure and the return. Miss Ingram, as before, was the only lady equestrian, and as before, Mr. Rochester galloped at her side. The two rode a little apart from the rest. I pointed out this circumstance to Mrs. Fairfax, who was standing at the window with me. "'You said it was not likely they should think of being married,' said I. "'But you see, Mr. Rochester evidently prefers her to any of the other ladies.' "'Yes, I dare say. No doubt he admires her.' "'And she him,' I added. Look how she leans her head toward him as if they were conversing confidentially. I wish I could see her face. I have never had a glimpse of it yet. You will see her this evening, answered Mrs. Fairfax. I happened to remark to Mr. Rochester how much Adèle wished to be introduced to the ladies, and he said, Oh, let her come into the drawing-room after dinner, and request Miss Eyre to accompany her. Yes, he said that for mere politeness. I need not go, I am sure, I answered. Well, I observed to him that as you were unused to company, I did not think you would like appearing before so gay a party, all strangers. And he replied in his quick way, Nonsense! If she objects, tell her it is my particular wish, and if she resists, say I shall come and fetch her in case of contumacy. I will not give him that trouble, I answered. I will go, if no better may be, but I don't like it. Shall you be there, Mrs. Fairfax? No, I pleaded off, and he admitted my plea. I'll tell you how to manage so as to avoid the embarrassment of making a formal entrance, which is the most disagreeable part of the business. You must go into the drawing-room while it is empty, before the ladies leave the dinner-table. Choose your seat in any quiet nook you like. You need not stay long after the gentlemen come in, unless you please. Just let Mr. Rochester see you are there, and slip away. Nobody will notice you. Will these people remain long, do you think? Perhaps two or three weeks, certainly not more. After the Easter recess, Sir George Lynn, who is lately elected member for Milcote, will have to go up to town and take his seat. I dare say Mr. Rochester will accompany him. It surprises me that he has already made so protracted a stay at Thornfield." It was with some trepidation that I perceived the hour approach when I was to repair with my charge to the drawing-room. Adèle had been in a state of ecstasy all day, after hearing she was to be presented to the ladies in the evening and it was not till Sophie commenced the operation of dressing her that she sobered down. Then the importance of the process quickly steadied her, and by the time she had her curls arranged in well-smoothed, drooping clusters, her pink satin frock put on, her long sash tied, and her lace mittens adjusted, she looked as grave as any judge. No need to warn her not to disarrange her attire. When she was dressed, she sat demurely down in her little chair, taking care previously to lift up the satin skirt, for fear she should crease it, and assured me she would not stir thence till I was ready. This I quickly was. My best dress, the silver-grey one, purchased for Miss Temple's wedding, and never worn since, was soon put on, my hair was soon smoothed, my sole ornament, the pearl brooch, soon assumed we descended. Fortunately, there was another entrance to the drawing-room than that through the saloon where they were all seated at dinner. We found the apartment vacant, a large fire burning silently on the marble hearth, and wax candles shining in bright solitude, amid the exquisite flowers with which the tables were adorned. The crimson curtain hung before the arch, slight as was the separation this drapery formed from the party in the adjoining saloon, they spoke in so low a key, that nothing of their conversation could be distinguished beyond a soothing murmur. Adèle, who appeared to be still under the influence of most solemnising impression, sat down without a word on the footstool I pointed out to her. I retired to a window-seat, and taking a book from a table near, endeavoured to read. 
Adèle brought her stool to my feet. Ere long she touched my knee. "'What is it, Adèle?' Est-ce que je ne puis pas prendre une seule de ces fleurs magnifiques, mademoiselle, seulement pour compléter ma toilette? You think too much of your toilette, Adèle, but you may have a flower. And I took a rose from a vase and fastened it in her sash. She sighed a sigh of ineffable satisfaction, as if her cup of happiness were now full. I turned my face away to conceal a smile I could not suppress. There was something ludicrous as well as painful in the little Parisienne's earnest and innate devotion to matters of dress. A soft sound of rising now became audible. The curtain was swept back from the arch. Through it appeared the dining-room, with its lit lustre pouring down light on the silver and glass of a magnificent dessert service, covering a long table. A band of ladies stood in the opening. They entered, and the curtain fell behind them. There were but eight. Yet somehow, as they flocked in, they gave the impression of a much larger number. Some of them were very tall. Many were dressed in white, and all had a sweeping amplitude of array that seemed to magnify their persons, as a mist magnifies the moon. I rose and curtsied to them. One or two bent their heads in return. The others only stared at me. They dispersed about the room, reminding me, by the lightness and buoyancy of their movements, of a flock of white plumy birds. Some of them threw themselves in half-reclining positions on the sofas and ottomans. Some bent over the tables and examined the flowers and books. The rest gathered in a group round the fire. All talked in a low but clear tone, which seemed habitual to them. I knew their names afterwards, and may as well mention them now. First there was Mrs. Eshton and two of her daughters. She had evidently been a handsome woman, and was well preserved still. Of her daughters, the eldest, Amy, was rather little, naive and childlike in face and manner, and piquant in form. Her white muslin dress and blue sash became her very well. The second, Louisa, was taller and more elegant in figure, with a very pretty face, of that order the French term minois chiffonnier. Both sisters were fair as lilies. Lady Lynn was a stout and large personage of about forty, very erect, very haughty-looking, richly dressed in a satin robe of changeful sheen. Her dark hair shone glossily under the shade of an azure plume, and within the circlet of a band of gems. Mrs. Colonel Dent was less showy, but I thought more ladylike. She had a slight figure, a pale, gentle face, and fair hair. Her black satin dress, her scarf of rich foreign lace, and her pearl ornaments pleased me better than the rainbow radiance of the titled dame. But the three most distinguished, partly, perhaps, because the tallest figures of the band, were the dowager Lady Ingram and her daughters, Blanche and Mary. They were all three of the loftiest stature of women. The dowager might be between forty and fifty, her shape was still fine, her hair, by candlelight at least, was still black, her teeth, too, were still apparently perfect. Most people would have termed her a splendid woman of her age, and so she was, no doubt, physically speaking. But then there was an expression of almost insupportable haughtiness in her bearing and countenance. She had Roman features and a double chin, disappearing into a throat like a pillar. These features appeared to me not only inflated and darkened, but even furrowed with pride, and the chin was sustained by the same principle, in a position of almost preternatural erectness. She had, likewise, a fierce and a hard eye. It reminded me of Mrs. Reed's. She mouthed her words in speaking. Her voice was deep, its inflections very pompous, very dogmatical, very intolerable, in short. A crimson velvet robe and a shawl turban of some gold-wrought Indian fabric invested her, I suppose she thought, with a truly imperial dignity. Blanche and Mary were of equal stature, straight and tall as poplars. Mary was too slim for her height, but Blanche was moulded like a dian. I regarded her, of course, with special interest. First, I wished to see whether her appearance accorded with Mrs. Fairfax's description, secondly, whether it at all resembled the fancy miniature I had painted of her, and thirdly, it will out, whether it was such as I should fancy likely to suit Mr. Rochester's taste. As far as person went, she answered point for point, both to my picture and Mrs. Fairfax's description. The noble bust, the sloping shoulders, the graceful neck, the dark eyes, and black ringlets were all there. But her face! Her face was like her mother's, her youthful, unfurrowed likeness, 
the same low brow, the same high features, the same pride. It was not, however, so saturnine a pride. She laughed continually. Her laugh was satirical, and so was the habitual expression of her arched and haughty lip. Genius is said to be self-conscious. I cannot tell whether Miss Ingram was a genius, but she was self-conscious, remarkably self-conscious indeed. She entered into a discourse on botany with the gentle Mrs. Dent. It seemed Mrs. Dent had not studied that science, though, as she said, she liked flowers, especially wild ones. Miss Ingram had, and she ran over its vocabulary with an air. I presently perceived she was, what is vernacularly termed, trailing Mrs. Dent that is, playing on her ignorance. Her trail might be clever, but it was decidedly not good-natured. She played. Her execution was brilliant. She sang. Her voice was fine. She talked French apart to her mamma, and she talked it well, with fluency and with a good accent. Mary had a milder and more open countenance than Blanche, softer features, too, and a skin some shades fairer. Miss Ingram was as dark as a Spaniard. But Mary was deficient in life. Her face lacked expression, her eye lustre. She had nothing to say, and having once taken her seat, remained fixed like a statue in its niche. The sisters were both attired in spotless white. And did I now think Miss Ingram such a choice as Mr. Rochester would be likely to make? I could not tell. I did not know his taste in female beauty. If he liked the majestic, she was the very type of majesty. Then she was accomplished, sprightly. Most gentlemen would admire her, I thought, and that he did admire her I already seemed to have obtained proof. To remove the last shade of doubt, it remained but to see them together. You are not to suppose, reader, that Adele has all this time been sitting motionless on the stool at my feet. No, when the ladies entered, she rose, advanced to meet them, made a stately reverence, and said with gravity, Bonjour, mesdames and Miss Ingram had looked down at her with a mocking air, and exclaimed, "'Oh! what a little puppet!' Lady Lynn had remarked, "'It is Mr. Rochester's ward, I suppose, the little French girl he was speaking of.' Mrs. Dent had kindly taken her hand, and given her a kiss. Amy and Louisa Eshton had cried out simultaneously, "'What a love of a child!' And then they had called her to a sofa, where she now sat, ensconced between them, chattering alternately in French and broken English, absorbing not only the young lady's attention, but that of Mrs. Eshton and Lady Lynn, and getting spoilt to her heart's content. At last coffee is brought in, and the gentlemen are summoned. I sit in the shade, if any shade there be in this brilliantly lit apartment. The window curtain half hides me. Again the arch yawns. They come. The collective appearance of the gentlemen, like that of the ladies, is very imposing. They are all costumed in black. Most of them are tall, some young. Henry and Frederick Lynn are very dashing sparks indeed, and Colonel Dent is a fine, soldierly man. Mr. Eshton, the magistrate of the district, is gentlemanlike. His hair is quite white, his eyebrows and whiskers still dark, which gives him something of the appearance of a pair nobler de théâtre. Lord Ingram, like his sisters, is very tall. Like them also, he is handsome. But he shares Mary's apathetic and listless look. He seems to have more length of limb than vivacity of blood or vigour of brain. And where is Mr. Rochester? He comes in last. I am not looking at the arch, yet I see him enter. I try to concentrate my attention on those netting-needles, on the measures of the purse I am forming. I wish to think only of the work I have in my hands, to see only the silver beads and silk threads that lie in my lap. Whereas I distinctly behold his figure, and I inevitably recall the moment when I last saw it, just after I had rendered him what he deemed an essential service, and he, holding my hand and looking down on my face, surveyed me with eyes that revealed a heart full and eager to overflow, in whose emotions I had a part. How near had I approached him at that moment? What had occurred since, calculated to change his and my relative positions? Yet now, how distant, how far estranged we were! So far estranged that I did not expect him to come and speak to me. I did not wonder, when, without looking at me, he took a seat at the other side of the room, and began conversing with some of the ladies. 
No sooner did I see that his attention was riveted on them, and that I might gaze without being observed, than my eyes were drawn involuntarily to his face. I could not keep their lids under control. They would rise, and the irids would fix on him. I looked, and had an acute pleasure in looking, a precious yet poignant pleasure, pure gold with a steely point of agony, a pleasure like what the first perishing man might feel, who knows the well to which he has crept is poisoned, yet stoops and drinks divine draughts nevertheless. Most true it is that beauty is in the eye of the gazer. My master's colourless olive face, square massive brow, broad and jetty eyebrows, deep eyes, strong features, firm grim mouth, all energy, decision, will, were not beautiful, according to rule but they were more than beautiful to me. They were full of an interest, an influence that quite mastered me, that took my feelings from my own power and fettered them in his. I had not intended to love him. The reader knows I had wrought hard to extirpate from my soul the germs of love there detected, and now, at the first renewed view of him, they spontaneously arrived, green and strong. He made me love him without looking at me. I compared him with his guests. What was the gallant grace of the Lynns, the languid elegance of Lord Ingram, even the military distinction of Colonel Dent, contrasted with his look of native pith and genuine power? I had no sympathy in their appearance, their expression, yet I could imagine that most observers would call them attractive, handsome, imposing, while they would pronounce Mr. Rochester at once harsh-featured and melancholy-looking. I saw them smile, laugh. It was nothing. The light of the candles had as much soul in it as their smile, the tinkle of the bell as much significance as their laugh. I saw Mr. Rochester smile. His stern features softened. His eye grew both brilliant and gentle, its ray both searching and sweet. He was talking at the moment to Louisa and Amy Eshton. I wondered to see them receive with calm that look which seemed to me so penetrating. I expected their eyes to fall, their colour to rise under it. Yet I was glad when I found they were in no sense moved. He is not to them what he is to me, I thought. He is not of their kind. I believe he is of mine. I am sure he is. I feel akin to him. I understand the language of his countenance and movements. Though rank and wealth sever us widely, I have something in my brain and heart, in my blood and nerves, that assimilates me mentally to him. Did I say, a few days since, that I had nothing to do with him but to receive my salary at his hands? Did I forbid myself to think of him in any other light than as a paymaster? Blasphemy against nature! Every good, true, vigorous feeling I have gathers impulsively round him. I know I must conceal my sentiments. I must smother hope. I must remember that he cannot care much for me. For when I say that I am of his kind, I do not mean that I have his force to influence and his spell to attract. I mean only that I have certain tastes and feelings in common with him. I must then repeat continually that we are for ever sundered. And yet, while I breathe and think, I must love him." Coffee is handed. The ladies, since the gentlemen entered, have become lively as larks. Conversation waxes brisk and merry. Colonel Dent and Mr. Eshton argue on politics. Their wives listen. The two proud dowagers, Lady Lynn and Lady Ingram, confabulate together. Sir George, whom, by the by, I have forgotten to describe, a very big and very fresh-looking country gentleman, stands before their sofa, coffee-cup in hand, and occasionally puts in a word. Mr. Frederick Lynn has taken a seat beside Mary Ingram, and is showing her the engravings of a splendid volume. She looks, smiles now and then, but apparently says little. The tall and phlegmatic Lord Ingram leans with folded arms on the chair-back of the little and lively Amy Eshton. She glances up at him, and chatters like a wren. She likes him better than she does Mr. Rochester. Henry Lynn has taken possession of an ottoman at the feet of Louisa. Adele shares it with him. He is trying to talk French with her, and Louisa laughs at his blunders. With whom will Blanche Ingram pair? She is standing alone at the table, bending gracefully over an album. She seems waiting to be sought, but she will not wait too long. She herself selects a mate. Mr. Rochester, having quitted the Eshtons, stands on the hearth as solitary as she stands by the table. She confronts him, 
taking her station on the opposite side of the mantelpiece. "'Mr. Rochester, I thought you were not fond of children.' "'Nor am I.' "'Then what induced you to take charge of such a little doll as that?' pointing to Adèle. "'Where did you pick her up?' "'I did not pick her up. She was left on my hands.' "'You should have sent her to school.' "'I could not afford it. Schools are so dear.' "'Why, I suppose you have a governess for her. I saw a person with her just now. Is she gone? Oh, no! There she is still, behind the window-curtain. You pay her, of course. I should think it quite as expensive. More so, for you have them both to keep in addition.' I feared, or should I say hoped, the allusion to me would make Mr. Rochester glance my way, and I involuntarily shrank further into the shade, but he never turned his eyes. I have not considered the subject," said he, indifferently, looking straight before him. "'No! You men never do consider economy and common sense. You should hear Mamma on the chapter of governesses. Mary and I have had, I should think, a dozen at least in our day. Half of them detestable, and the rest ridiculous, and all incubi. Were they not, Mamma? "'Did you speak my own?' The young lady, thus claimed as the dowager's special property, reiterated her question with an explanation. "'My dearest, don't mention governesses. The word makes me nervous. I have suffered a martyrdom from their incompetency and caprice. I thank heaven I have now done with them.' Mrs. Dent here bent over to the pious lady, and whispered something in her ear. I suppose, from the answer elicited, it was a reminder that one of the anathematized race was present. "'Tant pis,' said her ladyship. "'I hope it may do her good.' Then, in a lower tone, but still loud enough for me to hear, "'I noticed her. I am a judge of physiognomy, and in hers I see all the faults of her class.' "'What are they, madam?' inquired Mr. Rochester aloud. "'I will tell you in your private ear,' replied she, wagging her turban three times with portentous significancy but my curiosity will be past its appetite. It craves food now." "'Ask Blanche. She is nearer you than I." "'Oh, don't refer him to me, Mamma. I have just one word to say of the whole tribe. They are a nuisance. Not that I ever suffered much from them. I took care to turn the tables. What tricks Theodore and I used to play on on Miss Wilson's, and Mrs. Gray's, and Madame Joubert! Mary was always too sleepy to join in a plot with spirit. The best fun was with Madame Joubert. Miss Wilson was a poor sickly thing, lachrymose and low-spirited, not worth the trouble of vanquishing, in short. And Mrs. Gray was coarse and insensible. No blow took effect on her. But poor Madame Joubert! I see her yet in her raging passions, when we had driven her to extremities, spilt our tea, crumbled our bread and butter, tossed our books up to the ceiling, and played a shower of airy with the ruler and desk, the fender and fire-irons. Theodore, do you remember those merry days?" "'Yes, to be sure I do,' drawled Lord Ingram. And the poor old stick used to cry out, "'Oh, you villain jailed!' And then we sermonized her on the presumption of attempting to teach such clever blades as we were, when she herself was so ignorant." "'We did. And Teddo, you know, I helped you in prosecuting, or persecuting, your tutor, way-faced Mr. Vining, the parson in the pip, as we used to call him. He and Miss Wilson took the liberty of falling in love with each other. At least Teddo and I thought so. We surprised sundry tender glances and sighs which we interpreted as tokens of la belle passion, and I promise you the public soon had the benefit of our discovery. We employed it as a sort of lever to hoist our dead weights from the house. Dear Mamma, there, as soon as she got an inkling of the business, found out that it was of an immoral tendency. Did you not, my lady mother? Certainly, my best. And I was quite right. Depend on that. There are a thousand reasons why liaison between governesses and tutors should never be tolerated a moment in any well-regulated house. Firstly, oh, gracious Mamma, spare us the enumeration. O oh, rest, we all know them. Danger of bad example to innocence of childhood, distractions and consequent neglect of duty on the part of the attached, mutual alliance and reliance, confidence thence resulting, insolence accompanying, mutiny and general blow-up. Am I right, Baroness Ingram, of Ingram Park? My lily-flower, you are right now, as always. Then no more need be said, 
change the subject. Amy Eshton, not hearing or not heeding this dictum, joined in with her soft infantine tone. Louisa and I used to quiz our governess, too, but she was such a good creature, she would bear anything, nothing put her out. She was never cross with us, was she, Louisa? No, never. We might do what we pleased, ransack her desk and her work-books, and turn her drawers inside out, and she was so good-natured she would give us anything we asked for." "'I suppose now,' said Miss Ingram, curling her lips sarcastically, we shall have an abstract of the memoirs of all the governesses extant. In order to avert such a visitation, I again move the introduction of a new topic. Mr. Rochester, do you second my motion?" "'Madam, I support you on this point, as on every other." "'Then on me be the onus of bringing it forward. Signor Eduardo, are you in voice to-night?" "'Donna Bianca, if you command it, I will be." Then, Signor, I lay on you my sovereign behest to furbish up your lungs and other vocal organs, as they will be wanted on my royal service. Who would not be the Rizzio of so divine a Mary? A fig for Rizzio! cried she, tossing her head with all its curls as she moved to the piano. It is my opinion the fiddler David must have been an insipid sort of fellow. I like black Bothwell better. To my mind, a man is nothing without a spice of the devil in him, and history may say what it will of James Hepburn, but I have a notion he was just the sort of wild, fierce, bandit hero whom I could have consented to gift with my hand. "'Gentlemen, you hear. Now which of you most resembles Bothwell?' cried Mr. Rochester. "'I should say the preference lies with you,' responded Colonel Dent. "'On my honour, I am much obliged to you,' was the reply. Miss Ingram, who had now seated herself with proud grace at the piano, spreading out her snowy robes in queenly amplitude, commenced a brilliant prelude, talking meantime. She appeared to be on her high horse to-night. Both her words and her air seemed intended to excite not only the admiration, but the amazement of her auditors. She was evidently bent on striking them as something very dashing and daring indeed. "'Oh! I am so sick of the young men of the present day!' exclaimed she, rattling away at the instrument. Poor, puny things, not fit to stir a step beyond papa's park gates, nor to go even so far without mamma's permission and guardianship. Creatures so absorbed in care about their pretty faces, and their white hands, and their small feet, as if a man had anything to do with beauty, as if loveliness were not the special prerogative of woman, her legitimate appanage and heritage. I grant an ugly woman is a blot on the fair face of creation, but as to the gentlemen, let them be solicitous to possess only strength and valour. Let their motto be, hunt, shoot, and fight. The rest is not worth a fillip. Such should be my device, were I a man." "'Whenever I marry,' she continued, after a pause which none interrupted, "'I am resolved my husband shall not be a rival, but a foil to me. I will suffer no competitor near the throne. I shall extract an undivided homage. His devotions shall not be shared between me and the shape he sees in his mirror. Mr. Rochester, now sing, and I will play for you." "'I am all obedience,' was the response. "'Here, then, is a corsair song. Know that I dote on corsairs, and for that reason sing it con spirito." Commands from Miss Ingram's lips would put spirit into a mug of milk and water. Take care, then. If you don't please me, I will shame you by showing how such things should be done. That is offering a premium on incapacity. I shall now endeavour to fail. Gardez-vous en bien. If you err willingly, I shall devise a proportionate punishment. Miss Ingram ought to be clement, for she has it in her power to inflict a chastisement beyond mortal endurance. Ha! Huh? Explain! commanded the lady. Pardon me, madam. No need of explanation. Your own fine sense must inform you that one of your own frowns would be sufficient substitute for capital punishment." Sing, said she, and again touching the piano, she commenced an accompaniment in spirited style. Now is my time to slip away, thought I, but the tones that then severed the air arrested me. Mrs. Fairfax had said Mr. Rochester possessed a fine voice. He did a mellow, powerful bass, into which he threw his own feeling, his own force, finding a way through the air to the heart, and there waking sensations strangely. 
I waited till the last deep and full vibration had expired, till the tide of talk, checked an instant, had resumed its flow. I then quitted my sheltered corner and made my exit by the side door, which was fortunately near. Thence a narrow passage led into the hall. In crossing it, I perceived my sandal was loose. I stopped to tie it, kneeling for that purpose on the mat at the foot of the staircase. I heard the dining-room door unclose. A gentleman came out. Rising hastily, I stood face to face with him. It was Mr. Rochester. "'How do you do?' he asked. "'I am very well, sir.' "'Why did you not come and speak to me in the room?' I thought I might have retorted the question on him who put it, but I would not take that freedom. I answered, "'I did not wish to disturb you, as you seemed engaged, sir.' "'What have you been doing during my absence?' "'Nothing particular. Teaching Adèle, as usual.' and getting a good deal paler than you were, as I saw at first sight. What is the matter?" "'Nothing at all, sir." "'Did you take any cold that night you half drowned me?' "'Not the least." "'Return to the drawing-room. You are deserting too early.' "'I am tired, sir.' He looked at me for a minute. "'And a little depressed,' he said. "'What about? Tell me.' "'Nothing. "'Nothing, sir. I am not depressed.' "'But I affirm that you are. So much depressed that a few more words would bring tears to your eyes. Indeed, they are there now, shining and swimming, and a bead has slipped from the lash and fallen on to the flag. If I had time, and was not in mortal dread of some prating prig of a servant passing, I would know what all this means. Well, to-night I excuse you. But understand that so long as my visitors stay, I expect you to appear in the drawing-room every evening. It is my wish. Don't neglect it. Now go and send Sophie for Adèle. Good night, my—' He stopped, bit his lip, and abruptly left me. End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of Jane Eyre》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. — Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. — Chapter Eighteen Merry days were these at Thornfield Hall, and busy days, too. How different from the first three months of stillness, monotony, and solitude I had passed beneath its roof! All sad feelings seemed now driven from the house, all gloomy associations forgotten. There was life everywhere, movement all day long. You could not now traverse the gallery, once so hushed, nor enter the front chambers, once so tenantless, without encountering a smart lady's maid or a dandy valet. The kitchen, the butler's pantry, the servants' hall, the entrance hall were equally alive, and the saloons were only left void and still when the blue sky and halcyon sunshine of the genial spring weather called their occupants out into the grounds. Even when that weather was broken, and continuous rain set in for some days, no damp seemed cast over enjoyment. Indoor amusements only became more lively and varied, in consequence of the stop put to outdoor gaiety. I wondered what they were going to do the first evening a change of entertainment was proposed. They spoke of playing charades, but in my ignorance I did not understand the term. The servants were called in, the dining-room tables wheeled away, the lights otherwise disposed, the chairs placed in a semicircle opposite the arch. While Mr. Rochester and the other gentlemen directed these alterations, the ladies were running up and down stairs, ringing for their maids. Mrs. Fairfax was summoned to give information respecting the resources of the house in shawls, dresses, draperies of any kind, and certain wardrobes of the third story were ransacked, and their contents, in the shape of brocaded and hooped petticoats, satin sacks, black modes, lace lappets, etc., were brought down in armfuls by the Abigails. Then a selection was made, and such things as were chosen were carried to the boudoir within the drawing-room. Meantime Mr. Rochester had again summoned the ladies round him, and was selecting certain of their number to be of his party. "'Miss Ingram is mine, of course,' said he. Afterwards he named the two Mrs. Eshton and Mrs. Dent. He looked at me. 
I happened to be near him, as I had been fastening the clasp of Mrs. Dent's bracelet, which had got loose. "'Will you play?' he asked. I shook my head. He did not insist, which I rather feared he would have done. He allowed me to return quietly to my usual seat. He and his aides now withdrew behind the curtain. The other party, which was headed by Colonel Dent, sat down on the crescent of chairs. One of the gentlemen, Mr. Eshton, observing me, seemed to propose that I should be asked to join them, but Lady Ingram instantly negative the notion. No, I heard her say, she looks too stupid for any game of the sort. Ere long a bell tinkled, and the curtain drew up. Within the arch, the bulky figure of Sir George Lynn, whom Mr. Rochester had likewise chosen, was seen enveloped in a white sheet. Before him, on a table, lay open a large book, and at his side stood Amy Eshton, draped in Mr. Rochester's cloak and holding a book in her hand. Somebody unseen rang the bell merrily. Then Adele, who had insisted on being one of her guardian's party, bounded forward, scattering round her the contents of a basket of flowers she carried on her arm. Then appeared the magnificent figure of Miss Ingram, clad in white with a long veil on her head, and a wreath of roses round her brow. By her side walked Mr. Rochester, and together they drew near the table. They knelt, while Mrs. Dent and Louisa Eshton, dressed also in white, took up their stations behind them. A ceremony followed in dumb show, in which it was easy to recognise the pantomime of a marriage. At its termination, Colonel Dent and his party consulted in whispers for two minutes. Then the Colonel called out, "'Bride!' Mr. Rochester bowed, and the curtain fell. A considerable interval elapsed before it again rose. Its second rising displayed a more elaborately prepared scene than the last. The drawing-room, as I have observed before, was raised two steps above the dining-room, and on the top of the upper step, placed a yard or two back within the room, appeared a large marble basin, which I recognised as an ornament of the conservatory, where it usually stood, surrounded by exotics and tenanted by goldfish, and whence it must have been transported with some trouble, on account of its size and weight. Seated on the carpet, by the side of this basin, was seen Mr. Rochester, costumed in shawls with a turban on his head. His dark eyes and swarthy skin and Paynim features suited the costume exactly. He looked the very model of an eastern emir, an agent or a victim of the bowstring. Presently advanced into view Miss Ingram. She too was attired in oriental fashion, a crimson scarf tied sash-like round the waist, an embroidered handkerchief knotted about her temples, her beautifully moulded arms bare, one of them upraised in the act of supporting a pitcher, poised gracefully on her head. Both her cast of form and feature, her complexion and general air, suggested the idea of some Israelitish princess of the patriarchal days, and such was doubtless the character she intended to represent. She approached the basin, and bent over it as if to fill her pitcher. She again lifted it to her head. The personage on the well-brink now seemed to accost her, to make some request. She hasted, let down her pitcher on her hand, and gave him to drink. From the bosom of his robe he then produced a casket, opened it, and showed magnificent bracelets and earrings. She acted astonishment and admiration. Kneeling, he laid the treasure at her feet. Incredulity and delight were expressed by her looks and gestures. The stranger fastened the bracelets on her arms, and the rings in her ears. It was Eliza and Rebecca. The camels only were wanting. The divining party again laid their heads together. Apparently they could not agree about the word or syllable the scene illustrated. Colonel Dent, their spokesman, demanded the tableau of the whole, whereupon the curtain again descended. On its third rising only a portion of the drawing-room was disclosed, the rest being concealed by a screen, hung with some sort of dark and coarse drapery. The marble basin was removed. In its place stood a deal table and a kitchen chair. These objects were visible by a very dim light proceeding from a horn lantern, the wax candles being all extinguished. Amidst this sordid scene sat a man with his clenched hands resting on his knees, and his eyes bent on the ground. I knew Mr. Rochester, though the begrimed face, the disordered dress, his coat hanging loose from one arm, as if it had been almost torn from his back in a scuffle, the desperate and scowling countenance, the rough, bristling hair might well have disguised him. As he moved, a chain clanked. To his wrists were attached fetters. "'Bridewell!' exclaimed Colonel Dent and the charade was solved. A sufficient interval having elapsed for the performers to resume their ordinary costume, they re-entered the dining-room. Mr. Rochester led in Miss Ingram. She was complimenting him on his acting. 
"'Do you know,' said she, "'that of the three characters I liked you in the last best? Oh, had you but lived a few years earlier, what a gallant gentleman highwayman you would have made!' "'Is all the soot washed from my face?' he asked, turning it towards her. "'Alas, yes, more's the pity. Nothing could be more becoming to your complexion than that ruffian's rouge.' "'You would like a hero of the road, then?' An English hero of the road would be the next best thing to an Italian bandit, and that could only be surpassed by a Levantine pirate. "'Well, whatever I am, remember you are my wife. We were married an hour since, in the presence of all these witnesses.' She giggled, and her colour rose. "'Now, Dent,' continued Mr. Rochester, "'it is your turn.' And as the other party withdrew, he and his band took the vacated seats. Miss Ingram placed herself at her leader's right hand. The other diviners filled the chairs on each side of him and her. I did not now watch the actors. I no longer waited with interest for the curtain to rise. My attention was absorbed by the spectators. My eyes, erewhile fixed on the arch, were now irresistibly attracted to the semicircle of chairs. What Sherard, Colonel Dent, and his party played, what word they chose, how they acquitted themselves, I no longer remember. But I still see the consultation which followed each scene. I see Mr. Rochester turn to Miss Ingram, and Miss Ingram to him. I see her incline her head towards him, till the jetty curls almost touch his shoulder and wave against his cheek. I hear their mutual whisperings. I recall their interchanged glances, and something even of the feeling roused by the spectacle returns in memory at this moment. I have told you, reader, that I had learnt to love Mr. Rochester. I could not unlove him now, merely because I found that he had ceased to notice me, because I might pass hours in his presence and he would never once turn his eyes in my direction, because I saw all his attentions appropriated by a great lady, who scorned to touch me with the hem of her robes as she passed, who, if even her dark and imperious eye fell on me by chance, would withdraw it instantly, as from an object too mean to merit observation. I could not unlove him because I felt sure he would soon marry this very lady, because I read daily in her a proud security in his intentions respecting her, because I witnessed hourly in him a style of courtship which, if careless and choosing rather to be sought than to seek, was yet in its very carelessness captivating, and in its very pride irresistible. There was nothing to cool or banish love in these circumstances, though much to create despair. Much too you will think, reader, to engender jealousy. If a woman in my position could presume to be jealous of a woman in Miss Ingram's. But I was not jealous, or very rarely. The nature of the pain I suffered could not be explained by that word. Miss Ingram was a mark beneath jealousy. She was too inferior to excite the feeling. Pardon the seeming paradox. I mean what I say. She was very showy, but she was not genuine. She had a fine person, many brilliant attainments, but her mind was poor her heart barren by nature. Nothing bloomed spontaneously on that soil, no unforced natural fruit delighted by its freshness. She was not good, she was not original. She used to repeat sounding phrases from books. She never offered nor had an opinion of her own. She advocated a high tone of sentiment, but she did not know the sensations of sympathy and pity. Tenderness and truth were not in her. Too often she betrayed this, by the undue vent she gave to a spiteful antipathy she had conceived against little Adèle, pushing her away with some contumelious epithet after she happened to approach her, sometimes ordering her from the room, and always treating her with coldness and acrimony. Other eyes besides mine watched these manifestations of character, watched them closely, keenly, shrewdly. Yes, the future bridegroom, Mr. Rochester himself, exercised over his intended a ceaseless surveillance, and it was from this sagacity, this guardedness of his, this perfect, clear consciousness of his fair one's defects, this obvious absence of passion in his sentiments towards her, that my ever-torturing pain arose. I saw he was going to marry her, for family, perhaps political reasons, because her rank and connections suited him. I felt he had not given her his love, and that her qualifications were ill adapted to win from him that treasure. This was the point. This was where the nerve was touched and teased. This was where the fever was sustained and fed. She could not charm him. 
If she had managed the victory at once, and he had yielded and sincerely laid his heart at her feet, I should have covered my face, turned to the wall, and, figuratively, have died to them. If Miss Ingram had been a good and noble woman, endowed with force, fervour, kindness, sense, I should have had one vital struggle with two tigers, jealousy and despair. Then, my heart torn out and devoured, I should have admired her, acknowledged her excellence, and been quiet for the rest of my days. And the more absolute her superiority, the deeper would have been my admiration, the more truly tranquil my quiescence. But as matters really stood, to watch Miss Ingram's efforts at fascinating Mr. Rochester, to witness their repeated failure, herself unconscious that they did fail, vainly fancying that each shaft launched hit the mark, and infatuatedly pluming herself on success, when her pride and self-complacency repelled further and further what she wished to allure. To witness this, was to be at once under ceaseless excitation and ruthless restraint. Because when she failed, I saw how she might have succeeded. Arrows that continually glanced off from Mr. Rochester's breast, and fell harmless at his feet, might, I knew, if shot by a surer hand, have quivered keen in his proud heart, have called love into his stern eye, and softness into his sardonic face. Or better still, without weapons, a silent conquest might have been won. "'Why can she not influence him more, when she is privileged to draw so near to him?' I asked myself. Surely she cannot truly like him, or not like him with true affection. If she did, she need not coin her smiles so lavishly, flash her glances so unremittingly, manufacture airs so elaborate, graces so multitudinous. It seems to me that she might, by merely sitting quietly at his side, saying little and looking less, get nigher his heart. I have seen in his face a far different expression from that which hardens it now, while she is so vivaciously accosting him. But then it came of itself. It was not elicited by meretricious arts and calculated manoeuvres, and one had but to accept it, to answer what he asked without pretension, to address him when needful without grimace. And it increased, and grew kinder and more genial, and warmed one like a fostering sunbeam. How will she manage to please him when they are married? I do not think she will manage it. And yet it might be managed and his wife might, I verily believe, be the very happiest woman the sun shines on. I have not yet said anything condemnatory of Mr. Rochester's project of marrying for interest and connections. It surprised me when I first discovered that such was his intention. I had thought him a man unlikely to be influenced by motives so commonplace in his choice of a wife. But the longer I considered the position, education, etc., of the parties, the less I felt justified in judging and blaming either him or Miss Ingram, for acting in conformity to ideas and principles instilled into them, doubtless, from their childhood. All their class held these principles. I supposed, then, they had reasons for holding them such as I could not fathom. It seemed to me that, were I a gentleman like him, I would take to my bosom only such a wife as I could love. But the very obviousness of the advantages to the husband's own happiness offered by this plan, convinced me that there must be arguments against its general adoption, of which I was quite ignorant. Otherwise, I felt sure all the world would act as I wished to act. But in other points, as well as this, I was growing very lenient to my master. I was forgetting all his faults, for which I had once kept a sharp look-out. It had formerly been my endeavour to study all sides of his character to take the bad with the good, and from the just weighing of both to form an equitable judgment. Now I saw no bad. The sarcasm that had repelled, the harshness that had startled me once, were only like keen condiments in a choice dish. Their presence was pungent, but their absence would be felt as comparatively insipid. And as for the vague something, was it a sinister or a sorrowful, a designing or a desponding expression? that opened upon a careful observer now and then in his eye, and closed again before one could fathom the strange depth partially disclosed, that something which used to make me fear and shrink, as if I had been wandering amongst volcanic-looking hills, and had suddenly felt the ground quiver and seen it gape, that something I at intervals beheld still, and with throbbing heart, but not with palsy nerves. Instead of wishing to shun him, I longed only to dare to divine it. And I thought Miss Ingram happy, because one day she might look into the abyss at her leisure, explore its secrets, and analyse their nature. Meantime, 
while I thought only of my master and his future bride, saw only them, heard only their discourse, and considered only their movements of importance, the rest of the party were occupied with their own separate interests and pleasures. The ladies Lynn and Ingram continued to consort in solemn conferences, where they nodded their two turbans at each other, and held up their four hands in confronting gestures of surprise, or mystery or horror, according to the theme on which their gossip ran, like a pair of magnified puppets. Mild Mrs. Dent talked with good-natured Mrs. Eshton, and the two sometimes bestowed a courteous word or smile on me. Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and Mr. Eshton discussed politics, or county affairs, or justice business. Lord Ingram flirted with Amy Eshton, Louisa played and sang to and with one of the Messrs. Lynn, and Mary Ingram listened languidly to the gallant speeches of the other. Sometimes all, as with one consent, suspended their by-play to observe and listen to the principal actors, for after all Mr. Rochester, and, because closely connected with him, Miss Ingram, were the life and soul of the party. If he was absent from the room an hour, a perceptible dullness seemed to steal over the spirits of his guests, and his re-entrance was sure to give a fresh impulse to the vivacity of conversation. The want of his animating influence appeared to be peculiarly felt one day that he had been summoned to milk it on business, and was not likely to return till late. The afternoon was wet. A walk the party had proposed to take to see a gypsy camp, lately pitched on a common beyond hay, was consequently deferred. Some of the gentlemen were gone to the stables. The younger ones, together with the younger ladies, were playing billiards in the billiard-room. The dowagers Ingram and Lynn sought solace in a quiet game at cards. Blanche Ingram, after having repelled, by supercilious taciturnity, some efforts of Mrs. Dent and Mrs. Eshton to draw her into conversation, had first murmured over some sentimental tunes and airs on the piano, and then, having fetched a novel from the library, had flung herself in haughty listlessness on a sofa, and prepared to beguile, by the spell of fiction, the tedious hours of absence. The room and the house were silent. Only now and then the merriment of the billiard-players was heard from above. It was verging on dusk, and the clock had already given warning of the hour to dress for dinner, when little Adèle, who knelt by me in the drawing-room window-seat, suddenly exclaimed, "'Voilà, Monsieur Rochester, qui revient!' I turned, and Miss Ingram darted forwards from her sofa. The others, too, looked up from their several occupations, for at the same time a crunching of wheels and a splashing tramp of horse-hoofs became audible on the wet gravel. A post-chaise was approaching. "'What can possess him to come home in that style?' said Miss Ingram. "'He rode Mes Raw, the black horse, did he not, when he went out? And Pilot was with him? What has he done with the animals?' As she said this, she approached a tall person and ample garments so near the window, that I was obliged to bend back almost to the breaking of my spine. In her eagerness she did not observe me at first, but when she did, she curled her lip and moved to another casement. The post-chaise stopped. The driver rang the door-bell, and a gentleman alighted attired in travelling garb. But it was not Mr. Rochester. It was a tall, fashionable-looking man, a stranger. "'How provoking!' exclaimed Miss Ingram. "'You tiresome monkey!' apostrophizing Adèle, "'who perched you up in the window to give false intelligence!' And she cast on me an angry glance, as if I were in fault. Some parleying was audible in the hall, and soon the newcomer entered. He bowed to Lady Ingram, as deeming her the eldest lady present. "'It appears I come at an inopportune time, madam,' said he, "'when my friend, Mr. Rochester, is from home. But I arrive from a very long journey and I think I may presume so far on old and intimate acquaintance as to install myself here till he returns." His manner was polite. His accent, in speaking, struck me as being somewhat unusual, not precisely foreign, but still not altogether English. His age might be about Mr. Rochester's, between thirty and forty. His complexion was singularly sallow. Otherwise he was a fine-looking man, at first sight especially. On closer examination, you detected something in his face that displeased, or rather that failed to please. His features were regular, but too relaxed. His eye was large and well cut, but the life looking out of it was a tame, vacant life. At least so I thought. The sound of the dressing-bell dispersed the party. It was not till after dinner that I saw him again. He seemed then quite at his ease. But I liked his physiognomy even less than before. It struck me as being at the same time unsettled and inanimate. His eye wandered, and had no meaning in its wandering. This gave him an odd look, such as I never remembered to have seen. 
For a handsome and not unamiable looking man, he repelled me exceedingly. There was no power in that smooth-skinned face of a full oval shape, no firmness in that aquiline nose and small cherry mouth, there was no thought on the low, even forehead, no command in that blank brown eye. As I sat in my usual nook, and looked at him with the light of the girandole on the mantelpiece beaming full over him, for he occupied an armchair drawn close to the fire, and kept shrinking still nearer, as if he were cold, I compared him with Mr. Rochester. I think, with deference be it spoken, the contrast could not be much greater between a sleek gander and a fierce falcon, between a meek sheep and the rough-coated, keen-eyed dog, its guardian. He had spoken of Mr. Rochester as an old friend. A curious friendship theirs must have been, a pointed illustration indeed of the old adage that extremes meet. Two or three of the gentlemen sat near him, and I caught at times scraps of their conversation across the room. At first I could not make much sense of what I had heard, for the discourse of Louisa Eshton and Mary Ingram, who sat nearer to me, confused the fragmentary sentences that reached me at intervals. These last were discussing the stranger. They both called him a beautiful man. Louisa said he was, a love of a creature, and she adored him. And Mary instanced his pretty little mouth and nice nose, as her ideal of the charming. "'And what a sweet-tempered forehead he has!' cried Louisa. "'So smooth! None of those frowning irregularities I dislike so much! And such a placid eye and smile!' And then, to my great relief, Mr. Henry Lynn summoned them to the other side of the room, to settle some point about the deferred excursion to Hay Common. I was now able to concentrate my attention on the group by the fire, and I presently gathered that the newcomer was called Mr. Mason. Then I learned that he was but just arrived in England, and that he came from some hot country, which was the reason, doubtless, his face was so sallow, and that he sat so near the hearth, and wore a surtout in the house. Presently the words, Jamaica, Kingston, Spanish Town, indicated the West Indies as his residence, and it was with no little surprise I gathered, ere long, that he had there first seen and become acquainted with Mr. Rochester. He spoke of his friend's dislike of the burning heats, the hurricanes, and rainy seasons of that region. I knew Mr. Rochester had been a traveller, Mrs. Fairfax had said so, but I thought the continent of Europe had bounded his wanderings, till now I had never heard a hint given of visits to more distant shores. I was pondering these things, when an incident, and a somewhat unexpected one, broke the thread of my musings. Mr. Mason, shivering as some one chanced to open the door, asked for more coal to be put on the fire which had burnt out its flame, though its mass of cinder still shone quite hot and red. The footman, who brought the coal, and going out, stopped near Mr. Reston's chair, and said something to him in a low voice, of which I heard only the words, "'Old woman, quite troublesome.' "'Tell her she shall be put in the stocks if she does not take herself off,' replied the magistrate. "'No, stop,' interrupted Colonel Dent. "'Don't send her away, Eshton. We might turn the thing to account. Better consult the ladies.' And speaking aloud, he continued, "'Ladies, you talked of going to Hay Common to visit the gypsy camp. Sam here says that one of the old Mother Bunches is in the servants' hall at this moment, and insists upon being brought in before the quality to tell them their fortunes. Would you like to see her?' "'Surely, Colonel,' cried Lady Ingram. You would not encourage such a low impostor. Dismiss her by all means at once." "'But I cannot persuade her to go away, my lady,' said the footman. "'Nor can any of the servants. Mrs. Fairfax is with her just now, entreating her to be gone. But she has taken a chair in the chimney-corner, and says nothing shall stir her from it till she gets leave to come in here." "'What does she want?' asked Mrs. Eshton. "'To tell the gentry their fortune, she says, ma'am, and she swears she must and will do it. "'What is she like?' inquired the Mrs. Eshton, in a breath. "'A shockingly ugly old creature, miss, almost as black as a crock.' "'Why, she's a real sorceress!' cried Frederick Lynn. "'Let us have her in, of course.' "'To be sure,' rejoined his brother. "'It would be a thousand pities to throw away such a chance of fun.' "'My dear boys, what are you thinking about?' exclaimed Mrs. Lynn. "'I cannot possibly countenance any such inconsistent proceeding.' chimed in the dowager Ingram. "'Indeed, mamma, but you can, and will,' pronounced the haughty voice of Blanche, as she turned round on the piano-stool, where till now she had sat silent, apparently examining sundry sheets of music. "'I have a curiosity to hear my fortune told. Therefore, Sam, order the bell-dam forward.' "'My darling Blanche, recollect!' "'I do,' 
I recollect all you can suggest, and I must have my will. Quick, Sam!" "'Yes, yes, yes!' cried all the juveniles, both ladies and gentlemen. "'Let her come! It will be excellent sport!' The footman still lingered. "'She looks such a rough one,' said he. "'Go!' ejaculated Miss Ingram, and the man went. Excitement instantly seized the whole party. A running fire of raillery and jest was proceeding when Sam returned. "'She won't come now,' said he. "'She says it's not her mission to appear before the vulgar herd—them's her words. I must show her into a room by herself, and then those who wish to consult her must go to her one by one.' "'You see now, my queenly Blanche,' began Lady Ingram, "'she encroaches. Be advised, my angel girl, and—' "'Show her into the library, of course,' cut in the angel girl. "'It is not my mission to listen to her before the vulgar herd, either. I mean to have her all to myself. Is there a fire in the library?' "'Yes, ma'am. But she looks such a tinkler.' "'Cease that chatter, blockhead, and do my bidding.' Again Sam vanished, and mystery, animation, expectation rose to full flow once more. "'She's ready now,' said the footman, as he reappeared. She wishes to know who will be her first visitor. "'I think I had better just look in upon her before any of the ladies go,' said Colonel Dent. "'Tell her, Sam, a gentleman is coming.' Sam went and returned. "'She says, sir, that she'll have no gentleman. They need not trouble themselves to come near her. Nor,' he added, with difficulty expressing a titter, "'any ladies, either, except the young and single.' "'By Jove, she has taste!' exclaimed Henry Lynn. Miss Ingram rose solemnly. "'I go first, she said, in a tone which might have befitted the leader of a forlorn hope, mounting a breach in the van of his men. "'Oh, my best! Oh, my dearest! Pause! Reflect!' was her mamma's cry. But she swept past her in stately silence, passed through the door which Colonel Dent held open, and we heard her enter the library. A comparative silence ensued. Lady Ingram thought it le cas to wring her hands, which she did accordingly. Miss Mary declared she felt, for her part, she never dared venture. Amy and Louisa Eshton tittered under their breath, and looked a little frightened. The minutes passed very slowly. Fifteen were counted before the library door again opened. Miss Ingram returned to us through the arch. Would she laugh? Would she take it as a joke? All eyes met her with a glance of eager curiosity, and she met all eyes with one of coldness and rebuff. She looked neither flurried nor merry. She walked stiffly to her seat, and took it in silence. "'Well, Blanche,' said Lord Ingram. "'What did she say, sister?' asked Mary. "'What did you think? How do you feel? Is she a real fortune-teller?' demanded the Mrs. Eshton. "'Now, now, good people,' returned Miss Ingram, "'don't press upon me. Really, your organs of wonder and credulity are easily excited. You seem, by the importance of you all, my good mamma included, ascribed to this matter, absolutely to believe we have a genuine witch in the house, who is in close alliance with the old gentleman. I have seen a gipsy vagabond. She has practised in hackneyed fashion the science of palmistry, and told me what such people usually tell. My whim is gratified, and now I think Mr. Eshton would do well to put the hag in the stocks to-morrow morning, as he threatened." Miss Ingram took a book, leant back in her chair, and so declined further conversation. I watched her for nearly half an hour. During all that time she never turned a page and her face grew momently darker, more dissatisfied, and more sourly expressive of disappointment. She had obviously not heard anything to her advantage, and it seemed to me, from her prolonged fits of gloom and taciturnity, that she herself, notwithstanding her professed indifference, attached undue importance to whatever revelations had been made her. Meantime, Mary Ingram, Amy and Louisa Eshton, declared they dared not go alone, and yet they all wished to go. A negotiation was opened through the medium of the ambassador, Sam, and after much pacing to and fro, till, I think, the said Sam's calves must have ached with the exercise, permission was at last, with great difficulty, extorted from the rigorous Sibyl for the three to wait upon her in a body. Their visit was not so still as Miss Ingram's had been. We heard hysterical giggling and little shrieks proceeding from the library, and at the end of about twenty minutes they burst the door open, and came running across the hall as if they were half scared out of their wits. "'I am sure she is something not right!' they cried, one and all. "'She told us such things! She knows all about us!' And they sank breathless into the various seats the gentlemen hastened to bring them. 
pressed for further explanation, they declared she had told them of things they had said and done when they were mere children, described books and ornaments they had in their boudoirs at home, keepsakes that different relations had presented to them. They affirmed that she had even divined their thoughts, and had whispered in the ear of each the name of the person she liked best in the world, and informed them of what they most wished for. Here the gentleman interposed with earnest petitions to be further enlightened on these two last-named points, but they got only blushes, ejaculations, tremors, and titters, in return for their importunity. The matrons, meantime, offered vinaigrettes and wielded fans, and again and again reiterated the expression of their concern that their warning had not been taken in time, and the elder gentlemen laughed, and the younger urged their services on the agitated fair ones. In the midst of the tumult, and while my eyes and ears were fully engaged in the scene before me, I heard a hem close at my elbow. I turned, and saw Sam. "'If you please, miss, the gypsy declares that there is another young single lady in the room who has not been to her yet, and she swears she will not go till she has seen all. I thought it must be you. There is no one else for it. What shall I tell her?' "'Oh, I will go by all means,' I answered and I was glad of the unexpected opportunity to gratify my much-excited curiosity. I slipped out of the room, unobserved by any eye, for the company were gathered in one mass about the trembling trio just returned, and I closed the door quietly behind me. "'If you like, miss,' said Sam, "'I'll wait in the hall for you, and if she frightens you, just call and I'll come in.' "'No, Sam, return to the kitchen. I am not in the least afraid.' "'Nor was I but I was a good deal interested and excited. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Jane Eyre This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 19 The library looked tranquil enough as I entered it, and the Sibyl, if Sibyl she were, was seated snugly enough in an easy-chair at the chimney-corner. She had on a red cloak and a black bonnet or rather a broad-brimmed gipsy hat, tied down with a striped handkerchief under her chin. An extinguished candle stood on the table. She was bending over the fire, and seemed reading in a little black book, like a prayer-book, by the light of the blaze. She muttered the words to herself, as most old women do, while she read. She did not desist immediately on my entrance. It appeared she wished to finish a paragraph. I stood on the rug and warmed my hands, which were rather cold, with sitting at a distance from the drawing-room fire. I felt now as composed as ever I did in my life. There was nothing, indeed, in the gypsy's appearance to trouble one's calm. She shut her book and looked slowly up. Her hat-brim partially shaded her face, yet I could see, as she raised it, that it was a strange one. It looked all brown and black. Elf-locks bristled out from beneath a white band which passed under her chin, and came half over her cheeks, or rather jaws. Her eye confronted me at once with a bold and direct gaze. "'Well, and you want your fortune told?' she said, in a voice as decided as her glance, as harsh as her features. "'I don't care about it, mother. You may please yourself. But I ought to warn you I have no faith.' It's like your impudence to say so. I expected it of you. I heard it in your step as you crossed the threshold." "'Did you? You've a quick ear?' "'I have. And a quick eye, and a quick brain.' "'You need them all in your trade.' "'I do. Especially when I've customers like you to deal with. Why don't you tremble?' "'I'm not cold.' "'Why don't you turn pale?' "'I am not sick.' Why don't you consult my art? I'm not silly. The old crone nitched a laugh under her bonnet and bandage. She then drew out a short black pipe, and lighting it, began to smoke. Having indulged a while in this sedative, she raised her bent body, took the pipe from her lips, and while gazing steadily at the fire, said very deliberately, You are cold, you are sick, and you are silly. Prove it, I rejoined. I will, in a few words. You are cold, because you are alone, 
No contact strikes the fire from you that is in you. You are sick, because the best of feelings, the highest and the sweetest given to man, keeps far away from you. You are silly, because suffer as you may, you will not beckon it to approach, nor will you stir one step to meet it where it waits you." She again put a short black pipe to her lips, and renewed her smoking with vigour. You might say all that to almost any one who you knew lived as a solitary dependent in a great house. I might say it to almost any one. But would it be true of almost any one? In my circumstances? Yes, just so in your circumstances. But find me another precisely placed as you are. It would be easy to find you thousands. You could scarcely find me one. If you knew it, you are peculiarly situated. Very near happiness, yes, within reach of it. The materials are all prepared. There only wants a movement to combine them. Chance laid them somewhat apart. Let them be once approached, and bliss results." I don't understand enigmas. I never could guess a riddle in my life. If you wish me to speak more plainly, show me your palm. And I must cross it with silver, I suppose. To be sure. I gave her a shilling. She put it into an old stocking-foot which she took out of her pocket, and having tied it round and returned it, she told me to hold out my hand. I did. She approached her face to the palm, and pored over it without touching it. "'It is too fine,' said she. "'I can make nothing of such a hand as that, almost without lines. Besides, what is in a palm? Destiny is not written there.' "'I believe you,' I said. No she continued. It is in the face, on the forehead, about the eyes, in the lines of the mouth. Kneel and lift up your head." "'Ah! Now you are coming to reality,' I said, as I obeyed her. I shall begin to put some faith in you presently." I knelt within half a yard of her. She stirred the fire, so that a ripple of light broke from the disturbed coal. The glare, however, as she sat, only threw her face into deeper shadow. Mine it illuminated. I wonder with what feelings you came to me to-night," she said, when she had examined me a little. I wonder what thoughts are busy in your heart during all the hours you sit in yonder room with the fine people flitting before you, like shapes in a magic lantern, just as little sympathetic communion passing between you and them, as if they really were mere shadows of human forms, and not the actual substance. I feel tired often, sleepy sometimes, but seldom sad. Then you have some secret hope to buoy you up and please you with whispers of the future?" "'Not I. The utmost I hope is to save money enough out of my earnings, to set up a school some day in a little house rented by myself." "'A mean nutriment for the spirit to exist on. And sitting in that window-seat—you see I know your habits—you have learned them from the servants." "'Ah! You think yourself sharp? Well, perhaps I have. To speak truth, I have an acquaintance with one of them, Mrs. Poole." I started to my feet when I heard the name. "'You have, have you?' thought I. "'There is diablerie in the business after all, then.' "'Don't be alarmed,' continued the strange being. "'She's a safe hand, is Mrs. Poole, close and quiet. Any one may repose confidence in her. But as I was saying, sitting in that window-seat, do you think of nothing but your future school? Have you no present interest in any of the company who occupy the sofas and chairs before you? Is there not one face you study, one figure whose movements you follow with the least curiosity?" I like to observe all the faces and all the figures. But do you never single one out from the rest? Or it may be two? I do, frequently. When the gestures or looks of a pair seem telling a tale, it amuses me to watch them. What tale do you like best to hear?" Oh, I have not much choice. They generally run on the same theme—courtship, and promise to end in the same catastrophe—marriage. And do you like that monotonous theme? Positively, I don't care about it. It is nothing to me. Nothing to you? When a lady, young and full of life and health, charming with beauty and endowed with the gifts of rank and fortune, sits and smiles in the eyes of a gentleman you—I what? You know, and perhaps think well of. 
I don't know the gentlemen here. I have scarcely interchanged a syllable with one of them, and as to thinking well of them, I consider some respectable, and stately and middle-aged, and others young, dashing, handsome, and lively. But certainly they are all at liberty to be the recipients of whose smiles they please, without my feeling disposed to consider the transaction of any moment to me. You don't know the gentlemen here. You have not exchanged a syllable with one of them. Will you say that of the master of the house?" "'He is not at home.' "'A profound remark! A most ingenious quibble! He went to milk it this morning, and will be back here to-night or to-morrow. Does that circumstance exclude him from the list of your acquaintance, blot him, as it were, out of existence?' "'No, but I can scarcely see what Mr. Rochester has to do with the theme you had introduced. I was talking of ladies smiling in the eyes of gentlemen, and of late so many smiles have been shed into Mr. Rochester's eyes that they overflow like two cups filled above the brim. Have you never remarked that?" Mr. Rochester has a right to enjoy the society of his guests. No question about his right. But have you never observed that, of all the tales told here about matrimony, Mr. Rochester has been favoured with the most lively and the most continuous? The eagerness of a listener quickens the tongue of a narrator. I said this rather to myself than to the gipsy, whose strange talk, voice, manner, had by this time wrapped me in a kind of dream. One unexpected sentence came from her lips after another, till I got involved in a web of mystification, and wondered what unseen spirit had been sitting for weeks by my heart, watching its workings, and taking record of every pulse. "'Eagerness of a listener!' repeated she. Yes, Mr. Rochester has sat by the hour, his ear inclined to the fascinating lips that took such delight in their task of communicating, and Mr. Rochester was so willing to receive, and looked so grateful for the pastime given him. You have noticed this?" Grateful? I cannot remember detecting gratitude in his face. Detecting? You have analysed, then. And what did you detect, if not gratitude? I said nothing. You have seen love, have you not? And looking forward, you have seen him married, and beheld his bride happy?" Hm, not exactly. Your witch's skill is rather at fault sometimes. What the devil have you seen, then? Never mind. I came here to inquire, not to confess. Is it known that Mr. Rochester is to be married? Yes, and to the beautiful Miss Ingram. Shortly. Appearances would warrant that conclusion. And no doubt, though with an audacity that wants chastising out of you, you seem to question it, they will be a superlatively happy pair. He must love such a handsome, noble, witty, accomplished lady, and probably she loves him, or if not his person, at least his purse. I know she considers the Rochester estate eligible to the last degree, though God pardon me, I told her something on that point about an hour ago which made her look wondrous grave. The corners of her mouth fell half an inch. I would advise her blackavist suitor to look out. If another comes with a longer or clearer rent-roll, he's dished." "'But, mother, I did not come to hear Mr. Rochester's fortune. I came to hear my own, and you have told me nothing of it." "'Your fortune is yet doubtful. When I examined your face, one trait contradicted another. Chance has meted you a measure of happiness, that I know. I knew it before I came here this evening. She has laid it carefully on one side for you. I saw her do it. It depends on yourself to stretch out your hand and take it up, but whether you will do so is the problem I study. Kneel again on the rug." "'Don't keep me long. The fire scorches me.' I knelt. She did not stoop towards me, but only gazed, leaning back in her chair. She began muttering. "'The flame flickers in the eye. The eye shines like dew. It looks soft and full of feeling. It smiles at my jargon. It is susceptible. Impression follows impression through its clear sphere. Where it ceases to smile, it is sad. An unconscious lassitude weighs on the lid. That signifies melancholy resulting from loneliness. It turns from me. It will not suffer further scrutiny. It seems to deny, by a mocking glance, the truth of the discoveries I have already made, to disown the charge of both sensibility and chagrin. Its pride and reserve only confirm me in my opinion. The eye is favourable. As to the mouth, it delights at times in laughter. It is disposed to impart all that the brain conceives, though I dare say it would be silent on much the heart experiences. Mobile and flexible, it was never intended to be compressed in the eternal silence of solitude. 
It is a mouth which should speak much, and smile often, and have human affection for its interlocutor. That feature, too, is propitious. I see no enemy to a fortunate issue but in the brow, and that brow professes to say, I can live alone if self-respect and circumstances require me to do so. I need not sell my soul to buy bliss. I have an inward treasure born with me, which can keep me alive if all extraneous delight should be withheld, or offered only at a price I cannot afford to give. The forehead declares, reason sits firm and holds the reins, and she will not let the feelings burst away and hurry her to wild chasms. The passions may rage furiously, like true heathens, as they are, and the desires may imagine all sorts of vain things. But judgment still shall have the last word in every argument, and the casting vote in every decision. Strong wind, earthquake, shock, and fire may pass by, but I shall follow the guiding of that still small voice which interprets the dictates of conscience. Well said, Forred. Your declaration shall be respected. I have formed my plans. Right plans, I deem them. And in them I have attended to the claims of conscience, the counsels of reason. I know how soon youth would fade, and bloom perish, if in the cup of bliss offered but one dreg of shame, or one flavour of remorse were detected. And I do not want sacrifice, sorrow, dissolution. Such is not my taste. I wish to foster, not to blight. To earn gratitude, not to wring tears of blood. No, nor of brine. My harvest must be in smiles, and endearments, and sweet— That will do. I think I rave in a kind of exquisite delirium. I should wish now to protract this moment ad infinitum, but I dare not. So far I have governed myself thoroughly. I have acted as I inwardly swore I would act, but further might try me beyond my strength. Rise, Miss Eyre, leave me. The play is played out." Where was I? Did I wake or sleep? Had I been dreaming? Did I dream still? The old woman's voice had changed. Her accent, her gesture, and all were familiar to me as my own face in a glass, as the speech of my own tongue. I got up, but did not go. I looked, I stirred the fire, and I looked again. But she drew her bonnet and her bandage closer about her face, and again beckoned me to depart. The flame illuminated her hand stretched out. Roused now, and on the alert for discoveries, I at once noticed that hand. It was no more the withered limb of Eld than my own. It was a round, supple member, with smooth fingers symmetrically turned. A broad ring flashed on the little finger, and stooping forward, I looked at it, and saw a gem I had seen a hundred times before. Again I looked at the face, which was no longer turned from me. On the contrary, the bonnet was doffed, the bandage displaced, the head advanced. "'Well, Jane, do you know me?' asked the familiar voice. "'Only take off the red cloak, sir, and then—' "'But the string is in a knot. Help me.' "'Break it, sir.' "'There, then. Off, ye lendings!' And Mr. Rochester stepped out of his disguise. "'Now, sir, what a strange idea!' "'But well carried out, eh? Don't you think so?' "'With the ladies you must have managed well.' "'But not with you?' You did not act the character of a gypsy with me. What character did I act? My own? No, some unaccountable one. In short, I believe you have been trying to draw me out. Or in. You have been talking nonsense to make me talk nonsense. It is scarcely fair, sir. Do you forgive me, Jane? I cannot tell till I have thought it all over. If, on reflection, I find I have fallen into no great absurdity, I shall try to forgive you. But it was not right." "'Oh, you have been very correct, very careful, very sensible." I reflected and thought on the whole I had. It was comfort. But indeed I had been on my guard almost from the beginning of the interview. Something of masquerade I suspected. I knew gypsies and fortune-tellers did not express themselves as this seeming old woman had expressed herself. Besides, I had noted her feigned voice, her anxiety to conceal her features. But my mind had been running on Grace Poole, that living enigma, that mystery of mysteries, as I considered her. I had never thought of Mr. Rochester. "'Well,' said he, "'what are you musing about? What does that grave smile signify?' "'Wonder, and self-congratulation, sir. 
I have your permission to retire now, I suppose." No. Stay a moment, and tell me what the people in the drawing-room yonder are doing." Discussing the gipsy, I dare say. Sit down. Let me hear what they have said about me. I had better not stay long, sir. It must be near eleven o'clock. Oh, are you aware, Mr. Rochester, that a stranger has arrived here since you left this morning? A stranger? No. Who can it be? I expected no one. Is he gone? No. He said he had known you long, and that he could take the liberty of installing himself here till you returned. The devil he did! Did he give his name? His name is Mason, sir, and he comes from the West Indies, from Spanish Town in Jamaica, I think. Mr. Rochester was standing near me. He had taken my hand as if to lead me to a chair. As I spoke, he gave my wrist a convulsive grip. The smile on his lips froze. Apparently a spasm caught his breath. Mason! The West Indies! he said, in the tone one might fancy a speaking automaton to announce its single words. "'Mason, the West Indies,' he reiterated, and he went over the syllables three times. Growing in the intervals of speaking whiter than ashes, he hardly seemed to know what he was doing. "'Do you feel ill, sir?' I inquired. "'Jane, I've got a blow. I've got a blow, Jane,' he staggered. "'Oh, lean on me, sir!' Jane, you offered me your shoulder once before. Let me have it now." "'Yes, sir, yes, and my arm.' He sat down and made me sit beside him. Holding my hand in both his own, he chafed it, gazing on me at the same time with the most troubled and dreary look. "'My little friend,' said he, "'I wish I were in a quiet island with only you, and trouble and danger and hideous recollections removed from me.' "'Can I help you, sir? I'd give my life to serve you." "'Jane, if aid is wanted, I'll seek it at your hands. I promise you that." "'Thank you, sir. Tell me what to do. I'll try at least to do it." "'Fetch me now, Jane, a glass of wine from the dining-room. They will be at supper there. And tell me if Mason is with them, and what he is doing." I went. I found all the party in the dining-room at supper, as Mr. Rochester had said. They were not seated at table. The supper was arranged on the sideboard. Each had taken what he chose, and they stood about here and there in groups, their plates and glasses in their hands. Every one seemed in high glee. Laughter and conversation were general and animated. Mr. Mason stood near the fire, talking to Colonel and Mrs. Dent, and appeared as merry as any of them. I filled a wine-glass. I saw Miss Ingram watch me frowningly as I did so. She thought I was taking a liberty, I dare say. And I returned to the library. Mr. Rochester's extreme pallor had disappeared, and he looked once more firm and stern. He took the glass from my hand. "'Here is to your health, minister and spirit,' he said. He swallowed the contents, and returned it to me. "'What are they doing, Jane?' "'Laughing and talking, sir.' "'They don't look grave and mysterious, as if they had heard something strange?' "'Not at all. They are full of jests and gaiety.' "'And Mason?' "'He was laughing, too.' If all these people came in a body and spat at me, what would you do, Jane?" "'Turn them out of the room, sir, if I could.' He half smiled. "'But if I were to go to them, and they only looked at me coldly, and whispered sneeringly amongst each other, and then dropped off and left me one by one, what then? Would you go with them?' "'I rather think not, sir. I should have more pleasure in staying with you.' "'To comfort me?' "'Yes, sir, to comfort you as well as I could.' And if they laid you under a ban for adhering to me?" I probably should know nothing about their ban, and if I did I should care nothing about it. Then you could dare censure for my sake? I could dare it for the sake of any friend who deserved my adherence, as you, I am sure, do. Go back now into the room. Step quietly up to Mason, and whisper in his ear that Mr. Rochester has come, and wishes to see him. Show him in here, and then leave me." Yes, sir. I did his behest. The company all stared at me as I passed straight among them. I saw Mr. Mason delivered the message, and preceded him from the room. I ushered him into the library, and then I went upstairs. At a late hour, after I had been in bed some time, I heard the visitors repair to their chambers. I distinguished Mr. Rochester's voice, and heard him say, "'This way, Mason. This is your room.' He spoke cheerfully. The gay tones set my heart at ease. I was soon asleep. End of chapter 19
Chapter Twenty of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter Twenty. I had forgotten to draw my curtain, which I usually did, and also to let down my window blind. The consequence was, that when the moon, which was full and bright, for the night was fine, came in her course to that space in the sky opposite my casement, and looked in at me through the unveiled panes, her glorious gaze roused me. Awaking in the dead of night, I opened my eyes on her disk, silver-white and crystal-clear. It was beautiful, but too solemn. I half rose, and stretched my arm to draw the curtain. Good God! What a cry! The night, its silence, its rest, was rent in twain by a savage, a sharp, a shrilly sound, that ran from end to end of Thornfield Hall. My pulse stopped, my heart stood still, my stretched arm was paralysed. The cry died, and was not renewed. Indeed, whatever being uttered that fearful shriek could not soon repeat it, not the widest-winged condor in the Andes could, twice in succession, send out such a yell from the cloud shrouding his eyrie. The thing delivering such utterance must rest ere it could repeat the effort. It came out of the third story, for it passed overhead. And overhead, yes, in the room just above my chamber ceiling, I now heard a struggle. A deadly one, it seemed, from the noise, and a half-smothered voice shouted, "'Help! Help! Help!' three times rapidly. "'Will no one come?' it cried. And then, while the staggering and stamping went on wildly, I distinguished through plank and plaster, "'Rochester! Rochester! For God's sake, come!' A chamber door opened. Some one ran or rushed along the gallery. Another step stamped on the flooring above, and something fell, and there was silence. I had put on some clothes, though horror shook all my limbs, I issued from my apartment. The sleepers were all aroused, ejaculations, terrified murmurs sounded in every room, door after door unclosed, one looked out and another looked out, the gallery filled. Gentlemen and ladies alike had quitted their beds, and, oh, what is it? Who is hurt? What has happened? Fetch a light! Is it fire? Are there robbers? Where shall we run? was demanded confusedly on all hands. But for the moonlight they would have been in complete darkness. They ran to and fro, they crowded together, some sobbed, some stumbled, the confusion was inextricable. "'Where the devil is Rochester?' cried Colonel Dent. "'I cannot find him in his bed.' "'Here! Here!' was shouted in return. "'Be composed, all of you. I am coming.' And the door at the end of the gallery opened, and Mr. Rochester advanced with a candle. He had just descended from the upper story. One of the ladies ran to him directly. She seized his arm. It was Miss Ingram. "'What awful event has taken place?' said she. "'Speak! Let us know the worst at once!' "'But don't pull me down or strangle me,' he replied, for the Misses Eshton were clinging about him now, and the two dowagers in vast white wrappers were bearing down on him like ships in full sail. "'All right! All's right!' he cried. "'It's a mere rehearsal of much ado about nothing. Ladies, keep off, or I shall wax dangerous." And dangerous he looked. His black eyes darted sparks. Calming himself by an effort, he added, "'A servant has had the nightmare, that is all. She's an excitable, nervous person. She construed her dream into an apparition or something of the sort, no doubt, and has taken a fit with fright. Now then I must see you all back into your rooms, for till the house is settled she cannot be looked after. Gentlemen, have the goodness to set the ladies the example. Miss Ingram, I am sure you will not fail in evincing superiority to idle terrors. Amy and Louisa return to your nest like a pair of doves, as you are. Madame, to the dowagers, you will take cold to a dead certainty if you stay in this chill gallery any longer." And so, by dint of alternate coaxing and commanding, he contrived to get them all once more enclosed in their separate dormitories. I did not wait to be ordered back to mine, but retreated unnoticed, as unnoticed I had left it not, however, to go to bed. On the contrary, I began and stressed myself carefully. The sounds I had heard after the scream, and the words that had been uttered, had probably been heard only by me, for they had proceeded from the room above mine. 
but they assured me that it was not a servant's dream which had thus struck horror through the house, and that the explanation Mr. Rochester had given was merely an invention framed to pacify his guests. I dressed, then, to be ready for emergencies. When dressed, I sat a long time by the window looking out over the silent grounds and silvered fields, and waiting for I knew not what. It seemed to me that some event must follow the strange cry, struggle, and call. No. Stillness returned. Each murmur and movement ceased gradually, and in about an hour Thornfield Hall was again as hushed as a desert. It seemed that sleep and night had resumed their empire. Meantime the moon declined. She was about to set. Not liking to sit in the cold and darkness, I thought I would lie down on my bed, dressed as I was. I left the window, and moved with little noise across the carpet. As I stooped to take off my shoes, a cautious hand tapped low at the door. "'Am I wanted?' I asked. "'Are you up?' asked the voice I expected to hear, viz. my master's. "'Yes, sir.' "'And dressed?' "'Yes.' "'Come out, then, quietly.' I obeyed. Mr. Rochester stood in the gallery holding a light. "'I want you,' he said. "'Come this way. Take your time, and make no noise.' My slippers were thin. I could walk the matted floor as softly as a cat. He glided up the gallery and up the stairs, and stopped in the dark low corridor of the fateful third story. I had followed and stood at his side. "'Have you a sponge in your room?' he asked in a whisper. "'Yes, sir.' "'Have you any salts, volatile salts?' "'Yes.' "'Go back and fetch both.' I returned, sought the sponge on the washstand, the salts in my drawer, and once more retraced my steps. He still waited. He held a key in his hand. Approaching one of the small black doors, he put it in the lock. He paused and addressed me again. "'You don't turn sick at the sight of blood?' "'I think I shall not. I have never been tried yet.' I felt a thrill while I answered him, but no coldness and no faintness. "'Just give me your hand,' he said. "'It will not do to risk a fainting fit.' I put my fingers into his. "'Warm and steady,' was his remark. He turned the key and opened the door. I saw a room I remember to have seen before, the day Mrs. Fairfax showed me over the house. It was hung with tapestry, but the tapestry was now looped up in one part, and there was a door apparent, which had then been concealed. This door was open, a light shone out of the room within. I heard thence a snarling, snatching sound, almost like a dog quarrelling. Mr. Rochester, putting down his candle, said to me, "'Wait a minute,' and went forward into the inner apartment. A shout of laughter greeted his entrance, noisy at first, and terminating in Grace Poole's own goblin, Ha! Ha! She, then, was there. He made some sort of arrangement without speaking, though I heard a low voice address him. He came out and closed the door behind him. "'Here, Jane,' he said, and I walked round to the other side of a large bed, which, with its drawn curtains, concealed a considerable portion of the chamber. An easy chair was near the bedhead. A man sat in it, dressed with the exception of his coat. He was still, his head leant back, his eyes were closed. Mr. Rochester held the candle over him. I recognised in his pale and seemingly lifeless face the stranger, Mason. I saw, too, that his linen on one side and one arm was almost soaked in blood. "'Hold the candle,' said Mr. Rochester, and I took it. He fetched a basin of water from the washstand. "'Hold that,' said he. I obeyed. He took the sponge, dipped it in, and moistened the corpse-like face. He asked for my smelling-bottle, and applied it to the nostrils. Mr. Mason shortly unclosed his eyes. He groaned. Mr. Rochester opened the shirt of the wounded man, whose arm and shoulder were bandaged. He sponged away blood, trickling fast down. "'Is there immediate danger?' murmured Mr. Mason. "'Pooh! No, a mere scratch. Don't be so overcome, man. Bear up. I'll fetch a surgeon for you now, myself. You'll be able to be removed by morning, I hope. Jane,' he continued. "'Sir?' "'I shall have to leave you in this room with this gentleman, for an hour, or perhaps two hours. You will sponge the blood as I do when it returns. If he feels faint, you'll put the glass of water on that stand to his lips, and your salts to his nose. You will not speak to him on any pretext. And Richard, it will be at the peril of your life if you speak to her. Open your lips, agitate yourself, and I'll not answer for the consequences.' Again the poor man groaned. He looked as if he dared not move. 
fear, either of death or of something else, appeared almost to paralyse him. Mr. Rochester put the now bloody sponge into my hand, and I proceeded to use it as he had done. He watched me a second, then saying, "'Remember, no conversation,' he left the room. I experienced a strange feeling as the key grated in the lock, and the sound of his retreating step ceased to be heard. Here then I was, in the third story, fastened into one of its mystic cells, night around me, a pale and bloody spectacle under my eyes and hands, a murderess hardly separated from me by a single door. Yes, that was appalling. The rest I could bear, but I shuddered at the thought of Grace Poole bursting out upon me. I must keep to my post, however. I must watch this ghastly countenance, these blue still lips forbidden to unclose, these eyes now shut, now opening, now wandering through the room, now fixing on me, and ever glazed with the dullness of horror. I must dip my hand again and again in the basin of blood and water, and wipe away the trickling gore. I must see the light of the unsnuffed candle wane on my employment, the shadows darken on the wrought antique tapestry round me, and grow black under the hangings of the vast old bed, and quiver strangely over the doors of a great cabinet opposite, whose front, divided into twelve panels, bore in grim design the heads of the twelve apostles, each enclosed in its separate panel as in a frame, while above them at the top rose an ebon crucifix and a dying Christ. According as the shifting obscurity and flickering gleam hovered here or glanced there, it was now the bearded physician, Luke, that bent his brow, now St. John's long hair that waved, and anon the devilish face of Judas that grew out of the panel, and seemed gathering life and threatened a revelation of the arch-traitor, of Satan himself in his subordinate's form. Amidst all this, I had to listen as well as watch, to listen for the movements of the wild beast or the fiend in yonder side den. But since Mr. Rochester's visit, it seemed spellbound. All the night I heard but three sounds at three long intervals. A step creak, a momentary renewal of the snarling canine noise, and a deep human groan. Then my own thoughts worried me. What crime was this that lived incarnate in this sequestered mansion, and could neither be expelled nor subdued by the owner? What mystery that broke out now in fire and now in blood, at the deadest hours of night? What creature was it, that masked in an ordinary woman's face and shape, uttered the voice, now of a mocking demon, and anon of a carrion-seeking bird of prey? And this man I bent over, this commonplace, quiet stranger, how had he become involved in the web of horror? And why had the fury flown at him? What made him seek this quarter of the house at an untimely season, when he should have been asleep in bed? I had heard Mr. Rochester assign him an apartment below. What brought him here? And why now was he so tame under the violence or treachery done him? Why did he so quietly submit to the concealment Mr. Rochester enforce? Why did Mr. Rochester enforce this concealment? His guest had been outraged, his own life on a former occasion had been hideously plotted against, and both attempts he smothered in secrecy and sank in oblivion. Lastly, I saw Mr. Mason was submissive to Mr. Rochester, that the impetuous will of the latter held complete sway over the inertness of the former. The few words which had passed between them assured me of this. It was evident that in their former intercourse, the passive disposition of the one had been habitually influenced by the active energy of the other. Whence then had arisen Mr. Rochester's dismay when he heard of Mr. Mason's arrival? Why had the mere name of this unresisting individual, whom his word now sufficed to control like a child, fallen on him, a few hours since, as a thunderbolt might fall on an oak? Oh, I could not forget his look and his paleness when he whispered, "'Jane, I have got a blow! I have got a blow, Jane!' I could not forget how the arm had trembled which he rested on my shoulder, and it was no light matter which could thus bow the resolute spirit, and thrill the vigorous frame of Fairfax Rochester. "'When will he come? When will he come?' I cried inwardly, as the night lingered and lingered, as my bleeding patient drooped, moaned, sickened, and neither day nor aid arrived. I had again and again held the water to Mason's white lips, again and again offered him the stimulating salts. My efforts seemed ineffectual. Either bodily or mental suffering, or loss of blood, or all three combined, were fast prostrating his strength. He moaned so, and looked so weak, wild, and lost, I feared he was dying, and I might not even speak to him. The candle, wasted at last, went out, 
As it expired, I perceived streaks of grey light edging the window-curtains. Dawn was then approaching. Presently I heard Pilot bark far below, out of his distant kennel in the courtyard. Hope revived. Nor was it unwarranted. In five minutes more the grating key, the yielding lock, warned me my watch was relieved. It could not have lasted more than two hours. Many a week has seemed shorter. Mr. Rochester entered, and with him the surgeon he had been to fetch. "'Now, Carter, be on the alert,' he said to this last. "'I give you but half an hour for dressing the wound, fastening the bandages, getting the patient downstairs, and all.' "'But is he fit to move, sir?' "'No doubt of it. It is nothing serious. He is nervous. His spirits must be kept up. Come, set to work.' Mr. Rochester drew back the thick curtain, drew up the holland blind, let in all the daylight he could, and I was surprised and cheered to see how far dawn was advanced, what rosy streaks were beginning to brighten the east. Then he approached Mason, whom the surgeon was already handling. "'Now, my good fellow, how are you?' he asked. "'She's done for me, I fear,' was the faint reply. "'Not a whit! Courage! This day fortnight shall hardly be a pin the worse of it. You've lost a little blood, that's all. Carter, assure him there's no danger." "'I can do that conscientiously,' said Carter, who had now undone the bandages. "'Only I wish I could have got here sooner. He would not have bled so much. But how is this? The flesh on the shoulder is torn as well as cut. This wound was not done with a knife. There have been teeth here.' "'She bit me,' he murmured. She worried me like a tigress when Rochester got the knife from her. "'You should not have yielded. You should have grappled with her at once,' said Mr. Rochester. "'But under such circumstances, what could one do?' returned Mason. "'Oh, it was frightful,' he added, shuddering. "'She looked so quiet at first. "'I warned you,' was his friend's answer. "'I said, be on your guard when you go near her. Besides, you might have waited till to-morrow, and had me with you. It was mere folly to attempt the interview to-night, and alone.' I thought I could have done some good. You thought! You thought! Yes, it makes me impatient to hear you. But however you have suffered, and are likely to suffer enough for not taking my advice, so I'll say no more. Carter, hurry! Hurry! The sun will soon rise, and I must have him off. Directly, sir. The shoulder is just bandaged. I must look to this other wound in the arm. She has had her teeth here, too, I think. She sucked the blood. She said she'd drain my heart," said Mason. I saw Mr. Rochester shudder. A singularly marked expression of disgust, horror, hatred, warped his countenance almost to distortion, but he only said, "'Come, be silent, Richard, and never mind her gibberish. Don't repeat it.' "'I wish I could forget it,' was the answer. "'You will, when you are out of the country. When you get back to Spanish Town, you may think of her as dead and buried, or rather you need not think of her at all.' "'Impossible to forget this night.' It is not impossible. Have some energy, man. You thought you were as dead as a herring two hours since, and you are all alive and talking now. There. Carter is done with you, or nearly so. I'll make you decent in a trice. Jane!" he turned to me for the first time since his re-entrance. Take this key, go down to my bedroom, and walk straight forward into my dressing-room. Open the top drawer of the wardrobe, and take out a clean shirt and neck-handkerchief. Bring them here, and be nimble." I went out, sought the repository he had mentioned found the articles named, and returned with them. "'Now,' said he, "'go to the other side of the bed while I order his toilet. But don't leave the room. You may be wanted again.' I retired as directed. "'Was anybody stirring below when you went down, Jane?' inquired Mr. Rochester presently. "'No, sir. All was very still.' "'We shall get you off cannily, Dick, and it will be better, both for your sake and for that of the poor creature in yonder. I have striven long to avoid exposure, and I should not like it to come at last.' Here, Carr, to help him on with his waistcoat. Where did you leave your furred cloak? You can't travel a mile without that, I know, in this damned cold climate. In your room. Jane, run down to Mr. Mason's room, the one next mine, and fetch a cloak you will see there." Again I ran and returned, bearing an immense mantle lined and edged with fur. "'Now I've another errand for you,' said my untiring master. "'You must away to my room again. What a mercy you are showed with velvet, Jane!' A clod-hopping messenger would never do at this juncture. You must open the middle drawer of my toilet-table, and take out a little phial and a little glass you will find there. Quick!" I flew thither and back, bringing the desired vessels. That's well. Now, doctor, I shall take the liberty of administering a dose myself, on my own responsibility. 
I got this cordial at Rome of an Italian charlatan, a fellow you would have kicked, Carter. It is not a thing to be used indiscriminately, but it is good upon occasion, as now, for instance. Jane, a little water." He held out the tiny glass, and I half filled it from the water-bottle on a washstand. "'That will do. Now wet the lip of the phial." I did so. He measured twelve drops of a crimson liquid, and presented it to Mason. "'Drink, Richard. It will give you the heart you lack, for an hour or so. But will it hurt me? Is it inflammatory? Drink! Drink! Drink!" Mr. Mason obeyed, because it was evidently useless to resist. He was dressed now. He still looked pale, but he was no longer gory and sullied. Mr. Rochester let him sit three minutes after he had swallowed the liquid. He then took his arm. "'Now I am sure you can get on your feet,' he said. "'Try!' The patient rose. "'Carter, take him under the other shoulder. Be of good cheer, Richard. Step out, that's it.' "'I do feel better.' remarked Mr. Mason. I am sure you do. Now, Jane, trip on before us away to the back stairs. Unbolt the side passage door, and tell the driver of the post-chaise you will see in the yard, or just outside, for I told him not to drive his rattling wheels over the pavement, to be ready. We are coming. And, Jane, if any one is about, come to the foot of the stairs and hem." It was by this time half-past five, and the sun was on the point of rising, but I found the kitchen still dark and silent. The side passage door was fastened. I opened it with as little noise as possible. All the yard was quiet, but the gates stood wide open, and there was a post-chaise, with horses ready harnessed, and the driver seated on the box, stationed outside. I approached him, and said the gentlemen were coming. He nodded. Then I looked carefully round, and listened. The stillness of early morning slumbered everywhere. The curtains were yet drawn over the servants' chamber windows. Little birds were just twittering in the blossom-blanched orchard trees, whose boughs drooped like white garlands over the wall enclosing one side of the yard. The carriage horses stamped from time to time in their closed stables. All else was still. The gentlemen now appeared. Mason, supported by Mr. Rochester and the surgeon, seemed to walk with tolerable ease. They assisted him into the chaise. Carter followed. "'Take care of him.' said Mr. Rochester to the latter, and keep him at your house till he is quite well. I shall ride over in a day or two to see how he gets on. Richard, how is it with you? The fresh air revives me, Fairfax. Leave the window open on his side, Carter. There is no wind. Good-bye, Dick. Fairfax. Well, what is it? Let her be taken care of. Let her be treated as tenderly as may be. Let her— He stopped, and burst into tears. I do my best, and have done it, and will do it," was the answer. He shut up the chaise door, and the vehicle drove away. "'It would to God there was an end of all this,' added Mr. Rochester, as he closed and barred the heavy yard-gates. This done, he moved with slow step and abstracted air towards a door in the wall bordering the orchard. I, supposing he had done with me, prepared to return to the house. Again, however, I heard him call, "'Jane!' He had opened the portal, and stood at it, waiting for me. "'Come where there is some freshness for a few moments,' he said. "'That house is a mere dungeon. Don't you feel it so?' "'It seems to me a splendid mansion, sir.' "'The glamour of inexperience is over your eyes,' he answered. "'And you see it through a charmed medium. You cannot discern that the gilding is slime, and the silk draperies cobwebs, that the marble is sordid slate and the polished wood's mere refuse chips and scaly bark. Now here," he pointed to the leafy enclosure we had entered, "'all is real, sweet, and pure.' He strayed down a walk edged with box, with apple-trees, pear-trees, and cherry-trees on one side, and a border on the other full of all sorts of old-fashioned flowers, stocks, sweet-williams, primroses, pansies, mingled with southernwood, sweet-briar, and various fragrant herbs. They were fresh now as a succession of April showers and gleams, followed by a lovely spring morning could make them. The sun was just entering the dappled east, and his light illumined the wreathed and dewy orchard trees, and shone down the quiet walks under them. "'Jane, will you have a flower?' He gathered a half-blown rose, the first on the bush, and offered it to me. "'Thank you, sir.' "'Do you like this sunrise, Jane?' That sky with its high and light clouds, which are sure to melt away as the day waxes warm, this placid and balmy atmosphere?" "'I do. Very much.' 
You have passed a strange night, Jane. Yes, sir. And it has made you look pale. Were you afraid when I left you alone with Mason? I was afraid of someone coming out of the inner room. But I had fastened the door. I had the key in my pocket. I should have been a careless shepherd if I had left a lamb, my pet lamb, so near a wolf's den unguarded. You were safe. Will Grace Poole live here still, sir? Oh, yes, don't trouble your head about her. Put the thing out of your thoughts. Yet it seems to me your life is hardly secure while she stays. Never fear. I will take care of myself. Is the danger you apprehended last night gone by now, sir? I cannot vouch for that till Mason is out of England, nor even then. To live, for me, Jane, is to stand on a crater-crust which may crack and spew fire any day. But Mr. Mason seems a man easily led. Your influence, sir, is evidently potent with him. He will never set you at defiance or wilfully injure you. Oh, no! Mason will not defy me. Nor knowing it will he hurt me. But unintentionally he might in a moment, by one careless word, deprive me, if not of life, yet for ever of happiness. Tell him to be cautious, sir. Let him know what you fear, and show him how to avert the danger. He laughed sardonically, hastily took my hand, and as hastily threw it from him. If I could do that, Simpleton, where would the danger be? Annihilated in a moment! Ever since I have known Mason, I have only had to say to him, Do that, and the thing has been done. But I cannot give him orders in this case. I cannot say, Beware of harming me, Richard, for it is imperative that I should keep him ignorant that harm to me is possible. Now you look puzzled, and I will puzzle you further. You are my little friend, are you not? I like to serve you, sir, and to obey you in all that is right. Precisely. I see you do. I see genuine contentment in your gait and mien, your eye and face when you are helping me and pleasing me, working for me and with me, in, as you characteristically say, all that is right. For if I bid you do what you thought wrong, there would be no light-footed running, no neat-handed alacrity, no lively grace and animated complexion. My friend would then turn to me, quiet and pale, and would say, No, sir, that is impossible. I cannot do it, because it is wrong. And would become immutable as a fixed star. Well, you too have power over me, and may injure me, yet I dare not show you where I am vulnerable, lest, faithful and friendly as you are, you should transfix me at once. If you have no more to fear from Mr. Mason than you have from me, sir, you are very safe. God grant it may be so. Here, Jane, is an arbour. Sit down." The arbour was an arch in the wall, lined with ivy. It contained a rustic seat. Mr. Rochester took it, leaving room, however, for me. But I stood before him. "'Sit,' he said. "'The bench is long enough for two. You don't hesitate to take a place at my side, do you? Is that wrong, Jane?' I answered him by assuming it. To refuse would, I felt, have been unwise. Now, my little friend, while the sun drinks the dew, while all the flowers in this old garden awake and expand, and the birds fetch their young ones breakfast out of the thorn-field, and the early bees do their first spell of work, I'll put a case to you, which you must endeavour to suppose your own. But first look at me, and tell me you are at ease, and not fearing that I err in detaining you, or that you err in staying." No, sir, I am content. Well, then, Jane. Call to aid your fancy. Suppose you were no longer a girl well reared and disciplined, but a wild boy indulged from childhood upwards. Imagine yourself in a remote foreign land. Conceive that you there commit a capital error, no matter of what nature or from what motives, but one whose consequences must follow you through life and taint all your existence. Mind, I don't say a crime. I'm not speaking of shedding blood or of any other guilty act, which might make the perpetrator amenable to the law. My word is error. The results of what you have done become in time to you utterly insupportable. You take measures to obtain relief. Unusual measures, but neither unlawful nor culpable. Still you are miserable, for hope has quitted you on the very confines of life. Your sun at noon darkens in an eclipse, which you feel will not leave it till the time of setting. Bitter and base associations have become the sole food of your memory. You wander here and there, seeking rest in exile happiness and pleasure, I mean in heartless sensual pleasure, such as dulls intellect and blights feeling. 
heart-weary and soul-withered, you come home after years of voluntary banishment. You make a new acquaintance, how or where, no matter. You find in this stranger much of the good and bright qualities which you have sought for twenty years, and never before encountered. And they are all fresh, healthy, without soil and without taint. Such society revives, regenerates. You feel better days come back, higher wishes, purer feelings. You desire to recommence your life, and to spend what remains you of days in a way more worthy of an immortal being. To attain this end, are you justified in overleaping an obstacle of custom, a mere conventional impediment which neither your conscience sanctifies, nor your judgment approves?" He paused for an answer. And what was I to say? Oh, for some good spirit to suggest a judicious and satisfactory response! Vain aspiration! The west wind whispered in the ivy round me, but no gentle aerial borrowed its breath as a medium of speech. The birds sang in the tree-tops, but their song, however sweet, was inarticulate. Again Mr. Rochester propounded his query. Is the wandering and sinful but now rest-seeking and repentant man, justified in daring the world's opinion in order to attach him for ever this gentle, gracious, genial stranger? thereby securing his own peace of mind and regeneration of life. Sir, I answered, a wanderer's repose or a sinner's reformation should never depend on a fellow creature. Men and women die, philosophers falter in wisdom, and Christians in goodness. If any one you know has suffered and erred, let him look higher than his equals for strength to amend and solace to heal. But the instrument, the instrument! God, who does the work, ordains the instrument. I have myself, I tell it to you without parable, been a worldly, dissipated, restless man, and I believe I have found the instrument for my cure in—' He paused. The birds went on carolling, the leaves lightly rustling. I almost wondered they did not check their songs and whispers to catch the suspended revelation. But they would have had to wait many minutes, so long was the silence protracted. At last I looked up at the tardy speaker. He was looking eagerly at me. "'Little friend,' said he, in quite a changed tone, while his face changed too, losing all its softness and gravity, and becoming harsh and sarcastic. "'You have noticed my tender penchant for Miss Ingram. Don't you think if I married her she would regenerate me with a vengeance?' He got up instantly, went quite to the other end of the walk, and when he came back he was humming a tune. "'Jane, Jane,' said he, stopping before me, "'you are quite pale with your vigils. Don't you curse me for disturbing your rest?" "'Curse you? No, sir." "'Shake hands in confirmation of the word. What cold fingers! They were warmer last night when I touched them at the door of the mysterious chamber. Jane, when will you watch with me again?" "'Whenever I can be useful, sir." "'For instance, the night before I am married. I am sure I shall not be able to sleep. Will you promise to sit up with me to bear me company? To you I can talk of my lovely one. For now you have seen her and know her." "'Yes, sir." "'She's a rare one, is she not, Jane?' "'Yes, sir." "'A strapper, a real strapper, Jane, big, brown, and buxom, with hair just such as the ladies of Carthage must have had. Bless me! There's dent and lin in the stables. Go in by the shrubbery through that wicket." As I went one way, he went another, and I heard him in the yard, saying cheerfully, Mason got the start of you all this morning. He was gone before sunrise. I rose at four to see him off. End of chapter twenty. Chapter twenty one of Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 21 Presentiments are strange things, and so are sympathies, and so are signs, and the three combined make one mystery to which humanity has not yet found the key. I never laughed at presentiments in my life because I have had strange ones of my own. Sympathies, I believe, exist. 
For instance, between far distant, long absent, wholly estranged relatives, asserting, notwithstanding their alienation, the unity of the source to which each traces his origin, whose workings baffle mortal comprehension. And signs, for aught we know, may be but the sympathies of nature with man. When I was a little girl, only six years old, I one night heard Bessie Levin say to Martha Abbott that she had been dreaming about a little child, and that to dream of children was a sure sign of trouble, either to one's self or one's kin. The saying might have worn out of my memory, had not a circumstance immediately followed which served indelibly to fix it there. The next day Bessie was sent for home to the deathbed of her little sister. Of late I had often recalled this saying and this incident, for during the past week scarcely a night had gone over my couch that had not brought with it a dream of an infant, which I sometimes hushed in my arms, sometimes dandled on my knee, sometimes watched playing with daisies on a lawn, or again dabbling its hands in running water. It was a wailing child this night, and a laughing one the next. Now it nestled close to me, and now it ran from me. But whatever mood the apparition evinced, whatever aspect it wore, it failed not for seven successive nights to meet me the moment I entered the land of slumber. I did not like this iteration of one idea, the strange recurrence of one image, and I grew nervous as bedtime approached and the hour of the vision drew near. It was from companionship with this baby phantom I had been roused on that moonlight night when I heard the cry and it was on the afternoon of the day following I was summoned downstairs, by a message that some one wanted me in Mrs. Fairfax's room. On repairing thither I found a man waiting for me, having the appearance of a gentleman's servant. He was dressed in deep mourning, and the hat he held in his hand was surrounded with a crape band. "'I dare say you hardly remember me, miss,' he said, rising as I entered. "'But my name is Levin. I lived coachman with Mrs. Reed when you were at Gateshead eight or nine years since, and I live there still. "'Oh, Robert! How do you do? I remember you very well. You used to give me a ride sometimes on Miss Georgiana's bay pony. And how is Bessie? You are married to Bessie?' "'Yes, miss. My wife is very hearty, thank you. She brought me another little one about two months since. We have three now, and both mother and child are thriving.' "'And are the family well at the house, Robert?' "'I am sorry I can't give you better news of them, miss.' They are very badly at present, in great trouble." "'I hope no one is dead,' I said, glancing at his black dress. He too looked down at the crape round his hat, and replied, "'Mr. John died yesterday was a week, at his chambers in London.' "'Mr. John?' "'Yes.' "'And how does his mother bear it?' "'Why, you see, Miss Eyre, it is not a common mishap. His life has been very wild. These last three years he gave himself up to strange ways, and his death was shocking." I heard from Bessie he was not doing well. Doing well? He could not do worse. He ruined his health and his estate amongst the worst men and the worst women. He got into debt and into jail. His mother helped him out twice, but as soon as he was free he returned to his old companions and habits. His head was not strong. The knaves he lived amongst fooled him beyond anything I ever heard. He came down to Gateshead about three weeks ago, and wanted Mrs. to give up all to him. Mrs. refused. Her means have long been much reduced by his extravagance. So he went back again, and the next news was that he was dead. How he died, God knows. They say he killed himself." I was silent. The things were frightful. Robert Levin resumed. Mrs. had been out of health herself for some time. She had got very stout, but was not strong with it, and the loss of money and fear of poverty were quite breaking her down. The information about Mr. John's death and the manner of it came too suddenly. It brought on a stroke. She was three days without speaking. But last Tuesday she seemed rather better. She appeared as if she wanted to say something, and kept making signs to my wife and mumbling. It was only yesterday morning, however, that Bessie understood she was pronouncing your name, and at last she made out the words, "'Bring Jane. Fetch Jane Eyre. I want to speak to her.' Bessie is not sure whether she is in her right mind, or means anything by the words. But she told Miss Reed and Miss Georgiana, and advised them to send for you. The young ladies put it off at first, but the mother grew so restless, and said, "'Jane! Jane!' so many times, that at last they consented. I left Gateshead yesterday, and if you can get ready, Miss, I should like to take you back with me early to-morrow morning." "'Yes, Robert, I shall be ready. It seems to me that I ought to go.' "'I think so too, Miss. Bessie said she was sure you would not refuse. But I suppose you will have to ask leave before you can get off." 
"'Yes, and I will do it now.' And having directed him into the servants' hall, and recommended him to the care of John's wife and the attentions of John himself, I went in search of Mr. Rochester. He was not in any of the lower rooms. He was not in the yard, the stables, or the grounds. I asked Mrs. Fairfax if she had seen him. Yes, she believed he was playing billiards with Miss Ingram. To the billiard-room I hastened. The click of balls and the hum of voices resounded thence. Mr. Rochester, Miss Ingram, the two Mrs. Eschen, and their admirers, were all busied in the game. It required some courage to disturb so interesting a party. My errand, however, was one I could not defer, so I approached the master where he stood at Miss Ingram's side. She turned as I drew near, and looked at me haughtily. Her eyes seemed to demand, "'What can the creeping creature want now?' And when I said in a low voice, "'Mr. Rochester,' she made a movement as if tempted to order me away. I remember her appearance at the moment. It was very graceful and very striking. She wore a morning robe of sky-blue crape. Her gauzy azure scarf was twisted in her hair. She had been all animation with the game, and irritated pride did not lower the expression of her haughty lineaments. "'Does that person want you?' she inquired of Mr. Rochester, and Mr. Rochester turned to see who the person was. He made a curious grimace one of his strange and equivocal demonstrations, threw down his cue, and followed me from the room. "'Well, Jane,' he said, as he rested his back against the schoolroom door, which he had shut, "'if you please, sir, I want leave of absence for a week or two.' "'What to do? Where to go?' "'To see a sick lady who has sent for me.' "'What sick lady? Where does she live?' "'At Gateshead, in Blankshire.' "'Blankshire?' That is a hundred miles off. Who may she be that she sends for people to see her at that distance? Her name is Reed, sir, Mrs. Reed. Reed of Gateshead. There was a Reed of Gateshead, a magistrate. It is his widow, sir. And what have you to do with her? How do you know her? Mr. Reed was my uncle, my mother's brother. The deuce he was! You never told me that before. You always said you had no relations. None that would own me, sir. Miss Reed is dead, and his wife cast me off. Why? Because I was poor and burdensome, and she disliked me. But Reed left children. You must have cousins. The George Lynn was talking of a Reed of Gateshead yesterday, who, he said, was one of the veriest rascals on town, and Ingram was mentioning a Georgiana Reed of the same place, who was much admired for her beauty a season or two ago in London. John Reed is dead too, sir. He ruined himself, and half ruined his family, and is supposed to have committed suicide. The news so shocked his mother that it brought on an apoplectic attack. "'And what good can you do her? Nonsense, Jane! I would never think of running a hundred miles to see an old lady, who will, perhaps, be dead before you reach her. Besides, you say she cast you off.' "'Yes, sir, but that is long ago, and when her circumstances were very different. I could not be easy to neglect her wishes now.' How long will you stay? As short a time as possible, sir. Promise me only to stay a week. I had better not pass my word. I might be obliged to break it. At all events, you will come back. You will not be induced under any pretext to take up a permanent residence with her. Oh, no! I shall certainly return if all be well. And who goes with you? You don't travel a hundred miles alone. No, sir. She has sent a coachman. A person to be trusted? Yes, sir. He has lived ten years in the family. Mr. Rochester meditated. When do you wish to go? Early to-morrow morning, sir. Well, you must have some money. You can't travel without money, and I dare say you have not much. I have given you no salary yet. How much have you in the world, Jane? He asked, smiling. I drew out my purse. A meagre thing it was. Five shillings, sir. He took the purse, poured the hoard into his palm, and chuckled over it as if his scantiness amused him. Soon he produced his pocket-book. "'Here,' said he, offering me a note. It was fifty pounds, and he owed me but fifteen. I told him I had no change. "'I don't want change, you know that. Take your wages.' I declined accepting more than was my due. He scowled at first. Then, as if recollecting something, he said— Right, right, better not give you all now. You would, perhaps, stay away three months if you had fifty pounds. There are ten. Is it not plenty?' "'Yes, sir, but now you owe me five. 
"'Come back for it, then. I am your banker for forty pounds.' "'Mr. Rochester, I may as well mention another matter of business to you while I have the opportunity.' "'Matter of business? I am curious to hear it.' "'You have as good as informed me, sir, that you are going shortly to be married.' "'Yes. What then?' "'In that case, sir, Adèle ought to go to school. I am sure you'll perceive the necessity of it." "'To get her out of my bride's way, who might otherwise walk over her rather too emphatically. There's sense in the suggestion, not a doubt of it. Adèle, as you say, must go to school. And you, of course, must march straight to the devil?' "'I hope not, sir. But I must seek another situation somewhere.' "'In course,' he exclaimed, with a twang of voice and a distortion of features equally fantastic and ludicrous. He looked at me some minutes. "'And old Madame Reed, or the Misses, her daughters, will be solicited by you to seek a place, I suppose?' "'No, sir. I am not on such terms with my relatives as would justify me in asking favours of them. But I shall advertise.' "'You shall walk up the pyramids of Egypt,' he growled. "'At your peril you advertise. I wish I had only offered you a sovereign instead of ten pounds. Give me back nine pounds, Jane. I've a use for it.' "'And so have I, sir,' I returned, putting my hands and my purse behind me. I could not spare the money on any account. "'Little niggard,' said he, refusing me a pecuniary request, "'give me five pounds, Jane.' "'Not five shillings, sir, nor fivepence. Just let me look at the cash.' "'No, sir, you are not to be trusted.' "'Jane.' "'Sir?' "'Promise me one thing.' I'll promise you anything, sir, that I think I am likely to perform. Not to advertise, and to trust this quest of a situation to me. I'll find you one in time." "'I shall be glad to do so, sir, if you in your turn will promise that I and Adèle shall be both safe out of the house, before your bride enters it." "'Very well, very well. I'll pledge my word on it. You go to-morrow, then?" "'Yes, sir, early. Shall you come down to the drawing-room after dinner? No, sir, I must prepare for the journey. Then you and I must bid good-bye for a little while. I suppose so, sir. And how do people perform that ceremony of parting, Jane? Teach me. I am not quite up to it. They say, farewell, or any other form they prefer. Then say it. Farewell, Mr. Rochester, for the present. What must I say? The same, if you like, sir. Farewell, Miss Eyre, for the present. Is that all?" Yes. It seems stingy to my notions, and dry and unfriendly. I should like something else, a little addition to the right. If one shook hands, for instance. But no, that would not content me either. So you'll do no more than say farewell, Jane?" It is enough, sir. As much good will may be conveyed in one hearty word as in many. Very likely. But it is blank and cool. Farewell." "'How long is he going to stand with his back against that door?' I asked myself. I want to commence my packing." The dinner-bell rang, and suddenly away he bolted, without another syllable. I saw him no more during the day, and was off before he had risen in the morning. I reached the lodge at Gateshead about five o'clock in the afternoon of the first of May. I stepped in there before going up to the hall. It was very clean and neat. The ornamental windows were hung with little white curtains, the floor was spotless, the grate and fire-irons were burnished bright, and the fire burnt clear. Bessie sat on the hearth, nursing her last born, and Robert and his sister played quietly in a corner. "'Bless you! I knew you would come!' exclaimed Mrs. Levin as I entered. "'Yes, Bessie,' said I, after I had kissed her, "'and I trust I am not too late. How is Mrs. Reed? Alive still, I hope?' Yes, she is alive, and more sensible and collected than she was. The doctor says she may linger a week or two yet, but he hardly thinks she will finally recover. Has she mentioned me lately? She was talking of you only this morning, and wishing you would come, but she is sleeping now, or was ten minutes ago when I was up at the house. She generally lies in a kind of lethargy all the afternoon, and wakes up about six or seven. Will you rest yourself here an hour, miss, and then I will go up with you? Robert here entered, and Bessie laid her sleeping child in the cradle, and went to welcome him. 
Afterwards she insisted on my taking off my bonnet and having some tea, for she said I looked pale and tired. I was glad to accept her hospitality, and I submitted to be relieved of my travelling garb just as passively as I used to let her undress me when a child. Old times crowded fast back on me as I watched her bustling about, setting out the tea-tray with the best china, cutting bread and butter, toasting a tea-cake, and between whiles giving little Robert or Jane an occasional tap or push, just as she used to give me in former days. Bessie had retained her quick temper as well as her light foot and good looks. Tea ready, I was going to approach the table, but she desired me to sit still, quite in her old peremptory tones. I must be served at the fireside, she said and she placed before me a little round stand with my cup and a plate of toast, absolutely as she used to accommodate me with some privately purloined dainty on a nursery chair, and I smiled and obeyed her as in bygone days. She wanted to know if I was happy at Thornfield Hall, and what sort of a person the mistress was, and when I told her there was only a master, whether he was a nice gentleman, and if I liked him. I told her he was rather an ugly man, but quite a gentleman, and that he treated me kindly, and I was content. Then I went on to describe to her the gay company that had lately been staying at the house, and to these details Bessie listened with interest. They were precisely of the kind she relished. In such conversation an hour was soon gone. Bessie restored to me my bonnet, etc., and accompanied by her I quitted the lodge for the hall. It was also accompanied by her that I had, nearly nine years ago, walked down the path I was now ascending. On a dark, misty, raw morning in January, I had left a hostile roof with a desperate and embittered heart, a sense of outlawry and almost of reprobation, to seek the chilly harbourage of Lowood, that born so far away and unexplored. The same hostile roof now again rose before me. My prospects were doubtful yet, and I had yet an aching heart. I still felt as a wanderer on the face of the earth, but I experienced firmer trust in myself and my own powers, and less withering dread of oppression. The gaping wound of my wrongs, too, was now quite healed, and the flame of resentment extinguished. "'You shall go into the breakfast-room first, said Bessie, as she preceded me through the hall. The young ladies will be there. In another moment I was within that apartment. There was every article of furniture looking just as it did on the morning I was first introduced to Mr. Brocklehurst. The very rug he had stood upon still covered the hearth. Glancing at the bookcases, I thought I could distinguish the two volumes of Buick's British Birds, occupying their old place on the third shelf, and Gulliver's Travels and the Arabian Nights ranged just above. The inanimate objects were not changed, but the living things had altered past recognition. Two young ladies appeared before me, one very tall, almost as tall as Miss Ingram, very thin, too, with a sallow face and severe mien. There was something ascetic in her look, which was augmented by the extreme plainness of a straight-skirted, black-stuffed dress, a starched linen collar, hair combed away from the temples, and the nun-like ornament of a string of ebony beads and a crucifix. This, I felt sure, was Eliza, though I could trace little resemblance to her former self in that elongated and colourless visage. The other was as certainly Georgiana, but not the Georgiana I remembered, the slim and fairy-like girl of eleven. This was a full-blown, very plump damsel, fair as waxwork, with handsome and regular features, languishing blue eyes, and ringleted yellow hair. The hue of her dress was black, too, but its fashion was so different from her sister's, so much more flowing and becoming, it looked as stylish as the others looked puritanical. In each of the sisters there was one trait of the mother, and only one. The thin and pallid elder daughter had her parents' cairngorn eye. The blooming and luxuriant younger girl had her contour of jaw and chin, perhaps a little softened, but still imparting an indescribable hardness to the countenance otherwise so voluptuous and buxom. Both ladies, as I advanced, rose to welcome me, and both addressed me by the name of Miss Eyre. Eliza's greeting was delivered in a short, abrupt voice, without a smile, and then she sat down again, fixed her eyes on the fire, and seemed to forget me. Georgiana added to her, how do you do? Several commonplaces about my journey, the weather, and so on, uttered in rather a drawling tone, and accompanied by sundry side-glances that measured me from head to foot, now traversing the folds of my drab merino pelisse, and now lingering on the plain trimming of my cottage bonnet. 
Young ladies have a remarkable way of letting you know that they think you a quiz, without actually saying the words. A certain superciliousness of look, coolness of manner, nonchalance of tone, express fully their sentiments on the point, without committing them by any positive rudeness in word or deed. A sneer, however, whether covert or open, had now no longer that power over me it once possessed. As I sat between my cousins, I was surprised to find how easy I felt, under the total neglect of the one and the semi-sarcastic attentions of the other. Eliza did not mortify, nor Georgiana ruffle me. The fact was, I had other things to think about. Within the last few months feelings had been stirred in me so much more potent than any they could raise, pains and pleasures so much more acute and exquisite, had been excited than any it was in their power to inflict or bestow, that their airs gave me no concern either for good or bad. "'How is Mrs. Reed?' I asked soon looking calmly at Georgiana, who thought fit to bridle at the direct address, as if it were an unexpected liberty. "'Mrs. Reed! Ah, mamma, you mean. She is extremely poorly. I doubt if you can see her to-night.' "'If,' said I, "'you would just step upstairs and tell her I am come, I should be much obliged to you.' Georgiana almost started, and she opened her blue eyes wild and wide. I know she had a particular wish to see me," I added, and I would not defer attending to her desire longer than is absolutely necessary. "'Mamma dislikes being disturbed in an evening,' remarked Eliza. I soon rose, quietly took off my bonnet and gloves, uninvited, and said I would just step out to Bessie, who was, I dared say, in the kitchen, and ask her to ascertain whether Mrs. Reed was disposed to receive me or not to-night. I went, and having found Bessie and dispatched her on my errand, I proceeded to take further measures. It had heretofore been my habit always to shrink from arrogance. Received as I had been to-day, I should, a year ago, have resolved to quit Gateshead the very next morning. Now it was disclosed to me all at once that that would be a foolish plan. I had taken a journey of a hundred miles to see my aunt, and I must stay with her till she was better, or dead. As to her daughter's pride or folly, I must put it on one side, make myself independent of it. So I addressed the housekeeper, asked her to show me a room, told her I should probably be a visitor here for a week or two, had my trunk conveyed to my chamber, and followed it thither myself. I met Bessie on the landing. "'Missus is awake,' said she. "'I have told her you are here. Come and let us see if she will know you.' I did not need to be guided to the well-known room, to which I had so often been summoned for chastisement or reprimand in former days. I hastened before Bessie. I softly opened the door. A shaded light stood on the table, for it was now getting dark. There was the great four-post bed with amber hangings as of old. There the toilet-table, the armchair, and the footstool, at which I had a hundred times been sentenced to kneel, to ask pardon for offences by me uncommitted. I looked into a certain corner near, half expecting to see the slim outline of a once-dreaded switch which used to lurk there, waiting to leap out imp-like and lace my quivering palm or shrinking neck. I approached the bed, I opened the curtains, and leant over the high-piled pillows. Well did I remember Mrs. Reed's face, and I eagerly sought the familiar image. It is a happy thing that time quells the longings of vengeance, and hushes the promptings of rage and aversion. I had left this woman in bitterness and hate, and I came back to her now with no other emotion than a sort of ruth for her great sufferings, and a strong yearning to forget and forgive all injuries, to be reconciled and clasp hands in amity. The well-known face was there, stern, relentless as ever. There was that peculiar eye which nothing could melt, and the somewhat raised, imperious, despotic eyebrow. How often had it lowered on me menace and hate! and how the recollection of childhood's terrors and sorrows revived as I traced its harsh line now. And yet I stooped down and kissed her. She looked at me. "'Is this Jane Eyre?' she said. "'Yes, Aunt Reed. How are you, dear Aunt?' I had once vowed that I would never call her Aunt again. I thought it no sin to forget and break that vow now. My fingers had fastened on her hand which lay outside the sheet. Had she pressed mine kindly, I should at that moment have experienced true pleasure. But unimpressionable natures are not so soon softened, nor are natural antipathies so readily eradicated. Mrs. Reed took her hand away, 
and turning her face rather from me, she remarked that the night was warm. Again she regarded me so icily, I felt at once that her opinion of me, her feeling towards me, was unchanged and unchangeable. I knew by her stony eye, opaque to tenderness, indissoluble to tears, that she was resolved to consider me bad to the last, because to believe me good would give her no generous pleasure, only a sense of mortification. I felt pain, and then I felt ire, and then I felt a determination to subdue her, to be her mistress in spite both of her nature and her will. My tears had risen just as in childhood. I ordered them back to their source. I brought a chair to the bedhead. I sat down and leaned over the pillow. "'You sent for me,' I said, and I am here, and it is my intention to stay till I see how you get on." "'Oh, of course! You have seen my daughters?' Yes. Well, you may tell them I wish you to stay till I can talk some things over with you I have on my mind. To-night it is too late, and I have a difficulty in recalling them. But there was something I wished to say. Let me see." The wandering look and changed utterance told me what wreck had taken place in her once vigorous frame. Turning restlessly, she drew the bedclothes round her. My elbow, resting on a corner of the quilt, fixed it down. She was at once irritated. "'Sit up,' said she. "'Don't annoy me with holding the clothes fast. Are you Jane Eyre?' "'I am Jane Eyre. I have had more trouble with that child than any one would believe. Such a burden to be left on my hands, and so much annoyance as she caused me daily and hourly with her incomprehensible disposition, and her sudden starts of temper, and her continual unnatural watchings of one's movements. I declare she talked to me once like something mad, or like a fiend. No child ever spoke or looked as she did. I was glad to get her away from the house. What did they do with her at Lowood? The fever broke out there, and many of the pupils died. She, however, did not die. But I said she did. I wish she had died." "'A strange wish, Mrs. Reed. Why do you hate her so?' I had a dislike to her mother always, for she was my husband's only sister, and a great favourite with him. He opposed the family's disowning her when she made her low marriage, and when news came of her death he wept like a simpleton. He would send for the baby, though I entreated him rather to put it out to nurse and pay for its maintenance. I hated it the first time I set my eyes on it. A sickly, whining, pining thing! It would wail in its cradle all night long, not screaming heartily like any other child, but whimpering and moaning. Reed pitied it, and he used to nurse it and notice it as if it had been his own. More, indeed, than he ever noticed his own at that age. He would try to make my children friendly to the little beggar. The darlings could not bear it, and he was angry with them when they showed their dislike. In his last illness he had it brought continually to his bedside, and but an hour before he died he bound me by vow to keep the creature. I would as soon have been charged with a pauper brat out of a workhouse, but he was weak, naturally weak. John does not at all resemble his father, and I am glad of it. John is like me, and like my brothers. He is quite a Gibson. Oh, I wish he would cease tormenting me with letters for money. I have no more money to give him. We are getting poor. I must send away half my servants, and shut up part of the house, or let it off. I can never submit to do that. Yet how are we to get on? Two-thirds of my income goes in paying the interest of mortgages. John gambles dreadfully, and always loses. Poor boy! He is beset by sharpers. John is sunk and degraded. His look is frightful. I feel ashamed for him when I see him." She was getting much excited. I think I had better leave her now, said I to Bessie who stood on the other side of the bed. "'Perhaps you had, miss. But she often talks in this way towards night. In the morning she is calmer.' I rose. "'Stop!' exclaimed Mrs. Reed. "'There is another thing I wish to say. He threatens me. He continually threatens me with his own death, or mine, and I dream sometimes that I see him laid out with a great wound in his throat, or with a swollen and blackened face. I am come to a strange pass. I have heavy troubles. What is to be done? How was the money to be had?" Bessie now endeavoured to persuade her to take a sedative draught. She succeeded with difficulty. Soon after Mrs. Reed grew more composed, and sank into a dozing state. I then left her. More than ten days elapsed before I had again any conversation with her. She continued either delirious or lethargic, and the doctor forbade everything which could painfully excite her. 
Meantime, I got on as well as I could with Georgiana and Eliza. They were very cold indeed at first. Eliza would sit half the day sewing, reading, or writing, and scarcely utter a word either to me or her sister. Georgiana would chatter nonsense to her canary bird by the hour and take no notice of me. But I was determined not to seem at a loss for occupation or amusement. I had brought my drawing materials with me, and they served me for both. Provided with a case of pencils and some sheets of paper, I used to take a seat apart from them, near the window, and busy myself in sketching fancy vignettes, representing any scene that happened momentarily to shape itself in the ever-shifting kaleidoscope of imagination. A glimpse of sea between two rocks, the rising moon, and a ship crossing its disk, a group of reeds and water-flags, and a naiad's head, crowned with lotus-flowers rising out of them, an elf sitting in hedge-sparrow's nest, under a wreath of hawthorn bloom. One morning I fell to sketching a face. What sort of a face it was to be I did not care or know. I took a soft black pencil, gave it a broad point, and worked away. Soon I had traced on the paper a broad and prominent forehead, and a square lower outline of visage. That contour gave me pleasure. My fingers proceeded actively to fill it with features. Strongly marked horizontal eyebrows must be traced under that brow. Then followed, naturally, a well-defined nose, with a straight ridge and full nostrils. Then a flexible-looking mouth, by no means narrow. Then a firm chin, with a decided cleft down the middle of it. Of course, some black whiskers were wanted, and some jetty hair tufted on the temples and waved above the forehead. Now for the eyes. I had left them to the last, because they required the most careful working. I drew them large. I shaped them well. The eyelashes I traced long and sombre, the irids lustrous and large. Good, but not quite the thing, I thought, as I surveyed the effect. They want more force and spirit. And I wrought the shades blacker, that the lights might flash more brilliantly. A happy touch or two secured success. There! I had a friend's face under my gaze. And what did it signify that those young ladies turned their backs on me? I looked at it. I smiled at the speaking likeness. I was absorbed and content. "'Is that a portrait of some one you know?' asked Eliza, who had approached me unnoticed. I responded that it was merely a fancy head, and hurried it beneath the other sheets. Of course I lied. It was, in fact, a very faithful representation of Mr. Rochester. But what was that to her, or to any one but myself? Georgiana also advanced to look. The other drawings pleased her much, but she called that— an ugly man!" They both seemed surprised at my skill. I offered to sketch their portraits, and each in turn sat for a pencil outline. Then Georgiana produced her album. I promised to contribute a water-colour drawing. This put her at once into good humour. She proposed a walk in the grounds. Before we had been out two hours, we were deep in a confidential conversation. She had favoured me with a description of the brilliant winter she had spent in London two seasons ago, of the admiration she had there excited, the attention she had received, and I even got hints of the titled conquests she had made. In the course of the afternoon and evening these hints were enlarged on, various soft conversations were reported, and sentimental scenes represented, and in short, a volume of a novel of fashionable life was that day improvised by her for my benefit. The communications were renewed from day to day. They always ran on the same theme—herself, her loves, and woes. It was strange she never once adverted either to her mother's illness or her brother's death, or the present gloomy state of the family prospects. Her mind seemed wholly taken up with reminiscences of past gaiety, and aspirations after dissipations to come. She passed about five minutes each day in her mother's sick-room, and no more. Eliza still spoke little. She had evidently no time to talk. I never saw a busier person that she seemed to be, yet it was difficult to say what she did, or rather to discover any result of her diligence. She had an alarm to call her up early. I know not how she occupied herself before breakfast, but after that meal she divided her time into regular portions, and each hour had its allotted task. Three times a day she studied a little book, which I found on inspection was a common prayer-book. I asked her once what was the great attraction of that volume, and she said, The Rubric. Three hours a day she gave to stitching with gold thread the border of a square crimson cloth, almost large enough for a carpet. In answer to my inquiries after the use of this article, she informed me it was a covering for the altar of a new church lately erected near Gateshead. 
Two hours she devoted to her diary, two to working by herself in the kitchen garden, and one to the regulation of her accounts. She seemed to want no company, no conversation. I believe she was happy in her way. This routine sufficed for her, and nothing annoyed her so much as the occurrence of any incident which forced her to vary its clockwork regularity. She told me one evening, when more disposed to be communicative than usual, that John's conduct and the threatened ruin of the family had been a source of profound affliction to her. But she had now, she said, settled her mind and formed her resolution. Her own fortune she had taken care to secure, and when her mother died, and it was wholly improbable, she tranquilly remarked, that she should either recover or linger long, she would execute a long-cherished project, seek a retirement where punctual habits would be permanently secured from disturbance, and place safe barriers between herself and a frivolous world. I asked if Georgiana would accompany her. "'Of course not. Georgiana and she had nothing in common. They never had had. She would not be burdened with her society for any consideration. Georgiana should take her own course, and she, Eliza, would take hers." Georgiana, when not unburdening her heart to me, spent most of her time in lying on the sofa, fretting about the dullness of the house, and wishing over and over again that her aunt Gibson would send her an invitation up to town. "'It would be so much better,' she said, "'if she could only get out of the way for a month or two, till all was over.' I did not ask what she meant by all being over, but I suppose she referred to the expected decease of her mother, and the gloomy sequel to funeral rites. Eliza generally took no more notice of her sister's indolence and complaints, than if no such murmuring, lounging object had been before her. One day, however, as she put away her account-book and unfolded her embroidery, she suddenly took her up thus. "'Georgiana, a more vain and absurd animal than you, was certainly never allowed to cumber the earth. You had no right to be born, for you make no use of life. Instead of living for, in, and with yourself, as a reasonable being ought, you seek only to fasten your feebleness on to some other person's strength. If no one can be found willing to burden her or himself with such a fat, weak, puffy, useless thing, you cry out that you are ill-treated, neglected, miserable. Then, too, existence for you must be a scene of continual change and excitement, or else the world is a dungeon. You must be admired, you must be courted, you must be flattered, you must have music, dancing, and society, or you languish, you die away. Have you no sense to devise a system which will make you independent of all efforts, and all wills but your own? Take one day, share it into sections, to each section apportion its task, leave no stray unemployed quarters of an hour, ten minutes, five minutes, include all, do each piece of business in its turn with method, with rigid regularity. The day will close almost before you are aware it has begun, and you are indebted to no one for helping you to get rid of one vacant moment. You have had to seek no one's company, conversation, sympathy, forbearance. You have lived, in short, as an independent being ought to do. Take this advice. The first and last I shall offer you. Then you will not want me or any one else, happen what may. Neglect it. Go on as heretofore, craving, whining, and idling, and suffer the results of your idiocy, however bad and insuperable they may be. I tell you this plainly, and listen, for though I shall no more repeat what I am about to say, I shall steadily act on it. After my mother's death, I wash my hands of you. From the day her coffin is carried to the vault in Gateshead Church, you and I will be as separate as if we had never known each other. You need not think that because we chance to be born of the same parents, I shall suffer you to fasten me down by even the feeblest claim. I can tell you this, if the whole human race, ourselves except, were swept away, and we two stood alone on the earth, I would leave you in the old world, and betake myself to the new." She closed her lips. "'You might have spared yourself the trouble of delivering that tirade,' answered Georgiana. "'Everybody knows you are the most selfish, heartless creature in existence, and I know your spiteful hatred towards me. I have had a specimen of it before in the trick you played me about Lord Edwin Vere. You could not bear me to be raised above you, to have a title, to be received into circles where you dare not show your face, and so you acted the spy and informer, and ruined my prospects for ever." Georgiana took out her handkerchief, and blew her nose for an hour afterwards. Eliza sat cold, impassable, and assiduously industrious. True, generous feeling is made small account of by some, but here were two natures rendered, the one intolerably acrid, the other despicably savourless for the want of it. Feeling without judgment is a washy draught indeed, but judgment untempered by feeling is too bitter and husky a morsel for human degluition. It was a wet and windy afternoon. Georgiana had fallen asleep on the sofa over the perusal of a novel. 
Eliza was gone to attend a saint's day service at the new church, for in matters of religion she was a rigid formalist. No weather ever prevented the punctual discharge of what she considered her devotional duties. Fair or foul, she went to church thrice every Sunday, and as often on weekdays as there were prayers. I bethought myself to go upstairs and see how the dying woman sped, who lay there almost unheeded. The very servants paid her but a remittent attention. The hired nurse, being little looked after, would slip out of the room whenever she could. Bessie was faithful, but she had her own family to mind, and could only occasionally come to the hall. I found the sick-room unwatched, as I had expected. No nurse was there. The patient lay still, and seemingly lethargic, her livid face sunk in the pillows, the fire was dying in the grate. I renewed the fuel, rearranged the bedclothes, gazed a while on her who could not now gaze on me, and then I moved away to the window. The rain beat strongly against the panes, the wind blew tempestuously. One lies there, I thought, who will soon be beyond the war of earthly elements. Whither will that spirit, now struggling to quit its material tenement, flit when at length released? In pondering the great mystery, I thought of Helen Burns, recalled her dying words, her faith, her doctrine of the equality of disembodied souls. I was still listening in thought to her well-remembered tones, still picturing her pale and spiritual aspect, her wasted face and her sublime gaze as she lay on her placid deathbed, and whispered her longing to be restored to her divine father's bosom, when a feeble voice murmured from the couch behind, "'Who is that?' I knew Mrs. Reed had not spoken for days. Was she reviving? I went up to her. "'It is I, Aunt Reed.' Who? I," was her answer. "'Who are you?' Looking at me with surprise and a sort of alarm, but still not wildly. "'You are quite a stranger to me. Where is Bessie?' "'She is at the lodge, aunt.' "'Aunt,' she repeated. "'Who calls me aunt? You are not one of the Gibsons, and yet I know you. That face, and the eyes, and forehead are quite familiar to me. You are like—why, you are like Jane Eyre!' I said nothing. I was afraid of occasioning some shock by declaring my identity. Yet, said she, I am afraid it is a mistake. My thoughts deceive me. I wish to see Jane Eyre, and I fancy a likeness where none exists. Besides, in eight years she must be so changed. I now gently assured her that I was the person she supposed and desired me to be, and seeing that I was understood, and that her senses were quite collected, I explained how Bessie had sent her husband to fetch me from Thornfield. I am very ill, I know," she said ere long. I was trying to turn myself a few minutes since, and find I cannot move a limb. It is as well I should ease my mind before I die. What we think little of in health burdens us at such an hour as the present is to me. Is the nurse here, or is there no one in the room but you?" I assured her we were alone. Well, I have twice done you a wrong which I regret now. One was in breaking the promise which I gave my husband to bring you up as my own child. The other—' She stopped. "'After all, it is of no great importance, perhaps,' she murmured to herself. "'And then I make it better, and to humble myself so to her is painful.' She made an effort to alter her position, but failed. Her face changed. She seemed to experience some inward sensation, the precursor, perhaps, of the last pang. "'Well, I must get it over. Eternity is before me. I had better tell her. Go to my dressing-case, open it, and take out a letter you will see there." I obeyed her directions. "'Read the letter,' she said. It was short, and thus conceived. "'Madam, will you have the goodness to send me the address of my niece Jane Eyre, and to tell me how she is? It is my intention to write shortly, and desire her to come to me at Madeira. Providence has blessed my endeavours to secure a competency, and as I am unmarried and childless, I wish to adopt her during my life, and bequeath her at my death whatever I may have to leave. I am, madam, etc., etc., John Eyre, Madeira." It was dated three years back. "'Why did I never hear of this?' I asked. "'Because I disliked you too fixedly and thoroughly ever to lend a hand in lifting you to prosperity. I could not forget your conduct to me, Jane, the fury with which you once turned on me, the tone in which you declared you abhorred me the worst of anybody in the world, the unchildlike look and voice with which you affirmed that the very thought of me made you sick, and asserted that I had treated you with miserable cruelty. I could not forget my own sensations when you thus started up and poured out the venom of your mind. 
I felt fear as if an animal that I had struck or pushed had looked up at me with human eyes and cursed me in a man's voice. "'Bring me some water! Oh, make haste!' "'Dear Mrs. Reed,' said I, as I offered her the draught she required, "'think no more of all this. Let it pass away from your mind. Forgive me for my passionate language. I was a child then. Eight, nine years have passed since that day.' She heeded nothing of what I said, but when she had tasted the water and drawn breath, she went on thus. I tell you I could not forget it, and I took my revenge. For you to be adopted by your uncle, and placed in an estate of ease and comfort, was what I could not endure. I wrote to him. I said I was sorry for his disappointment, but Jane Eyre was dead. She had died of typhus fever at Lowood. Now act as you please. Write and contradict my assertion. Expose my falsehood as soon as you like. You were born, I think, to be my torment. My last hour is racked by the recollection of a deed which, but for you, I should never have been tempted to commit. If you could be persuaded to think no more of it, aunt, and to regard me with kindness and forgiveness. You have a very bad disposition, said she, and one to this day I feel it impossible to understand. How for nine years you could be patient and quiescent under any treatment, and in the tenth break out all fire and violence I can never comprehend. My disposition is not so bad as you think. I am passionate, but not vindictive. Many a time, as a little child, I should have been glad to love you if you would have let me, and I long earnestly to be reconciled to you now. Kiss me, aunt." I approached my cheek to her lips. She would not touch it. She said I oppressed her by leaning over the bed, and again demanded water. As I laid her down, for I raised her and supported her on my arm while she drank, I covered her ice-cold and clammy hand with mine. The feeble fingers shrank from my touch, the glazing eyes shunned my gaze. "'Love me, then, or hate me as you will,' I said at last. "'You have my full and free forgiveness. Ask now for God's, and be at peace.' Poor suffering woman! It was too late for her to make now the effort to change her habitual frame of mind. Living, she had ever hated me. Dying, she must hate me still. The nurse now entered, and Bessie followed. I yet lingered half an hour longer, hoping to see some sign of amity, but she gave none. She was fast relapsing into stupor, nor did her mind again rally. At twelve o'clock that night she died. I was not present to close her eyes, nor were either of her daughters. They came to tell us the next morning that all was over. She was by that time laid out. Eliza and I went to look at her. Georgiana, who had burst into loud weeping, said she dared not go. There was stretched Sarah Reed's once robust and active frame, rigid and still. Her eye of flint was covered with its cold lid. Her brow and strong traits wore yet the impress of her inexorable soul. A strange and solemn object was that corpse to me. I gazed on it with gloom and pain. Nothing soft, nothing sweet, nothing pitying or hopeful or subduing did it inspire. Only a grating anguish for her woes, not my loss and a sombre, tearless dismay at the fearfulness of death in such a form. Eliza surveyed her parent calmly. After a silence of some minutes, she observed, With her constitution she should have lived to a good old age. Her life was shortened by trouble. And then a spasm constricted her mouth for an instant. As it passed away, she turned and left the room. And so did I. Neither of us had dropped a tear. End of chapter 21